Welcome along to the Circuit de Catalunya Barcelona, the 24 hours of Barcelona in glorious sunshine. It's just coming up to midday local time here, and we feel so refreshed after yesterday's downpour. We are back to sunny conditions and expecting beautiful sunshine throughout this 24 hours of Barcelona, the 24th edition of this famous race, which began as a touring car race, but now includes a plethora of GT3 machinery, GT machinery generally. And we've got a really fantastic grid of five separate categories to celebrate and so much festivities down on the grid. It's absolutely packed full of people because uh, the local crowd here are allowed to come in for free. Mugello started our European tour with the 12 hours there in March. Spa, Francochon, Monza, Esteril, look at the names that these guys have visited across the season. But this is the sole 24-hour race for 2023. A huge challenge awaiting all of our teams and drivers here in Barcelona. Midday local time start, midday finish on Sunday. And what a difference the day makes. Yesterday, it was incredibly grey, incredibly overcast, thunderstorms hit the circuit, and then the rain just would not stop it. Compromised our qualifying sessions, but no more compromises today. Bone dry, humidity still actually quite high. We're expecting highs of up to 28 degrees today, even higher on Sunday for our tour to the beach post-race. Enjoying the sunshine in his shorts. It was appalling to choose shorts and t-shirts yesterday, but Nick Damon has his setup right today, Nick. Ah, good evening, Ben. Good evening, good afternoon, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the front of the uh, the grid here in the Circuit of Catalonia, and welcome to several people with castanets. Um, the uh, the local dancers. It's like the Spanish version of Morris dancing, only perhaps uh, a little bit more energetic as it come out of breath. Anyway, we had a qualifying session yesterday, as you say. I was erroneously attired but now we have a grid and the grid was set in just that one session yesterday so it's a kind of a mixed up grid we've got a, a g a 992 porsche in second this is the uh, the imsa porsche which is in pole um a little bit short of drivers at the moment i think they're all having a bit of a watch of the uh, um exciting castanet based dancing over this side in second uh, is the red ant car so that's where the 992 car has qualified in second Again, it's uh, it's Cassinetti, but let's talk to uh, Hoop Van Eindhoven. So, on the front row of the grid, in a 992, bit of a surprise. Yeah, I was surprised as well, but uh, if you see the lap, uh, I think we could have gone uh, for Paul as well. So, really happy to start here, and uh, now we just need to maintain our position for 24 hours. Now, I hope you're going to change the tyres for you, Star, because you've got wet side in the moment. <laughs> yeah, for sure, they are still uh, in the tyre warmer, so we get a fresh head on for the start. You've got a lot of faster cars behind you. Is it a case the first few laps you've got to try and let them through whilst losing the least amount of time? Well, I, I just go for it and uh, drive as hard as I can with the tyre management and then see how I can uh, let them pass the, the quickest way. Yeah. In, the, in the second place car. We'll come to you meandering down. We've got a kind of a, a weird front back, front back situation here because we've got to get back up for the, uh, the front for the... Uh, Po ceremonies for the uh, national. The, here is the uh, the third place car, and that's the Rinaldi uh, Ferrari. And here is the team, the drivers. It's George Vice, Torsten, Kratz, and uh, Leonard. Leonard, um, you're very fond of a bucket hat. You were even wearing a bucket hat at breakfast. What is it about the bucket hat that particularly it make, makes you happy? Uh, it's really nice, you know. You get sun cover from all sides. Uh, looks good. And the pizza one is the lucky one for the ways. Now, the real question is, if you like bucket hats so much, why have you not got a properly logoed bucket hat? Yeah, good question. Maybe we, we work on that. Excellent. <laughs> Let's go, Torsten, um, you've got a, a 992 in front of you and a, and a Porsche in front of you. I mean, this car was fantastic in, in Estoril. Is it as good here in, in Barcelona? Uh, I would say yes. And, um, yeah, the training was, was uh, OK. The qualifying was, was also great yesterday with a cup uh, Porsche in front of us. He will not last long there, and uh, <laughs> so and we will find our way to the to the front. And Georg, in Estoril, you drove about nine minutes at the end to bring the car home. Are you going to do the full two hours this time? Ah, oh, now it's twenty-four hours, you know. But you only have to do two of them. Now I go for maybe sixteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Um, I think in the evening I go in the car for two hours or whatever, and tomorrow also, it's okay. Right, so thank you. That's the team uh, from the uh, Wokkenspiegel uh, Ferrari. Uh, next to him uh, on the row, it's the, uh, the 23 car, who I must admit, I don't know who that is because I haven't uh, studied the thing. That's the car collection motorsport Porsche um, of a number of drivers, many of whom have nope, been identified. Um, let's have a, uh, a quick win at Alex. So, um, quite a long way up on the grid. Are you surprised about how good a qualifying it was for you? Well, there was Ivan in the car, and uh, I know he's one of the quickest amateurs out there, so he did a very good job in the a very wet first qualifying. So a bit uh, unfortunate that we couldn't drive later on, but I would say it's a good starting position for us. Very wet all yesterday, so have you had to guess the setup, or did you already know a dry setup for Barcelona? Well, luckily, we have to say that this car is very fast in the wet, so we just had to compromise for a setup that in the end we knew that was unlikely to have wet and rain in this 24-hour race. So we just had a setup to keep it safe, keep it quick, but uh, not, uh, not change it too much so that the, the way of the car was handling was quite similar for us and on the dry as well. Great stuff, best of luck. Right, we're going to meander back to the front of the grid because it's time for one of those very important things in every, any international race, which is the national anthems. Now, of course, we are in Catalonia, so we have the national anthems of both Spain and the Catalonia region. And it will be brought to you by the group called E Strings by Geo. And I'm not sure whether I cue them in, I point to them, I just say, go, off you go. <laughs> They're being announced by the PA, and then there'll be E-String by Geo will be playing as the two national anthems. Vinga, aquest fort aplaudiment. Moltíssimes gràcies a la gent de E-Strings by Gio. Una vegada well, més. Fantàstic there by E-Speed by Gio. And if I find the person who stole half their instruments, I'll, uh, I'll personally sort them out. Uh, fantastic stuff. Now, we have been told to have a quick shifty at the trophies. They love a good trophy shot here. Um, these are the things that people are racing for. You have the participation trophy for every North London primary school. Then you have the main trophy. But you also, of course, this is the... the the trophy Fermi Velez, which is uh, a trophy that's been for many years, because of course we have uh, this race, whilst it's been a 24 hour series for a few years, it's now running its 22nd time. And this is the Spirit of the Race Award, which will be decided by none other than us uh, towards the end of the race. So uh, we will be looking to see who has exhibited the spirit of endurance in 24 hour 
races. There tends to be a lot of endurance and a lot of spirit. Right, let's go and uh, see if we can meander back down and see if we can talk to some more people slightly deeper into the grid. It is absolutely packed. They have let most of Barcelona onto the grid, which is great, because obviously it gives people the chance to experience the excitement of endurance sports car racing. It does make meandering down the grid lane a little bit more difficult than it should be, uh, because there's too many people around. Right, let's see if we can have a quick word with uh, the team uh, who are doing uh, an extra bit of racing. Uh, it's Daniel Alleman. Daniel, um, a lot of extra work for you today, because uh, two of your drivers aren't even here. Yeah, we are looking for the driver. <laughs> Not here, yeah. yeah. We have a lot to do, yeah. So, Robert and uh, um, Ralph are going to come along just for the evening. So, you have to do all the ri driving between then. <laughs> Lots more driving for you. I don't understand you, sorry. <laughs> Patrick, um, so you've been, you've been drafted into the team to replace uh, Robert and uh, uh, Ralph who aren't here. Yeah, well, the guys guys realize they have double duties this weekend. So Ralph and Robert are in Valencia for sprint, and uh, that's why that's why I'm I'm going to be here for the night a bit to support the guys. Have you driven for the team before? Yeah, we're doing GT Open together with with Renauers. I drove with Alfred Renauer in um, in GT Open and Paul Ricard together. It's a great team, good fun, good guys. With Daniel, uh, we basically shared a pit box in the past, so that's that. And back to the old car, you're on the previous version of GT3. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the old, old, horse, old horse runs. It's a great car. It goes well. We have a bit more top speed than the, than the Gen 2 car, which should, help us, uh, which should help us in the race. And we'll just roll through. All good. Thank you, Patrick. It's from the 91 Herbert Motorsport car. Just continue meandering down. Ah, there's the, oh, hang on a second. You've got Simon, my, my, my favorite man. It's, it's, it's Simone de Castro. Don't put, do you have any kinders for me? No, 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 I'm more, more concentrated. But if you make a good stint, I wait a new package of Kinder for me. Fantastic. Barcelona, it's a great track. Do you, what do you think of the track itself? It's like a classic circuit no, now, isn't it? The track, track is fantastic. It's like Mugello. But uh, now it's very hard because uh, we start with 992 in the third uh, uh, line. And uh, in the rear, I have a lot of GT3. So watch the Tibu. We will watch, and more importantly, we'll find out a little bit more about the Circuit of Catalonia, because Ben is going to talk you around a lap. Well, it's not Ben, it's me, Joe. Joe Bradley, going to take you around this Circuit de Catalonia, well established on the motorsport calendar, the 24 hours of Barcelona, established since 1998, and a very, very demanding from both the driving and engineering sense in the words. Long, long straight past the... the never-ending turn three that will take everything out of those tires. The left front tire takes a bashing through three and it's really down to driver management throughout the stint, how you get through. Short shoot downhill to a very fast 180 degree sweeping right-hander that opens up very nicely, get the car back across to the left for it's the downhill left-hander hairpin, quite tight, another heavy braking point and you wanna get momentum because this section here through the kink at six and then into the uphill section. Very tight left-hander at seven, sweeping through turn eight, which is a kink, and then the very fast turn nine. Very demanding, got to get your point, your apex very, very spot on. If you're just a meter offline, you're going to run off and incur the wrath of the officials. Heavy braking for 10, it's a sweeping corner, and then through the kink at 11, and then 12. Brings us back towards the stadium section. We're not miss. we're not doing this uh, configuration of track. It's through turn 13 there, just in the background, and then straight into what will be 14, which is there on 16 on that track map. So we're not doing that chicane sequence. We are running the old course, the standard course that this circuit came alive to when we first had the Spanish Grand Prix here back in 1991. And it's, I'm happy to see that configuration back on the calendar. Well, back down here on the grid. Are you with me, guys? Back here down the grid, we have... I wanted to speak to Antonio Sinero, but I'm, I'm not sure 
which one is An Antonio? Oh, he's there at E2P. Uh, you appear to have brought your entire family with you, and, and they're, they're very closely together. Yeah, as you can see, you have a very big family. <laughs> I, I like this particular. They managed the sunglasses the right side. Yeah, the sunglasses are great, yeah. So how, more importantly, how's it? This is quite frightening. I'm feeling quite oppressed by a number of Antonios. It's actually quite frightening. It's one of my nightmares. I mean, you've got, what I have to say is you've all got lovely hair. Lovely hair. Yeah, of course, of course. My hair is lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, lo how long did that take this morning? I mean, how long does the hair preparation take? Not that much. The race preparation is, is more important, yeah. And how is preparation for the race going? Um, we are really... Um, we are going to defend uh, a lot in the start, so we are going to take it calm, and, and let's see how, how it works. Yep. Great. Um, thank you, Antonio. Um, look, I've got great hair, great hair, bad hair. Great hair, bad hair. Thank you very much, guys. E2P there, uh, having a bit of fun. Okay, now back down. Uh, You are the expert. I've lost the cameraman. Seb's was wandering around going, where is he? Uh, you're starting a bit further back. There's a number of slower cars than you'd expect because of the qualifying behind you. And uh, you damaged your car yesterday. So how are things? Well, you know, the CP Racing guys did a great job. Got everything back together. Shane had a little mishap. We all do. Won't be his last. Um, but, uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, getting me back from yesterday. The, uh, but, again, they did a great job getting it back together. We'll just move forward. I just talked to Elo over in the one car, and we'll move forward and try and get the... They're a very close team over here, isn't they? <laughs> now, we will be speaking to Shane later, because Shane, Shane's let us down, but we'll talk to him later about that, because we've got, to, we've got 12 hours to fill about how he's let us down, hasn't he? Yes. He has let us down with his sideboard, but we, we, we have a whole little thing planned for that later, so don't worry, you won't miss out on the Shane Lewis sideboard uh, problem. Right, so moving down, as you can see, many people are kind of tidying up and getting out off the grid. Um, they're kind of waving. Let's see, let's see if I can capture somebody I do want to speak. I felt, uh, this walking backwards, going, ah, there we are. There's the man I want. This is the man I want to finish my uh, final grid work in Europe, walking Europe for Creventic for this year. It's Gary Williams, the man behind Creventic. Gary, it's the end of the European season. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm, I'm feeling fantastic. I, I, I always the start grid is one of my favourites uh, a moment and the last uh, round of the, of the championship. So uh, exciting moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, a difficult season with some problems, obviously. We had some problems in, uh, uh, earlier with, with events disappearing when they should have been arranged. But how do you feel overall the season went? I mean, was it, it started brilliantly with Mugello and Spa, didn't it? Yes, well, of course, uh, Mugello was great, Spa was great. But I think uh, we had a great uh, uh, season. We had a lot of competitors coming back. So we have a, a strong uh, championship. So this, this here this has to be decided for many classes. So uh, I, we are happy with the season, uh, yes. And of course, we've got uh, the Middle East season coming up next. We go to Kuwait, then Dubai, and then Abu Dhabi, then back into Europe next season. Give it, so, so, talk to us about next year's European season. Okay, but first, we hope all, all to see you all, of course, in Kuwait, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. And uh, uh, next year, uh, yesterday, we announced uh, the calendar. So, we are really happy to have again a, a championship of five uh, rounds, starting again in Mugello, 12 hours uh, race, then uh, uh, Spa, we have uh, Portimao. And we have a new uh, track, Misano, and we finish in uh, Barcelona. So five round uh, track with two 24 hour race and three 12 hour. And there's a mystery track, isn't there as well? Uh, there is, but that's not of the championship. Yeah, but you, you, you must. You, apparently, you, he, Jerry, we got asked Gary for about oh, no, about 20 minutes. Yes, he wouldn't tell us where it was. Can you give us like one extra clue? Uh, no, sorry, I oh. uh, can't. But it will be exciting. It, I, what I can tell you, it will be announced within two weeks. Fantastic. Okay, so I think they are now clearing the grid. There, is, there does seem to be a couple of spaces here. So, but maybe a couple of cars still in the pits. We'll, we'll check that out as we go. But uh, now, with about uh, four minutes, it rolls off. I'm going to pass you back up to the booth to Ben and to Thank Joe. Thank you very much, Nick Damon, on the grid there in his shorts. All the energy, all the passion. And the grid is now cleared of all the fans that were absolutely making Nick's life uh, very tricky. They've all got themselves onto the roof, by the looks of it, above and, and above the, uh, the garages. So they're going to have a great vantage point on this uh, fantastic facility here in Barcelona. Uh, a wonderful circuit, a wonderful place to go racing. Uh, and with those changes that we saw uh, on the track map and Joe uh, described, 
a much better flowing circuit, especially in that last part of the lap. The grid has been formed in the GT class uh, by a single qualifying session for the amateur drivers. So it's going to be very mixed up. 76 IMSA LM, uh, LS Group Performance Porsche is on the pole position, and it's the best 992 Red Ant 903 car that lines up alongside with the uh, 296 GT3 Ferrari in third and Car Collections 23 fourth position and second in the 992 category. Then we go to Billy Motorsport by EB, third in 992. Look, we've got more 992s than GT3s right now. GT3 Herbert Motorsport on row three in sixth position. Haas RT in seventh and then Richardson Racing on their debut in 992 AM, eighth position and best of the AM category ahead of their rival uh, in GT3, Hoffer Racing, the best of the GTX, ended up being the KTM Crossbow in 10th position of Razoon More Than Racing, Yuta Racing, GT3 Pro-Am in 11th, and then the local team E2P Racing in their 9.9, oh, they're in the GT3 now, uh, so they're in the GT3 AM category in 12th position, Shira Sport PHX uh, in their R8 LMS GT3 in 13th, and then CP Racing with the collision down at turn one in that sole qualifying session, only 14th for the Mercedes. Yuta Racing's 72, 15th, and then NM Racing in a GT2 Mercedes in 16th spot. Then we have the Huracan Super Trofeo, which is in GTX in 17th. Red Camels, 992 down in 18th position. Work to do for them. A 992 Amcar 19th for MRS GT Racing. We think that's one car that's missing from the grid. Then 930 HRT Performance, 992 GT3 20th. Red Ant 904 21st. Land Motorsport 22nd for the... Uh, Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff team, th number 34 in the Audi. An NKPP by HRT in 23rd. Seb Lajoux Racing in 24th in their 992 GT3 as well. And then we have VDS Racing Adventures in their Mark II V8 in the GTX category ahead of an older generation 992 GT3 car. That's why the Escudia Farron uh, sits in the GTX category. Then we have Orchard Racing and HRT Performance on row 14. HRT and Vortex, the first of the Vortex is on row 15. Row 16, we're still in the GTX class, is in 31st position, the last, I think, of our GT cars, and that is the Vortex 702. Then Bagheera Racing is tops the first qu qualifying session. So that was a qualifying session that was full uh, spread of three sessions. Uh, they are ahead of Atlas BX Motorsport, then Hoffer Racing by Bonk uh, in an M4, an old GT3 Cup car uh, of Tracy Crone, did not set at time, so they're gonna start on row 18. Curiously though, uh, ahead of, kind of in the mix of the GT4 cars, I'm not sure exactly why. And the TCE category, Holmgard ahead of Wolf in their two TCR cars, with Baz Kooten also in a TCR Cupra in third position. Just three TCR cars fighting it out in TCE. Well done, Ben. 39 cars qualified for this 24-hour race. We'll see. We'll get a report from the pits as to whether those gaps on the grid will be filled with cars starting from the pit lane. At the Furman Velleth Trophy is what we're playing for here this weekend in Barcelona. Who's Furman Velleth? Well, he's one of Spain's most famous racing drivers, well known in sports car racing. Got a, a, a slow starter, just getting a push start. That's the 416 car, just going to be helped. To be. Is that not Bagheera? It's Bagheera, yeah. So it's that's our pole GT4 car. And also one of our championship protagonists. Um, Furman Velleth. Uh, Class winner at Le Mans in 1987 in the Spice Engineering C2 class car and renowned also in America, the Doyle Reese Racing, uh, another first place in class in the WSC class in 1998, sharing a Ferrari 333 SP, would you believe, with Eric van der Poel and Wayne Taylor at Le Mans. So two class wins at Le Mans for Furman Velleth and in this part of the world, he's a local chap to Barcelona, he's still honoured in this way every year here at the 24 hours of barcelona nice and slow on this warm-up lap you see the very kind of pale colored tarmac we have here at barcelona almost white in color it gets baked so hard over the summer months 
but uh, we are expecting decent temperatures uh, today in racing. Just having a look at the tracker, we definitely have 988 uh, in the pit. So that is the MRS GT Racing Porsche uh, that sits in the AM category of 992. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a starter for the moment. Uh, I guess the there's Bagheera who's oh. been pushed into the pits. So they have had a failure trying to get off the line in the GT4 category. It's a drama before we even get underway here. Now, this Barcelona. has got championship connotations, of course, not just for GT4, but for the overall GT European trophy. Um, Bagheera, uh, only two points behind the Atlas BX Motorsport team in the GT4 class, but Bagheera, third place in the European Trophy Championship, again, only two points behind the leaders who were Atlas BX and RD Signs, both on 164. We'll, uh, we'll keep you updated as to how the championship, the European Championship, is looking as we go through this 24 hour race, but already significance to that with the Bagheera car into the pit. I think it's been restarted though, Ben, looking yep. like it's crawling to the front of the pit lane and will start from the pit lane so not really losing too much ground as long as we get that car going just not going to be quite as up to temperature on that first lap likewise with anti ramo at the end of pit lane looks like the 988 will get going but just at the back of the field and uh, the car's now getting very close to the end of this lap it's quite a quick end to the lap once they've got that down to that big braking zone at turn 10 because we don't have the big chicane that we used to have a great display there of what it looks like a cup car versus a gt3 car they are both 992s but on the left hand side is the 992 category car which is the, basically the cup car the one make carrera cup or super cup car on the right hand side on the pole position is the gt3 spec the gt3 just looks like it's been in the gym a few more days <laughs> yeah. of the week doesn't it it's a little bit bulked out wider track uh, flared wheel arches but here we go ben we are being brought nicely down to the line by gregory gervia in the pole position number 76 the red lights are on and we're about to go racing Gregory Gilbert gets the 24 hours of Barcelona underway from pole position and has a clear advantage. He's going to tow the Ferrari of WTM Rinaldi Jochen Krumbach. Looking, going down the inside, stronger on the brakes and already side by side for the lead. Krumbach desperately wants to establish a rhythm at the head of the field. He's going to go round the outside at turn two and that's going to give him the inside line for turn three and Ferrari take the lead here after three corners. Confidence from Krumbach and he gets ahead of Eindhoven, of course, different class of car, we'd expect that. Uh, but there was a door open. Ferrari leads Porsche in third position. The 23 of Alex Fontana, a very aggressive Porsche racer. He's also in the GT3 car. Uh, he's a pro in a pro-am category car. And Hass RT up to fourth position. So they've really done very quick work of those outlying 992 cars. Yeah, some very, very aggressive driving from Max Hofer in the number 21 Hass RT. The Audi yeah. R8 going down the inside there and overtaking about four cars. I was a little worried, Ben about how they would sidestep that 992 class car because it just hasn't got the speed and acceleration or the traction of the GT3 class. Well, everybody has gone through and we're already onto the infield section heading towards turn 10. We know how quick that 296, that brand new Ferrari WTM debuted at the Estoril 12 hours and had a very, very successful weekend. We know how quick that car is and right now, it's showing us exactly how quick it is by pulling already a couple of car lengths. Gregor Gilbert does not have the experience of driving a Porsche like Alex Fontana does behind. Second and third in the race, you can see the confidence that Alex Fontana has in third versus Gilbert, who doesn't seem to have the front end as yet in that black LS Group performance Porsche and is already losing a little bit of ground to the Ferrari. It is WTM by Rinaldi that leads. A small gap then to LS Group performance. And now Alex Fontana looks down the inside for second position. Further back, there is also a battle. Mercedes defending uh, from Audi. That's Alex Prince and Baz Schuten, I believe. And Alexander Price holds on to what is a sixth spot. So great first lap there. Ferrari, Porsche, Porsche, Audi, Porsche, Mercedes, Audi, Porsche, Audi. That was your top eight. As we are going about this, it's a bit like it has the look of a 10 lap sprint race at this point, Ben, with people jigging around and looking for position. It's a 24 hour race, boys. You need to just maybe, you know, be a little bit more conservative. 
it maybe looks worse than it is with just people just trying each other out. But things settling down into lap two and the Ferrari of the WTM, Rinaldi Racing going off and pulling out even more of a gap to that number 76 but IMSA LS Group Performance Porsche. I guess that's what happens when you have so many cars out of position at the yes. start. You need to be aggressive to clear them as quickly as possible because you can easily lose two, three, four seconds. You can lose touch of the group if you're not that aggressive. Max Hofer getting up from uh, seventh, I think it was at the start, up to fourth position now. He has uh, behind him Alfred Renauer in the Herbert Porsche crawling all over the rear wing uh, and then a little bit of a gap to the first of our Mercedes. Alexander Prince in the 11. Bad Schutten then uh, follows on and then is the first of the 992s. Would you believe it is Willy Motorsport by EV Motors that's the first of the 992s? Uh, which means that Hub van Inhofen was very cautious at the start from the front row and has dropped to second in class there. GTX being led by the KTM Crossball Razoon more than racing Dominic Obert, 11th overall leading GTX and looking down the order. We've got a car being pushed back into the pit lane. We've now got Dinah Binks in the pit lane. Di will be able to tell us exactly who that is, but that looks like David Vasecki in the Bugira, Bugira ZM Racing Mercedes, the GT4. Again, That's we saw that car being pushed into the pit lane, so still those problems remain and that's going to have a massive effect on our championship battle going forward. That's real shame. They haven't really been able is. to get that car. He's obviously been able to leave pit lane, but it's instantly failed on him again. Maybe as he felt uh, trying to leave the grid, now it's being pushed back. The great thing about Creventic Racing is it doesn't mean it's all over for them. You can get assistance back to the pits. You can rebuild that car, but they will now be relying upon incidents from the other GT4 competitors to get themselves back through the field. There are points awarded for both the 12 and the 24 hour points of this race. TCR class, the TCE Championship Touring Car Endurance Series, being led at the moment by championship leader Holmgard Motorsport, Magnus Holmgard, at the wheel of the 102. They're all right, they're weird down the field, but the TCE battle will continue throughout this 24 hour race. And Holmgard Motorsport, they just basically have to finish to win the European Championship. So they are on. Um, probably a conservative, uh, quite a conservative strategy already. However, they are leading TCR and TCE, so all good for them so far with leading the class battle. I do like the current configuration of the circuit of Catalonia. That the, the, the finish of the lap, we move to that kind of Mickey Mouse chicane configuration for some years, didn't we? And now we've gone back both in uh, in all categories of racing and it's a much more progressive way to finish the lap and a much more back to the character that was created when this circuit became, came to prominence with two sweeping right-handers to finish the lap and you then plow down this i think this straight is a kilometer long ben so we do see optimized speeds going into turn one Running on board there with Rick Broikers, who starts the Red Camel Jordan machine, third in class in 992. And we were just getting a quick look at the rear end of the Mercedes-AMG GT2 car from NM Racing, the local team here, running a GT2 Mercedes. Uh, and it's a very interesting piece of kit because it's got a lot of grunt, but it's a lot slower through the corners, making it hard for these guys to try and get past it because as soon as it can open its doors and get the power down it's going to sprint away uh, from the 992 category car but when it gets to the corners it's quite a heavy machine it doesn't have the downforce and it's a bit lumbersome and cumbersome to get through the tighter parts of this track hrt max hoffer under pressure here from alfa Renau for fourth position yeah that's the Haas audi um, the 91 the herbert car here with a change of livery. It's now in red and white. I'm all four cars being red and white for obvious reasons, if anybody knows me. Uh, meanwhile, down in the pits, I think Diane might have something for us, Ben. Let's head down to the pits now. Diana.
Lots of work to do to diagnose what's going on with Bagheera, the GT3 Mercedes, a GT4 Mercedes, sorry. Uh, and uh, Diana will be across exactly what needs to be changed there. Got to be something in the drivetrain for sure. Uh, having got that car started and then instantly stopped twice, I'm suggesting that it's some, like, either a weird electrical thing, which is very hard to diagnose, or something a bit more mechanical and drivetrain related, which could be a little bit easier. Normally, you can tell if it's a drive shaft because it goes click, click, click when you're pushing it along the pits. Yeah, that, uh, I'm not sure. I can't hear from here. No, we can't hear I anything. I can't hear from here. Got so, no, no, I, I mean, it, it's not good, Ben, because we're already, what, eight minutes into this race? And being eight minutes down over 24 hours, all right, you know, it, it, you, you may get that car, you will get that car back into the race, but certainly out of class winning contention and another slow moving car. Would you believe this? That is the car that is in contention for the European trophy. The GT leader of the championship, joint leader with Atlas BX, the slow-moving RD signs Lamborghini, car 720, tying at the moment on 164 points, is now moving slowly. Is this championship going to be handed to the Atlas BX Motorsport BM, uh, Mercedes? Unbelievable drama in the championship. Not just the 24 hour is, but the championship already with just, what, 10 minutes of racing? And already the championship coming to the fore. Palace Blaskovic aboard the Super, uh, Super Trofeo uh, Hurricane Lamborghini said one of many teams that have got two cars uh, in their garages to be able to pill for parts. He had some drive to be able to get up the hill uh, to the top point of this circuit. He's pretty much at the highest point now. He does have to go back up again at turns uh, 10, 11 and 12 before then probably could free wheel. But now the car seems to be rolling a bit faster again. So very curious issue. And he's going all right. He's, he's moving. He's fine. I'm sure he's, he's got, got to come into the pits and check, but it's going a lot faster than it was at, uh, at turn seven. Diana is down on the pits, and we have Bagheera with bonnet and boot up. Yes, they've taken the car into the garage now. They think there's an issue with the fuel cell. They're not sure. They're just going through all the diagnostics at the moment to try and work out what the problem might be. And I may try and uh, speak to someone, but uh, if you give me two seconds while they're having a look, but they're definitely got the laptop plugged in and checking I just quickly asked one of the crew and he said I think it's the fuel cell so they are looking at all that information now 720 Lamborghini seemingly had what's, what's been like? actually we don't know yet most likely the fuel pump burned but we don't know that's incredibly frustrating at the start for you but that's racing so what do they take how is it Guy's going to be on it and fix it as quickly as possible. Fix it shortly and we will. We continue. Thank you. Remarkable. Well, it's one of those things, Ben. Um, you can, you know, your fuel pump's either working or it's not. It kind of, you know. But is it, it something that kind of would die uh, from overuse? Not when you turn the car on straight away. You mean, should we be lifing those components? No, but I would expect a fuel pump to overheat because it's pumping a lot uh, and then die, not sit on the grid for 20 minutes doing nothing it's yeah. nice and cool <laughs> uh, turn the car on and die no because that's what that's what they'll do that's how, okay that's why motorsports character building <laughs> because you'll put the car away the night before you'll come back the next day you've done nothing to it you'll go to start it up and the fuel pump won't work yeah you know it's that kind of component you know you could you could life that you could you know i i daily change the change the fuel pump for every single outing. oh no no but, you know, some, some teams do, some teams no, don't. No, no. If I'm paying the budget, no. Yeah, exactly. When it fails. Exa exactly. <laughs> when it fails. That's one um, of those un unlucky, unfortunate things to have happened. It's that, not that hot, Ben, no. for it to overheat. We, it's only, what, 25, 26 degrees now? We're going to get highs of 27, 28, I'm told. That's the forecast. It's certainly hot. But it's not 35, 40 degrees, which is when you see things like fuel pumps and fuel vaporization become an issue. And curiously, the nine, uh, the 720 RD signs Lamborghini got back going again, didn't go into the pits, did a, spent a couple of corners control up deleting, and by the time it got to turn 10, was back up to speed and drove straight past the pits and seems to be running, albeit losing a decent chunk of time. How much time did it lose uh, trolling around uh, on that last lap? It's dropped all the way down to 37th position. Um, and actually, but seems good, seems good again. So. 
Uh, we've got at the tail of the field, the very tail of the field, obviously the, uh, the TCR cars, uh, and it is involved in that. We ride on board with Rick Broikers. Now, I mentioned earlier on that he was staring down the back of the uh, NM Racing Mercedes, but I can't seem to clear him. And actually, Rick's lost a position here uh, to Lucas Sandal in the 930 HRT Performance Porsche. Maybe just to kind of say, well, you have a go at this Mercedes because it's quite hard to clear. We've also had uh, Stefano Monaco in the HRT Performance Porsche number 967 moving into second place in the 992 class ahead of Sabino de Castro. The Villy Motorsports by EB Motors dropping down the order to third just behind that. So the 992 battle, Ben, already shaping up to be a bit of a fist fight, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder when that must have happened a lap or two ago because Villy Motorsports were definitely leading the class mm. with challenge from, uh, from Red Ant. But Stefano Monaco in, in the 967 HRT Performance Porsche was not in that battle at that time uh, and uh, is now up into second position. So maybe a slow lap uh, last time through. And that last uh, camera shot we just had was absolutely evidence of what these guys are going to contend with. So we're sitting behind the GT2 car. Look how much, how soft that Mercedes is. I was explaining to you yesterday. Yeah. It is so soft uh, because it sits so high uh, to give it, give it a decent balance of performance and to try and get it to work and rather than just understeer everywhere. The 992 car is super well set up, would be so much faster through the corner if there wasn't a Mercedes in the way. But once you get to the straight, the Mercedes with so much more power just jets off. So the Porsche can sit alongside but then can't clear and is being compromised on lap time event overall because of the situation they find themselves in. Great battle forming up there, still going on. And a uh, little bit of rearward grip there as he uh, put the boot in on the Haas RT uh, R8, just beginning to be a little oh. bit uh, losing a bit of traction, maybe already overheating the tyres as the Herbert car comes out of turn five and goes alongside down it towards turn six. And I think that position has changed, which is just ahead of what we're now seeing. Uh, there is also a Ginetta in the way, the G56, GT4 car, uh, which needs to be cleared. So that's going to compromise these little battles for a moment. And yes, we're now, uh, now ahead of Haas RT. Yeah, Herbeth, just again, Alfred Reynauer. How many times have we said this about the Herbeth car, the 91 car? It goes about its racing very stealthily and just waiting, playing a waiting game there. Alfred Reynauer just picked his moment. He followed the Haas RT for lap after lap after lap. And then I think that was more down to Max Hofer losing a bit of traction coming out of turn four, losing traction equally through turn five. And that allowed the... Herbert Carter to pull alongside. Let's head down to the pits, Diana. Thanks very much, Joe. Yes, we st I have a bit of an update here as to, to what's going on. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Martin, Martin. Martin, thank you. We did speak yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've been looking at the situation here, but you've got a bit of an update as to what's happening now. Actually, we can expect the same trouble to happen to too many competitors here because the fuel supply and fuel we're using here is extremely dirty and it's clogging up uh, the fuel filter and then the burning the pump. Yeah, so more of this happening will, uh, will come uh, throughout the race, for sure. Just one of these unexpected things. It like always it. seems to be like that, doesn't it? So we cannot do much because we have a, uh, one a fuel supply. We cannot choose the fuel. But since yesterday, we know that fuel is, is extremely dirty. And uh, that's not really good because it's affecting the competition. The team are working on it. You're working as quickly as you can to get back out to rejoin. Yeah, in a couple of minutes we start again. Thank you. Work to do then for Bagheera. Bagheera because uh, of the Jungle Book, because the uh, black emblem of the leopard and the leopard in the Jungle Book is called Bagheera. It's always panther. Yeah, that. It's a black panther in It's not a leopard, because leopards not a leopard. aren't black. Leopard has spots. I just couldn't remember what it's the a panther. big cat was black, called. Big black, black cat. Yeah. Big black cat, there you go. Bagheera. Bagheera racing. 
which are most famous for um, truck racing and That's right. their Dakar exploits. Ali Kolik, uh, the female racer aboard that team, is uh, unique in that she's uh, taken multiple championships uh, in off-road truck racing. But they've been with us all year, and it's great to have them with us. And they're looking for a great success at the end of this uh, season, the end of this race, because the end of the 24 hours of Barcelona concludes our European part of the championship. And we, we might be even establishing champions at midnight uh, tonight because points will be awarded at that point. And therefore, gaps may be uh, established that are unclosable before the end of the race. Half points at midnight, double points at the 24 hours. So big points all available. The 910 Porsche, Laurent Cochard in the Sebelgio Racing with Duo just pulling back onto the track after a little bit of an excursion. I think that's down, be that's between turns three and turn four. So just coming out of that sweeping right-hander and then easy to do, just getting it a little bit on the dirt, perhaps having a bit of a pirouette onto the grass on driver's right. That car resuming, not causing any problems for anyone else, only itself. As the Hofer car continues to lap just ahead of Bashutin in the Jutta Racing Audi R8. The Hofer car with Alex Prince at the wheel. Great to see the Krolls and the Prince families back out with their Mercedes AMG D. And Alex showing great pace there in the Mercedes. Currently seventh overall, Bashutin in the Jutta car. Just trailing him round. And we're seeing a lot of this. It's uh, I use this term a lot at this stage of any endurance race. It's a high-speed game of chess by any account, isn't it? Um, some drivers forgetting that part of the script and uh, battling it out. But at the moment, the 909 of Rick Breukers thinking he's a GT3 car by the looks of that. Oh, the, the, the he's in amongst it all, isn't he? Well, the problem is this GT2 car that's sitting ahead and, and it's stopped the 992s from clearing it. Uh, and it's allowed the GT3 cars, the final two GT3 cars in the field, Utah Racing and Land Motorsport, to now catch up. So we've got uh, Jabolon, Jabolonskis and Ingo Vogler in their two GT3 cars, 11th and 12th in GT3, joining third uh, and fourth in GT in uh, 992, all stuck behind second in GT. X, which is that uh, GT2 car, and it is, uh, as we've just, just already described, difficult to clear. Aboard the NM Racing Mercedes is Jorg Viban for the moment. Car collection yeah. Audi Look, defending. It's getting so yeah, frustrating. It, it, it's a cork and a bottle, isn't it? And then we've got the 909, 992 entry of Red Camels, Rick Breukers, stopping that car collection Audi going. It is the car collection Audi, yeah, yeah. Rick, isn't it? Uh, stopping him progressing any further. But it is that GT2 Mercedes that the spec of the car, performance level wise, has got, it's got a lot of power, but not as much aero and handling. Hence, it's very quick on the straights, but not as quick through the corners. Now, the GT3 Audi here might have the opportunity uh, to get past side by side, though. For third position overall, Renauer, uh, sorry, second, Renauer and Fontana going side by side because Greg Gilver has dropped behind this lot. Gilver's now down uh, to fifth position in class. Uh, he was second, and so Fontana and Renauer now fighting over second spot. There's a BMW uh, ahead of them from the, one of the lower classes. The lappery begins then, uh, and there is Fontana, and Fontana with the second of the hour, the Eddie Earhart, right on his tail. So uh, I talked about Gilver's lack of experience in a Porsche, lack of experience in a GT3 car. He did such a good job on the early part of the uh, stint to stay in second position, but he's struggling now. You can see that through turn five. And Earhart's got a little bit of a sniff down the inside here to get himself up uh, into fifth position and does so. It's not going to be long before Eddie Earhart moves up the driver rankings from an AM plus to a silver because he is a rapid and plus very very useful tool to have in the toolbox and they're showing his prowess there and being able to just circumnavigate that Porsche of the IMSA LS group Gregory Gilver now dropping behind to sixth meanwhile Alex Prince in the number 11 
still fends off the Bashutin, <clears throat> pardon me, the number 71 Audi, just slotting under the rear wing of the Mercedes and keeping the pressure on. That's simply what you've got to do. Meanwhile, the battle for second rages on. The leading Ferrari, 13 laps completed, has already pulled out more than, well, it's gone up again. It was 12 seconds, it's now 13 seconds. So the Ferrari of Jochen Krumbach, out in the lead of this 24-hour race, continues to increase that gap. Behind him, though, Alex Fontana in the 23, car collection Porsche, Alfred Reinauer in the Herbert Motorsport car. They are battling it out. And then just behind them, that's that battle there, the number 11, Mercedes with the 71 of Bashut and in the Utah car. They're still going to circulate together and just wait for an opportunity to overtake. Does seem as though the NM Racing Mercedes has now been cleared uh, by at least Utah Racing 72 GT3 car. I'm not sure whether any of the 992s were able to follow him through, though, I'm afraid. Uh, so they're still struggling to clear the Mercedes. Uh, but uh, Yuta Racing, fifth in AM, in GT3 AM, I should say, but 11th overall, uh, has been able to clear. And that means he's going to give himself a little bit of space between himself and Ingo Vogler in the uh, Land Motorsport Audi that sits in 12th. We're looking at uh, the number 11 machine, Alexander Prince, in the Hover Racing Mercedes GT3 AM, second position in class. But unfortunately, the leader in his class is the leader of the race, 19 seconds up the road. Other drivers to share the number 11, come with a full driver uh, quarter here. Michael Kroll. Michael has campaigned this car for some time. Chantel Prince, Alex Prince's wife, formerly Chantel Kroll, remember, our former ladies' champion here in the 24-inch series. And then we've got Karsten Tilke sharing the car, and Manuel Rubov, who I'm not quite sure I'm familiar with, to be honest, Ben, Manuel Rubov will be in the car sometime over the course of this race. Uh, battle for second, they're still raging in the foreground. The Haas RT Audi coming through. So car collection, Porsche still second. Alfred Renauer in the Herbert car still third. Haas RT having a bit of a, a lonely drive in fourth there, not really being able to get on terms with the Herbert Motorsport car ahead. And then behind the, the Haas RT car, Elia Earhart in the another Audi R8. This one, the Shearer Sport car. And then Gregory Gouver in the IMSA LS Group Performance Porsche started on the pole position, dropping down to sixth. And then behind them is the hole for battle. That is the number 23. That's the second place Porsche of Alex Fontana that we just mentioned. And we've got development in the pits. Let's head down to Diana. Diana, more development with the 416. that car they think it was the filter as he told Martin told you earlier on but the car is out on the apron fired up and away back to rejoin the racetrack I mean a, a really superb job by the crew here they were working as quickly as possible and got that car back out so we'll just have to see how it gets on in the next well hopefully laps. that is all the bad luck over now for Bagheera Racing's Mercedes and we'll see David Vasecki get on with the race which he'd be very very eager to get on with having had that car stifled from the start, so it's already, just check, 12 laps down, of course, from the leader. The cars around it for the GT European Trophy, the Atlas BX car and the RD Signs racing Lamborghini, they are the two cars, and it's ground to a halt, oh. I'm afraid. That fueling issue, they assessed that to be Dirt in the fuel, causing a fuel starvation issue. He looks like he's fired it up, Ben, and got the car moving again, but he only got as far as the outside of turn two there, towards turn three in the Bugira Mercedes. We'll, we'll monitor that as he makes his way back around. Has he got it going again? He has, so he's moving. He's already through turn four. Staying on the outside, though, he's not up to racing pace there, is he? Well, also, he's got a lot of very fast cars around in the GT3 yeah. category, uh, leading 10 cars, trying to get past. So actually wise to try and stay as far away. Whilst you also uh, are not up to speed yourself, get out of the way of uh, all the fast GT3 cars, because you could easily find yourself being rear-ended and uh, 
And yeah, there we go. Alexander having to find a little slither of a gap to get through there at turn seven. He doesn't know where he is in the rhythm of the race. No. He's just joined in. He doesn't know where the cars are in the field. When you when you start the race and you get going, you, you expect a bit of a breather in a GT4 car before you've got the GT3 cars coming round. Well, David Vasecki there, just he's joined the track. He doesn't know where anyone is. And right now, he's on a voyage of discovery as to where he is in the playing order and in the... Uh, in the pecking order, I should say, as he begins to get up the speed in that Bagheera Mercedes. Hopefully, that car will not have any further problems and we can race for the GT European Trophy, which is what I was hoping for. Straightforward race to the flag tomorrow afternoon at midday. And that looks like, it looks like as it comes through turn 14, that sweeping right-hander, high-speed right-hander, and on to the one kilometre straight, long straight here at the Circuit of Catalonia. He's got that car up to speed now. That's the first, that's the first racing lap he's about to yeah. start now. Yeah, and everyone else up to lap 14. So uh, a good, well, basically half an hour behind uh, rivals. Lots and lots of traffic to contend with here. Again, it's the, uh, the Mercedes uh, GT2 car uh, still ahead of the GT3 Land Audi. We've got to change for second. The Herbeth car has finally made the move on Alex Fontana in the car collection Porsche. So a change of Porsches into that second place. Alfred Renauer in the 91, ahead now of the 23 of Fontana. And already a gap of 2.6 seconds, is it? No, no, sorry, just under a second. So just beginning to establish himself in that second place. Now then, the question is, Ben, the Herbeth car now having got into that second place, 13.7 seconds to the leading Rinaldi Racing Ferrari, the DWTM, the Vox Spiegel team, Monschau, Rinaldi Racing Ferrari, the 296, brand new GT3 from Maranello. 13.7 seconds was the gap. Let's see if Alfred Renauer can reduce that and begin to give us a race for the overall lead. We'll come back just over the line now to complete 17 laps. Uh, so count from uh, well, count from about five seconds ago uh, to see exactly the gap, 13.3. So it was a faster lap then from Renauer, taking half a second out of Krumbach. Uh, we are still expecting these GT3 cars to go at least another 30 minutes. Ingo Vogler shows the nose uh, to the NM uh, Racing Jorg Vivan. But look how the Mercedes just disappears when they get their foot down. It must be bye really, bye. really, really frustrating. You've got a lot more aero grip than the 34 car collection car. And there you close the gap, go, close go, go, the gap go, go, go. to the back of the GT2 Mercedes. Nope. And then burst of power, the Mercedes pulls away. You've got to really throw the dice, roll the dice and go down the inside. I mean, I'm sure the Mercedes drivers in that car are aware of... Oh, you know, nice performance levels. That Has was, he got through? Yeah, that was very nice. He, he held the inside line, and with the ability, with the Mercedes up to the outside and the track clear, he was able to hold on. Now down the inside, having to be really squeezed through there was Harley Horton in the 992 sixth position for the 929 car. That was very aggressive, and I think the Mercedes was happily going to be turning in and claiming the apex of 13, but the Porsche was alongside enough. What are we about to see? Oh, round goes the KTM crossbow. Harmless spin for the number 714. Leader in class. Now wait yep. for the Mercedes to come past here, and Mercedes will move into GTX lead. There it goes. He gets going. The engine has remained on. I'm just trying to find out. I'm just trying to establish where that is, Ben. Is it turn one? It is turn one, yeah. Okay. Good spot. Yeah, so again, tricky, tricky. Very fast entry into turn one it's not as slow as it looks you can carry no. a lot of speed into that right hander and the 714 the ktm has gotten underway and is back in the race just trying to get back into that rhythm dominic oibert at the wheel of the razoon car and back into the pits has come bagheera bagheera zm racing mercedes Still with fueling issues. We'll wait to see if we get anything further from them. But it, it's one of those niggly problems, isn't it? Fuel starvation, fueling problems, 
causing the engine to, I would imagine, keep cutting out. And David Vasecki just can't quite get this race underway for the Bagheera team. And bringing that car back into the pits, more time being lost. When, when anybody ever tells me that you can carry a lot more speed into turn one uh, than it looks, because it does this, I mean, it's a 90 degree corner, but because turn two is then going left and there's a lot of camber, it, you can throw a lot more speed at it. I always cast my mind back to Antonio Pizzonia in a road car Jaguar. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you have another open window, go onto YouTube and watch Antonio Pizzoni at Jaguar Barcelona. He carries quite a lot more speed into Turn 1 than a road car was able to do so. Legend has it that he basically braked at the same point as he had done earlier in the day in his Formula 1 car, but he was in a road car. <laughs> what, 75 metres? Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I mean, that iconic shot of Senna and Mansell going wheel to wheel down there into Turn 1. Oh, that is worth a watch, yes, yes. Um, and Good when mark. you get down there, it, it, it looks quite open from where we're sitting. It feels a lot more claustrophobic when you're at speed going into that corner in anything, whether it be a road car like Antonio Pizzonia or indeed Mansell and Senna, as they did in 1991, the first time the Spanish Grand Prix visited here, the Circuit of Catalonia. And uh, already a lot of history surrounding this track, this race, the 24 hours of Barcelona, been going since 1998. It started off as a touring car race. The 24-inch series took it over. And it's reverted back to its touring car heritage in 2017. And it was a TCE, part of the touring car endurance series only back then. And it was a huge grid of touring cars, if I remember, TCRs and, and the like won by the NM Racing team, who are indeed here again. And we've been talking about them a lot because that's the team behind the new innovative GT2, GT2 spec Mercedes that yeah, we've uh, been talking so much about. And are based in Montmelo, which is literally the industrial estate across the road from this circuit. So uh, they haven't had to travel particularly far uh, and have local drivers always wanting to participate in this iconic local race uh, and so nm racing a, a mainstay really of, of anything barcelona uh, they always have a little bit of an edge when they come racing here against the competition uh kill because uh nils montserrat knows this team so well nils himself a very strong carter not never really had the results in car racing that he did in karting uh but has formed this very successful team that was um he was big he was massive in world karting wasn't he in the 90s yeah yeah, up there with the uh, the big names of that time uh, on the world karting scene. And of course, becoming a big name in car racing needs a, a, bit, a bigger bank account than it does in karting, of course. But uh, great to have them here. And great for a bit of insight as to, uh, as to the difference in the GT2 class. And it is, when you see them with GT3 and GT4 cars, sharing the same track it really does bring home the difference in the performance levels and the spec and the class spec i'm just a little bit disappointed because gt2 should be quicker than gt3 logically it's sort of going back to the days when it was but i'm talking about the early 2000s i think uh we are 20 laps in with Jochen krumbach still leading as he did from i think about lap two didn't he, he took over we expected the Wachtenspiegel team munchau ferrari this brand new GT3 spec Ferrari 296, it does look the absolute part and you expect to see great cars coming out of Maranello. Well, this continues in that vein. He's got a gap of 12.3 seconds, so it has come down ever so slightly to Alfred Reynauer, who now holds that second place in their Porsche, the Herbert Motorsport Porsche. Alex Fontana, Alex dropping back four seconds off the rear wing of that Herbert car in third. So that's your first three. Let's head back down to the pits where Diana's got something for us. It's doing what it's doing. So, to real, the really obviously 
not happy that the car is in the garage at this early stage of the race, but they're still working hard to make sure they can do what they can to get it back out. Drivers um, are waiting, ready to jump back in, but I think it could be a bit of a longer time here. I can see the working frantically at the back of the car and still think it's the, the fuel pump yeah, issue. We've just seen a brand new fuel pump being removed out the back of the car there. Uh, so they've had an old one, put a new one in and have the same issue. It can't be coincidental that it's the same issue again with a different pump, surely. The, the, the problem is, if it is indeed contaminated fuel with dirt or whatever, it could be all sorts of things in there. Whereabouts in the system is, is the, the blockage, yeah. is, is the problem. And, you know, those fuel pipes go from that, that fuel tank all the way in the back of the car, all the way through to the front of the end, where, where the engine is on that Mercedes. And it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a tricky job flushing the whole system out and trying to get down to the, the, uh, the literal gritty bit that is causing you the issue. Don't forget to get in touch with us Hashtag 24H series, hashtag 24HBCN is what we're following. I'm Ben Consti, uh, we are at RSL Studio, uh, and uh, you can chat with us and enjoy this 24 hour race uh, throughout up until 11 o'clock this evening, and then uh, back on at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning local time uh, through to the culmination at midday as our leaders now have significant traffic different traffic to what they've dealt with before they've got past the tce cars they've got easily past the gt4 cars much harder to clear slower gt3 and 992 machines as our leaders are having to do right now we've just had a quick look at the 296 ferrari the gap is down to 9.4 seconds now as it was trying desperately to get past that and then racing uh, Mercedes GTX machine that leads the class now. Interestingly, though, by only 2.2 of a second, there is a battle on for GTX between the Mercedes and the KTM crossbow recovering after that spin down at turn one. I have just checked the start and the Bockenspiegel, Tim Manchow, Ferrari actually led across the line on lap one, so he is our only, our, our only leader at this point. He really did go at it hammer and tongs to start with and he was bagging in the fastest laps on at the very start of the stint his last fast lap came on lap five and established that ferrari at the front of this field and is managing to manage that gap it is coming down though ben it's down to nine and a half seconds 23 laps completed nine and a half seconds last time through we're just waiting for the herbert car to come through now the Herbert car just coming through underneath us and we'll be able to check. It's gone back out, so it was nine and a half, it's now 11 and a half. And that's traffic, isn't it? Yeah, it's traffic ebbing and flowing. But overall, just looking at the lap time that these cars are producing, a 145.3 for the Ferrari, 147.2 last time by. But that is coming down overall. We'll see, we'll keep an, an eye on that gap because that is for our overall lead. Ferrari versus Porsche. Nine nine two class, currently eleventh overall. It's the red ant car. Car that started on the front row of the grid by dint of the wet and interrupted qualifying session that we had here. Only one of our fifteen minute segments for AM drivers establishing the grid to start this race. So as we expected the car to do, it's settled in. Still leading nine nine two. Gap of about ten seconds for the red ant car number 903 second is the number 967 hrt's porsche of stefano monaco and then they've got a gap of about seven seconds or actually it's 12 seconds before the third place 992 class car comes through sabino de castro and the Vili motorsport by evie motors porsche and then just four seconds behind them rick breakers the driver that started the red camel car the red camel porsche here as ever stalwarts of the 24H series and Rick currently 15th overall and fourth in the 992 class. Always, always a great race with these Porsche Cup cars and we expect that to remain as tight as that 
all the way through to tomorrow lunchtime. On board with the RPM Crone Racing Machine, which uh, had an incident in practice and therefore didn't do qualifying, but because the GT qualifying was only one session, uh, it, well, I suppose it still ended up at the back of the uh, pack regardless. Patrick Hoisman is uh, driving that machine, a very, very experienced uh, campaigner over many years. And actually, if you look at that driver lineup with Tracy Crone and Nicholas Johnson, it's a strong lineup for uh, RPM Racing. They sit ninth at the moment in 992, but actually are second in the AM class because uh, Mark van der Aar is the leader in that class uh, and he's only a couple of positions. He's only about 10 seconds up the road. We've had a response from the leading Ferrari, another fast lap put in there, extending the gap to 12.7. So Alfred Renauer, we're getting towards, we're not that far away, Ben, from expecting these GT3 cars to require a bit of a top up of fuel, probably yeah. in about, what, 15 minutes or so? So we have still got a few, uh, a bit of time left before we, uh, we change the Hankook tires and maybe have a top up of fuel as we continue to watch the GT2 spec Ferrari 715 Ferrari Mercedes I'm looking at a Mercedes and I said Ferrari I've got the silver you know as well what? I think I'm in love with the 296 that it, it, the 296 don't tell the, your wife they've managed I think she already knows um, <laughs> I think they've retained that elegance that we saw in the 308. If you look at the body shape of that 296, they've, they've, they've clearly, they're clearly hanging on and understand the history and heritage that the Ferrari name makes. That KTM crossbow uh, in the hands uh, of Dominic Olbert a lot stronger than Jörg Veilbaum because uh, already the whole start finish straight between the two of them. Haas RT here uh, with a little bit of ha actually getting past Alex Fontana there for third position. So Audi ahead of Porsche. This is the time where the Porsches might start to fade a little bit if they've been overdriven in the early part of the stint. But that's good work from Max Hofer. Haas RT Audi up to third position. Ahead of them, Renauer, 11 and a half back from Jochen Krumbach in the Ferrari. So it's Ferrari, Porsche, Audi at the head of our field. Brilliant, isn't it? Ferrari, Porsche, Audi, Porsche, Audi, Porsche, Mercedes to give the rundown to seventh spot. So the gap's come down to 11.5, so that is remaining in that area of just over 10 seconds for the lead, but we are uh, interesting to see the Haas RT Audi R8, Max Hofer at the wheel of that car. A little bit of a driver change on that car than what we've seen this season, at number 21. We've got uh, Milka Panu, Matthew Detry, who was a driver we've seen in that car. Max Hofer, I think we've seen Max out in this car before, but two, two other drivers, Gavin Pickering, the British driver, onto the driver roster for the number 21. And we've got a car off, Ben, who's that? Facing the wrong direction. Uh, it is one of our 992 class cars. The spotter's guide never came through, did it? No. Uh, out of memory. Um, and so I think, and we're about to find out, because it's actually going to get closer to our camera. 910. Uh, so that is Long Kucha in the Seb Lajoux racing, uh, and they are sixth in AM 992. So right at the back of the field, and here's 13th. another ah, replay no, of it. Sorry. Last. No, no, sixth in the AM category. Sixth in the AM, sixth yeah. In the, in yeah. the cup, yeah, but 13th overall in 992. And he's just basically looped it all on his own. But he's running again. Kochar? Kochar. Laurent Kochar. Kochar. You live in France, how do you say that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Forget half the letters in it, all right. and you might be all right. Laurent with no T, even though there's a T. Kochar with no D, even though there's a D at the end. Basically, well, you would be Jean Bradley. 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 <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> yeah. Je yeah, there you go, perfect. You're speaking perfect French, Joe. Your wife's French. I know she is. Even her, sir, her? her surname doesn't has a letter on the end that doesn't actually get pronounced as well. Such a waste. <laughs> Such a waste. Such a waste of letters. 
Uh, that battle for third isn't over, is it? SRT being hassled by the car collection Porsche. Fontana in the Porsche. Max Hofer in the Audi R8. Just in the foreground there, just going out of uh, sight into turn seven. I like what you did there. Hassled. Hassled, yes. He didn't even realise it, did he? I did, actually. Oh, you did? Okay. I just, uh, I'm glad you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. KTM GTX version of uh, what is also a GT2 car. There is a homologated GT2 spec of that machine. There are uh, five of them uh, four hours down the road in Valencia this weekend. The GT2 series, European series, is running there. Uh, but we have the GTX version here, which actually has more power uh, than the GT2 version. When you drive a GT2 car to GT2 spec, because they're trying to balance it with all the other random machines that are part of that particular category of car, uh, there is a lot of limitations that you have to run to. Whereas when you get it to a GTX spec, as we do here, it's almost more open. Although, they, of course, 24X series are trying to balance uh, a Vortex uh, with a new GT2 Mercedes. They're trying to make them as competitive to each other. Uh, but there is a lot more liberty uh, in GT, uh, the 24H series, which is a great thing, which allows us to see uh, some weird and wonderful machines like the Vortex competing alongside the Mark II V8. We haven't seen that kind of Mustang-shaped thing very much. Uh, it's out there. Yeah, it's great. I love those cars. The silver liveried Mercedes of the Atlas BX Motorsport team, John Kim Kim at the wheel of that car, that car currently leading the championship and it's ahead of its other protagonists. Um, but not leading today, so far. Leading Third. the championship, but second in GT4 at the moment. Yeah. Hoffer racing by Bonk in their BMW GT4. M4 is uh, 14 seconds, 13 seconds ahead. And that, I think, is our leading TCR car, just uh, just ahead of us. One, no, that's the, the third TCR car, the 125. We've got three TCR machines. 125, 121, which is the Wolfpower Racing Audi, and 102, which is Holmgaard's Cupra. The Vortex are here. Vortex bringing two cars. Three cars? Three. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Two cars on the track. Very exciting to one see. One in the paddock. Waiting to see Nick do a walk around yes. of the brand new Vortex 2.0. What a, what a fab. Yes. So yesterday we had the launch of the brand new Vortex that will be used in the 2024 season. And with two cars out on track at the moment. Just going to give you where they are. 29th overall, currently 5th in GTX. And 31st overall, 7th in GTX. Philippe Bonnel in the 701 and Julien Buello in the 702. The Home Guard car is currently leading TCR and leading the TCE Championship. And as long as the Home Guard car finishes this race, it will win the championship. In fact, if it's in the lead or, or finishes the 12 hour segment of this race, it will gather enough points to secure it as the TCE, the Touring Car Endurance Series champion for 2023. I apologise, I pointed to that car thinking that it was shedding tyre, but actually it was just running over marbles down the start finishing straight. Uh, it's a car that actually is also built here in Barcelona. All of the VAG TCR machines are built in what used to be the Seat Cupra factory in Barcelona, which used to provi uh, produce all the uh, one mate Cupra championship cars around the world, uh, and now they build uh, the TCR VAG machines, which began their life uh, as a say at Cupra, uh, then they got reshelled uh, to be a Volkswagen as well, of course, as the, the competition. And, the, and then also uh, the Audi RS3 joined uh, that manufacturing area, and they're all built here in Barcelona. Which means all three of our TCR cars are built in Barcelona. There is. I've got some Spanish heritage inside of them so they would have a spanish passport if they could yeah. even though it's a vw yeah there we go yeah bagheera laying some 11s getting out of the uh, pit garage for the second attempt uh, to see whether they have fixed the issue with their fuel pump 
Where is the blockage in the system? Right, everybody. Have Fing they cleared it? Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed as we see that number 416 Mercedes leave the pit lane, go out on track. We've seen this before. This is the tester, though. I don't know what components they've changed. I think they said they were going to change the complete fuel pump, whether or not they're going to completely change the fuel tank as well. That's a bolt-in, bolt-out job. Not, not as hard as it sounds, especially on a race car. It's just basically a, a big box that they carry in the boot there, just under the rear wing, inside that rear hatch. And so far, so good. He's into turn three already, I mean, just left the pits. Need to be getting those tyres up to temperature as well. Is it a box or is it a bag? It's a bag inside a box, actually. There we go. Yeah. Because it is actually, it's not a, 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 it's not a solid component. It, it has an element of flexibility in it, so that if it has impact, it flexes rather than breaks. Inside the, the box. Inside yeah. the box. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't have a floppy bag in the boot. The floppy bag goes inside the, 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 uh, the aluminium box that protects it from mechanics sticking things in it. Like also drivers. that, yeah. Resting your cup of coffee on there. Great for resting your cup of coffee on, actually. <laughs> Fuel cell. That's a great battle that's been going on from pretty much the start. The number 11, Hofer car, Hofer Mercedes, circulating in the hands of Alex Prince in seventh, and then just behind them, Bash Schutten in the Utah Racing Audi. They've been circulating nose to tail for pretty much the whole of this race, making their way through traffic as they do, and just circulating together, the number 11 and the number 71. It's Mercedes and Audi, two of the German Mark's finest examples, and they're currently seventh and eighth, those two. Not making any kind of challenge by shooting, quite happy to sit there in the wheel tracks of the Hofer racing car. And another car from Audi, currently fifth overall, Elia Earhart continues. And Elia Earhart now coming up behind, uh, putting a lap down actually on that car collection R8. I thought that was for a move. So we have got a car collection ahead of it, but it's a Porsche. Not used to seeing the car collection Porsche. But uh, Earhart, he's got gap of, well, he was right on the tail, actually, of Alex Fontana. But having just got through traffic, he's dropped back slightly, so a bit of a be there. Willie Motors losing a, another position to the second of the HRT performance Porsches. That's now dropping to fourth position in 992. Lucas Sandel's been working on that for a while. Sabine De Castro, at the early stages of this race, leading 992 with a great start, uh, but has now faded down to fourth position in that class. They don't need to pit as frequently as our GT3 cars, as we've got... Is that the same? Yeah. It is the same That's Porsche. That's the 910. The 910 Porsche has another pirouette. Lauren Couchard finding, it, uh, finding this stint a bit tricky. It's a couple of spins that we know of. And that's out of turn three again. It wasn't turn three no, that caught him out before. I'm saying that's 12. Are you? Yes, I think you're right. Yeah, it's the arena section, isn't it? So turn 12 this time for Kulshaw. It's, it's a very odd view of turn 12. I don't think we usually have a camera position in that spot. Well, certainly in other forms of racing, we don't. So it makes that it makes it look a little bit. I think it's usually a bit further around, but. Uh, Gives us a good view, a different view. I Spot like it when you get different views I of the do. racetrack. I do, I absolutely do, yeah. Mighty confusing for yeah. a commentator, but... Yeah, once we get into it, though, um, we, we've got that number one, 910 resuming. We've seen him do that a couple of times. He's now back in the race. He's still down there in 35th overall and has dropped to the tail of the 992 class, down in 13th. So a bit of a struggle for Lauren Cochart in the Seb Lejeune racing by Duo Porsche. Now we have the battle that has been running pretty much from the start. Alex Prince and the Hall for Mercedes, the Audi of Utah Racing, Bashutin, just dropping off from underneath the rear wing, giving himself a bit of air, I would think, is Bashutin. Just dropping off a few car lengths. So that 
not really looking like a change is about to happen for that seventh place. Alex Prince just making his way through the 992 class cars there ahead of him. A few questions on our uh, YouTube stream about the Vip Vortex 2.0. Is the 2.0 smaller than the 1.0? No, it's a it's a completely different car. It's a, a carbon fibre version of a, the Vortex uh, that we see on circuit right now, being a space frame, so big steel frame with uh, fibreglass wrapped around it. It is a fully carbon car built by McGill, uh, using the same engine at the moment, big chunky V8, uh, but... Uh, if you hang around with us, then we will explain a lot more and hopefully give a chance to have a look at it uh, because it is a very, it's not a particularly visually very different car to what we uh, are used to seeing, but actually the build of it is totally different. There yeah. is the Mark car. There's another unique machine. I love the look of that. Yeah, styled a bit like a Ford Mustang. Got a Ford engine in it, 5.2 litre. 4 cam V8, 615 brake horsepower at 7,000 revs. And it's Mark Cars Australia that produce these cars. They look as well as they sound. And right now, where is he in the uh, where is he in the order? I thought I did spot third. Him there. Yeah, third in GTX, currently down the order. Third in GTX and 25th overall. And the reason he's third is because we've got our first visitor to the pits and the pesky. NM Racing Mercedes GT2 car is the first one into our fuel boxes, interestingly, followed by the KTM Crossbow. So GTX needing fuel earlier than our GT3 cars in this first stint. Uh, we are usefully positioned directly above the fuel bays, uh, so we can see exactly the kind of availability and what's going on down there. Yellow flags at turn four, which is uh, at the end of the first sector somebody facing the wrong direction potentially who is that somebody however we will have to wait a few moments to find out oh no it's Lauren Koshar and this time he's in the gravel trap uh, this could be the first code 60 of the 24 hours of Barcelona here as we click into the second hour of the race that is not going to be driven out I'm afraid and the door is actually open by Lauren Koshar trying to get some air into the cockpit uh, we haven't gone purple yet. The marshal's got it in his hand. We have now. I think that's a great time to hand over to the second of our teams. Uh, Joe Bradley, thank you very much for joining myself, Ben Cox and Joris. It's Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer who will guide you through the next two hours. Well, thank you very much to Ben Consinjuris and Joe Bradley. The seats are still warm as we climb aboard. 26 degrees outside. Tomorrow is going to be hotter still, but I think 29 is the peak of, peak of what we'll see. But uh, Belong and Kubar, who've been going very well in the Porsche Cup class, obviously a little bit of a setback down at turn 10. That's the left-hander at the end of the infield straight. And that little slide wide, very, very frustrating indeed for all concerned. Code 60, just at the point those first cars were coming into the pit stop, Johnny. So, you know, it's that classic case of scramble and all your plans suddenly get uh, thrown a little out of kilter. Yeah, and it's also about when you manage to get into the pits. Some cars possibly manage to pit just before the caution. Others will not have done and therefore have to adjust their stops accordingly. What a queue. I mean, those that don't want to get into fuel, and why would you at this stage, actually can't get by the, uh, the end of the queue that's stretching out towards the pit lane itself. So then there's a fight as the Vili Motorsport car just about squeezes ahead. But we've only got... We've got five one, pumps. One, two, three, four... Is it five? Yeah, the five pumps, unless one's been removed overnight. Oh, yes. And, uh, it just uh, doesn't have an awning, the first one you get to. Four that's canopies, right. which is the thing that's confusing me. Um, but, yeah, so many cars, therefore, just waiting their turn, and mechanics, engineers will be on the scene. There's also the Ginetta that's parked up, I noticed, next to the first of those pumps... Good point for clarification doing? from Ben Constantinos. Five pumps, but that counts for ten refilling points. Yeah, that's what was confusing me as well, because the Genetta G56 uh, was parked up against uh, pump one, 
and clearly the mechanics were working on that car. That's not the penalty box, which is uh, further up in pit lane proper. So there is the scope to fuel as many as 10 cars all at once, but that's a question of whether you've actually managed to get beyond the queue. And clearly plenty thought it's just not worth the time we're going to waste here. So let's go down, maybe do the pit stop in two parts, because if the code 60, generally speaking, an early code 60 like this will be kept out for two laps. The recovery of the 121 car is ongoing, but I think even if that gets going again, the code 60 will stay out for at least two of the laps at code 60 speeds to allow cars to come in, uh, maybe not at the first opportunity, but at the second time. So you, you may well do tyres and a driver change on the first pit stop, then come back in and do the fuel when things are quieter. Bad news for Laurent Kobach, Koshar, as they're trying, uh, Koshar, they're trying to remove the 910 uh, Porsche from the gravel trap down at turn 10. Unfortunately for him and for the rescue crew, the, the pickup truck is rather bedding itself down in the gravel. So uh, they've got to clear the pickup truck first. That won't take long at all. And then the number 910. So he's got the equivalent of going to the petrol pumps and finding someone not sure if they've got, they want to get some chocolate or some ice cream while they're at the till just in front of him. One of the big delays then, as mentioned, was the 955 Porsche as uh, it was in two minds. Do I turn right to go into the fueling quadrant or, in fact, just give up on this uh, pit stop for the time being and head straight on? 955 did go down to the team instead. And Diana Binks now with Sabine De Castro. I am with Sabine. He's just jumped out of the car. Uh, Sabine, we saw that you sort of hesitated to possibly take on fuel but decided not to come straight into the pit. Uh, yes, now a lot of confusion now in the pit. Uh, the refueling area is full. We want to uh, enter, but uh, there is full and lost uh, maybe one minute uh, to wait the other uh, car entering the refuel area. We start very well, uh, push a lot, push a lot, but after uh, 10 laps, uh, the same the other driver, very difficult uh, track like in Mugello in the afternoon. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the grip uh, is less, 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 uh, but now 24 hours is a lot longer. Uh, it's only one hour. It looks like it's quite tough behind the wheel, certainly within the car, and you know, the heat is building, but the time's on track, uh, you know, it's settling in now, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the track is not difficult to drive in because uh, uh, all drivers respect uh, all. Uh, now uh, it's only first, first hour. First hour, uh, we wait, wait, wait. The night is very, very long, uh, but not bad. Are you satisfied with your performance during that hour? Yes. Now I think what uh, is possible to change uh, faster, to have uh, less uh, uh, understeering, uh, but um, work. I'll let you get a rest. Thank you. He's a three-time GT Italia champion, Sabino, so knows certainly GT3 and, in some cases, GTS machinery when he used to race for EB Motors and I'm sure has done a number of laps around here. I mean, joined uh, Villy Motorsports organisation three years ago and there's that strong connection with EB Motors from the Romanian squad as well but it's just been pointed out to me that they were not the only ones to be heavily delayed in the choice between fuel or not fuel uh, Code 60 is still out there were two cars off the road certainly the 121 TCR car has been recovered I reckon the 930 car is moving again now. Again, a li little bit of front right damage. Uh, thank you for, for Koshar there. That possibly came when he was being pulled out of that deep gravel, dra gravel trap at turn 10. So circulating, but uh, very frustrated. Probably shed about three laps there uh, during that moment. Yeah. So he could go back to green straight away. But as I say, I reckon the choice has been made by the race direction crew to keep this code 60 hours. Under a minute to go till the end of the procedure. And have you had chance to come in on two separate occasions? It's not going to be far off that now, uh, ideally to, to do your pit stop in one slug, but there is the option to have done it in two parts. Yeah, and the, and the crews have sort of bided their times and six cars are now, seven cars are now at refueling, six, they're sorting and changing. Basically, the crews that waited decided not to risk getting caught in a queue at the pumps have uh, been able to profit, one would suggest. But uh, as you say, Code 60 coming to an end very soon indeed.
Vortex rejoining. There's a good example of the blend line. So you have to stay well over to the right hand side and not cross the white line before it runs out. Green flag is out again though now. And uh, after a relatively short code 60, we are racing again. Let's hope that uh, from a distance record perspective, those code 60s are kept at a minimum. The difficulty with this place is there's some runoff, but there's also a lot of wide and deep gravel traps. So if you do make a mistake, you're unlikely to get out of the stones and need outside assistance. And they'll always do that on the whole under a code 60. So we will lose crucial mileage. Here's a glimpse of uh, Harley Horton in the HRT Performance Porsche, 11th position overall, but leading the class of 992s. 929 ahead of Hoop van Eindhoven, who slots in behind the Red Ant Racing car after its first pit stop, and NKPP with another HRT Performance prepared car running in third in the 992s. Yeah, and for Harley Horton, has yet to visit the pits. That's why he's uh, vaulted to the front of the class in 929. But uh, now just a handful of cars in the refueling. CP Racing's Mercedes coming through to slot into position. But I think the teams have all done that uh, rather well indeed. Harley Horton uh, visiting... Well, he, you should say high, wide and handsome. Brian Jones commentating at Brand Satch. That was turn nine, which is quite high. Not quite so handsome racing line there for Harley Horton. Out way beyond the white line at the top of the crest there. But such a difficult corner, Johnny. When you go up the hill, you cannot see. It's a bit like a couple of corners uh, up at uh, two-thirds of the way around the lap. At Donington, there is blind turning. You have to have faith, but at least there's plenty of runoff there. And then, of course, runs all the way down the slope to turn 10. Very, very tricky corner. But I guess... A lot of the drivers here for the first time in this championship. Most of the running yesterday was in very, very wet conditions. So they're learning as they go, and Harley most certainly be one among those ranks. Yeah, that's really tough when all the early running has uh, been hampered by the rainfall. All of a sudden, you know, in a GT3 car, there is a possibility of a 143, 144 second lap. But where do you find the time? Where do you want to risk it? It's a question of just chiseling away at uh, those lap times as much as possible if you're an am and you're still learning the behavior of the car in these better conditions vortex working its way through the lingering right hander at turn three with some traffic in sight often that's useful as well to have a car that you can monitor your progress with although there are now laps between these cars 701 with Lionel Amrush at the wheel with the sister car behind it in fact on the timing screen they both run in GTX now, the vast majority of the runners have made a pit stop. The car in second place is not Antonio Sonera, who Nick made laugh so much down on the grid. E2P, big wink from Nick, Nick there in the back of the commentary box. Uh, good humour, it must be said, down on the grid, but he uh, is in second place over us. Overall, owes us a pit stop. The next highest driver who hasn't made a pit stop is Harley Horton, who we've been looking at, who is leading the Porsche Cup class, but uh, they will have to come in very soon. And you know what? They can take their pick of fueling pumps. The last of the car's refueling has just moved away. So for maybe for Harley Horton and for Antonio Saniero, that was a very good tactic indeed. Well, let's find out. Jochen Krumbach due across the line in the next two seconds. And uh, again, it's a, it's a decent lap of 145.9, just working his way back up to full race speed. The incident involving car 76 and that 121 that was in the gravel trap to partially cause the code 60 is now under investigation. Ivar's Valas is Wolf Power Racing Audi, in fact, now in pit road for a, well, the cle cleaning up of that car, I suppose. I was going to say a scheduled pit stop, but it'll certainly need a new set of tyres and they'll be checking it over as well to make sure that no gravel has worked its way into all those awkward positions. Could I possibly offer you some good news after almost almost missing the first hour of the race, the Bagheera ZM Racing Mercedes in the GT4 class going very well, and, and with each lap it's going faster and faster in the hands of David Vasecki, but what a frustration for them, having to start uh, from the pit exit, and then it wouldn't start whatsoever. An hour or the best part of fixing that, so the crew will have earned their lunch, and David Vasecki now is completely out of sync with everybody else. All they've got to do now is just plug away. Let's grab another word uh, with Diana Binks and, more crucially, from the Red Camels crew, you've found Rick Broikestein. I certainly have. Rick has just jumped out of the car after that first hour out there on track. First of all, Rick, how, how was that session? Uh, it was really difficult. Uh, we we're really struggling with the setup. We don't have any grip in the front, so we have to carry the brake almost to the exit of the corner, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just really difficult. We, we lose around one second just in the last two corners, I think, and uh, 
it's really frustrating to drive, to be honest. Conditions are just evolving here. Obviously, we're very early on into the race, but how much are you understanding your tyre wear? I think the rear tyres are really good and uh, we don't have any overs here. It's just that because of the rain yesterday and we missed some hours during the red flag, we thought we had a quite an okay setup, but apparently it's not the case at all. You said you're not really satisfied yet with the handling of the car. What do you need to do to change that? I think we have to change the setup, but the race already started, so uh, we just have to deal with it. Will the car come to you at some point, do you think? I think it will only get worse because in the night the temperatures will drop. So I, I think the understeer will be even worse in the night. That's where your experience comes in, isn't it? Yes, but uh, there is only so much you can do. And um, yeah, we tried to carry the brake into the corner to compensate for the understeer. But it is still is too much to drive. It's, it's really undrivable. Thanks, Rick. Oh dear, and I don't think they're going to be isolated in that respect, you know, because of all of the condition that we've had prior to the race that is then not replicated in the race, they're just struggling in with rotating the car through the corners. If it's wanting to just drive off into the gravel at every conceivable moment, uh, Rick Broikers is, is, uh, is normally a happy chappy. I'm remembering only a handful of years ago when he was winning absolutely everything oh. at the start of 2019, I think it was. He is mightily frustrated there. And I was going to say he's putting a brave face on it, but frankly, the brave face was probably thrown away into the bin as well. You know, it's not often you, you get a driver actually saying, no, it's only going to get worse. Most of them go, we'll crack away. But last night we were talking to Red Camels, Jordan, and they knew this, that they didn't know what setup to go with. But why would anybody else, with all that wet running beforehand and uh, not enough track time for a lot of the drivers? But, uh, well, we, what we know, looking at the weather forecast, things are looking good from here right through till midday tomorrow. In fact, all of tomorrow. So all the rain we've had uh, Friday here in Barcelona is behind us. One other little bit of information. That, uh, we've got Herbert Motorsport in second place, uh, third place, effectively second, because got the E2P racing Porsche hasn't pitted yet. They've got a slight problem because they've got that split programme this weekend with uh, two of their drivers uh, down competing in uh, Valencia in the GC World Challenge Sprint Series. Ralph Bone and Robert Ronald will be turning up and the start of that race has been delayed, which won't help because um, unfortunately a Lamborghini Super Tre Trofeo race one of the drivers reprofiled some of the barriers there. So uh, just when you're on the fine edge of really, really tricky logistics for two of your drivers coming back here, they'll be saying, well, thank goodness we've got a fifth driver on board, bringing Patrick Kolb so he can do a bit of the heavy lifting until Ralph Bone turns up. And he's got to turn up because uh, this will be his 50th race in the 24H series. So uh, we're waiting for him and for Robert Renauer. But that means the heavy carrying will Daniel Allerman, who's just taken over from Alfred Renauer. And then Patrick Cole will take it through to the evening, but it's just the arrival of the other two is going to be later. It's Fabian Dance getting into the Red Camels car, by the way, and how much warning did Rick Broikers give Fabian about how badly the car was handling? Possibly the, the less the better uh, for him to then find it out, but almost visually, I can tell that car is struggling to turn through the corners, and one or two have already got by the 917. Actually, is Fabian catching now the 917? They're circulating at very close quarters indeed. Porsche 917 being driven by Laurent Miesbach of uh, the Orchid racing team. And meanwhile, the 24 Haas RT of Miko Panu. Miko Panu for one of three Audis that are together on the screen right now. So the Utah Racing 71, Haas in fifth place in card 21, and then Share a Sports PHX offering of Christy Yearns, car number one running in sixth, but they're all trying to catch a Ferrari, which is 40-odd seconds up the road in the hands of Joachim Krumbach with Antonio Sonero for E2P Racing, number 90, looking to try and close in. Someone of note who is definitely going to be worth keeping our eye on, the young hot shoe, not so young actually these days, Julian Andlauer in the 76 car uh, for IMSA LS Group Performance. So back with IMSA Performance and uh, has just set the fastest lap of the race there, a 143.886. Perhaps not a surprise as Andlauer, I reckon, is going to start to work his way to really the sharp end from eighth position. Yeah, that driver lineup for IMSA LS Performance, very, very strong indeed. So let's see how that one shakes out. Julian Andlauer, where is he in the moment? About eighth place overall, but that one should be on the advance. Already the lap times are looking very good with that fastest lap at the moment. His next target, not too far up the track, 
and it's Alex Fontana, car collection, motorsport, Porsche, but at the moment it's Ferrari, Porsche, Porsche, three Audi. So a real mix of cars at the front of the field. But uh, for a lot of the drivers, as we, as we just heard from Rick Broikers, they'll be going, we've clearly guessed at that setup a little bit, haven't we? And it's not quite working. And it's very difficult here at the circuit. It has a mixture of everything. That's why it was always such a popular uh, circuit for the Formula One teams to come and test at, because you've got fast corners, mid feet, and slow speed corners. But if it's not right, at certain points, if, it, if you let that mind worm get into, into, your, into your brain that all is wrong, I think you've got to just understand at certain points, three corners a lap, it might be good. The rest, maybe not so much. Yeah, and, uh, well, guesswork, you're sort of half joking there, but there will be a strong element of that because you're having to see where the car was quick in the wet and then somehow adapt that in the dry. Side-by-side -side cars there, although in different positions within the race, the 955 heading to the inside in the hands of Papi Cosimo, and that car is in 25th position, although 10th in the 992 class. Bouguera having had that big delay at the start, now firmly in the race and rounding the first corner. David Vesecchi, fourth placed in GT4. And there's the 76 Porsche of Julian Anlauer, uh, eighth at the moment, but don't be surprised for him to have made a number of spots up at the end of what could be an hour-long stint. It might be even longer than that, depending on how long they want to keep the gold driver on board. Obviously, there are limitations, though, with Pro-Am lineups as to how long the 24-year-old can drive in one go. It's amazing. You have a, a, a code 60 and uh, people decide when to come in, when to get fuel, and then suddenly, just after that, you get a gaggle of eight cars going down the start-finish straight, almost as tight as they would have been on the opening lap of this race. And in among those are those three Audis running fourth, fifth and sixth. Jonas Karklis, due to racing, tucked in behind. Second driver in the Haas RT Audi, that's a finish race, racer, Mika Panu. And in, just behind him, Shira Sport, PHX. Expect that number one Audi, Krista Johns, at the wheel to keep advancing. It's a very strong lineup in that one. Started by Elliot Erhart, did a great job. He's got Pierre Kaffer we found in the pits. If you've got a Pierre Kaffer in your pit garage, you've got to feel, yeah, there's a bit of a spring in my stride. Yeah, he just has that influence on a team, doesn't he? And uh, will have helped no end during the trying sessions uh, yesterday. And he will, no doubt, be able to put, uh, together with the other Brains Trust within that team, try and put their heads together and think, right, how are we going to make this car quick in a session, in a... Uh, track that we haven't yet experienced they will have lots of data from previous years though as well and that's maybe the slightly confusing thing about other teams that have struggled uh, because surely they can draw on set up um, annuals if you like from uh, previous visits to this circuit through the left hander oh a slight squirm there from the Kirchhoff sponsored car collection Audi and more so just a slight drift from the front, but well, that again would indicate to me maybe a, a touch of understeer from the 34 car, and it is definitely with company heading down that short hill between 13 and 14. I just want to take my hat off, my metaphorical hat, to uh, whoever decided about 18 months ago that uh, chicane should be removed between the penultimate and final corners. So, so much more uh, to talk about. Let's go down to the pits because uh, Diana Binks has her next victim. The 121 car is in the garage. Ivor Vallas is chatting to me now. Ivor, what's happened to the car to bring it into the garage? I, I saw, I didn't notice it until I was walking up the pit lane and saw everyone working frantically on the car. Yeah, the problem was that uh, I lost the grip in the turn, uh, I don't know, five or seven, I, I don't remember, the, from the numbers. And um, yeah, there was just no grip anymore because my tires are gone. I killed them actually very fast because I was maybe a little bit aggressive on the front tires and uh, didn't take the right line. So, yeah, and went in the gravel. And if you go with a TCR car in the gravel, so you have to change the drive shaft definitely. How, how tricky is it to manage the tires? It's very tricky in this, in this kind of temperatures. It's very tricky. It's very, 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 you have to really be patient on the throttle you have to be patient on the on the on the on the car so and as uh, when when you were driving like i i was driving all this season the sprint races so i used to drive a little bit more aggressive and yeah just uh, yeah my mistake sorry for that we lost i think a lot of time but it's still 24 22 hours to go so we will fight try to fight back a lot of cars out there on track how, how are you managing the traffic 
Yeah, actually it is quite difficult because you all the time have, with a slower car you all the time have to watch the mirrors because uh, the fastest cars try to pass you even in those places where sometimes it's impossible to pass. So you have to be re really careful there. Okay, but it looks like they're nearly done and they're going to get the car back. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Ivar's Valles there. I'm not sure what the record time of changing a drive shaft is on a TCR, but I would imagine it's going to be a little while longer, although the suggestion is that uh, the crews are maybe clearing the garage so that car can head back out into the race. But that, along with one of the Porsche Cup cars, the cause of our first Code 60. And keeping my fingers crossed as I say that, uh, that is the only difficulty we've had in the early stages and the teams would dearly just like some sustained running now so that they can get into a rhythm and work out also things like fuel consumption levels so that they know when they're most likely to need to call into the pits next time around. It's that classic case, you know, the drivers did have time on track yesterday, but the track, you know, a canoe would have been a little more handy uh, at certain times. It was so super wet. And yes, you have experience, but things do change from year to year. And if they missed last year's race, it's just coming here and racing without that final chicane. We were talking about it off air. You save, you save a bit of brake life by not having the chicane and braking heavily into it, but therefore without it, you're carrying more speed down the start finish straight. And what happens at the end of that? Some drivers apparently break into turn one. I've never met one yet who's owned up to such a heinous crime. But yes, so uh, where you gain with one hand, you lose with the other. But I thought very interesting uh, from Eva Valas there to talk about just driving too hard too soon. Yeah, uh, it's more of a lift turn one, surely. Yes, I'm, joking. I'm, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> Uh, but you are going to be reaching that corner at a higher speed. 991, or, or the 91 Porsche, I should say, with its red and white livery. Tidy little move there down the inside of the 9T car. So uh, that is Herbert overtaking E2P racing. And to be honest, Antonio Sonera not really making a big deal of that, perhaps knowing that the next time around he would be into fuel anyway. So pointless holding back a Herbert Motorsport car that is in a good phase of the race. You're only going to delay yourself if you continue to defend overly. And he was one of the last cars, certainly the last cars in the GT3 class to come and make that first uh, visit to the refueling. Still a couple of cars in the Porsche Cup class have stayed out. Another car from GT3 I've just spotted. Oh, no, that's come in. Uh, yeah, sudden change around on the order just outside the top 10. But certainly the tactic, their decision was, let's not get tripped up by anyone else. One person I quite like to talk about, he's doing quite well in this race. His name is Jochen Krumbach, WTM by Rinaldi Racing. Brilliant start from him up from the second row, and he's just driven away. Just waiting to see what the gap is between. He's got 45 laps under his belt in that uh, new for 2023, the 296 GT. Three Ferrari, which looks fabulous. The team has, of course, winning pedigree here just 12 months ago, but that was with the 488. But uh, lap after lap, Jochen Krumbach is looking super comfortable in the lead of this race. And while his uh, rivals are lapping generally in the 1 minute 47, as he can do 1 minute 45, 1 minute 45. So the gap goes up and up and up. Very impressive. Yeah, it has been from a bronze-rated driver, although uh, really experienced with WTM through the years and with their link-up with Rinaldi Racing. Uh, knows the Nürburgring Nordschleife like the back of his hand, but uh, yes, having competed with the team, although not been part of that winning lineup last year in the 488, uh, he has driven here a, a number of times and just knows GT3 cars. I think it's also important to know that you're not going to be one of the quickest compared to someone like Julian Anlauer, and it's pointless trying because you may well just ping it off into the scenery. Find your ideal lap time that you're comfortable with and just keep ticking off that delta time. And strangely enough, the stint will start to come to you. And to, to have over 60 seconds now as a race lead is mightily impressive after barely an hour and a half. Yeah, you can actually see on the opening laps of the race, we weren't in the commentary booth, but I was watching trackside. You could see some who absolutely decided to ignore the sort of red rag and go chasing after everyone else. They were straight into their program. And the two Vortexes were doing precisely that. Lille Lamruche uh, started the 701, the sister car, uh, was running just behind, tucked in behind, and they were neat and tidy. We've now had a little bit of driver change action for them in the GTX class, but Lionel Lambus, with all those years of experience of the Vortex, what I call the old Vortex now, which is, of course, the current one. We've got the new one in the paddock looking very, very smart indeed, but they were running to a programme. Julien Boyot started the second car, but now a second Amrouche, Solène Amrouche, is taking, has taken over the 702. 
Good dicing between the 930 and the 909 Porsche Cup cars. So 930 is the entry from HRT Performance. Fabian Dance kind of going against what Rick Breukers was suggesting and the Red Camel Jordans.nl car, because clearly there is a bit of speed there. And Lucas Sundahl, last time around, lapping a touch slower than the Swiss driver who is doing the chasing. So he's trying to find a way through. Fabian Dance maybe fainting to the inside line. This is for 19th and 20th overall, but more importantly for these drivers, 5th and 6th within their category. Also having to put a lap on one of the GT4 Mercedes as well. And staying in the 992 category, uh, NKPP for Mark van den Aar has just come into pit lane, and that's on the 43rd lap, but for van den Aar, how far through his stint? It's about right, I reckon, uh, to be now making a stop for the 928 car. Obviously, this will lose it some ground, but I always like a sports car race where different teams get onto different pit stopping strategies nice and early, and we have to try and work out which is the best way of doing it, and who's likely to take the win by the end of it all. Yeah, and I, th I think actually having that code 60, just as those first round of pit stops was coming up, maybe the teams would have been had a more similar tactic, but most of them just didn't want to risk being at the back of the queue for the pumps when the first of the cars decided, right, we're in, because uh, five fuel pumps, but that's 10 fueling nozzles, and uh, there was quite a queue, and certainly you could lose, you could shed 20, 30 seconds there, and it takes a long time to get that back. So that rather split the field. Just double checking it, the highest run that hasn't pitted, still Harley Hortons uh, up into, uh, just judging across, leading the Porsche Cup class in eighth overall, but he will have to come in very, very soon indeed. There was a driver change um, for the E2P Racing Porsche with Javier Morcillo taking over that car. So Morcillo now on an outlap in the 90 Porsche after a full season in the 24H series. Uh, I say full season, he actually did one race, big pardon, last year, and uh, funnily enough, it was here at Barcelona, so he's becoming certainly a specialist for E2P racing to call upon, a regular in the Dutch Supercar Challenge prior to that in all manner of machines, including LMP3 machinery, which more recently has been allowed to race in the Supercar Challenge. So Spaniard perhaps more at home in the Netherlands, and that's probably where conversations were first had about the Creventic race here or Creventic organised race, of course, with a much longer history than that. Very wide in the background for one of the Porsche Cup cars, kicking through the gravel there, and that may well have given a place to the Porsche alongside. I'm struggling to identify specifically which one that was, Bruce, but you'll get your uh, spotter's guide out. We'll, well try I, and delve deep, deeply. Well, I could, because he, he very was literally underneath our feet by the time he managed to rejoin the circuit. And I was just hoping, wondering if it was the E2P uh, Porsche, but I, I don't well believe it was. It on an outlap, perhaps. Well, let's go down to the pits, because uh, while we're having a dig around, uh, Mark van der Aar has been caught by Diana Binks. Mark has just jumped out of the car. Mark, we're, a, we're an hour and a half into this race. How satisfied are you with how things are going so far? Uh, to be honest, not really happy, because uh, we lost the power steering after six, seven laps. So I tried to communicate with the team, and it didn't work. Um, so then you lose time in this communication, and afterwards it was quite heavy because uh, you really need the power steering but uh, yeah in the end i finished my uh, session so in that way we're still in the race and i hope they can fix it i mean it must be it's incredibly hot behind the wheel so that must make your job even more difficult yeah definitely yeah it's uh, we had a code 60 i was able to drink a lot so i finished the whole bottle that helped me in the concentration but uh, I, it's it's durable but uh, it's hot that's true when you came in for that pit stop and driver change there, the team were working very efficiently on that. It was a quick stop. Yeah, yeah, but they train a lot for that, and uh, HRT is an ex a team with a lot of experience, so uh, yeah, we hope that helps us to get a good result. How much do you enjoy this race and the challenges that it brings? Yeah, it's my uh, second time in the pours, and then do the start. That was cool. I really overtook, uh, I think, maybe five, six cars. Uh, that was nice, but uh, yeah, then I had to try to find a rhythm, and then the power steering stopped. So uh, it was a bit uh, mixed up, but uh, I'm happy. Now, 
Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Well, Mark. the driver who's taken over from him is Guy Besham, who was standing ahead of me in the lunch queue. All looked good and calm for him as he piled up a plate of salad, but clearly now he's going to have to work for his living a little bit more. But, you know, being a, a driver of the tall persuasion, he should have no problem at all, doesn't need power steering. Yeah. No chance, all these mod cons. I don't know what you can do in the middle of a race about trying to fix that, because it will need a, a very lengthy pit stop to turn that around and maybe even component change it depends really what bit of it has failed i suppose and does the telemetry on the car tell you how to fix it uh, is the other question but i mean it's a 24-hour race and you have a major as in power steering failure in hour two uh, these are modern race cars but it just shows that it depends where they've been running recently i suppose they'll try and strip them down and start again from fresh each time but sometimes things slip through the net Bruce oh they do and it's often a question of degree sometimes you have intermittent failure it could just be a valve that's not quite uh, clear other times it's complete but again it's different drivers would get in and manage the problems in different way but obviously the team will be thinking right can how long a stop will we have to have to change it's going to be a fairly comprehensive one but you might be saying Tough guys, you just got to nurse it to the finish. But when you've still got 22 and a bit, nearly 22 and a half hours to go, perhaps a little bit of sympathy because with with every lap, if they're losing a modicum, but also if it's tiring the drivers in their stints, what happens when a driver is tired, Johnny? That's the moment at which they may just run a little bit wide on a corner, as we've seen already uh, with the number nine, nine ten Porsche just riding a little, running a little wide at turn ten means stuck in the gravel, lose immediately three laps yeah. at the very least. The problem with it being in the 992 class or any one make category within the race is that the cars are so close anyway you're now fighting cars with power steering with a car that hasn't got it and that is just huge it's tiring on the drivers yeah but it's also you know you it is virtually impossible to extract a lap time like everybody else is doing when you've got one hand tied behind your back metaphorically yeah it certainly comes at a cost just spotted that uh, the Harley Horton Porsche has come in to make a pit stop. I think that's pretty much, yes, everybody but, oh, I found another NKP by HRT Performance, but that has made a pit stop. It's shown us not having made one, but we've uh, just heard from the driver who got out and we've reported that Geese Besham has taken over. So the 928 Porsche has made a pit stop too. So I think that's a, a clear round for everybody. The only one that hasn't really made a pit stop is Bagheera ZM Racing's uh, Mercedes. That's because it spent the best part of 55 minutes in the pits before it got going with that fuel pump problem. And David Masecki's been doing a very very good job in that but uh, 18 laps down on the car in front all they can do is chip away uh, and enjoy the rest of the race as much as they can bear in mind of course Johnny they were very very tight in the battle for GT4 uh, honors in this series only two points in it was it 164 to 162 against Atlas BX Motorsport and, and that silver Mercedes is going very well leading the GT4 class still with the opening driver JK as they call him or Yong Yong Kim one of the uh, Korean racers there, and so big frustration. You know, it's just unfortunately could strike at any moment in the season. It struck them just as they were coming round to the grid. So frustrating. Terrific fight for third position and downwards in the 992 class, getting glimpses of uh, Fabian Dance, very close indeed to Tracy Crone. The engine you can hear in the background is that powering the Crone Racing and RPM run Porsche that uh, had a terrible start to the weekend with a big off yesterday that then needed repairing and that took a, a big chunk of the day away from RPM. HRT performance in this fight for Lucas Sundahl and uh, Javier Morcillo in the GT3 car is on the same lap and only tenths of seconds away. So four cars in quick succession there, 16th down to 19th position. And now a pit stop for the 929 Porsche, which is uh, Harley Horton. This is the one we were expecting, Bruce, and we reckon the last car to now pit after a lengthy opening stint. So, yes, we had that good chunk of code 60, but an hour and a half just over of fuel mileage looks to be very impressive for HRT number 929. Yeah, late wait to see who takes over. I'll give you a choice. You could have... Uh... Anthony Lees from Down Under, you can have Michael Pitamba from uh, South Africa and Julian Hanses, young German racer who was very, very impressive when the track was at its wettest. But that, a very good opening stint there from Harley Horton settling down into this circuit. It's dropped the car down to 20, nearly 30th position as it rejoins the race. But of course, that will be the last one in next time around as well. Quite a few of the crews have kept their driver in to do a double 
uh, stint at the start of the race, and most notably Jochen Krumbach, continues to stretch his advantage. One minute, 13 seconds in the lead of this race. But for 929, slotting back into the race, uh, and that's running in, of course, the Porsche Cup class. It was seven minutes and three seconds to be exact under code 60, just the one caution to date. And otherwise, uh, we've been, well, uh, nearly 40 minutes out of that code 60 now because Bruce and I took over from Ben and Joe at pretty much that caution period. Very busy indeed through turn five. And now there's some damage on the back of the eighth place Porsche, which is the 903. I think that's possibly bodywork peeling back from the rear right. Better view of it as it headed, there it is, down to the, down the main straight. That looks to be possibly side to side contact. Yeah, it's a bit of the rear wing, in fact, which is just edging away from that rear right tire. Let's get to Diana Binks, who's in the pit lane for us once again. I'm with Harley Horton, who you were just talking about, just pitted from the 929. Quite a lengthy stint out there, Harley. How was it from your perspective? Very good. We made up a lot of places. Uh, we struggled to pit under Code 60 because the refueling area was full. So we just made the stint go as far as we could, made up a lot of places. And now Julian's in the car. I think we're going to see where we really are. How is the balance of the car developing? I know it's obviously an hour and 40 minutes or so, still quite early. But what did you notice? Well, it's so hot out there. I mean, start the stint, balance, lovely. And you just feel the rear tire start to slip. And as soon as you get that slide, it's gone. And you lose a second, two seconds. So it's really hard to keep the pace throughout the stint. Lots of concentration, but it was really good. How much are you understanding the tire wear? Well, through uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday testing, we ran the tire very far uh, to check how the wear would be and what the time could be like. Now it's a bit hotter today, uh, but we think we can take them an hour 40, maybe longer in the night, but we'll see. We're a little bit blind, but we did all our testing, all we could, so. How important is it to have such a team behind you? I mean, every time, well, your sister car and yourself came in for a pit stop, very quick, very slick. Yeah, I mean, last night we were here till midnight practicing, practicing driver swaps to get it on point and it's paid off. Hopefully it pays off for the rest of the race. We'll see, I don't think you can be perfect throughout the race, it's such a long race. Um, but yeah, we're looking good. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. He became the youngest ever Brit to race in the Nürburgring 24 hours uh, this year. And uh, after a couple of seasons in the Ginetta GT5 Challenge in the UK with Eddie Ives outfit Elite Motorsport, this is some step now up to proper international motorsport. But uh, I think that stint particularly will uh, have looked good to the rest of the paddock. Only 18 years old and, uh, yeah, really spreading his wings in 2023 with uh, Barcelona, with the Nürburgring and a few other international tracks as well. Good it's interviewee. Not, absolutely so. And just to clarify, he said Julian's gone out. We were talking about the other yes. trio in the team. That's Julian Hanses. And it's one of three cars in the Porsche Cup entered by HRT performers. So spreading that experience. But we did hear that one of the sister cars, the, the one that uh, Geese Besham uh, has just gone out, taken over from Mark van der Aert, that's the one that has the power steering problem. So a little bit of work to be done by the team, but very, very impressive from young Harley there. We saw him have one little off-track moment up at the crest of the hill at turn nine. But apart from that, neat, tidy, and very consistent. I was keeping a look at his time, and that's a very good sign. But, you know, at 18, to be out learning all these classic European circuits, it's, it's a pretty good way to spend your summer, isn't it? Certainly so, yes. So Julian Hans says he is starting to uh, yeah, turn green on the screen. So there's a bit more speed in that car that maybe they can continue to unlock. Uh, Hoop van Eindhoven in the Red Ant Racing number 903 is at, at the front of the 992 class and has the buffer zone now of Arimas Jablonskis in the Utah Racing Audi, which is running in eighth place and sandwiched between the top two in 992 so it's oop and then it's stefano monaco in the 903 and 967 porsches respectively as the race leader goes back across the line and the leads up to nearly a minute and 20 seconds now however krista yearns the former bentley factory driver really applying the pressure now to daniel alleman because the herbert motorsport porsche and the share sport audi cross the line with just 0.3 of a second between them 
Yeah, it's fantastic. Better than the opening lap in so many ways, but you've got the clarity of that battle uh, for second place. But here we are, Ferrari, Porsche, Audi, a fabulous mix. Just really need the Mercedes and GT3 to get up there. And at the moment, the better place to those is Charles Espinal, but in for CP Racing in eighth place overall. So uh, very much, sorry, seventh place overall. Beg your pardon, Charles. But uh, certainly at the front, Jochen Krumbach is just looking super smooth. Lap after lap, he's sitting on a lead of 1 minute 20 seconds now, while the battle for second place is clearly very, very tight indeed. Worth pointing out, Herbeth Motorsport, you naturally look for a black Porsche. Of course, they've got a black Porsche running at Valencia in the GT World Challenge, but red and white, red on the nose, white over the roof and down the doors, red on the tail, Daniel Anneman pushing on. But in terms of lap pace, marginally slower than Christy Ons, who's just starting to find his uh, find his form in that black and yellow Audi for there it is front of screen car between one of the Porsche Cup cars between him and the chaser Daniel Alleman so I expect the advantage to go out in favor of the car in second place Shira Sport PHX that Shira Sport combined with uh, what was Phoenix Racing. We saw them uh, effectively the retirement of Eric Moser, the boss of Phoenix Racing, at the Nurburgring 24 hours. We saw someone being applauded in the garage. It wasn't David Pittard. He was out busy winning the race uh, with Ferrari. But Eric Moser, all those years with uh, Phoenix and, uh, you know, bring, melding those teams. It's a super powerhouse. Raphael van der Straten in the VDS car rounding the turn. That is the mightily impressive uh, looking and sounding Mark II V8. Mark, a company based in Norburn, Australia, who have been uh, um, racing Mark cars at the Dubai 24 hours for a number of years in various guises. That is absolutely not a Ford Mustang. It looks just like one, but it is a Mark car uh, that just happens to share one or two lines compared to a Pony from the US. Uh, but but yeah, sounding glorious with their V8 and the 758 car running in the GTX category. A whole mixture, a melting pot of GT cars to be found there. And uh, at the moment, the class is led by the RD Signs Cholet racing team for Pauli Paulius uh, Pascovicius, number 720. Yeah, very, very close for company with the Razoon more than racing KTM. Very, very tight on times, half a second apart, but by far the best sound. So it comes down the start from this track underneath the feet of the tall grandstand is the rumbling mark to the Ford V8, and it just is exquisite. And you know what? When you walk do a pit walk before any of these races in the 24H series, that car draws as many admiring glances, certainly at Spa, maybe the Belgians. In fact, they've always, my parents lived in, in Brussels in the late 1950s, and there was a huge number of American cars. They've already had, always had a penchant for American cars, so that was drawing a lot of admiring glances. Yeah, and you can understand why. Uh, it uh, instantly becomes a fan favorite, and uh, the, the design process often sort of derived in the, in the Ford uh, designing uh, board if you like because we've had previously the mark car looked a little bit like a ford focus but we also had the mazda body shell that goes on top of a space frame chassis as well um, so i look forward to what may happen in the future with mark uh, marc with rafael van der Straten, who's been in the possession of one for a little while now as you say with uh, those belgian roots but it's two germans out front in the form of jochen krumbach and christa jerns the problem with Jörns now is that uh, he's cleared Daniel Alleman, and as you say, that gap started to grow between Herbert Motorsports Porsche and the Audi of Scherer Sport. But Christa Jörns looks at the timing screen or maybe gets a quick radio message from the team. He had a minute and 21 seconds to try and reel in Jochen Krumbach, which will be some task in the remaining drive time for both. Now, the pace of Jochen Krumbach suddenly drops away on that lap. He's been doing 1 minute 45, so he's dropped down to the pace. We've just seen the Haas RT Audi, Milka Jön, Mika Jöns, uh, sorry, Mika Panu, fourth place overall. All the top few cars are lapping in 1 minute 47. So I just want to see, what, is there anything untoward, or was it just being cautious in traffic for Jochen Krumbach, our late race leader, W2M TM by Rinaldi racing Ferrari? Let's look at his next lap time. Certainly his best lap time is the best part of four seconds faster than that. One minute 43.9 seconds for our race leader. But then again, doesn't need to take all the risks. Johnny sitting on an advantage last time I check of a minute and 20 seconds. Yeah, and a question of in this early stage, I suppose WTM not wanting too much. They don't want to extend it you know, beyond this and run the risk of throwing it away. Just be comfortable with what they've built so far. Fear not, everyone. Fans of WTM back in 1 minute 45. So a bit of traffic, a little bit of caution from Jochen Krum back in the lead of the race. Just, uh, well, why not? There's no point taking a risk if you built such a sizable advantage.
And as we stay firmly focused on whether that lead battle is going to condense a touch, uh, Diana Binks spotting more stories in the pit lane. GSR Motorsports Giudetta G56 GT4 is in the garage at the moment, just walked in to see what the situation is. And they said the fuel is too hot, the car is overheating. So they've had to take it into the garage to try and cool everything down. They were not able to get to um, a fuel stop um, they, they had the far away fuel stop, so they decided to come back in here. So I'm not really 100% sure what happened, but the car is definitely overheating and they're just trying to cool it down now before they get back out. With ambient temperature so high or set to become even greater, then you want to try and cu cure that because before it starts doing major damage to the engine. Again, though, how easy is that to do in race? I would suggest not easy at all um, and it, it might be the wiser decision as Dice just explained to just take the car out of competition for a little while get to the bottom of it before you then push on otherwise you're going to have to have a costly repair and probably a retirement mind you Johnny this must feel quite uh, chilly for you having done the, the race at Aragon a few weeks ago where 40 was sort of the mean temperature wasn't it it was yeah 42 I think I arrived at, in Zaragoza with and um, yeah it, actually for Friday and Saturday it cooled off but midweek unbearable uh, this feels very comfortable indeed at barcelona yeah shorts are not having to run for shade too much but the drivers in we heard from harley horton there of course if you've been racing uh Ginetta's in the uk for a while he's more you uh, sort of less less in a sort of precipitous temperatures but uh, anyhow you all have to learn but certainly my thinking about uh, endurance racing in countries that get very very hot in summer i think northern europe might be the better place for them to go and play in the summer months particularly because southern europe's had such an incredibly hot last month or so but uh, right here right now at barcelona this is exactly the sort of temperatures we want still looking at that tattered right rear on the 903 porsche it's running sort of very at a very decent pace who van eindhoven who was one of the stars when the track got very very wet last night uh, what we had in night practice was you had most of the teams have five drivers. They had to do two flying or two light timed laps apiece, so an out lap, two flying laps in lap. So over a 90 minute practice session, having lost lots of track time earlier in the day because of the rain, it was very tricky. But right at the end, Hubert Eindhoven suddenly went second quickest. Why did he suddenly vault in that Porsche Cup car, car up to the top? Because they decided, hey, we got some slick tyres. So suddenly we had times. Uh, coming down to about 1 minute 50 seconds flat. Best lap in the race today in proper dry conditions. 1 minute 43.893 seconds from our race leader, Jochen Krumbach. But uh, Huban Eidhofen showed a very strong hand last night. He's a great driver. I mean, he really came to my attention a couple of seasons ago in the Porsche Carrera Benelux Championship when he raced with P Team PGZ and uh, onward then into the Deutschland and Super Cup ra uh, races on occasion as well with GP Elite. Fittingly, Oop van Eindhoven from Eindhoven in the Netherlands, but only 23 years old. And I can see why he's been plugged into effectively the same car. It's just that this one's set up to do 24 hours rather than about 40 odd minutes. Yeah, I, I did a couple of commentaries on the uh, Benelux series, the Porsche Carrera Cup, a few years ago, and it suddenly has been refreshed. You had a whole host of teenagers racing it. You know, many moons ago, you'd have one or two, but it was the vast majority, and it really, the fields weren't big. They're growing all the time, but it was the young stars coming through, and it's funny how you suddenly get these changes in championships, but that's because, as we know, Johnny, working in sports car and GT racing, it is a place where young drivers come almost directly. You know, Viz, Harley Horton down there in the pits at the age of 18. It used to be where people came a little bit later, but uh, certainly it's the right place to be at the moment. And this is a very, very good shop window with a lot, a lot of um, AM drivers who, who need a quick young gun to sign up to, to race with them in series like the 24H series. So it's not a bad place to go out in this shop window, show your talent. Well, heat praise on the shoulders of Olivier Atz, who is the uh, championship coordinator and has helped me a number of times for weekends covering that. But, it, you know, he, yes, he's the coordinator, but he's also drumming up lots of interest from elsewhere within motorsport, uh, recognises where the Benelux championship is on the Porsche Carrera Cup ladder. But it's ideal for them maybe a following season in Deutschland or indeed Super Cup to support the Grand Prix. Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely a rich vein uh, for new talent, there are also pro, uh, pro am and am categories within that, but not surprisingly, there's some crossover then from that championship into the 24H series as well. 60 laps up now 
for race leader Jochen Krumbach, for Wokenspiegel team Monschau. It might be a brand new Ferrari 296, but it appears just to be as quick as last year's car at the moment. It's always that crossover point when one GT model is uh, superseded by another, and it doesn't always start winning in the in the first season. But the NLS, of course, uh, the, more to the point, the Nurburgring 24 Hours provided a famous, famous stage for a victory, a huge victory in the inaugural season, the 296 GT3, where victory in that 24 hours for the first of 296s was a springboard to the Le Mans 24 hours. And we all know that Ferrari did rather well in that, in the centenary year, but uh, very much the team's liking the 296. I mean, as soon as I saw the fir first images, I thought, ooh, it just looks a sharper tool than the 488. The 488 still a brilliant car with all those years of experience for the teams to uh, to gather and uh, put into getting the car set up. But those that have embraced the 296 GT3 in the first season, I think, have been very, very impressed indeed. It's all about the priority when you set down for the design process. Do you want to build a racing car that is also then a road car or vice versa? Or trying to convert a road car to make it good on the track. And it just feels like the 296 is, is almost prototype-esque, if you can have that within GT3 racing. Um, some of trying to make a car supersonic is futile within GT3 because they're always going to get balanced and performanced, ultimately. But nevertheless, you want something that, yeah, where jaws are on the floor when people first see it in the paddock and a car that looks to be going very swiftly when really it's just being backed out of the trailer uh, is always a good start. Yeah, and don't forget, of course, uh, it's not just pros racing and GT racing. It's got to work for the AM as well. Having something that's a superb car in the hands of those with cat-like abilities and uh, reactions isn't so good if you've got a 55-year-old businessman who's the AM part of that section and they need to have something they can find confidence with. But uh, talking to drivers who've been enjoying the 296 in the first season, it leans marginally towards... The, the drivers, the AM drivers feeling a little bit confident, but certainly the pros can wring enormous speed out of it. But looking at the way that WTM uh, by Rinaldi Racing have got their hands on this, I think they've found a, a, a compromise setup that really seems to work across the board. That said, of course, a lot of track time was uh, very misleading with all that rain. Friday here, yesterday at Barcelona. The other thing we should remind you is that the Ferrari has been entered as an AM car, so uh, it, it has principally got AMs within it, not an AM plus, in fact. The only semi-pro is Leo Weiss, son of Georg Weiss, who is the WTM part of the entry, Wolkenspiegel Team Monschau. So what they will hope is that they've got consistency, right? whereas it's you know other cars relying on raw pace but not at all times through the race, if they can roughly produce the same sort of lap time from start to finish, then that might be good enough. But there are theoretically quicker cars further down the order. For instance, the number one Audi of Sherrod Sport is a pro-am entry with Christa Jerns in the lineup, along with Elia Earhart and a certain Pierre Kaffer. We've got a pro-am car in the form of 21 Haas RT with their Audi. Mathieu Dietry and Max Hoffer are the two semi-pros there. And then the IMSA LS Group Performance car is not a, a Pro-Am or an Am. It's got uh, two semi-pros, the pro of Julian Anlauer, who's at the wheel, and then Laurent Hergon, who is the Am. So some, some teams are not necessarily showing their full hand right now, uh, but no doubt about it, if, if Jofkin Krumbach continues in this form, um, the early gaps that is, that is building in this opening couple of hours almost might be insurmountable. It's possibly a bit too early to mention that because I haven't even talked about the issue of reliability yet, and that does come as a bit of a question mark with a brand new car. It certainly does. Always can be a little bit misleading in these, uh, particularly if you've got five driver lineup. But uh, of course, you've got to average out their, their pace across all five drivers. But uh, looking at that lineup for IMSA LS Group Performance, the 76 Porsche, Julian Andler, Gregory Gilbert, who's, who's won race after race in class in the French GT4 series. Simon Termain was one of the coming drivers uh, from the Alp. Alpine Europa Cup a couple of years ago, and Laurent Hergon, well, he's there as the AM because he's uh, north of 50, but he's been uh, the test driver for the Alpine uh, squad and all those cars. He's got plenty of track experience. That is why you've really got to look for that lineup. And at the moment, it's uh, sitting not at the top of the field, it's sitting down. In fact, it's just come out of the pits after the second pit stop, Julian Andalou, just waiting to see if he has remained on board, but it's down in ninth place, but that should bob into the top six and stay there or thereabouts, I'd suggest. And certainly with Julian Andlau, it could sort of 
mm. reduce the number in front of its name, so it could be yeah. going higher up the order. Yes, um, every chance of that. He's only been at the wheel of the car for 43 minutes. The clock ticks by in the stint column, telling us how long a driver has been at the wheel, and that should not include the time in the pits either. So, um, unless I suppose sometimes if a driver stays at the wheel, then automatically the pit lane is included, the pit stop is included. I'll, I'll check that to see whether the clock is effectively stopped as Julian Anlauer now rejoins. So, he certainly gave for a little bit more, and uh, the team will be grateful for his services as well. It's very hard to explain how dire the weather was yesterday evening when the drivers wanted to go out on the track and all track action was suspended for a while. When you get a high shot looking out over the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia, and just see the glorious hills in the background, the circuit looking supreme, and it looks all the better for the removal of that final chicane, the one that nestled between turns 13 and the final corner. It does give the, the groups of cars a wonderful sweep down from 12, dipping through 13, through turn 14, the final corner. We've seen a few drivers, Johnny, running wide in their attempt to try and get close to arrival to get a slipstream down the start finish straight it is a very very broad gravel trap we were talking this morning about how it used to be uh, rather less of a gravel trap but rather more of a tire wall just beyond the gravel trap uh, back in the 1990s and it certainly caught out a few drivers but right now it's a wonderful sweep all the better for not having that chicane and it does lead to some really great little uh, attempted moves down into turn one so far i think the driver's been quite sensible a lot of them have read the manual that says you are in an endurance race 24 hours is the required distance so uh, haven't seen too many daft moves down into turn one no uh, sometimes of course you go for an overtake assuming or hoping that the car you're about to pass has seen you uh, that's not always the case and we've had some collisions uh, earlier on in the weekend there but yeah better to have discretion as the thing for most forefront in your mind to keep all four corners of the car as straight as possible so wonderful i hope you're enjoying our coverage in both sound and vision because so, there's some crass cracking drone shots from the top of uh, the circuit that uh, angles i've never quite seen before frankly no, it's very exciting i'll tell you what else is also exciting but entirely predicted that jochen krumbach would uh, with uh, almost precisely uh, Two hours completed, coming from the lead of the race. He's in re refueling. The Herbert Motorsport Porsche is in almost a lap behind him now, actually. That was in just first. Yes, it pitted a lap earlier. Daniel Alleman in refueling. And Christa Jons, the Shearer Sport PHX Audi, has just completed his refueling. And he's uh, trickling in that awfully, agonizingly slow feeling pace into the pit lane itself under the, under the control tower. CP Racing Mercedes in the pits as well and a host of others uh, making making their stops but most notable is our race leader Jochen Kronbach a double stint two lots of one hour in and we'll see who's going to take that one over next Jim. Jorg Weiss, Leonard Weiss, Torsten Kratz or Isak Totumli Lopez that's your choice you've got a choice of four in the five driver lineup have had just had a change of position out on the circuit Carsten Tilke has just been overtaken by the Land Motorsport Audi that's car number 34 and Carsten Tilke was driving the Hofer Racing Mercedes AMG GT3, the only one in that top class that's running in the sort of a silver grey livery. And down in the pit lane, though, we've got uh, Diana Binks, where it's sudden. No, not, not getting busy. Sorry, misheard something. Yeah, it's uh, it was almost Binks's voice, but uh, Ashley begins with Natasha. Natasha. Yes, uh, and we'll be uh, running down the standings in a moment or two, but you're tuned to the Radio Show Limited network of channels for coverage of the 24th edition of the 24 Hours of Barcelona. It's Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer, and we've now done two hours of this year's race. Now, time to check out what order the various categories are in. Two separate races in one, remember, the GT Series and the TCE Series under glorious skies here in Montmelo, Barcelona. Uh, 22, car 22 for Wockenspiegel Team Monschau and Rinaldi Racing's Jochen Krumbach leading the way. We have only had one leader so far. It's always been the 22 after the pass was made into the first corner ahead of the 91 Herbert Motorsport Porsche. In fact, both of those cars are actually getting fueled right now. So the bizarre situation of the two race leaders stopped in the pit lane, but it's all part of the plan. Third place is the 903 Red Ant Racing and uh, actual class leader in the 992 class. Then it is the Shearer Sport PHX Audi now in the hands 
of uh, Krista Yearns, still in the hands of Krista Yearns. CP Racing's number 85 is running in fifth place with Charles Espen Lab in that almost all American lineup. They're joined by Phil Quaife this weekend after Adam Krista Dulu was part of the lineup last week at the Nurburgring. Haas RT's number 21 Audi with Chris Cools is in sixth ahead of the Lant Motorsport Audi of Tim Vogler. And then it's the Hoffa Racing Mercedes number 11 in eighth place. IMSA LS Group performance still with Julian Andlauer driving that for his second stint now, his ninth ahead of the car collection Audi in the GT3 Pro-Am category. 11th position for the Audi of Jutta Racing, number 71, and E2P Racing, the Spanish outfit with an all-Spanish lineup as well. Still Javier Morcillo driving the number 90 car in 12th. The second Jutta Racing Audi is 13th, number 72, ahead of the Razoon more than racing KTM Crossbow, which is the GTX race leader now with Dominic Olbert at the wheel. 15th for Red Camel Jordans NL 992 Porsche and it's Villy Motorsport by Ebby Motors, third in that category, 16th in GT. The 907 RPM Racing Porsche is 17th ahead of the NM Racing Team offering in GTX. That's a Mercedes GT2 car. Red Ant Racing's 992 Porsche for Jimmy De Bruyke is in 19th spot ahead of Lucas Sundahl for HRT Performance. VDS Racing Adventures Mark Carr, 21st. Uh, another GTX car is the 701 Vortex just behind in 22nd. And then two more Porsche Cup cars in the 992 AM class is the 988 numbered MRS GT Racing offering. HRT Performance are 24th in a 992 standard driver lineup. Orchid Racing Team is 25th, HRT Performance, Amcar 967 26th. Then it's the RD Signs Cholet Racing Crew for their GTX Super Trofeo Lamborghini. NKPP by HRT Performance is 28th, Richardson Racing's Porsche 29th, the Atlas BX Motorsport Mercedes GT4 is in 30th position, and then it's the Hoffer Racing by Bonk Motorsport BMW, and the Escuderia Faroon GTX Porsche in 32nd. The second of the Vortex, 33rd. Seb Lajoux racing by Duvo, so it's a combination of France and Luxembourg. The 910 is in 34th position. GSR Motorsports, Ginetta, 35th. And finally, the Bulgaria ZM Racing Mercedes that had all that problem at the starts, 50-odd minutes in the pits. David Vasecki is now driving. And in the TCE standing, it's the 102 Holmgard Motorsport Cupra Leon that leads. And the leading margin is significant, actually, over the second-placed Jos Stevens Baz Kooten racing car, because there are a number of GT cars sandwiched in between the two leading Cupras. And the Wolf Power Racing Audi, number 121, after its runoff into the gravel when Ivar's Valers was driving it, it got recovered and uh, I believe is now running again in third position. And we can take a flick back through time to have a look at uh, the midday start and everything that's happened since then in this year's 24 Hours of Barcelona.
And let's start this segment of the race. Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer up on the, in the crow's nest overlooking things. And we have a change of voice in the pit lane as well. Welcome back, Nick Damon, with, uh, up until this point, our only race leader. Yeah, look at Cromrack, um, you decided you wanted to be in the lead. And it was actually after three corners you got it. Yeah, so um, let's say even we didn't start at the pool position this time, uh, but I had good, uh, get a good, really good start. It was a little bit hard in the first corner. We had a good fight. Uh, it was close door and door. But uh, yeah, at the end we could go as a first into the first lap. But from this point on, it was a question of tire management because tire management is uh, is the most important thing on this race with the new Hancock tires. Just one code 60. Do you think that worked for you? Yeah, honestly speaking, yes, because we were thinking about to do a single stint, double stint, single stint, and then just when it's code 60 came out, we said, okay, let's fuel up, uh, half tank. Uh, then the code 60 was over, and that's for me was perfect because then I could uh, go through my limit of the driving time. And yeah, for us, it was really good. And, how, and you're quite warm, and you've got to have lunch, obviously. How long do you uh, have a break now? You're going to rotate through all the drivers, or are you going to get back in quicker than that? Yeah, exactly as we do. And uh, of course, you remember last time, every driver who was okay in the stint can have ice cream. Ice cream, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So if you've behaved yourself, if you've not thrown the car off into the wall, then ice cream is the... Uh, oh, speaking of which, DME, thumbs up from Jochen Krumbach. You can bet that's not going to be the signal from elsewhere in the pit lane though so uh, this is which particular portion uh, bruce it is the one that was running in 22nd position it was uh, patrick luciano bay one of the is the mrs gt racing car facing backwards code 60 thrown very quickly because that was nose onto the track but deep in the gravel so no ice cream unfortunately for the spanish driver there for rotating it around Crumback, though, uh, very, very impressive, bringing that experience to the team. He's been racing in the Nürburgring 24 hours for many moons since 2004, was second in the Dubai 24. So he's not just quick in that race leading Ferrari, but uh, certainly a very safe pair of hands. And Leonard Weiss, by the way, the younger, the son of the Weiss family, is the driver who's taken over the race leading Ferrari. But uh, code 60, two hours and a few minutes have elapsed, so it's slowing down. And guess what? Suddenly quite a few cars in the refueling bay. Yeah, so a, a second chance to not exactly get free fuel because uh, there are limitations to what you can do under a Code 60. It's a little bit like in championships like the World Endurance Championship when a safety car comes out, the pit lanes automatically close for the first bit of it. These days in the WEC, a full course yellow locks you out of the pit lane entirely. You are permitted to make a pit stop. And uh, actually, Nick Damon's going to make a... Are you going to walk up? Yeah, you are walking all the way up to the fueling area. The great thing about a foot on pit entry and my new fabulous cameraman, Peter, is we can show you what's going on. I think we have to stop at this cone because we haven't got fireproofs. But um, as Peter can show you what's going on up there, you can see all the cars up there. The first car to refuel actually is Daniel Alleman in the uh, Herberth car. That's 91. Behind him, we have the, uh, the Lithuanian Audi. We've got um, just going past now and deciding not to fuel is the Hoffa GT4. Uh, BMW, because it's now all full up. There are five Bowsers, ten hoses, all of them petrol. Do you remember the old days when there were diesel cars in Creventic as well? They, and all the diesel fuel came out of a big bath, basically. Um, so there's cars coming. There's two spots clear. There's two clear spots here. And they, they, we waved in. Now, what's quite interesting, I'm not sure if Peter can show this, if you look at just behind that 25 hour, four hours, 25 hour, 24 hour, um, still on red line, yeah, 24 hour dead. Well, basically, there's a, there's a gap in the fence. And prior to a code 60, there's like a 40 refuelers all hunched up, ready to go. You know, they just leap out like ice hockey players wanting to replace someone. And they come running out and they kind of spill out and go, oh, and it's like, run around now, as Mike Reed would say, as they try and find a fuel pump. And then they, so they go, oh, I've got a fuel pump. And they go, oh, a car's not coming. And so they have to run back again. Like the, like the, you know, almost like the vultures out of bed, knobs and broomsticks. Go, oh, I've got a car, I've got a car. But now, they, now it's calmed down a bit. We've got five or six clear ones. You can see a lot of them have 
move back. But it's a fantastic thing. You've, the, the artistry, the, the balliness of a uh, refueler who's held behind a cage and then Code 16 is released to the world of refueling. I hope there's some music playing in the background and when the music stops, you better have found a fuel pump. Otherwise, it's time to get back <laughs> behind the wall again. I, th I think it's like Nick was yeah. went on supermarket sweep. Light on his feet, quick up and down the aisles. One thing worth pointing out there, Nick, was Shearer Sport PHX came in and uh, Pierre Kaffer handed that over very quickly to Michael Doppelmeyer, the number one Audi. I expected a long stint there, but obviously they decided Pierre Kaffer, with all that experience and that speed, would just be in and out of that car. So we'll look at that. So they're getting a fourth driver into the number one Audi from Shearer Sport PX, PHX. Started by Elia Hart, then Krista Jons did that really good stint. Pierre Kaffer was there for about three and three quarter minutes, plus a bit of refueling. Yeah, good point. And uh, that, I assume, is a bit of fluidity permitted in the in which order the drivers are going into. Probably valuable, very valuable, to have Pierre Caffer in when there's a green flag out, but definitely not when there's a Code 60. And if there's a feeling that this is going to be a slightly more lengthy Code 60, get your absolute pro out of the car as quickly as possible and uh, put him in when it's more valuable. Although we are going to return to green very quickly indeed. Some... Um, reacting to that green flag quicker than others, and this is a prime time to do some overtaking when it is legal, and whilst those around you, without wishing to be rude, are somewhat asleep. So, side-by-side uh, -side action coming out of turn four and downhill, the approach to turn five, which is a tricky corner. It's the 917 Porsche on the outside line there with the teal detailing of Fabio Spergi for Orchid Racing Team on an outlet and not too far away Julian Hanses for HRT performance in the 929 and also having just uh, gone into the pits from the GTX category and running again is Manel Lau Cornago in his Mercedes GT2 from the NM racing team but it is Leo Weiss taking over from the man we were just hearing with Nick Damon Jochen Krumbach who now pilots the Ferrari WTM by Rinaldi Racing 296 we're on lap 69 and the leading margin, I have no idea about under green flag conditions, 2 minutes 41 it was under code 60, uh, which looks uh, horrible from a WTM perspective, but we'll wait for the cars to pick up speed and maybe complete the next lap as we learn of problems for a car very close to Nick. It's the 928, the NKBP by HRT Performance, the... Uh... Geese Blessum, Harry Hilders, Bob Herber, Mark van der Aar machine. Don't forget that uh, Harry Hilders and Bob Herber have done more um, convention races than anybody else ever. I think they only missed one, I think. Uh, the car's in. It's got that kind of dreaded thing where a man's plugged in a... Well, he's plugged in an iPad rather than a laptop. There's a wheel off. There's a man rummaging around in the bottom of the car. I'm not quite sure who's in the car at the moment. I think it might be Harry, I think. Uh, but it's just not moving anywhere and they aren't really giving any reason why it's not. I'm not sure I see if you find if Bob can tell us why it's not going. Let's have a quick word. Bob, what's the, what's the problem? I think it's a transponder. Only the transponder. The rest is very good on the car but uh, it's a transponder and we can't go on as I uh, understand. So uh, let's see what happens. I don't know. Maybe put a new one in, isn't it? Have you got a new one? Sorry, yeah, I don't know. I'm not so technical orientated, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, this is terrible actually, huh? For just a small uh, part, but um, uh, this can happen. Uh, this can happen. Okay. I mean, how is the car going? Obviously, you didn't get much dry running yesterday. Is the car performing as you'd hope? Yeah, the car is doing very well. Very well prepared, and we tried to do all kind of uh, setups, but uh, eventually, I think we are on a good setup now. Uh, either with um, uh, new tires and older. So um, we're very happy with it, yeah. Always a nice car to drive. And we have a very nice group of people with Mark and Gijs and, uh, and Bob. So besides, we try to achieve something. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Great stuff, thank you. That's Harry Hilders. I, miss, I, miss, I misidentified my, my veteran from Bob and Harry. That's Harry Hilders.
uh, the Dutch veteran driver. Happy with the car, not happy with the ability for it to count laps. Yes, and unfortunately, when it's a mandated part, it's a common part across all the cars, and it fails, there's not really much else you can do other than try and come in and fix it. Will timekeeping provide them with another transponder? Well, if it's meant to be brought by the team, Probably not, so let's hope they've got a spare. Wonderful pronunciation of uh, a name that I always struggle with. I think it is Heispesum, though, rather it than is. Geese. So yes. Heispesum we'll go with from now on. Harry Hildes, Bob Herber, who Nick thought he was talking to, and Mark van der Aar, who we were hearing from not too long ago with Die. And don't forget that Mark van der Aar was reporting power steering problems with that car, but clearly... Uh, Gies hasn't uh, mentioned those so much. Maybe he's rather happier with it, or maybe it was a, a temporary problem, and just as he said, can be a little bit fleeting. But uh, for Harry Hild as well, he's all smiles, apart from the lack of transponder to make that car work and continue up the order. So it's going the wrong way. The 928 Porsche falling down the order, still with uh, Gies uh, listed as the driver of that, but it's tumbling down to 12th position in the Porsche Cup class. Nose to tail GT cars uh, through the kink at nine and pulling through the gears now. The glorious sound of the cars get not quite as fast as they will be on the main start finish straight. Very long run from 14 through to the first corner here at Barcelona, but uh, the, the one from nine to ten is uh, also decent high speed and then down to. Uh, virtually probably second gear but it's a great overtaking opportunity as well actually that corner was opened out a few seasons ago just be a much tighter left-hander at turn 10 that's where the giant grandstand which is on two levels overlooks and by about 10 o'clock tonight will be flooded with people through till the early hours that fits in perfectly with Spanish culture to uh, watch the motor racing at a, a sort of crazy time of the day, really. But uh, as I say, 12 to 1 in the morning, very popular. Well, it cools down a little bit. Should be, it's 27 at the moment. It's not dropping enormously, only down to 20 uh, degrees through the night. Five o'clock in the morning, still 20 degrees. And then the sun comes up or it's, the sky starts lighting it up just after 7 o'clock, 7 to 7.30. And you've, uh, but this morning, of course, we had mist, all of that moisture, that uh, the heavy rain yesterday, that was burning off. But uh, conditions perfect. What I really love here in the 24H, Series. The paddock is absolutely packed with people, but so many parents with young children coming at this time of day when the vast majority of the crowd come to sit here late into the evening with something to eat, something to drink, to watch the cars. The age age range will rise, but it was fantastic. You see so many uh, children under the age of 10 really having a fabulous time getting up uh, close to the cars, taking a look, and uh, good to see the parents, of course, being fully responsible. Almost every single one I saw had a pair of ear defenders. That's the child, not the parent. Yes. Very wise, I would say. Uh, Luke Broek is now going quicker than uh, anyone else has got done in the 909 Red Camel car. So is Luke able to cope with the understeer issues a little better than all the brothers? Rick, right now, he's just done a 148.655. The team, you can be uh, sure, are trying to work to not necessarily a full solution for that, but just making the drivers slightly more comfortable for the remaining time, which is 21 hours and 40 minutes. Still a Ferrari leading after 72 laps with Leo Weiss now at the wheel of number 22 WTM. One thing I've just been looking at, see if anybody had continued from the start of the race, just spotted Lionel Amrouche, one of the two vortexes, 701. Two pit stops so far, but he's still circulating. Then at the bottom of our timing screen, it says car 701. Oh, that's his car. Team manager to report to race control. So we keep an eye on that one. And uh, obviously, Lionel, the most experienced driver in any of the vor either of the Vortexes, but uh, maybe he's just uh, run a little too long, or maybe it was an infringement under those two uh, code 60s. We'll wait and see. No further information at the moment, but one to watch. Indeed so. Um, a variety of uh, Vortex he will have raced through the years, even going back to the GC automobile that looked like a BMW saloon car in the mid-2010s and then onward into the Vortex V8s in their various iterations. Has raced with Porsche Lorient Racing before as well. Hails from Nantes in France, and uh, just loves his motor racing as much as possible that he could do around his uh, business commitments through the rest of the year. But an exciting weekend for Vortex to launch their brand new car 
here at Barcelona. That happened yesterday, unfortunately, in miserable weather conditions, although they did find some gaps in the rain in order to do that. Yeah, they wanted to drag it out of the awning at the back, but then they didn't want to fill it up with water. But the most crucial element, when you look at the, the, the car for next year, much, much lower at the back, and uh, they've re removed pretty much all the metal bits. It's now going to be all carbon fibre with all the associated extra structural rigidity and therefore handling. So uh, it was looking very mean, slightly damp. Oh, dear, the race lit number 22, our racing Ferrari, has been damaged. It's sitting sideways in the track, and Leonard Weiss has dropped it coming out of turn two was someone else involved We've got to see that was sitting on a lead of uh, well the best part of one minute and 20 seconds it's now reversing back away from where it's hit it's gone off imagine going through turn one turn two where the track goes left he's gone a little too far left and now he's trying to avoid dropping into the gravel trap but time is being burnt but if he can tidy it around He's got to wait for a gap in the traffic. You don't have a long line of sight from the exit of turn two to the exit of turn one. He's going to have to spin it through, what, 150 degrees to point the right direction. And I suddenly think we could have the Imps of Porsche going into the lead any moment now. Just about the worst car to be next on the road is Julian Anlauer, the quickest guy out there. And he hasn't crossed the line yet to complete 73 laps, but he does so now. So look out for the 76 all-black Porsche about to work its way into sight. Turns one two and three still the ferrari no fire in the belly or is it just that they're waiting for a gap in the traffic now it can lurch forward and almost into the path of the cp racing mercedes i reckon that was the porsche that i'm talking about there are the flashing of the lights and it's a lead change at barcelona for the first time today julian anlauer knew exactly what was going on i'm sure because the team were on the radio the, the driver of the car you're trying to chase down is facing the wrong direction at turn two and anlauer needed to slice by as quickly as possible that's a huge amount of ground got gained back again and just put your mind in the in the garage of WTM by Rinaldi now having spent the first two and a bit hours building up almost a two minute lead it is gone in one moment it was a, it was a minute and 18 seconds at the end of the previous lap but of course only just started this lap getting it wrong somewhere between turn one and two rotating that Ferrari Leonard Weiss then had to have the odyssey just waiting waiting first to turn his car around enough to then spin it back into the onto the circuit but also just waiting for a gap in the traffic and as i said you've got such a short line of sight to see people you, you can only see them once they've come past the end of the wall as the cars turn into turn one but how cruel for them for that IMSA ls group performance porsche to be there just as they finally got going and it dived up the inside julian indlauer and didn't need a second invitation now he's going to be cool calm collected pulling away but what's the handling going be like for the uh, Ferrari it's still stuck behind the CP racing Mercedes that uh, uh, went through turn two just ahead of the IMSA Porsche but how's the car gonna handle did it hit that tire wall on the exit of turn two need to see both flanks I don't want to make light of this situation too early on, but there's going to be no ice cream for Leo Weiss after what Jochen Krumbach said. What I don't know, what we don't know yet, is whether there was another car involved, because Leo Weiss is the semi-pro. That's the really weird thing about it. We've had just about two hours of bronze driving time where Jochen Krumbach didn't put a foot wrong, and then all of a sudden Leo Weiss, who is very experienced, not only in this championship, but also the Nürburgring Nordschleifer, <laughs> facing the wrong way, possible damage on the car. I can only think that another car was involved, but we haven't yet had a message on the screen suggesting that is the case. I would expect incident involving car 22 and another now under investigation. And until we get that, we have to assume Leo's gone off on his own. Well, it's very unusual. Really hard to call, as you point out, when you regularly race this car on the Nürburgring Nordschleife for 172 turns per lap, and he hasn't put a wheel wrong in that this year. Anyhow, we'll wait and see. But the, the long and the short of it, leading the race by one minute and nearly 20 seconds, comfortable building on the work of Jochen Krumbach, and something untoward happened into turn two, whether off on his own, but it was just the period. He must, must have waited 40 seconds for a gap in the traffic. First uh, 30 seconds were getting the car pointed the right way, but then just waiting for that moment, because he knew if he jumped too soon, he'd be penalised for pulling in front of uh, yeah. other cars in the field. But sudden change, Ipsa performance. We talked about how their driver lineup is very, very strong across the board. Let's just run through it one more time. It was started by uh, Julian Andlauer, and he is now into the lead of the race. So let's see how that shakes out. But with uh, Gregory Gilbert, Saint Simon Turma, and Lauren Ergol still to have a go in that, that is suddenly into a very, very strong position. 
So a little wide over the green painted concrete for the IMSA performance car, but uh, still good pace across it. I just wonder whether was Leo Weiss having a, a moment at turn one, he then overcorrected rather than taking that escape road. Sometimes it's better to just swallow the fact that you've not got it right, lose the necessary time rather than trying to overcorrect and pitch the car into a spin. We're in a massive grey area here, folks, because we haven't had a chance to witness that uh, what exactly what happened at turn one again and now there's further drama because a mercedes from the gt4 category uh, gtx category which is manuel lau cornago in his mm racing team mercedes is deep in the gravel and where precisely is that on the circuit might be able to work it out from the sector times I it's somewhere in the early part of the lap. Might even be at the first corner again. I think it is at turn one. He's gone traditionally straight on where the cars used to go on the opening lap of the uh, Spanish Grand Prix and is sitting deep facing backwards in the gravel. That's the brand new GT2 Mercedes. And we have code 60, number three. And just want to correct a little bit of nonsense I spouted a moment ago. Of course, Julian Andlau is the second driver into the 76 Porsche. It was started by Gregory Gilbert. Uh, so, Gilbert, the semi-pro for the opening stint. Now we've got a pro. We do still have to have a number of stints for Laurent Hergon, probably around about six hours' worth, I would imagine, for the AM driver. But that is not has not been entered as a pro-AM or an AM car. So that's the reason why generally the combination leans towards the pro side of things. But for Lau Cornago, NM Racing Team were leading GTX. There's something about GT leaders and the first corner here at Barcelona in the last five minutes because a Ferrari number 22, our only leader up until that point, a huge spin and then an even bigger recovery has been so, so costly for Wokenspiegel Team Monschau uh, and Rinaldi Racing. But with a third code 60 of the race out again, this once more an opportunity to refuel cars but not to the maximum amount of fuel that you can put in. OK, code 60, cars having to run at a baited pace. So going through turn 13, the penultimate corner of the lap is our race leader, and only now exiting turn 12 with four cars between them is the car in second place, which is now the WTM Ferrari with Leonard Weiss at the wheel. Getting very busy, Nick Damon, in the pits. Well... Not as busy as you'd expect, actually. It's, you know, they say yellows breed yellows and purples breed purples, but this is one isn't being quite so popular as the others. There are a couple of cars already in, including the 23. Um, we've seen the car collection Audi go past, or the, sorry, the Land Motorsport Audi go past. Uh, the due to motorsport machine as well in the ninth place Audi. But it's not, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a full house. There's a few crawling in now, including the uh, CP Racing machine. We've got Share of Sport, of course who are chuffed to bits about this, because it means that Michael Doppelmeyer is going to run even more time under Code 60, because, you know, it doesn't matter what speed you are when the track is green, you are exactly the same speed as the fastest driver in the world under Code 60. And obviously, one of the two hours of Doppelmeyer's time, our, our erstwhile previous leader, Leonard Weiss, is now in for fuel as well. Um, the Bonk Motorsport uh, M4, which didn't get any fuel because there was no space last time round, has turned up in this kind of very attractive... Uh, sort of sea green and orange car. But um, there's a lot of cars who are just driving past and they were driving past when there was actual space. Um, they've now, we now do have a fuel queue, including the uh, 720 Lamborghini that's not going to get fuel immediately. Uh, and also I think, that's the, I think that's the Wolf Power car as well that's, uh, oh, he's found a space. He's managed to get in. He's, he's, he's popped into Tesco's. He's going to get himself a, uh, a pump and some uh, club car points. Uh, unsurprisingly, Red Camels Jordan under the tutelage and the strategy of Paul Trustwell. They're in for some fuel. But uh, when I turn the other way, most of these cars are just taking the fuel and going back out again. They've done those driver things. They've done the driver change. That's not happening. E2P were in whilst the track was green for a stop, and they did do a full driver change. Just watching Herberth going down the pit lane now. That's the 91 car. Now, they didn't stop for fuel because all the pumps were full. So they've done a, a run down. Uh, Leonard Weiss now is in the pits. So our second place manager, he's getting a new tire. He's getting a new, is it four new tires? Yep, he's getting a complete new set of tires for the, uh, the Wokenspiegel car. Now, I don't know whether they're blaming the tires for the spin or whether they just think that he has rotated on them so they could have some flat spots. But we're not, yeah, so we're not seeing a huge amount of P2 
pit action, but we are seeing a huge amount of, let's see if we can get some fuel after a long period of people not wanting fuel. So it's not all happening here, but quite a bit's happening. Well, something's still happening down at turn one. They're still trying to retrieve that GT2 Mercedes, the NM racing car, deep, deep in the gravel, about uh, 20 metres into the gravel trap, facing in the wrong direction. So yes, whatever happened, what caused the spin for our race leader? The Ferrari now, as Nick pointed out, a fresh set of rubber, and it's on its way down towards pit exit. But that's not the sort of expect mistake you expect to see from an advice. Still don't know, did he push or did he tumble on his own? Yeah. Um, you can't really suggest anything was down on the track because nobody else went off other than this Mercedes, but it was earlier in the corner. Um, exactly where the lose was for Leo Weiss, only he will be able to tell us. And you can be sure that either Nick or maybe Di at that point will be heading straight to Leo Weiss to get to the bottom of precisely what's happened. But it's a massive twist in the narrative of this race all of a sudden. That's why it's important, so important, to be paying attention to every single minute of a 24-hour race. Uh, by the way, there is a segment of overnight where you won't get commentary from us, but you will... I believe still get the onboard footage to keep an eye on the race to, and also uh, live timing will continue too. So uh, if you are brave enough to stay up all the way through the night, uh, it, probably you'll be updating us by seven o'clock tomorrow morning local when we come back on because uh, from 11 o'clock this evening through till seven will be our sleepy time and then we will bring you live coverage all the way through uh, with our commentary for the final five hours midday tomorrow gives you a chance to try your own commentary skills what it's like to commentate on a 24-hour race through the night something That's we've all had to do point. right just looking down into the pit lane simon terma has taken over the newly race leading him supporter he's taken over from julian andlauer and uh, patrick kolb third driver into the herbeth motorsport porsche and just to reiterate if you weren't here at the start of the race that's a car with a five driver lineup the herbeth motorsport uh, porsche but it's one of two cars the team's running this weekend in spain the other one is a little bit further down the road in valencia racing in the gt world challenge uh, europe event and ralph bone and robert ronauer are down there and they're going to be flying up here as soon as they possibly can to race through the night not expect to arrive until seven but i know the start of that race was delayed because of barrier repairs so that'll tighten their logistics but the the benefit johnny of bringing patrick kolb along not only a quick driver but also it just means that we've now got the third driver in that rotation and he's followed daniel alleman alfred renau has started the race but they may be running a little bit longer into the night than they had planned is the race in Valencia still going to be doing the full duration? How long yeah. is that? How long is the race? Oh, from start to finish. It's a sprint round. Very good. An nice hour. way of answering the question. Oh, OK. They're only an hour long, but nevertheless, when you're in Valencia and you're also due to be racing your Barcelona, it is uh, quite a bit of uh, pre-planning, of which Alfred Renauer knew absolutely nothing because he said, I'm here looking after cars at this event. I don't need to know that stuff. Fair enough. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's just trying to take the pressure off his shoulders. So just looking at the uh, GT2 Mercedes pulled out of the gravel. A little bit of an under-tray damage, not surprising, because it was uh, right on its belly, deep down in the gravel at Turn 1. Still under code 60, but now that's been removed from A, the gravel, and B, from the side of the track. One of the quickest drivers uh, in that stint, the driver who took the lead, Julian Andlauer, he's as quick as Nick, because Nick has caught up with him. Uh, Julian, that was a, a great stint because you ended up in the lead, but that was um, because the other car fell off. <laughs> Did you know you'd taken the lead? Uh, yeah, I mean, I saw the car in the gravel, I mean, spinning. Uh, let's say it was pretty tough, uh, there was thin on my side. Uh, we lost a lot of time in the pits because we couldn't pit under uh, code 60, so we tried to take advantage on the second one. Uh, pace was not too bad, but I mean, it's really difficult to drive out there. Uh, traffic is tough, but also the car degradation is, uh, is something to really manage. Uh, so. Yeah, that's what we try to do at the moment, but hopefully we're going to be a bit stronger during the night. At the moment, we struggle a little bit with the rear axle and the entries and a, a little bit of top speed as well. So is the degradation um, caused by the fact that the track got washed yesterday? Yeah, also it's very hot. We know that Barcelona is a, is a, is a track which is pretty tough on the tires, first of all. But on top of that, it's, it's pretty hot. Uh, track temp is, is uh, I think, 48, something like this. And uh, yeah, I think it's the same for everyone. Uh, maybe they struggle even more than us, but... We have to make the best out of it and uh, see where we can uh, where we can go through. Now, I mean, I think of course this year is we've changed the layout. We're not using the old chicanes, and they've got that, that much faster entry. Is that is that adding to the degradation, or is it actually making it easier? Uh, I have to say, I push a little bit on the front axle because we're, we're trying to carry a lot of speed in. But for us, I think in the car is a little easier, so because we don't like stop and then come back and then take the 
uh, the curb, so I would say for us it's a little easier and uh, it gives a bit more rhythm into the, in, in the car. So, Jimmy, what's the, what's the strategy on drivers? Are you just going to rotate through, through all of you or are you going to start going out of sequence? Yeah, at the moment we try to uh, see the pace of everyone in the traffic because it was a bit tough to see during the free practices and then see what's the best option. Also, I think they're not very, very used to drive during the night, so I think I won't sleep so much uh, <laughs> during these 24 hours, but I mean, it's part of the game, so we just, we, we're just going to push uh, to the end. Julian, thanks for this. Julian Anlauer there chatting to Nick. That's the benefit of entering uh, outside of the Pro-Am and the AM categories, if you like, because there shouldn't be too much of a limitation as to how much driving time Julian can do. He's a guy that came through uh, for, I remember, at Le Mans when he and Phil Hansen, I think, born on the same day, and we needed to go and interview both both drivers to say, what time of the day were you born? We need to know who's the youngest in the race. And they had, to call, they had to call their mothers. They hadn't a clue, frankly. They were very young at the time. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't feel that long ago, but it really was, because he's, uh, he's 24 now, and he was something like, I don't know, 14 at the time. He's got a beard now and everything. <laughs> right, incident between car 22 and 715 under investigation. But uh, So that's interesting. That's the Ferrari that was leading the race at the time. And fleetingly, I thought Jochen Krumbach had been put on board, but Leonard Weiss has now pipped, popped up again. Running in fourth place, the WTM by Rinaldi Ferrari, but that is under investigation for the incident with 715. There's your race leader for the crew from... Sorry, not the race leader. It uh, was before the pit stops, but Haas RT are, strictly speaking, with Chris Cools now the race leader. Live standings on the screen for the 24H series, powered by Hankook. This is the team's GT3 championship with the order currently, but of course, Haas RT are out front. They have a total of 126 points, leading by 10 over Shera Sport, PHX and the Audi, with CP Racing, Charlie Putman Racing of the US in third on 106. And there will be some other current championship positions we can show you in a moment or two but um these are kind of chop and change a great deal over the next 21 and a bit hours bruce oh aren't they going to just but uh, just to clarify that situation we were talking is under a minute to go until code 60 will end when i just cut out saying 715 i did mean to say the gg2 mercedes that we saw in the gravel trap but to my eye we only picked that up with about a lap after the ferrari went off at turn two but maybe it just hadn't been found at the time it was so deep in the gravel trap maybe it did clash into turn one we've had a change of tires on the ferrari so maybe there had been a puncture from a clash but that is just trying to grasp at straws and find a story. Share a sport leading in the pro am pro am category, so massive lead, 164 points over Herbert and Land Motorsport. The 715. We're going back to green now after our third code 60. But Nick, you've got some news on the NM Racing Mercedes, which caused the code 60. Yeah, just trundled down the pit lane uh, past myself and Peter. And, um, yeah, the rear left is flat. Now, obviously, I don't know what's cause and what's effect. Uh, whether it was flat, that's why I went in the gravel, which you think might be, because he's so far in the gravel where you don't need to as a skate row. But, yes, yeah, so he's got a flat rear left. But the rear left has stayed together very well. So you can manage to get back out again quite slowly. So the question is, what happened first, the off or the flat? And was he involved in any way with the Vockenspiel Ferrari? Let's find out later on. All right. Cars in the pits, by the way, and they're having to do a bit of work on that left-hand side. Thank you. CP Racing are leading the GT3 AM division. These are on current standing, so by no means decided. We've got, still got uh, a long, long way um, racing still to be completed before midday tomorrow. But CP Racing, top of the shop there, and 154 from the local crew, E2P Racing, and then the 22 Ferrari. Those point standings would have looked a lot rosier for the German crew prior to that uh, very costly spin and even longer rejoin. But uh, WTM by Rinaldi Racing, third spot, current standings. And that car is now heading around turn three. Certain camera angles suggest it's getting slightly gloomier out there, but actually up here out the window, there's still about the same cloud cover as we had an hour or so ago. In the 992 teams class, it's Vinnie Motorsport by Ebi Motors with a 10-point advantage over Red Ant Racing with Red Camel Jordans.nl. Far from the ideal car setup for car 909, and they are third in the standings, a further four points back, but that's very tight and set yet to change. 
Here is the fourth placed Ferrari then in the hands of Leo Weiss, showing evidence of uh, some of the front being taped up there, but that's nothing to do with the spin. That's from earlier on in the weekend. It's Chris Cools who leads then in the Haas RT Audi by a fairly big margin. I'll get you a gap in a moment over Patrick Kolb in the Herbert Motorsport Porsche. RPM Racing in the 992 AM division, a massive lead of over 100 points over Red Ant Racing. They're on 60, but HRT are also on 60 as well. So second and third, much closer, as Nick Damon's doing his... He's doing his Joe Bradley, frankly, this investigative work. I'm not used to this, Nick. Oh, it's, it's, it's CSI Barcelona. Um, I'm not sure if Peter can show this, but um, above the wheel arch, there's a big dent. Now, I don't know if that's cause and effect, where that dent was there before we started today, but there's also some, some scuffage there with a sort of red and a light, light colour. So it's been involved in something on that corner where there was a problem. So you're kind of thinking there's been an incident, and it may or may not be in that Ferrari, but you think it possibly helped off with my uh, definition of what's happened so far. They've just taken the under tray off, about four and a half tons of the gravel traps fallen out on the floor. Uh, Stefan Perrin's got into the car. But uh, yeah, it's looking more and more like he didn't go off on his own, put it that way. That's really quite interesting, but it, it can't be that the Ferrari and the Mercedes made contact because the Mercedes was not there when the Ferrari had spun, otherwise it would have had a Code 60 at the same time. Uh, actually, Race Direction did a very good job when Leo had his moment, Leo Vise, because they could have gone code 60 at that point. Had he been at turn two any longer, I'm sure the pace of the race would have been tempered. Just had a thought. OK, it seemed like an eternity that we had Leo Weiss sitting there waiting to rejoin. But of course, he then had a gaggle of cars between him and the new race leader, Yip's uh, performance Porsche. Maybe it happened after he rejoined going down into turn one, because it certainly was, what, a couple of laps later. When we were yeah. sitting, looking at the shot from turn three down to turn two to where the Ferrari was spun, we couldn't see in the background in that deep gravel trap, the 715 uh, GT2 class Mercedes. So we're still trying to put the story together for you. Still looking for any other warning on the screen because there was this notification that uh, the 22 Ferrari and the 715 uh, Mercedes in the GT2 class had had that clash, but we do not know any more than that at the moment. It's an 18-point lead for RD Science Cholet Racing Team over Vortex V8 in the GTX team's classification. This is the season point standings with Neun und Elf racing, who aren't here this weekend, I want to say. They're not, are they? So that's not going to change the 92 points that they have for third position. GT4, Atlas BX Motorsport on 180.1 points from Bugera ZM Racing on 162. So again, it's about an 18-point uh, advantage there for Atlas. PCR Sport a long way back in third position. We'll continue to show the changing point situation through the course of the race, by the way. This ability to be able to show you live point standings. Also, the 24hseries.com website, very good at that as well. It's updating every five minutes according to the latest positions. In the TCR class for the teams, Holmgard Motorsport on 120 versus Wolfpower Racing's number 121 Audi, which has already been off the road and into the gravel trap. So uh, the advantage firmly with the Danish crew for Holmgard Motorsport there. Through the gears we go on board with, uh, or in the background with uh, Porsche, working its way now through the early part of the lap. Chris Cools leads from Patrick Kolb, Haas and Herbert and Simon Tehrman, who took over the IMSA car from Julian and Lauer, as Nick continues to try and get to the bottom of what the issue is with the Mercedes. Um, he came up very quickly on a Porsche and a Ferrari, apparently, that were battling. And I think, as we know, these cars have got tremendous top speed and he was surprised by how fast he could come up and he actually then spooked himself and did hit. He says he hit the Porsche, maybe hit the Ferrari. And therefore, the, as his team uh, makes it, it was his fault. Uh, and that has taken out the rear end, as we know, and they've now replacing the wishbone. But uh, they say that this car is interesting because um, it makes its speed very differently from many of the other uh, types of car. And one of the biggest problems is they're losing the tyres after 30 laps. 
and they lose the fronts, then they lose the rears. So, you know, this car, the Hankook tyres, of course, are one size, one compound fits all. And perhaps the first outing for this GT, GT2 car, they've not got it quite tuned into the tyres. So they're losing them quickly, it's getting more tricky. Also, it's very quick in a straight line, and suddenly you find yourself on top of other cars you weren't expecting. Eek. Um, I am just discovering after that uh, inside, and thank you, Nick, that at 2.36, and I'd actually missed this race control message at the time. It says, incident involving car 715, the Mercedes, and car 22, the Ferrari, is under investigation. We'd said that we didn't actually get a blue backing on a message at the bottom of the screen. I, I don't think that was ever... Well, there's been a lot going on, so maybe we did miss it. That's been called as the fault of uh, Manuel Lau, and he just fessed up to it to Nick off air as well. So it's going to be a 10 second time penalty for the collision at the first corner. But now that takes away any blame from Leo Weiss. And I have to say, I was really quite puzzled by the fact that the semi pro got on, the, got to, on board the car and then it's facing the wrong way. We didn't see the contact with the 715 Mercedes, which I guess ended up in the gravel straight away. But it was so deep that it was out of the camera angle, I, I think is a simple question there because the camera looking down at the spun Ferrari was looking down from turn three and maybe the the Mercedes was so far into the gravel trap at turn one. So we knew it was under investigation. What we didn't know was the outcome. And they've been very quick in ruling that just 10 minutes after the uh, message went up. Uh, the blame, unfortunately, for Manuel Lau Corlago has, uh, Cornago has gone his way. The team gets an extra 10 seconds, uh, but are there hemorrhaging time as they sit down in the pit garage while well, that's being repaired down to 34th position Baz Kooten racing TCE class car should be going past them within the next few minutes up at the front end of the field though Chris Cools leading for Sandrine Haas's team that's uh, Haas RT with their number 21 Audi the car that's entered from yes check your national flags from Aruba and good to see some uh, local photographers have been brought over to take, take a look at what Sandri does when she's not living in Aruba. And her car racing here is sitting on an advantage of 20 seconds at the moment from Herbert Motorsports. Third driver in the cycle, which is uh, Patrick Kolb, has got on board in that number 91 uh, Porsche. So that's second. And third place, Simon Turman, not long into his stint in the Porsche that was leading when that little, oh, well, took the lead when that sort out happened with the spin for then advice in the WTM by Rinaldi Ferrari. The other interesting thing is that Manel Lau Cornago is a, a semi pro driver in that uh, NM racing team lineup. So you've got semi pro colliding with a semi pro. Not necessarily. The certain thing that first comes to mind when uh, there are incidents out on track, you tend to go for the lesser experienced drivers. Although, of course, just because you're semi-pro doesn't mean you've necessarily driven, driven GT4 machinery uh, and know the speed differential or indeed the sort of speed that you arrive down at the first corner. The cars with less downforce clearly have less drag and are at top speed down the main straight quicker in some cases than a GT3 car. That's certainly the case when you compare a Porsche Cup car with a Porsche GT3. So, no doubt, really wishing he could have he, he could uh, go through turn one rather differently now, uh, but that's the benefit of hindsight. We don't know how serious the, the damage or the collision was. The Ferrari has continued on, and I'm sure that damage was assessed when Leo Weiss came in for his stop, but... Really looking forward now to what Leo has to say, because we've sort of heard one side of the story, although driver didn't actually want to talk to Nick. Leo Weiss may well be, I'm sure he will be, more forthcoming. Yeah, well, in fact, just looking at the last lap time, not long has the field been released from that third Code 60, and in fact, second place is uh, in his sights, just two and a half seconds down on the Herbeth Porsche of Patrick Kolb. So Leonard Weiss actually setting decent pace. That's the message about Article 27 being breached uh, in the sporting code effectively um general code of driving conduct um 715 judged to be at fault 10 second penalty uh but that will be will have to be served in the pit lane so uh, there's the also the time it takes you to, to access pit road stop for 10 seconds and then head back out onto the road unless it is just added to the time we'll have to wait and see Slight concern over our, our race-leading 
Audi, the Haas RT car, its last lap was a 1 minute 50. The chasing cars were in 1 minute 46 and 1 minute 45. So suddenly, suddenly the, the advantage it had over the Herbert Motorsport Porsche has come down to 15 seconds, and it's only two and a half seconds further back, slightly less to lend advice. So second is catching, third is catching second, and second is catching first. Got to see what Chris Cools can do in that uh, number 21 Audi, the Haas RT car. Why, you know, you can lose a few seconds. Here we are, right, going through turn nine behind a, a fellow Audi. That's one of the Jutta racing Audis, but uh, I'm trying to look at the intervals. Are they looking quite respectable, being quite fine? So, don't know if something happened in front of Chris Cools or if there is something wrong with that car. Race leader, stint length 52, nearly 53 minutes. So, it's coming towards the end of the stint, and uh, Chris Cools should be handing that over. But uh, started went very well in the hands of Max Hofer. You saw him picking off a few positions, the young Austrian racer, Mika Panu. Uh, a Finnish amateur driver managed to have a good little second stint, but at the moment, just got to keep an eye on Chris Cools leading this yeah. race. If he does another lap in the 1 minute 50s, no, his next one was a 1 minute 48, so he's still losing time, but just not as much as before. And we have another fall of the 709 Porsche sitting side on. Escuderia Farion, and he's just just as he's sitting sideways, talk about insult to injury. There's a message on the screen saying he's got a penalty as well for speeding, <laughs> speeding in the pits. Oh no, actually out on the track. Beg your pardon. Uh, during code 60, so he's gone a little too fast, and he's given a far worse penalty to himself by uh, taking a rotation. And it's coming out of turn four, a little bit too much right foot round. He went to one side of the track and then unfortunately reversed to the other and then did that awful thing, go back across the track and then get it stuck in the gravel. Yeah, so it is going to be a code 60. Uh, it's a code 60, the very reason why that car was initially given a penalty. So the Escuderia Faroon Porsche of Augustin Sanabria Crespo, rear wheels in the gravel trap and going nowhere swiftly now. So our fourth code 60 of the race so far. That hopefully will be a very quick extraction for the all Spanish lineup in that car. And it'll get back uh, running again. Um, a word on Chris Cole's average time. It does appear to be right in the middle of the 148s. However, there have been two code 60s already prior to this one within his stint. So that will have brought the, the, the average time up quite a bit. He is capable of doing a 146.7. That's his best lap of his current stint. So you're right to be concerned about a 150, 1 minute 50. But that could just be down to the odd bit of traffic here and there. Patrick Kolb. 13.8 seconds through the last split down on Chris Cools. That probably was at green flag speeds as well. Leo Weiss, who's only a few seconds back from that. So if there has been any damage done to the rear of the Ferrari, and I'm, I'm sensing perhaps it was front of Mercedes into rear of Ferrari at the first corner, then hopefully the diffuser not too badly damaged. He may well be feeling it just a little in the setup but principally that's still the Ferrari that he was given, or rather, Wilkin Crumback was given at the start of the race, and that's the nature of a 24-hour race. Uh, you're going to get a car that is in perfect conditions at the start, less so at the end, and it's a question of how you deal with that. Shall we take this moment to just uh, run you through who's leading the classes? Obviously, outright race lead, Chris Cools, the Haas RT Audi. Good to see that 709 Porsche is back on terra firma and is now about to drive away from Turn 4 and probably come back round to the pits. Uh, Porsche Cup class led by uh, Luke Broikers. So despite Rick Broikers saying the handling's bad and it's getting worse, it's clearly good enough now. And Luke Broikers, younger brother, leading the Porsche Cup class in 10th place overall, not too far ahead of Sergio Nikolai, about five seconds advantage there. GTX is being led by... The Shulai Ra Sholei Racing Team Lamborghini. We sort of have a little bit of an off-track moment of recover in the first half hour or so of the race, but that's sitting on a, a small advantage over the KTM Crossbow with the uh, Polish racer Arta Quist, second overall in GTX. A GT TCR is uh, being led at the moment by Home Guard Motorsport. They've really been on top of form this season. They've got the, the Norwegian in the crew, Roy Edlund, uh, leading that class in 28th overall. And GT4, sorry, I've skipped right past that, Atlas BX Motorsport is uh, one position ahead of that in 27th. And that's the team largely crewed by Korean drivers. And it's uh, Donggi No who's at the wheel at the moment. Less than a minute before we go back to green, so if you haven't taken the opportunity early on in the Code 60 to get fuel in, uh, probably the opportunity's gone now because 
it will be a double whammy. You'll only get them to take on board a portion of your fuel and you'll be stuck in the pits as well whilst everyone else is going green. So one, two, three, four, five cars in the fueling quadrant. As we go back to green, there were one or two in the pits with Nick. Yeah, we had um, not exactly a, a huge number of takers and towards the end, we saw people just going straight to the pit lane, including the 903 Red Ant and the 85 uh, CP Racing. Now, the interesting thing is, they actually don't lose any time in doing that. And I'm wondering if they might make a tiny amount of time up because the pit lane speed limit is the same as the code 60 limit and it's slightly shorter if you go through the pit lane than if you go around the whole of uh, the last turn because of 15 or 16. So a few of them did dive in and did just trundle down the pit lane. I think more because they thought the uh, coast wasn't going to last long enough. But yeah, quite a lot, but not a lot of takers. And some of those who came to the pit lane did absolutely nothing with it. I thought, I thought it was a 40 limit in the pits rather than a 60, but... Well, I think it's 40 in the fuel zone, isn't it? It's, it's 20 there. Yeah, it's certainly be. very, very slow in the fuel zone. Well, what I would say is, when they were going down the pit lane and when they go down the straight, it seemed to be the same speed. OK. But I could be visually impaired. <laughs> I mean, you're right. I think it may well be 40, but all I'm saying is it did seem that they didn't care. Right. I think the inroad so. is still 60, and then you hit the white line just before the fueling yeah. area, but maybe that little bit that you can shortcut at 60 is worth doing when you add it all up. It's an interesting tactic. So, probably sorry, what, it, what it means yes. is, Johnny, is, I think what it means, Johnny, is you can take the risk. You can say, yeah, come in, come in, come in, and we'll make a decision on fuel or anything else, because your net loss of trolling down the pit lane is only going to be like a second or two seconds yeah. at most. So it, it, it just throws open strategy options. Now, there's a car. Is that car actually broken down in the, in the uh, fueling area? Perhaps if you look out the window, you might be able to see it. it's one of the portions. Uh, or are they lifting the bonnet to fuel is up? Is that the car that uh, caused the code 60, I wonder? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's 709, was right. it, I think. Uh, while, while that's been happening, though, Patrick Cole for Herbert Motorsport has fallen to third place because uh, Leonard Weiss is right back on it. Now only 8.4 seconds down with the race leader, Chris Cool. So that battle was uh, over about 25 seconds. Shortly after the, the code 60, it's down to 8.5 seconds covering the top three runners. But Leonard Weiss trying to get the Ferrari back into the lead of the race to atone for what happened down at turn one that ended up with the GT2 Mercedes from NM Racing in the gravel trap and him facing the wrong way and losing a lead. What was it? About a minute and 18 seconds, we said. Yeah. Waiting for so long to rejoin before there was a clear uh, gap in the traffic. Got back onto the track just as uh, the Imps Porsche came through and grabbed the lead, turning into turn three. Yeah, so a little bit of all change out front. I also just noticed that Leo Weiss has got ahead of Patrick Kolb and that happened just at the point where we went back to green flag, so uh, half a second or so, and this is a really nice battle now. Patrick Kolb looking for a way in front of the Ferrari. So uh, Chris Cool, Chris Cool's leading by eight and a half seconds, but the second place fight is the one to keep our eye on and uh, grab a chat, uh, a look at the rear of the Ferrari whenever we can, maybe here to see whether there's any discernible damage to the diffuser. There doesn't appear to be, Bruce. No, and I'm just looking, uh, only four and a bit seconds further back is Simon Termine in fourth place in the IMSA Porsche that uh, fleetingly led the race. But certainly the, the hunted is Chris Cools, the Haas RT number 21 Audi leading the race by a diminishing margin down to six and a bit seconds, almost two seconds gained in the first two thirds of this lap. So it's tightening up all the time. But the real move made there by Leonard Weiss to go by Patrick Kolb. So WTM by Rinaldi Ferrari up into second. Herbert Motorsport, Porsche back into third. Porsche's in third, fourth and fifth with IMSA performance in fourth. And Yannick Mettler for Car Collection. Motorsport. It's the uh, number 23 entry, red and white, and running, you know, quietly but uh, successfully up in that top five position. As Bruce Jones, he's off for a bit of a break. I'll be following him fairly shortly as well, as we really enjoy this race that uh, has been thrown wide open. I was a touch fearful that it will be very much a, a one prancing horse race, the way that the 22 Ferrari shot off into the distance. But uh, it's very much been livened up, certainly not in the favour of WTM by Rinaldi Racing. But as a spectacle, they are now going to have to work incredibly hard. They're reeling in the race leader, in fairness, in Chris Cools. Uh, 6.3 seconds, the deficit by lap 89. 
And Leo Weiss now having worked his way in front of the Porsche that sits in third for Patrick Kolb and Herbert Motorsport, uh, looking to try and slice into that 6.3 second gap. It's exactly three o'clock here in Barcelona. We've had three hours of running and uh, a very decent temperature. Pleasant to be out there at least if you're a spectator. Different story in a very hot race car. Uh, the front engine, that's where all the heat obviously then works its way into the cockpit for the mid-engine cars, all the heat sitting right behind you. So never an ideal situation. And for some cars that are already starting to break, bits starting to fail on them, we heard from Mark van der Aar that after an hour and a half, the power steering had started to go on his Porsche Cup car. And there's very little that uh, can be done between now and the end of the race if you want to stay in contention about fixing that. James Littlejohn's just gone across the line to set uh, the 906 Porsche Cup car's best lap of the race so far. Well, after an hour's worth of uh, Ben Constantinus and Joe Bradley earlier on, it was a very beha well behaved race, I would say, but uh, probably just the influence of me and Bruce has spiced it up. It took us a long time, Joe, to get to the bottom of exactly what had happened at the first corner, but it was contact to take out. Uh, Leo Weiss in the number 22 WTM Ferrari. He had a lead of a minute and 20 odd seconds and collision with a lower order class car, which can happen so often in a 24 hour race. He's then stuck at the first corner for basically a minute trying to rejoin and loses the lead. You messed it all up, didn't you? It was in lovely order there. The 296 Ferrari, the brand new Ferrari in GT3 spec was uh, uh, I'm not going to say walking away with it because we do we did have a race developing between that Vlock and Spiegel team, Monschau, Ferrari and the Herbert Porsche. However, Ben Consenduris just settling in now. Uh, we come back after our little break and the race has took on a full, fully different complexion with the SRT Audi now heading the field. Chris Cools at the wheel of that car and it's got about five seconds on the recovering Leo Weiss driven Ferrari now. Herbert's still in third. Simon Terman in the IMSA LS Group performance Porsche. That car started on the pole position. The car collection Porsche with Yannick Mettler just behind that. But Ben, uh, I've got to say it, we've got a race in our hands and it just shows, you know what, you can have the fa you can have the fastest car, which clearly that new 296 Ferrari is. Very, very, very competitive package there out of Maranello. But it's still endurance racing. It's still multi-class racing. And in 24 hours, uh, anything can actually happen. And we, you know what? It's still got 21 hours of the 24 to go. So it's probably going to. It's probably going to do exactly that. Probably going to change again. It and, is. and what it we, is. Uh, and what we obviously can't necessarily follow uh, at this early stage in the race is how the stints have worked out for the various different cars, how they've reacted. Uh, to the various code 60s that we've had and, and what kind of fuel loads therefore are in the cars because the first hour of the race was very simple no code 60s and very very easy and clear race uh, and we went through to the second hour with just a single code 60 which kind of actually fell at that hour mark and so for the gt3 cars it's a very easy choice as to what to do fueling wise it was just were you compromised uh, in the fuel bays by missing uh, the uh, the the eight uh, sorry 10 available slots uh, like we saw from Haas rt uh, who were about 12th car in and had to wait a long time so then two hours ago you said Haas was on the on the back foot but they have ignored all the code 60s since then haven't pitted uh, throughout those two code 60s and therefore because their last pit stop was under green flag conditions they had a full tank of fuel at that point we will expect to see Hasati, i think at any moment come into the pits because chris calls has been out for an hour and six there have been three separate code 60s within that time which extends his stint allows him to go longer because he'd have saved fuel within those code 60s but the cars behind, the Ferrari, uh, the Porsche, uh, and uh, the other Porsche of uh, IMSA LS Group Performance, both pitted under the, not the last Code 60, it was a short one, but the long Code 60, uh, and therefore are on different strategies. And uh, we can't go through all 40 or 39 cars to explain which one's which, but it does eventually play out. Uh, but yeah. the, this early stage of the race, it's kind of say what you see and see how we go. 
Well, it, it, it's we, we are playing a high-speed game of chess, as I see all yeah. the time. Uh, there's another Chris in that Haas RT team, Chris Dodonga, who's the chief engineer there, who's running the strategy on that number 21. And it's Chris who's gotten that car up there. He's the sort of engineer that's very calm and composed as we uh, as we go forward. We're about to see a change of lead, though, I'm pretty sure, because uh, Leo Weiss in the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari Vokspiel car, 1.1 uh, seconds uh, last time by, and they were taking chunks of time out of that leading Audi. So next time by, I'm pretty confident we're going to see a change of lead. Meanwhile, we're staying in the land of the 992 Porsches, as we've got, I think, information from the pits that the returning GT2 Mercedes is back out of the pits. Did I hear that? Let's go up down and Nick. Nick, I, I know you shouted up that uh, we were seeing the Mercedes leaving pit lane, and I'm just wondering if that's the case. He has left, yes, uh, sheepishly replaced the uh, left wishbone and deposit four and a half tonnes of gravel in the garage. Uh, man response coming together, which we will find out about what happened from Leonard Weiss. Uh, the car is back out again. Stefan Perran was on board that one. Stefan tries another car. Yeah. I think that's four different cars he's been in this season in the Creventic series. I'm wondering if Stefan is in the market for a purchase of that AMG GT2. Um, we'd love to see it running regularly in the series. Um, yes, Ben, uh, we have had that change of lead. You just spot spotted that. I, I mean, we're following an insignificant car in 24th position with the leading car behind that has just taken the lead. Not only that, but Herbert Motorsport directly behind them. Look at that, 1.1 seconds separating the top two cars. And no sign in that shot of Haas RT. 2.4 back already on that last lap. Uh, very much Chris Cools at the end of his stint, and I think both at the end of his tyre stint, just trying to stretch the fuel as long as possible. But there's a big gap already after a single lap between our front two. The Ferrari now clearing the uh, Mark V8 racing, the Porsche now clearing the Mark V8 racing as well. Uh, what is curious is that they've replaced the rear, was it rear right or rear left wishbone, I heard, um, on that Mercedes but it's been given a penalty for contact. Yeah. Well, the contact would have led to a damage, but that's the rear of the car. It's quite hard to cause an incident with the rear of your car. And certainly for me, it looks as though there's a bit of damage to the front of that Ferrari. Well, he might have turned in. He's probably turned yeah. in on the Ferrari and, and gone out of that. But I mean, all right, you, you could say that punishment enough from that incident was the damage you've incurred on yourself. But it's still a, a driver infringement, isn't it? It's still a, it's still a, a you know, worth of a, worthy of a penalty or else we will have drivers uh, just become, become, become a bit of a Mad Max situation out there. Uh, we've got a challenge for this lead kicking off, haven't we? Because that Herbeth car of Patrick Kolb right on the tail of the Ferrari. As this the could Ferrari change here. Trying to get through traffic. And now the flashing lights of the Herbeth car just going down the inside of the crossport. The Milwaukee liveried 714 numbered car there just getting out of the way as the leaders come through and this is turning into a sprint race kind of format now isn't it? He, he did very well there because Patrick Kolb moving around in the mirrors uh, of the KTM crossbow to make sure uh, that Arta Twists who is driving that could see that he was coming through and they will probably not have been aware that this is the battle for the lead of the race. Ferrari ahead of Porsche but for the few corners where they were trying to clear that Mustang-shaped Mark V8, it was advantage Ferrari, easy to clear the M4 GT4, but uh, Patrick Kolb joining that team in, uh, uh, in the 24H series, although part of the team uh, in ADAC GT, giving Leonardo Weiss a really hard time right now. And they are on a very similar strategy as well, to be fair. If you look at the uh, the last pit stop, Kolb was a lot shorter in the pits than Leo Weiss. Uh, and this is Kolb's first stint, whereas Leo in the car uh, since the two-hour mark. Yeah, uh, Weiss's stint length, uh, just over an hour, 64 minutes, 38 minutes for Kolb. Not that that will have a bearing on, say, driver fitness. I don't think that's going to be a factor as these two continue to chase one another down just ahead of this pack here. 
as through the traffic as well. Well, that's a change for third, isn't it? Yeah, Simon the Thurman third, yeah. going through. So what's happened to the Haas car? The Haas RT Audi? It's just at the end of its stint, I Dropping think. down. What, his tyres have gone? Because he's dropping down like a stone, isn't he? He's done uh, an hour and 11 on that, uh, in that stint. Yes, there's been three code 60s within that stint. The last uh, service was in, under green flag conditions. So I think they're just trying to stretch this out as much as possible. Maybe waiting for a code 60. Uh, I don't know, but ultimately, I think you're beyond 33 laps. You're almost beyond what the uh, the tyres in the very heat of the day now, three o'clock local time, possibly are willing to achieve. The leader just coming through turn nine, which is the fast sweep, the right hand sweep, and then that straight down to the uh, this short straight, short ish long enough to get a, a braking manoeuvre going at turn 10, which is a, a lot more open on this configuration of the circuit of Catalonia. Okay. As we come through 10 and then on through 12, still no change. Remarkable news from pit lane. The fuel pumps are out of service. So cars that need to pit, and I'm going to suggest that Chris Cools is one of those cars in the Haas RT machine, have no ability right now to get fuel. We have a view over... Uh, the pit area and I can't see why it is out of service. It doesn't seem like a huge amount of movement going on down there other than teams kind of frustrated uh, that they aren't able to do any servicing of their cars. Well, if you're new to the Krevenic series, basically the refueling aspect oh, of these cars... Generators off. Ah, oh, is that what it is? So the pumps aren't... Yeah, OK. Just to give people an idea if you're new to the series, um, unlike other series in endurance racing where cars are refuelled in front of their garage, in front of their pit garage, uh, we don't do that in 24-inch series. We have a fueling area. Uh, that, th th there's a lot of benefits from that. It's all about cost and savings. They're basically service station fuel pumps, the like of which you will see at any kind of service station, like at your supermarket. There's a car just come in there, Ben. It's the 906 numbered Porsche which is currently 26th, James Littlejohn. It's the Richardson Racing Car, currently in 10th place in 992. Now, I just, I'm not sure how desperate that Porsche is going to be. It's the only car that's been in since the, we've lost the generators. I would have thought Let's if it a is a generator issue, then it's not going to be long before so we can get that fired back up. Pitted under the last code 60. But David Waddington had done an hour and a half before that and ignored various Code 60s. So they, I think, would have had half a tank in that car and James Littlejohn out there for just eight laps. I, I think that's a very odd reason. I don't know why James Littlejohn would have been coming up, coming in after just eight laps of a stint. So, Nick, head down to Richardson Racing and see what's going on there because that would only be their third pit stop. Um, let's and, head, let's head uh, down we, are hear, we are hearing now that the fuel station is available. Right, uh, so that's a bit disastrous, really. I think really. Nick's got more information on that. Nick, what, what can you tell us about what's happening down there? Well, it was, it was a power failure that stopped the uh, fuel going through. But what's happened is that there's been a, a, one of the uh, Italian officials, Italian, the Spanish officials have walked down with the thumbs up. There was a kind of an agreed thumbs up from some of the yellow uh, overalls. Uh, again, Spanish fueling uh, regulated officials, but um, again, it's a bit of consternation. I think it's working. Uh, until someone actually stops for fuel, uh, it's quite hard to tell, is it, one way or the other? I think there might be a problem with Richardson Racing. Um, what, because they didn't get fuel, you mean? Well, they didn't get fuel, but they've only been going eight laps. Mm. The last time they were in the pits was only eight laps ago, under code 60. So even if they got half a tank, that should last 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it should last more than eight laps, for sure. Um, so now, OK, so the race control is saying fuel station is available again. No cars to prove it uh, as yet, uh, but I would say that Haas RT are probably one of the first to prove it. I mean, an hour and 16 in a GT3 car? That's a well, lot of we've had a code 60, remember? We've, well, they've had three, actually, yes, since so they were last that in. Stint. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's well doable. They've done a lot of saving at that time. Yeah, that's well in the window, isn't it? Three code 60s. Um, without even knowing the duration, just the, the fact that you will fuel save, because, what, they, they'll do about an hour and five minutes, won't they? So... The saga of James Littlejohn continues, because that was actually his second visit. 
So he did eight laps. He came into the pits um, literally one lap before we just mentioned it. And he's back in the pits again now, this time at the fuel bays. Uh, so he's done a full tour. So they must be absolutely desperate for yeah. fuel, which is a bit of a surprise. Oh, bits of car flying off on the start finishing straight. Someone's delaminated or something has delaminated. I think that's the number one, the Shearer Sport Audi there. Left rear tyre has just exploded as it, the car got to the braking area for turn one. Just seen that car with what looked like a shredded left rear corner. It's the bright yellow and black liveried car, the number one. Currently in seventh place, Michael Doppelmeyer is the driver at the wheel of that car. And he, having gone through turn one, will be limping his way around, just looking on the tracker, Ben. Don't um, forget the tracker is guesstimating. Yes, I know, yeah, <laughs> and it, that's why it's held up. It's waiting for it to catch up. Yeah. Now it catches up, so that number one, just going through turn four now. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that was... There oh, go. there he goes. There he is. He spun on the, uh, the lack of a, 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 a left rear. So he's got to wait for the traffic to get to come through. He's got to be patient. All of your instincts telling you to just spin that car to the right and get on with it. However, I'm not sure whether it's cause or effect. Luckily, those curbs very much motorbike style curbs. So very, very flat. He won't be beached on that, even if he doesn't have much of a tire left. No, as you say, Joe, left rear. Oh, oh don't come go into on, the gravel. Michael. Don't go into the gravel. Not with a left rear delaminated as well. OK, so that's so code 60 then. So what he done was he to return, he didn't quite have the steering lock and that took him into the gravel trap, quite well into the gravel trap, and now he's beached himself. So that car will need to be recovered onto a flatbed, potentially. If they, they might not want to just drag him out, we've gone code 60. So that issue with the number one Audi bringing out the purple flag again, it's and we've gone code 60. Amazing to watch the, uh, the fuel area because suddenly there's floods of people coming out of the uh, area in which they're kind of chilling out because every team now desperately wants to use these fuel bowsers. Look at the amount of people trying to get their teams and their cars in the right place. Hass RT, one of the first to respond. Great work by those that are in the right place. He's kind of sitting in it's the... It's a queue. He's kind of sitting in the middle, though, isn't he? he must, there must be a pump, pump available it, it, to him. No, he's, he's, the, he's, at the, he's at the number one pump. He's pulled in behind the, uh, the Bagheera ah, Mercedes there. No, but Bagheera, there. He's, not, he's not using the number one. Look, there's, the number ah, one is, is closest it? to us. They're using the second pump. Oh, that, isn't that annoying when you pull into the gas station? <laughs> yes. Isn't it annoying but, when somebody doesn't pull for, for all the way forward? And Haas has taken three. So, actually, there is somebody... No, none of these teams will be able to see it, but there is one pump one available. Yeah. And, and now teams are trying to juggle and place their cars in the right positions without getting held up. CP racing at the tail of the field, the marshal oh, telling them to hold. Somebody taking advantage of it. That's the TCR Audi being Wolf waved power. through to yeah. the number one pump. There you go. Confusion reigning, confusion reigns. So somebody taking advantage of the, uh, of the number one pump. That's the car in 23rd place, the Antonio Garzon in the Auckland Racing Porsche. 911, currently ninth in 992. The black and turquoise roofed car. I think CP Racing actually were at a pump. They're just so far back there. They don't have an awning over the last pump. So I think they did get in to a booth. How many cars oh, right, have yes. we got there? Yeah. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so all are occupied. Nobody is queuing. And everybody taking on fuel. So good spot with the number one pump by the way not being used <laughs> uh, number one is under investigation for contact with 34 which is ah. max edelhoff so is there a suggestion that uh, there's been some contact there which we, has caused that puncture we saw the, the the puncture happened on the main straight because yeah. we had this shot of bits of carbon fiber flying into other cars we didn't actually see number one initially um They've that's right we just saw the aftermath we now, saw whether, bits. <laughs> whether that's contact which has then brought about the puncture yeah because there was certainly nothing around that car when we saw the uh, the tyre give up. So, pits busy again as everyone reshuffles uh, their stints. I don't know how this affects 
a Haas RT because they would have they they have it's fallen nicely in the fact that they are going to pit under code 60. But remember, only half a tank of fuel versus um, uh, versus. I think Nick's got something for us down in the pits, Ben. Let's yep. uh, head down there, but, uh, Nick. Yeah, very, very busy pit lane at the moment. We've got the uh, Haas RT have just finished their full service. Um, uh, they've changed drivers, they've changed tyres, and they've got a full slurp of fuel. We had the 121 Wolf Power come in. We just had the 85, which, of course, is the CP race. I think Phil Quaife's got on board there, replacing Shane Lewis. With one car that definitely had to wait for fuel, which was the, uh, the 23 Porsche. That has now managed to uh, get through the half tank and it's trundling down the pit lane. We've had uh, the Mark VDS car, and now a kind of a second uh, selection of cars coming in, including the more than racing Razan, and more importantly, including the uh, Herberth Porsche. That's waiting an extra lap to come in to pick up fuel, and now the pubs are empty. So very, very busy this time, um, unlike last time when no one bothered. Now a lot of people need a bit of fuel, but don't forget, of course, it's only half a tank. And that might be why Richardson's had a problem, because they're only taking on half a tank at a time, they're not going to go that far in a GT3 car. We're just thankful that the generator was uh, back on before we went code 60, Nick. We've just been discussing that. If it had gone code 60, you would have been a lot of tactical refueling uh, unable to go ahead with. The number one is making its way around, limping its way around. It's crucial to take your time. Every instinct tells you to put your foot down and get back to the pits as quickly as possible. However, that's possibly the worst thing you can do. However, I do I do think the carcass of that tyre has left it's the gone. vehicle, hasn't it? I don't think there's much rubber flapping any longer, no. to be honest. No, there's no flappage. But it's what what you can still be doing is, grab, uh, is grating the floor along the tarmac. You are damaging that rear under tree as well, where the diffuser is. So you are going to be very lucky if you get away without damaging the uh, the diffuser, which, of course, affects the rear end aerodynamics, doesn't it? And you, the aero balance of the car is going to be disturbed. Uh, all of the main runners then took advantage of that Code 60 and have come in for a half a tank of fuel or 50% of their allocation. And we're just seeing now the... Leader, the number 22 Ferrari, just pulling off the fuel pump. So he, he'll be heading down to the pit, the pit apron. The Herbert Porsche has done likewise. The IMSA LS Group performance in third. Also. And the Ferrari. Ferrari's with Nick now. Nick. Uh, Leonard Vice has got out. A little bit further away. Can't quite see who's, uh, who's got in. Uh, we do have the uh, share of sport VHX and that's in getting fuel and then it'll come down about three garages or five garages or so further down than that Ferrari and they will be taking a driver change and full service. Obviously they'll have to assess the damage first and away and down and there goes the Ferrari. It's a little bit weighty, you kind of couldn't quite decide whether to go in front of the other. It's not, and we've gone green by the sound yeah, behind we have. me. Uh, and so that has worked out pretty well uh, for the Ferrari. Getting the tyres on just as we go green. He's going to trundle down the pit lane and be slightly compromised by the full speed nature of the track. But uh, he could have still been sitting in the fuel bay at this point, And uh, that would have been a lot more detrimental, as we see from uh, 929, which is down there right now, and the number one. Uh, share a sport still in the uh, in the fuel area. That's before they get the rest of the service completed. Driver change. Then we've now got in the at the wheel of the 22, the leading Ferrari, Isaac Tutumalu Lopez, has taken over that car. Patrick Kolb has stayed in the 91. Let's head back down the pits. Down with the share of sport car. Um, it has eight tons of gravel. Uh, it's done that thing they always do when uh, an Audi R8 whips off its tyres. It's smashed out that uh, rear, sort of what with the legality panel in a, a, a P car, but basically it's those strakes behind the wheel, which add a bit of downforce. That's kind of a separate bit of uh, plastic, or well, probably carbon fibre, let's be honest, that gets whipped off. OK, they've got the wheel off, and they've now got a uh, angle grinder to cut off some spare bits of metal. You can see cutting away. It's cutting away the... Uh, a damaged area of the wheel well, actually, as the wheel well cover is going. So this car is definitely going to be down on downforce. Diffuser itself, having a look, yeah, that seems okay, actually. 
But there they go, ripping out the wheel well cover. There's a slightly, what looks like quite important pipe they've got out there. It might just be an overflow pipe. But this will be um, aerodynamically hampered now for the rest of the race, because obviously it takes them too long, I think, to put that uh, panel back on again, uh, which is the rear left of the car. However, the arch is fine. It does appear the brakes are fine. It does appear the wishbones are fine. I wonder if they're actually going to release or drop down the rear diffuser, because there is so much gravel being held on the top of it, or they're just going to do the thing which is drive on and go left and right till it all falls out. But some good tie-up action now, and I can see some duct tape, and I can see a lump hammer, <laughs> so if they could just bring on the iPhone torch, we'd have the endurance race set. I don't know. That was some lovely angle grinder ambience, wasn't it, from Nick Spike <laughs> there? Lovely to see an angle grinder coming into action, especially onto a you know, a car such as the Audi R8. I mean, you wouldn't dream of taking your, taking your Audi R8 into a garage and having the mechanic appear with an angle grinder. But this is sports car endurance racing, so yeah, just get that car back out. That's the, the objective of the exercise for sure. Watching uh, the leader in GTX here, Nicola Michelin. Uh, sorry, complete lie, second in class, Arthur Twist, uh, being passed by Pat Kolb, who now leads uh, the overall in GT3 and in Pro-Am in their category uh, and still waiting for the Ferrari to come across the line it does do so not yet so there's a huge gap post code 60 between the 91 and uh, whoever is second because it might well be the 22 uh, Ferrari 296 but we haven't had it confirmed yet when it comes to the line uh, now it does so and Need to, need to wait a bit longer, but I think the gap could be... Can't be a lap. Either way, Ferrari has uh, Porsche 76 win company, Simon Turman, very experienced uh, Frenchman. Uh, and Gavin Pickering is only 2.6 back, so it's a very interesting battle for second. But now the, the uh, dice has very much swung towards Herbert Motorsport, and they are well ahead in the lead. Uh, Nick? advice just out of the um, first of all what happened in that incident with the Mercedes again sorry what happened in that incident with the Mercedes uh, yeah I don't know if the GT2 thinks he has bigger brakes than us but he completely t-boned me into turn one so yeah I don't know where he think he could break but I was already quite late on the brake and he just smashed into my door so what part of his car hits which part of your car? Uh, yeah, like his front, or like his front and left, front left tire hit my front right tire door or something. More generally, what is the track like today? What is the surface, what's the conditions like on the track? Yeah, it's quite difficult. I think it's getting pretty hot right now. Uh, yeah, at the end of the stint, I was lacking a bit of with the front tires. Um, yeah, and uh, saw some or one tire explode now on the straight right in front of me. So let's see how the tires will do. Is the is it now consistent or is the grip still coming up? As it as the track rubbers in, is the grip still going up? Mm, I don't feel the grip is getting much better now. It's Consistent, I would say, and you need to manage the tyre throughout the stint. No, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Yeah, we are very much in the heat of the day, and around this time of year, looking at 3.30 being kind of the heat of the day. But what we have seen over the last two nights is it doesn't seem to disappear, the heat, whether it be the temperature and the humidity last night or the night before where it was just a lovely sunny day. It doesn't drop significantly at night so far, and so... Uh, we aren't, we're going to have this kind of challenge of keeping the tyres good and keeping the brakes good uh, throughout the 24 hours. We've had a change of lead whilst we were down in the pits with uh, Leo Weiss. The Ferrari of Leo has dropped to second place. Patrick Kolb has gone ahead in the Herbert Porsche, ahead of Isaac Tutumalu Lopez. So a change of position with 
now a gap going out to last time through Ben I'm not quite sure what we've uh, witnessed here 40 seconds the gap between the Porsche and Ferrari now yeah and that's got to be down to the pit stops there's, there's yeah. nothing else you know pre pit stop they were all together post pit stop 40 seconds the gap so the way that the uh, pit stops have played out uh, for Herbert Motorsport let me tell you Kolb was in the car and stayed in the car and he did a 2 minute 17 at the fueling bay uh, Shera Sports getting a uh, causing a collision getting a 10 second time penalty so Michael Doppema uh, being given a responsibility uh, for that collision that we didn't see but it was with car 34 uh, which was um, who was in car 34 at the time can't even see him. Uh, Max Edelhoff, yes. Uh, so Patrick Kolb, 2 minutes 17 in the pits. Uh, in the 22 Ferrari, uh, 2 minutes 58 in the fuels bay. Was that purely to do with driver change? Uh, no, it's fuel bay. Fuel bay. Although maybe my timing screens isn't, uh, isn't uh, seeing the two separate things. Sometimes yes. it sees it, sometimes well, it Well, that, that's where your 40 seconds is, for sure. Yeah. That's where that's where go. they picked up 40 seconds. But uh, you can change drivers as you change tyres. So, so Patrick Cole did it, and Leo Weiss changing to Isaac Tumalu. They did change I drivers. Wonder if, I wonder if Kolber's double stinting tyres as well and just went straight through. I'm not sure, because Nick wasn't in that part of the pits, was he? So we, we're not sure what happened. Simon Turman stayed car. aboard uh, what is now third place car uh, IMSA LS Group Performance Porsche in the 76. So, and theirs was only a two minutes and 10. So that's elevated them up. Haas RT, earlier pit stop, three minutes and 20. So they now sit fourth and 46 seconds back from Patrick Cole. So all down to a single moment of code 60 and how it played out for you and what you did under that pit stop. Pretty much everyone's reset back into having pitted under that code 60 so there's a little bit less confusion but what the state of the car is what the state of the tires are how much fuel you've got in is not information that we can tell you and i, and I do think a contributory factor a major contributory factor was just how busy the fuel fueling station was there yeah it wasn't just a case of getting a clean in and out of the fueling some cars had a queue some cars uh, had a wait for other cars to be refueled so that was perhaps what, where the time had soaked up and certainly uh, with both cars coming in literally together the Herbeth car the Herbeth team uh, getting that car out in uh, in swifter time than the Ferrari so now we've got a race in our hands the Ferrari uh, the gap down to 34 seconds so to Tumalu Lopez is gaining 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 on that Patrick Cobb driven Herbeth car so we're going to see that 91 Porsche the red and white liveried car is losing time to the second place Ferrari 296. We'll keep an eye on that gap. It was 40 seconds. He took literally six seconds from him in one lap. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with uh, traffic. I suspect it has, but we'll see. And as ever, these races, they may be longer, long and drawn out, but they are constant givers of drama and incident. And once again, we've got Drama and incident certainly at the overall at the front of the overall field. Drama and incident coming together with regards to class leaders. The 992 class being led at the moment. Look, Breukers at the wheel of the red camel car, 909, seventh overall. And then just behind them, literally a second and a half, Sergio Nicolai in the 955 right on the tail. So we've got a 992 battle there for Vili Motorsports by Motors chasing down the red camel car. And they are currently seventh and eighth overall uh, and this is the battle for the lead in 992 with uh Willy motors down the inside there of luke breukers and taking the leading class it was 1.6 seconds the gap at the start of the lap but they've had a lot of traffic to get through and sergey nikolai then brings and moves Willy motorsport by emi motors back to the head of the field uh, and it was a little mistake from luke breukers he opened the door to allow that to happen and i wonder whether uh, the youngest Breuker will start fighting back now. Well, we'll see. I mean, we know how quick Sergio Nikolai is in, in a cup car. We know how quick Luke Breukers is. I mean, yeah, we always kind of consider Luke as being a, a rookie driver, but he's got a couple of years' experience, certainly 
more than two years experience under his belt so we should have a good battle now developing in 992 pre pre code 60 we had has rt at the head of the field only two stops for that team and last man in the car was chris cool he's with nick now chris um that was a long stint and it seemed that the car lost pace towards the end of that stint what happened the tires were a little bit dead on the end of the stint, but the car still good. Dus I'm contrary and SA uh, has the same lap times. Dus for me it was okay. Is it is the track turning out to be much more abrasive, causing much more tire wear than the team thought you thought? Uh, yes. Uh, it's difficult on the end for the tires. It's very hot. So uh, the car have a little bit difficult with that. Yes, okay. Yeah. How, how, obviously you were leading, so how is the team feeling the race is going? Because obviously since you got out, you've dropped back a few positions. How, how is the team feeling overall at the moment? Uh, well, it was a great feeling. It was the first time with an Audi R8 and the first time uh, leading also. It was a very happy feeling for that. Yes. And do you get a good rest now, or are they going to put you back in again quickly? Uh, I'm done, done well, three hours or so, and put in the car uh, behind. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Have a cool down. Chris Cool cooling down. <laughs> he needs to. He looks very, very hot. <laughs> you planned that all day, haven't you? No, Nick set me up, actually. He all said right. it. He said it. Giving him, uh, I'm giving him cred on that one. Yeah, you can give him that one. Yeah. Hassar T, a team that has certainly known how to win these 24 series races. Gavin Pickering, a name we haven't seen for a while. He's done a couple of races, I think, with us this year. And he's back out in that Audi R8, lapping in the one minute 45 last time through, 148, I should say, his last time through. The gap between the leaders coming down a little bit more, 29 seconds. I'm surprised, really am. Interestingly, um... I don't know whether they, the Ferrari had their uh, name ID in the wrong place because it's now become Torsten Kratz in the uh, 22. I noticed that. Yeah, it was <laughs> Isaac. <laughs> yes, so it, it's not Isaac de Malou no. Lopez that we've been crediting with uh, reducing that gap towards Patrick Cole, but is in fact Torsten Kratz now at the wheel. But uh, Patrick Kolb's not a slouch. He's, he's rated as Nam Plus uh, by Creventic. But to be losing nearly two seconds a lap uh, is a slight concern, I have to say, uh, for Herbert Motorsport at this point. Torsten Kratz uh, is certainly not the pro in that car, is he? Uh, what's he rated as? He's rated as an amp. He's amp, yeah. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, that is... Yeah, that's a quick amp to have on you. Is that you there for Patrick with a, an older set of tyres? Because, as you say, change the driver, change the tyre. And uh, we know that Leo Weiss was in the car before, so uh, maybe fresher tyres on the Ferrari than both yeah. uh, Herbert Motorsport and also IMSA LS Group Performance because they didn't change their driver. But they're doing 46, uh, 46.8s. Patrick Kolb is only on 48.0 and has been for the last couple of laps. Uh, yes, he's had traffic to contend with. He's just uh, got past the uh, TCR machines battling at the head of the field there but uh, he will be con I think the team will be concerned by that because Kolb's only been car's only been out for an hour Kolb's only been in the car for an hour and if they ha are if they didn't change the tyres last time the tyres have done three code 60s uh, of which probably 20 minutes of that uh, at slow speed and the rest at racing speed there was a lot of talk at Estoril about just how quick this Ferrari is and how, I'm not going to say easy to drive, but how able, even AM drivers are able to get to grips with this car. So it must be a very kind of a car that gives you a lot of feel, which is exactly what you want for a GT3. And Ferrari expected to sell quite a few of these, I would imagine. And with this, the only example that we've seen, certainly in the 24H series, the, uh, the other GT3 series around the world, it'll be a car of choice because it is a very, very, very quick race car. And we're seeing it being driven very ably 
So the gap was, what, 27 seconds? Now just gone through 25.6. Even with the traffic that we've yeah. seen the Ferrari contend with in that last sector of the lap. No answer from Luke Broikers on Sergio Nicolai. 6.3 the gap now, so uh, the multi-cupboard Willie Motorsports Porsche getting past, as we saw a couple of laps ago, clearing off from the Red Camel Jordan's Porsche. In GTX, it's RD signs well ahead of the KTM, which is second. Mark is third, and Mercedes now uh, down to fourth in that class. Uh, no, even further down, sorry, because it's uh, had those issues in the broken wishbone. It's the uh, Atlas BX Mercedes GT4 car that leads in GT4. And uh, Holmgaard's TCR leading in TCR. Sorry, Holmgaard's Cupra leading in TCR. No real big battles going on uh, in those lower classes right now. A little bit held up there, Patrick Kolb, as he comes through turn... 12 and down to 13, just having to be patient uh, with the Vortex. And that's the 702 because the 701 of Miguel Moya uh, is in the pits right now. The, uh, the 24 Series website will keep you informed as to how the championship standings develop through this race. And as we get towards the 12 hour mark, which will be when the points are awarded for half distance and then towards checkered flag so we'll see how things are developing as they will stand already we are preempting where the teams are going to be finishing and at the moment the atlas bx motorsport mercedes is the car that's currently in line for the gt trophy the overall european championship trophy at the moment rpm racing have come up into second place with joint point score of 172 the way they stand at the moment uh, they're joint with the Audi signs Lamborghini and then only two points behind them is Billy Motorsports by AB Motors so that currently leading the 992 class is doing the Billy Motorsports team a lot of good and putting them right there into contention you wouldn't want to call that the Bagheera team they've dropped out of contention slightly by being out of the points with those problems at the start of this race. So at the moment, Atlas BX are our champions elect. And I'm sure that won't stay the same bent as we get towards the checkered flag and even half distance when, when points will be allotted. But right now, the four class lead has been given full, a full 40 points and it makes things very, very tight for the European Championship going forward. On board with the uh, KTM Crossbow, GTX version of the uh, GT2 car. GT2 versus G oh, GTX versus GTX here. I was about to say GT2 versus GT2, but there are differences. Well, actually, there are differences in both cars because they're running to different regulations in the GTX category here to 24 H series than they would do if they were GT2 machines. Uh, but uh, they are in the same class, the Mercedes GT2. Oh, we've got a car in the gravel. And that is the Hoffer Racing number 11, I believe, in the gravel at the final turn. So Chantel, I'm afraid, uh, is, it's yeah, final turn, and it's going to need a code 60 to retrieve it. Now, that's a very fast turn. The I, I was going to say new, far in. new configuration, but it's not. It's the new old configuration, isn't it, <laughs> of the Circuit of Catalonia. And she'd lost, I think she may have been held round there. There's a... And... There's a there's a Chantel and the Hofer car goes backwards into our view out of the final turn and is backwards into the gravel. She's barely into the gravel, rear axle in the gravel, front axle just on the the green tarmac that uh, the outer curbing. But there was a car in close proximity, and we've got a code sixty. Yeah, and we had four cars in the pits before the before. code sixty came in. Right. right. So uh, Nick Damon was watching them. We've got a lot more uh, of the teams going down there uh, to get themselves half a tank of fuel. But there were a few cars, Nick, that preempted this and have got a full tank in there. Yeah, that's one of the rules that's going to change, of course, for the next season as it gets even more complex. So basically, these guys got in before it went purple this year. That includes the 907, the uh, 
I know it's not the Tracy Cron entered car, but it's the Tracy Cron car to all of us, the lime green Ferrari, uh, Porsche, sorry. Um, we also had the Land Motorsport, uh, Johannes Kirchhoff and, uh, and friends, Audi in there. Um, there was, I think, the Utah Motorsport 72 car, but so no one of the top leading cars managed to do this. Now we are in a situation of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think about eight cars. There's still three pumps left. Here comes the Bonk Motorsport M4. Here comes the RD Science Lamborghini. And that could be it. But one more space. And, Nick. and that is the Bagheera car. But the, 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 I'll tell you who. Do you know who's first person not getting a space? Definitely. That's our leader. That's a Herberth car. And take a look at the rear left corner of the 72 Audi when it comes past you. Because as Atlas BX pulled out of their fueling area, they simply peeled away uh, the piece of bodywork that sticks behind the rear left wheel uh, of the 72 Audi. Uh, it got left on the apron outside of the fueling area. Uh, and of course, those four cars were able to sit there for a long time and fuel because they can get their full tank. So they're almost blocking others from doing so, but damage to the 72 Audi by sitting still in the pits. The Herberth car has now got to a tank. I don't think it lost too much time. It may be only five or six seconds in total before it found a tank. Someone left. The uh, Share of Sport car has served its penalty, which was obviously picked up by Michael Doppelmeyer. The E2P car is coming out. So there's now space again. So you can uh, pit with joy. Uh, finally, the Crone Racing car, the uh, 907, that had a lovely full slug of fuel. That's left and leaving another empty space. Not seen the 72 so far. 72 Don't still that fueling. Same sort of rear panel. Yeah, I think they, I think they won the cars that got there. We go beforehand. now rolling. The 72 car. The here he comes. I'll just have a look and see what's fallen off it. But it's probably the same bit that came off the uh, Sheriff Sport. Exactly, it's exactly the same bit that came off the Sheriff Sport car. Though they have got a problem at the under tray side. They're going to have to pull that off as well. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a bit of the for the flick up underneath that quarter is still attached. And they had to yank that out and lose the whole of the, uh, I don't know, 70 pounds or 40 pounds or 20 pounds of downforce. All that aero course on the rear left. But Bougirard go past me, Herberth go past me. And it's now beginning to empty as this Code 60 runs through. Not seeing, but actually Bougirard are changing drivers. Looks like most people are just going fuels. Quite a lot of driving through. So... Basically, this one's a chance for half a Don't forget, fuel. Nick, so that we've, nice. we've now established it's definitely Bagheera. Yes. How is it then that um, when I asked Adam Lacko last night, he told me it was Bagheera? Oh, that just adds confusion. Well, we, we were told this morning by Ali Colic that it is Bagheera like the Jungle Book. This, and I'm going to say something now that only Joe will understand. This sounds like Caelan <laughs> Lamont. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got the energy to explain because, that one. I know, but if they can't agree yeah. amongst themselves, what, what chance, chance have we got? Have we got? Yeah. Uh, the GT2 Mercs in, the uh, more than uh, Razan, Razan more than racing uh, crossbows in, uh, the Woolly Motorsports by EB Motors uh, multicoloured Porsches in. These are all going getting half a tank, of course. Uh, so it's been a, I think a lot of people have found this particular one quite useful, mm. guys. When we get them back to back and they were looking quite short, we had a few non-takers. This looks like a, um, yeah, we'll have half a tank now. Yeah, no taker, much. Ferrari staying out for the moment. Uh, and the 21 hasn't pitted either. Uh, and that is the reason why we're still under code 60, because we're now sweeping all the gravel away that Chantal Prince brought back onto the circuit at the last turn. Of course, that is a place where you really don't want to suddenly lose grip uh, because it's now a much higher velocity corner than it used to be just an acceleration zone. Uh, and so we're just taking an opportunity to sweep up the circuit uh, whilst we're under code 60 because uh, they Mercedes unharmed uh, and back out. But interestingly, EB Motors is harmed and going into the garage, Nick. Simon Castro, they do a driver change anyway. Sergio Nicolo got out, Simon Castro gets in, but that car has gone into the pits. Now, what are they looking at? What are they trying to front fix? Left. Looks like an issue on the front left. Um, trying to see, I'm slightly wrong, so I can't see what the problem is. I'm going to try and stand, not completely in the way, but they are, yeah, very much front left issues. And this would be the piece of car that Mechanics may have made contact with Chantal Prince. We can't confirm it, but... Uh, they entered in shots yep. together. Yeah. Need, need yeah. to move the cameraman because he's going to get in the way. 
Uh, they are... Yeah, they are attacking that front end. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of work on the front left. It's being unscrewed. And it's the, ah, it's the front steering arm. And that's, ah, it's, it's come away. So they've broken uh -huh. the steering arm. Uh, so that's come away. Uh -huh. uh, and they are now trying to get off the other end of it. I assume it's a sheared. Because there's no sign. They said he hadn't taken it off before I came here. But they've now got that front steering arm off and they are trying to get the B end. Obviously, the biggest problem you've got is you're trying to work at that round the side of a brake disc that's probably still 400 degrees centigrade. And he's a very brave engineer because he's mostly got bare arms there. This is giving me nightmares the time I burnt the man uh, in the F1 pit lane when I bumped into him. He stepped backwards onto a brake disc of a just, just the end of a practice session. He walked backwards onto the brake disc, carbon fiber brake disc of a George, oh. lipped off, I thought he was just uh, being massively overreactive. Saw him the following day with massive bandages and packing and everything else. Because it's when you get burnt by one of those things, it's like a normal burn, because it's so hot. It's like a super yeah. burn. And it's, um, so I had to apologise profusely. <laughs> and uh, strangely, I don't think he accepted the apology. He didn't seem very fond about me. It was, it's, it was just me being you clumsy. Didn't oh, it was, ah, right, so you, you weren't compassionate to the fact that he'd hurt himself, Nick, is what I thought you just said there. At the yes. time, yeah. at the time, I thought, oh, what a big overreacting right man. Here, I've just knocked him back a couple of seconds, but he had literally parked his calf on a carbon fibre of F1 disc that had just come yeah, off the track. Yeah, it is very... And at that point, you kind of can't apologise enough the following day when you realise how injured no. he is, but what can you do? It's life, in it? Didn't get sued, so what can you do? Kind of look at those mechanics working underneath the wheel arch of that Porsche. And you can't, I mean, you, you stand there about a metre away from that brake disc and you can feel the heat. It's like a radiator. It's like a radiator. It's a thousand degrees when, you know, the brakes have been applied and it's just cooling off nice and slowly. So those mechanics are working under extreme envi in an extreme environment under that wheel arch. And it, it, it was a steering link that uh, to the, um, what am I trying to say? Not steering box, steering rack. Linking to the steering rack yeah. and the uh, and the upright um, is what was being replaced. And, and so it was wheel, so it was basically wheel it, to wheel contact with the Mercedes because I, I was, was no look, body work. I was looking at the Mercedes there as it was going round, and I couldn't see anything that was apparent. The offending bit of the oh, car. Oh, Nick's look. got the. Uh, Go ahead, Nick. Is it hot? That is, is the steering oh, yeah. arm. As you can see it's a bit of a bend. They've almost replaced it. They're looking to get it out, but this is the broken one. Which I shall have on eBay within <laughs> half an hour. Um, uh, yeah, I, I should. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll get you to present it to him for some reason, Joe. But that was a fantastic bit of uh, engineering because that's that bit there, which is the B end, is right inside the car. Yeah. Uh, right in the brake disc. So that's a, the, all right. It's it's unscrewing something and two bolts, but that ain't easy. I, Thank you very I, much. What about the tracking thing. though of that car now that it's had that replaced? No, it'll be it'll, it'll be, be pre-measured. Pre those will okay. all be preset. I would not present that to Sergio Nicolai, who was beside himself there, absolutely distraught, went and sat at the back of the garage for causing that delay for the car that was leading 992s. Now, uh, all right, the car limped round with bent steering, but then the car went into the pits under ideal conditions, because if you're going to do that repair, code 60 conditions is ideal for soaking up the time or not soaking up as much time as you would have under green. So that car now just making its way out. Sorry, Nick. The Le uh, Rinaldi are serving a penalty. Yes, they have a. P they have come in. Uh, WRT. Um, WRT. Completely wrong. <laughs> Team. WRT. WTM. I've got a completely wrong car. Uh, WTM by Ferrari. They are in the uh, penalty box at the moment. Serving a penalty. I'm sure they've already picked up a, uh, a lovely half tank of fuel. And they will crawl past it. This is a long penalty. What's this one for, boys? It's 120 seconds of penalty that's counting down. So that would be a minute's penalty, double because it's code 60. Have you got the penalty board up there? Yeah, overtaking under another car during the code 60, so previously the last code 60, uh, and therefore 60 second time penalty, uh, as you said. 30 seconds times by two because everybody is going slower but it's always better to get your penalties out the way under code 60 because even if we try and make it uh, more, we make it longer by doing it under it's still uh, less impactful to do your uh, drives under code 60 yes nick 
Last race you can do that. Yes, changing of the rules next year. Moving forward, the rules are changing for Q8 and you can no longer serve penalties under code 60. At all? Wow. Nope. Um, do you, have you read enough of the regs to say what happens if we don't get a code 60 before, uh, like sort of towards the end of the race, Nick, when we haven't got any code 60 and you've got the penalty to serve and you, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, under green flag conditions. And so what, what's the cutoff time towards the end of the race though? Uh, or do you have a regulated time to serve the penalty within? You have to serve it within two hours of receiving it. Right. If you don't serve it in two hours, it gets added to the end, which has caused problems in the past. Yes. If you remember back in Mugello, yep. Yep. when yes. the Renault won, because it got the extra lap, so it got like, but the lap time was like three and a half minutes because it had a two minute penalty, but it had got the lap. And if it had served it beforehand, it probably would have won. And it would have made great television, if I remember rightly. It's the yes. tension of the car coming on the pit lane to serve that penalty would have been very so tense we, with the second place so car I, coming around behind it. I actually remember us having a word with Gary on that evening saying, you've got to change that rule. But Yeah, we need it us. for television. <laughs> what could you do? Yeah, um, I, th I think that's a, uh, not a bad idea, actually. I don't, I'm not sure that's a, that's it a simplifies, bad idea. It does simplify a few things. It simplifies it for the officials, for yeah, sure. Yeah. We have swept the stones away from the final turn and I think everybody's also got service now because even the Ferrari that we say were, said was uh, ignoring uh, the last code 60, they have been to the pits. So has Haas RT a couple of laps later than the Porsche. Uh, but we are now soon going back to green flag racing. Nobody, as far as I'm aware from our point of view, is in the pit lane. So we're all ready to go. Uh, let's see what kind of uh, battles we've got spiced up once we get back to green flag because we've got Herbert ahead uh, at the lead of the race and it's the Ferrari now in second position. Off we go again. Yeah, Alfred Reynauer though, Ben, that's significant. In the 91 now, Herbert Carr being driven by Alfred Reynauer, one of the quickest drivers in that lineup. So they'll be consolidating that lead, I would imagine. We wait for Torsten Kratz to come by and give us an idea of just how far behind the Wachenspiegel team Monschau Ferrari is. And then likewise, Gavin Pickering still uh, in the Haas RT Audi will get an idea of just what our race gaps are and just how this race is gonna develop. We're, uh, we're just about to complete four hours of this 24 hour race. So still a long, long way to go, but uh, it doesn't stop us talking about the drama of the lead because what we've seen before, Herbert Motorsport get into the lead, 44 seconds is the gap, six seconds. In fact, the gap is to the Haas RT car. So Haas RT moving up to second, 44 seconds behind Herbert. In third place, uh, Lauren Hergon in the IMSA LS Group Porsche. Remember that because the car that started on the pole and then the Ferrari. And despite Hergon, doing two stops under the last code 60. So not only uh, has he jumped aboard, they have a full tank of fuel because two consecutive laps where they will have filled that car up means that their tank is now completely full uh, and probably not the same level as the cars ahead who also pitted, but not twice. Uh, and it's interesting that the Ferrari has actually lost ground, Torsten Kratz, uh, despite only doing the one pit stop, uh, it was a long pit stop for Torsten Kratz. He was at the fuel bay's four minutes, um, but uh, he has, we're not actually still waiting for him to come and look across the line. No, we're not now. They've dropped a minute behind the Herbert Porsche. So that's a huge chunk of time lost. So for the Ferrari to gain ground on the IMSA Porsche ahead of him, 10 seconds is the gap. The IMSA Porsche has got a six second gap to pick up on the Haas RT car. So Gavin Pickering, just have a look at the lap times last time by, it's an insignificant one, of course, because we've just gone green. So we'll pick up on their lap times and what these drivers are capable of. That will give us an indication of just how strong, if any, Renauer's position in that car is going to be. Meanwhile, 992, Evil Breakers has taken over the wheel of the 909 car, which has taken up the lead of 992, currently in eighth overall. They've got two GT3 cars in between themselves and the next car 
in the class, which is the Vili Motorsport by EB Motors. So Sabino they... de Castro now the wheel of the 955 in 11th. Uh, and I would say they might have even a lap because considering that car was in the pits for the long amount of time it was, there's no way uh, it, it was... Well, actually, I can tell you exactly how long it was in the pits. Six and a half... No. So yeah, six and a half minutes. So even at code 60 speeds, that would have been a single lap. I think Red Camel's Jordan yeah, now have a right. full lap over the rest of the 992 field, yeah, remarkably. Right. Um, I don't think I have them starred on my screen. Hang on, let's have a quick look. And they did pit under the last Code 60. Uh, so they haven't done as many pit stops as some of the others, but they are on a similar situation to most. And so uh, good work from Trusses in the strategy uh, yeah, 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 department of there. Yeah, of course. Paul Trusswell looking after the strategy on that 909. Right, so we're four hours into this race. Let's uh, take a, a quick check of where we're at. Of course, um, massive exclamation asterisk as to the results because uh, they're all on different strategies with different fuels and tyres. But it is Herbert who is 44 seconds ahead of Haas RT right now. They have a slender advantage over the first uh, of uh, the second of our Porsches uh, GT3 of IMSA LS Group Performance. Uh, and then the first of the GT Ams is the Ferrari of Rinaldi Racing in fourth overall. Fifth is third, uh, second in, uh, third in Pro-Am, Car Collections 23 with Hash Patel aboard right now. Uh, and then CP Racing up to sixth with Jutta 71 in seventh. And Red Camel's Jordan eighth overall and first of the 992s. Land Motorsport, the number 34 in ninth position. Then E2P Racing, GT Am. Uh, in 10th, 2nd in 992 is really motorsport by EB Motors. Would you believe they're still 2nd after bending their steering just a few moments ago? But they are under pressure now from the 903, Red Ant Racing 3rd in class, and HRT's, uh, sorry, the 929 HRT with Anthony Knees aboard right now, 4th in class, 13th overall. Their teammate, Gustav Bergstrom, talk about him in a second, uh, in 5th with Yuta Racing 72 in 15th overall, HRT Performance uh, G, uh, AM, 992 AM in 16th, 6th oh, uh, in class. GTX is led by the Huracan Super Trofeo of RD Signs with Hofer Racing uh, number 11 in 11th in class, 18th overall. Shura Sport, the number one with a puncture just a few moments ago, down in 12th now, 20th is the Red Ant 904. 907, RPM Racing, down in 21st. And then second in GTX is the KTM crossbow of Raison More Than Racing. With third in class, Mark V8, just 19 seconds back. And then Orchard Racing Team in 24th. Richardson Racing dropping to 25th. Uh, after a few issues earlier on and then the first the vortex is 26th with MRS starting from the pit lane down in 27th best GT4 28th overall Atlas BX Mercedes uh, with Sebastian Lejeune having some adventures out there in 29th the 702 vortex in 30th and then Escudia Fallon uh, in 6th in GTX 31st overall second GT4 is the Hoffer Racing by Bonk M4 GT4, 32nd. 33rd, NKPP by HRT with power steering issues, early doors. NM Racing have had their share of adventures as well, damage and a gravel trap visit in 34th. And then GSR, uh, Genetto, we haven't really seen much of that car, but 35th, 3rd in GT4. 4th in GT4, starting from the pit lane, and some half an hour back is our championship leaders in GT4. Bagheera, ZM Racing, 35th in class. In the TCE, it is Holmgaard ahead of Baz Kooten with Wolf Power Racing, 15 minutes back after having a change of drive shaft. So, one man I wanted to mention, because I've seen him about four times this weekend, but haven't spoken to him or spoken about him, Gustav Bergström, the 9.30 uh, 
plenty of Swedish and Scandinavian Porsche experience, but over two, year, two years ago decided to sack in circuit racing and to join the World Rallycross Championship for the electric era, where he partners Johan Christofferson, uh, the multiple champion. Christofferson himself doing a little bit of Creventic over the last couple of years. I noticed uh, his face on the wall of the hospitality, but Gustav Bergström uh, with us this weekend and part of one of three HRT Performance 992 Porsches, and he's just actually passed his teammate and moved up to fourth position. Uh, the 930 is Gustav, uh, and uh, they are 48 seconds back off the podium right now, but great um, support from HRT, a very, very strong German Carrera Cup team with three cars under their name and a fourth that they're running on behalf of remind me who's running the who they're running for the fourth car oh it's gone off my head now I hey, know, uh, uh, nkpp oh, of course of course they're all part of the same family in there in, yeah. the, in that garage aren't they and hrt oh they never come here with just one do they <laughs> they're always, clearly not they always got the ability to fill cars and and currently running fourth fifth and sixth uh, back to back not much in it really 13 seconds between the uh, the first of those HRT cars with Bergstrom at the wheel 13 14th and 15th overall Anthony Lee's in the second of those cars and then Maro Calamia uh, a name familiar with the 24 8 series he's in the third of those cars so fourth fifth and sixth certainly in contention just drop off the lead lap uh, as Yannick Redon now at the wheel of the 903 in third in 992 and then Sabino de Castro a uh, great job by Truss as you mentioned to get that 909 um, he has a tendency to understand what it takes to win these 24 hour races and these long distance races um, albeit in the 992 class and uh, it's not really rocket science Ben it's just about staying out on track isn't it quite frankly I if think you, you still have to. Track. You yeah. have to still read it in a certain yeah. way. Just trying to work out: has he actually got a? Has he got a full lap? I'm not sure they've got a full lap. Because Sabina Del Castro is in the uh, turn four five right now as uh, Evo comes over the line, so that is half a lap. But. My uh, timing screen suggests it's a lot longer than that. It, yeah, I th if it if it isn't a full lap, it'll be nigh on a lap because we've got the 909 on yeah, so 116. Yeah, exactly. So Evo's on 116. And the Vili Motorsport car on 115. And a, and a half a lap back from that. So I think it's a lap and a half that they've got advantage. Yep, def it's definitely more it's than huge. a lap, isn't it? It's yeah. huge. Yeah. They've picked that up well. Uh, the GTX battle, that's going the way of the RD Sainz Lamborghini. Josius Del Vidas at the wheel, and they are in contention for the championship still. Only eight points off the leader in the championship. So currently joined second with the RPM Racing Porsche. That's the overall European trophy that we're talking about. We have got... Uh, the class trophies as well to consider but we'll get more into that as we get towards well, I reckon the half stage I reckon tomorrow is a good time to start looking at championship well, permutations but, I know well, it's tonight actually to, well tonight we, we're going to be going off air at half distance so when we come back in the morning that'll wake us up won't it I have yes. to start doing some uh, mental arithmetic. Yeah, you know how we said we were just going to rock up 10 minutes before? Uh, maybe maybe yeah. an hour and 10 yeah, is maybe better. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And plenty of coffee. Oh, there's a Ginetta parked up at the exit of the final turn. Evo getting caught out there and having to tighten his line. Luckily, the Ginetta has got himself going again. I think there's been a little bit of a visit to the gravel trap. Here's a replay. And, oh, yes. And it's exa almost exactly the same as what happened to the Mercedes. Hass RT. <laughs> nearly getting caught out but uh, i think contact from the rd signs lamborghini and entering shot stage left but sideways was the ginetta thankfully though staying out of the gravel and getting back going again but there was contact for sure uh, well not actually for sure but 
I would expect there was contact between the Lamborghini and the Ginetta. Ginetta, of course, the mark that won this race overall back in 2017 when it was a, a round of the Touring Car Endurance Series. No GT cars in 2017. It was the G55 model, the car that we witnessed there. Not really then. a touring car. I know, and that, <laughs> that was the problem there, wasn't it? You know, we had a sports car winning uh, the Touring Car Endurance Series. Um, that was only a one-year thing. Um, I mean, this the history of this race, going back to 1998, was that it was a, tour, a race for touring cars and saloons and the like, with the, uh, the Seat Leon being the car of, uh, of choice, really. I think that... The latter stages of that. Isn't it weird that that's a pattern that I think you can see across lots of endurance motorsports? Look at the Spa 24 Hours. That started itself uh, as very much a touring car style and then a legitimate touring car race until... SRO took ownership and, and gave it to uh, GT category. But endurance and touring car racing, as we've seen in the 24 H series, has kind of disappeared. Even five years ago, we had grids of 30 odd TCR cars. And yes, we also had the GT cars, but we had people who wanted to go racing in touring cars. And that seems to have depleted the availability of the TCR car, perhaps. The Do you not think that's because the current touring car championships that we see? are for cars that are bespoke to their series. British Touring Cars, for instance. The, British the Touring Cars, yes. Yes, the, the regular TCR. But TCR T is a global championship. Yes, but the cars have evolved into the, spec the uh, specification for a sprint race. Yeah. So all of those components that we used to, that used to be so robust are now bespoke. So the suspension components, the drive shafts, the gearboxes have all become, have evolved into, into A, very expensive, and B, a, a kind of engineered for the sprint race format mm. and have become less of a car of choice. And that's why I see, I think we've seen TCRs, the TCR class in this series kind of drift away. Um, and we've had it on good authority. I remember Nick and I having a very interesting conversation with James Kerr about the cost of running an, an RS3 and everything had gone way up in price because the engineering on those TCR cars, the TCR spec cars, and just pick a manufacturer because they're all pretty much well, uh, they're the, the same. They're all bag, the, aren't they? Well, the three that we've got here are all manufactured by the same people yeah. and have the same chassis. It's just yeah. a different and, uh, bodywork over the top. And it'll be the same, it'll be the same running gear, the same drive shaft, yeah, same yeah. gearbox. And the price has gone up. And, the, and, and we've seen, dare I say, the robustness of the, of the, of the cars have kind of have come down with that because they're engineered for the sprint series format which you see throughout the world and um, i mean i would love to see you know in go, harking back to those days when we did have uh, healthy saloon car championships let's call them saloon car championships wouldn't it be great if we saw people from tcr uk entering their car into an endurance race on a weekend off. But if and, you could do it in a 992 Cup car, you should be able to do it in a TCR car. Really should. Yeah, good point. But the, the, the 992, the, the Porsche, you know, customer racing uh, with Porsche, it's always been renowned for just how bulletproof those cars are. That's why those series are so popular. And we see it here with uh, the most populated class of 13 cars in the 992 category forever growing and now bigger than the main GT class by one car, just a single car, but still it's an interesting fact. And when you can then rely upon someone like HRT who run those cars uh, in the Carrera Cup Deutschland series, and it'll be pretty much the same cars. It won't be that they have different cars for endurance and, and different cars for sprint. They will in part modify the sprint cars for the German, especially if this, let's say the German series is done and dusted. I don't know if it is or not. I'm sure it's not. But you could, in theory, just then transform your your uh, sprint car into an endurance car for the winter, ship it off to Q8, to Dubai, to Abu Dhabi, get all your new drivers well up to speed with the nuances of, of how the car feels. And so when they go back into the start of the European Carrera Cup series, all right, different tyres. A big effect. It's a big, it's a but massive thing. The car's thing. gonna, you're still gonna it's, have a great bit of active testing and lovely time hanging out in the Middle East over the winter. You know, you know what the systems are gonna be like from behind the wheel, aren't you? You know, you know where the switches are, yeah. the ergonomics of the car. 
Uh, but tyres are a big factor, actually. The uh, the Hankook tyre, completely different to, say, the Pirelli tyre that we see in other endurance series, very different to the Michelin tyre. Um, and so the car set up stiffer. So, you know, I've, I've heard from teams that it's kind of a pointless exercise other than driver time, other than, you know, client time, client by client, I mean driver, teams are, you know, teams' clients are the drivers and they'll go where the clients want to go. And if, you know, all right, the team's not going to learn anything regarding setup for their national uh, Carrera Cup series, but they are going to get a lot of race time and a lot of driving experience yeah. if that's what your driver's objective is. So I see your point. I like the idea. So let's go off to the Middle East. Yeah. Let's <laughs> let's do that. Let's I, go. I think you will be. Let's, yeah. <laughs> that means the team. Oh, yeah, but hang on. We need a bit of money to do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's the floor to the plan, Ben, oh, right yeah. there. Yes. One of these days, I'll have a company... You're still saying the same thing, age 60. Mate, I, mate, I tell you what. <laughs> One of these days, I, I, we I to fear, do it. I fear winning the lottery, because if I win the lottery, it's going to have to be 200 million. Because <laughs> an LMP program is going to cost what? That's a that's a three-year program, oh, isn't well, it? I think I think you're a bit past an LMP program. <laughs> I, I want to be on the pit wall. Oh right, I okay. just want to be there, mate. Oh, that's all right. Any that much yeah, money? Yeah. All you need to do is meet somebody who can who can stump up the cost. <laughs> you're just a team oh, manager. Oh, that's easy then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could do that now then. Just come, uh, you need to come to my house. It, you you can bump to... into loads of people like that. Yeah, you clearly, you're <laughs> in that bar that you were telling us your dad was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, let's get back to the race. Huh? Uh, we have, uh, we're inside the final 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, 20 oh, hours, wait. I wish. Inside uh, the 20 final 20 hours. hours. That's a beautiful way of yes, putting it. Yes, rather it than is. just over four hours. It was a slip, gone. a slip of the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> we are inside the fa the last 20 hours of this race <laughs> so we're, we're just you know what it, it develops in such a way doesn't it a, a long distance race does develop we're having the ferrari come back into the four it's only four and a half seconds behind the imza ls group porsche in second place uh however ahead of that imza group porsche the herbeth car is eking out a bit of a gap it's over 61 seconds now almost 62 seconds and we've seen that not coming down if anything it's extending and that's what we've seen the herbert team do with a, their race strategy and and their driver lineup is very very strong even their arms are very experienced and strong so i'm not sure whether anyone in that lineup out there at the moment has got the pace to maybe challenge for that herbert car going off into the lead what i want to be looking at is the battle for second because Torsten Kratz is able to lap that Ferrari in the 46s uh, and we've seen that not very many people able to do that actually Phil Quaife was in the 45s the last uh, time through so in CP racing he's the he's the pro in CP racing uh, for this weekend and uh, so he's the fastest man out on circuit but Lauren Hergon in the IMSA LS Group Performance Porsche is being caught by Torsten Kratz and I think the gap is coming down only by half a second on that last lap, but it's going to get close uh, between those two. And, and they're not massively different in pace. It's not going to be just a drive past and head off into the distance. I think it's going to be an interesting fight. There is the Ferrari, Torsten Kratz aboard that car. Last lap was a 49.8, so he got caught in traffic. But look ahead of him, and there is a black Porsche just there going down the inside of one of the Utah Racing Audis. Lauren Hergon aboard that car. He is LS Group. Uh, he, is, he runs a company which helps develop Renault Sports uh, motor racing vehicles, including the Alpine, the little Alpine, and usually is a mentor in that championship and races in GT4 Europe in an Alpine. To me, he's always Mr. Renault, Mr. Alpine, but this weekend he's uh, driving and has his team associated to Porsche. Uh, and, uh, is, but he's being caught. You mentioned Phil Quiff. Hmm. Interesting to uh, hear chat to Phil Quiff in the in catering, and he'd actually forgotten he'd won this race back in 20, <laughs> 20, 2012 in a McLaren, which he shared with uh, Adam Christodoulou, Klaus Hummel, Hummel, and Tim Mullen. Remember Tim Mullen? He was a McLaren works driver, wasn't he? I'm not sure what. I, we never hear Tim's name now, do we? He went off to Asia, and he was doing a, a lot in Porsche Carrera Cup Asia. No. I'm thinking of somebody else. Um, Timberland's still working behind the scenes 
at McLaren Trophy. Yes, yeah, I yeah, think. probably. The McLaren MP4, I mean, MP412, it was the first GT3 spec car out of that McLaren, out, out of McLaren, wasn't it? And very popular car at one point. Very rarely see a McLaren in a, in a, in a series like this. We have had the McLaren out in GT4. But uh, yeah, Phil Quiff in the CP car and currently fifth overall. Bit of uh, quite space developing in between our runners now, apart from that battle for second and third. 992, class evil breakers, as we've said, well over a lap ahead of the Vili car, the Vili Motorsports car, and the Red Ant car. That's the 955 numbered car, Sabino de Castro and Yannick Redont in the Red Ant Racing 903. And just behind that car, Gustav Bergström in the first of the HRT cars, beginning to pull away from his teammates now and has pulled out a bit of a gap. According to Driver DB, the last time Tim Mullen raced was in 2014. Oh, as long ago as that. Yeah. A, if I was to say to you, that's almost 10 years. I know, it's scary, eh? Yeah, very. But he is getting close to a significant age in which he will be downgraded to an AM. Uh, and therefore might have a comeback. It's funny how many drivers Probably will. have a 50-year-old yeah. comeback. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good to see him. The RPM racing in the Crone Racing Green, they've had a bit of a torrid weekend so far. Hopefully they'll have a, a race that'll run unhindered. The 907 car currently 19th overall but seventh of the 992 class and that car had to be completely rebuilt after a practice accident tracy crone at the wheel of that car getting punted off and helped off but it's great to see that car now out there and circling philip hamprecht at the wheel we've had a change of pit reporter with nick damon taking a break we've uh, exchanged him for diana binks who's down in the pit lane now diana what have you got for us I'm with the 702 Vortex team, and uh, I've got three people to talk to here because Philippe has just jumped out of the car, and he's not comfortable that his uh, English is good enough. But I did say to him, we could do it in Scottish if you want, and he laughed, so we'll have a go. <laughs> Philippe, obviously you've been out uh, during your stint. How did you find it, and what challenges did you have to face? Um. It's no problem, no problem. Um, las ruedas traseras, ashes. It was a, a really challenging stint because like the wheels were kind of like used. Uh, so it was tough, it was really hot and it was not the best thing for him. This is Philippe's daughter, by the way, who's doing our, our translation. Look, we just want to include you because you're part of this race and it's important to know what what your race is like. Are they satisfied of where they are at this point in the race? I know there's 20 hours still to go. She's also, she's also part of the team. She can respond. Yes, of course, it's very, it's very good, uh, very happy. Perfect, perfect, perfect. You always, uh, you always come with a, a lot of people, good team of people here who seem to work incredibly hard during a race weekend. How challenging is it for everyone? Yes, of course. Joanna. Joanna. I said there's always a big team of people here with Vortex. We run yeah. lots of cars. The team work incredibly hard all, all over the whole weekend. Yeah. How challenging is it for everyone behind the scenes? Okay. Et ça parle un petit peu plus pour les mécaniciens, parce que Vortex est une des plus grandes équipes en, en, en construction, etc. Donc, ils veulent savoir comment difficile est pour eux que ces motos se enfrentent, basiquement. C'est une famille de passionnés. C'est une famille passionnée. Ils ont été tellement passionnés. Ils ont été tellement passionnés. Ils ont été tellement passionnés. And the families that are together within also the race are as passionate as them. Thank you so much for helping. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philippe.
That was Philip and his daughter here from the Vortex team. I mean, it's difficult sometimes, doesn't it? We just, you know, if the, the language is not English, it's not easy. But it's really important to hear from the teams like the Vortex team who've been quite consistent and been in this championship for some time. It's, I would say it's very important. Vortex are a, a stalwart of this series, those small bespoke uh, mid-engined prototypes is the only way I can describe them. They're a tube frame uh, chassis with a huge Chevrolet, over 6.2 litres of Chevrolet power strapped to your backside, quite literally, in that car. However, the new car's not space frame, is it, Ben? We no. saw that unveiled yesterday, and it's a full carbon tub. And we're hoping to get a bit of a piece for you later on tonight if we can get the car into one of the garages out, out at the back of the paddock. So our cameras don't wait till don't that too late because it's, it's carbon fiber be dark. black. Yes, so it is. It might disappear a little bit yeah. into the, the night sky. I certainly, it certainly looks the part. It reminds me of an old Grand Am Daytona prototype. Uh, if, you squint, stubby. if you squint, it could well be. It's, it's got good. the same stubbiness as the Vortex. One point zero. But it's got some very interesting aero styling at the back, and and the car has been and done some yes. wind wind tunnel yep. development work on the car. Um, it's a lot prettier from behind. Yes, yes. I, I I mean, all right. The Vortex team have won Spirit of the Race award in the past. For me, the Vortex team should perhaps win the spirit of the race award every race yes. because they show some great spirit to keep those cars going round and round um, uh, what the new car might bring is a different level I think they've certainly just looking at it the Vortex V8 team are going to step up that next level it'll run in the GTX class of course because it's not under any kind of homologation rules it will also be a completely separate challenge for the mechanics to work on the, the days of, of the of the the, days of the, the, angle, the angle grinder and the, and the TIG grinder. welder, yeah. yes, uh, uh, maybe over. Yeah. We, we, we saw three different personalities in that interview with Diana, uh, and the middle one, Selene, uh, is also on the entry list as a driver, uh, as daughter to um, Lionel Amarouche, uh, who is long time, well, one of the partners uh, of the uh, Vortex organization, and Selene will be driving today as well it was interesting philip growl there actually speaking spanish so i think although he's got a french nationality probably not far from here the team is based near marseille it's it's south of france and right. actually we're only a couple of hours from the border here in barcelona yeah, yeah. Uh, and so kind of as much of a home race here as uh, as paul ricard perhaps would be uh, and in this area of uh, the Pyrenees and French and Spanish borders, There's plenty of areas that kind of have this crossover language uh, where the border has always been flexible, let's say. Doesn't happen in the UK. Border can't be flexible in the UK. There's water around it. But for most of Europe, borders well, between countries have kind of varied well, quite. What you're talking about, we speak a different language in the north and the south of the United well, Kingdom. Okay, so, and then uh, let's even talk about Scotland and Wales. Well, yes. <laughs> There's a Ferrari, right, second position. Uh, last lap was slower um, than Alfa Renauer, but what he has done during that interview has passed uh, the Porsche, the Porsche there just behind. So Laurent Hergon has lost his second position. And now just needs to see if he can hold on uh, to Torsten Kratz. Been running uh, without code 60 for a while. 40, uh, 33 minutes Torsten Kratz has been behind the wheel of that car, as, uh, as has Lauren Hergon. They part pitted and changed at the same time. So still got half a stint remaining on tyres and on cars. The question is, now having cleared the cars ahead of him, that is in the field, can Kratz make an impression on that Herbert Porsche? Ah, but Alfred's got so, such yeah, pace, hasn't he? Has. Well, well, you know what? Last time through, 46.3 for Alfred Reynauer, 46.7 for Torsten Kratz. So perhaps coming together now, lap time-wise, 47.4 for Reynauer. 
and then in a, just over a minute. Just following the uh, Atlas BX Motorsport 403, remember I reported uh, in that last Code 60 that he tagged uh, the back of the 72 Audi. Well, he has been given a 15-second penalty for that uh, tiny tag. It, you would not call it an unsafe release. He just misjudged the length of the bonnet of the uh, Mercedes and just lightly tagged the back of the car so that it ripped off a little bit of a pan on the 72. But he has been given 15-second penalty uh, for that little infraction, which is, I, I feel, unlucky for Atlas BX. Yeah, he probably he probably thought he was free. He threw, he was so close. It wouldn't, it? it wouldn't have even felt it. Yeah, yeah. He Probably wouldn't not. have even felt it. We've got a little bit of uh, detritus being dragged around by our Ferrari chasing down Herbert. A little bit of a plastic bag fluttering. The driver will be completely and utterly unaware of that, of course. Absolutely. And it will not be affecting anything on the car, so it's just basically aesthetically unpleasing at the moment. <laughs> uh, 1 minute and 11 is the gap between first and second. 147.4 was the lap time by Alfred Renauer. 148.4, so a full second quicker than the Ferrari that uh, Alfred Renauer pulled out. At TCE, we haven't mentioned TCE. Now, TCE is being led by the Home Guard team. Tom Clute in at the wheel of the 102. Now, championship wise, the TCE battle is going to come down to, I'm just trying to find it, the TCE trophy is very much in the hands of Holmgard. If they finish in this position, in the lead, if, in fact, I've, I've been told, even if they just finish the first 12 hours, they've clinched the European trophy for the Touring Car Endurance Series. And this, this year, we'll see the final running of the Touring Car Endurance Series. It won't continue into 2024. It'll be coming back as it was before we split the GT trophy and the Touring Car Endurance Series trophy. Before we split it, it was all just one big race with the mix of classes. We go back to that. We'll still have the Touring Car Endurance Series classes. However, it'll just be in the same race rather than two races in, in one as we've got now. So still all to play for, and it's easy for me to say, if you just stay there until midnight tonight, you're going to pick up the Endurance Series European Trophy. Well, we've still got to go round and round, and right now they are doing that. They're going round and round. They're Cooper Leon Competition, leading the TCE category from the Cooper, Cooper TCR of Bascoot. Christian Frankenhut, the driver at the wheel of the 125. Now, Christian, a big name from this series from uh, a few years ago. He was one of the main drivers with the Hofer team. He shared the car with Chantal, Michael, and uh, Kenneth. Kenneth Heyer was a Kenneth Heyer was a another stalwart of that team. Uh, he's been missing in action as Christian Frankenhut, but a very, very, very strong driver there and. He's back out in unfamiliar territory there in the front wheel drive Cupra of Baskuten. But no doubt this will probably just whet his appetite, won't it, to get back into the series proper and, and do a full, a full championship, perhaps. Hass RT just behind the 91 that we're following, which is our lead at Herbert Motorsport. And a Haas RT car just behind there means that they have lost now a full lap to the leader. Haas RT are fourth. So can you believe that Renau Alfred Renauer, Herbert Motorsport, have put a full lap after just four hours of racing between themselves and fourth position? And they only have 35 seconds to do that to third spot. That is, you know, if we do go into a safety car period, which is very unlikely uh, in this kind of, uh, well, this championship in the 24H series because of the Code 60 regulations. Uh, but a full lap is nearly two minutes. Mm. Such as the pace and the way that things have fallen. Ferrari, though, is now in the pits. Torsten Kratz has come in, and I think he has completely avoided the fuel bay. 
comes into the pits. He's up just underneath us uh, in box number five. And this doesn't look like a routine stop for the Ferrari. There is no tyres ready. They're looking around the car. Diana needs to hot foot up there because I think there's something going on with our third place and our leader in GTM. Yes, um, I'm not sure if Dai is down there. Let's. No, I can't see it. But that's definitely, if the car's just gone through and not refueled, that's always a bad sign, Ben, especially well. But then no one's even touching anything. Uh, let's head down to the pits now. Dai's ready for us. And we'll head down to Diana Binks in the pits now. What's happening down there, Dai? Joe, I'm not, uh, I'm not across the Ferrari as yet because I was just in the middle of chatting to Ben uh, here from HRT, the 929 car. Ben is the engineer for the car, so I wanted just to have a quick chat with him first and then I'll go and find out what the story is with the uh, third place runner at the moment. Ben, you're, you're the engineer for the number 929. We're sort of four hours plus into this race. What's been the biggest challenge for you so far? I think uh, everyone feels the heat. It's a uh, race starts at uh, midday, so uh, the first stints are heavy because of the heat. We saw some drivers already very exhausted come out of the car. I think we survived that time now, and it's getting to the night, getting a little colder, better for the tires, less under, obviously under slow, better car handling, and I think that was the biggest part for the beginning. We talked to one of the drivers earlier on, and they had a power steering issue. I mean, obviously that's something they've just got to live with. Yeah, it depends. Uh, sometimes we have soft alarms, which are not that critical. Uh, if it gets a hard alarm, then uh, yeah, we have to probably recalibrate it. But for the moment in my car, we had it twice or three times. It was a soft alarm, so it disappears after one or two turns and it's fine. Uh, it happens when you have four cars and uh, it happens on one or the other car, but uh, that's 24 hours. Are you satisfied with how the strategy is playing out for you at this point? I was unlucky with the long code 60 uh, time just, uh, I think, uh, like half an hour ago. But up to there, it was fine. But, uh, yeah, I missed the opportunity. It could have been uh, five laps later. How much are you sort of in communication with the driver while he's behind the wheel? Um, I'm trying. I mean, we have the radio communication. I have telemetry. I have, uh, before a stint, I talk to them like uh, one, two minutes, giving them advice about the driver getting out of the car. So... Uh, I have a good team this time, a good car, good driver, so then it's easy to communicate. And how much will the strategy plan change between now, going into the night stage and coming back into the daylight again? Yeah, it's difficult to say now. I have a, we have all a run plan for the 24 hours completely. We know exactly what we do. We need to adjust it uh, depending on the situations, depending on car, behavior of, of drivers. Also, the speed of the drivers is important uh, if you're getting a little bit earlier out or in. So difficult to say now what happens in the morning. I'm happy to know what happens when you go into the night. And I'm assuming you don't get any sleep. Uh, not for me. <laughs> but I'm used to it. It's my 25th, 24 hour race, so I know how to handle it. Ben, thanks so much for chatting to us. We'll, we'll come and find you in the night time and see how you're doing. Thank you. Bye. Joe, I will now go and see what I can find out um, about the Ferrari that you said had just come in. But, but that was Ben here with HR2, just giving us a little bit of insight as to, to what he's doing. Amazing, so many 24-hour races. Yeah, great insight there from the HRT engineer. Die will hot foot it down there. Ben, I think you said that the Ferrari's been pushed into its box. Ferrari is in the box. Uh, from where I can see, I can only see the front end of the car. The lights were still on. It, the car has now been powered off. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any work on the front end of the car. It's all on the back end of the car. Uh, but this is a real concern. They had great pace. Torsten Kratz was doing such a good job. Uh, interestingly, Haas RT also in the pits right now from fourth position. Uh, and they are getting a full, proper tank uh, of fuel. Uh, and I think Alfred Renault will need to do the same pretty soon because uh, they were also in at a similar time. It's obviously very difficult to know how much fuel was in the car before it that, fueled yeah, last that, time. That's always tricky for us, isn't <laughs> it? We don't know what, how much fuel was in the car when they've come in and, and replenished the fuel. I, I always like the term replenish rather than fill because we don't know. We well, just no, don't know. No, no, because you're not f to, to fill. No, to fill is OK, but... Well, that, that, sort of, uh, that sort of implies that it's full. full. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and the, the, team, the teams are actually... All right, I can hear everybody at home saying, well, just ask the teams. 
teams don't want to tell us that. We, and can, a, we, we, we quickly lose we quickly lose track of, of how much time the cars have have gone into the pits. Um, so Dai is down there with the Ferrari now. Shall we head down to her? What's going on though, Dai? Yeah. down here and it looks like they've been they've obviously plugged in to have a look and see what's going on but the driver has stayed behind the wheel as you can I'm sure you can see if you're watching in vision but if you're just listening the driver hasn't got out of the car that doesn't as much as they've come in and put the car into the garage there's not any frantic uh, running around the car at the moment so they're busy in discussion. I have tried to ask them, but obviously it's not the appropriate moment. But um, if you just bear with me, then I will, as soon as I get an opportunity, will do. But as I said, there's no, there's no rushing around panic here. There's actually a few scratched heads, I believe. Joe, these are the worst kind of problems, uh, aren't they? When you, uh, when you can see is. something bent, it's good. It's yeah, easy to yeah. fix. It's horrible when you have to plug in a laptop and try and work out what sensor is telling you the car is not working when it probably is. If the glitch is a sensor, then sensors can just think, yeah, I'm, not just, I'm, not, I'm just not going to work for the next 30 seconds. It's going to put up a, 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 a problem, a fault, it'll give you a fault code, you'll then clear it, and then you, know, you sometimes have to then send the car back out and see whether the fault code recurs. And it's just a, a voyage of discoverance. But this is really, really tragic at such an early stage for that Ferrari. The Ferrari's been really strong. Pace-wise, you know, the Ferrari 296, we know how quick that car is. We know how good the Rinaldi racing team is in running that car. The driver lineup they've put together, they were, you know, they weren't coming here to take part. They were coming here to win the race. And, you know, by all accounts, it looked very much like that was a possibility, a very strong possibility. However, just ebbing away from them all the time that that car is in that pit garage, and it still is in the pit garage, that Herbeth car is just going away, it's heading away from it. These feel like qualifying laps from Alfred Renauer. That was a 46-0. Uh, Bearing in mind the car's best is a 44-8. He's only just over a second slower than the ultimate pace of that car during race conditions and the way he was leaving lines around the circuit and using every inch of the tarmac and more he's at the end of his stint he's a light on tires he's probably light on fuel as well uh, and he's really trying to lay down as much of an advantage over lauren hergon who's now inherited uh, second place once more would you believe cp racing who've had a very quiet day so far are up to third now incredible that isn't it <laughs> incredible uh, how they've just snuck up on us and phil quaif has just uh, passed hash in the uh, car collection uh, number 23 that was there and thereabouts in the early running that is hash patel by the way but known as hash uh, we can see on the screen that the ferrari is heading back out but has the control up delete a laptop fix worked that is the question because you never quite know you might have cleared your errors but you never never know yes diana So we'll have to keep an and eye on that. Did they give one. any indication of what they mean by that? Is it is it a, a, a gear change issue? Are they seeing high temperatures, or are they being a bit sort of discreet with when you know just telling you the basics? Yeah, yeah, just the basics. They were not. They were actually um, looking for us to leave the garage at one point, so we could only get so much. Yeah, we think. It, I mean, you can appreciate it, yeah. can't you? It's frantic. They're all trying to. Although they were quite calm, which was the thing, and they did plug in. And, and have a look but driver change said it's gearbox related and it's probably in there maybe three four minutes if they think it's gearbox related then they will know it's gearbox related because they won't be able to go up or down the gearbox unless they can't do that because it's clutch related but ultimately the issue i would read into that is that they are stuck in a gear and whether that's gearbox fault sensor fault clutch fault it's still that is the problem actuator fault uh, yeah Looking remember, at the, it, remember, it's paddle shift, it's not mechanical. But still looking at the Just pace of the, the car switch. going out of the pits there, 
he didn't accelerate up to top speed, did he? No. Now it's seeing that the driver is Isaac Tutumalu Lopez. Oh, but he was uh, last time. Yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been we've been taught, we've been frauded with this. I, I suspect it might be. Um, so the drivers put the right, flick the uh, the switch to the right uh, to the right point, and it's giving us uh, the driver of that Ferrari. He's um, he's left the garage. He's out on his outlap, and we'll be able to quickly tell you whether or not he's up to pace. He's dropped to 16th overall in that time. He's on 134 laps. He's dropped five laps to the Renault leading Porsche. So that is. All right, we've got, what, 19 hours, 15 to go, plenty of time to make up five laps, but not at the pace that we can see the leaders producing. And it's going to be, you know, tenths of seconds here, half a second here, half a second there, but certainly not enough time in that space of time to make up five laps. So is this a Ferrari at top speed? Is this a Ferrari heading back to the pits? By the looks of the lack of use of racing line, he sits in the middle of the road and gets out of the way of the Utah Racing Audi. I say that Ferrari is coming back to Diana in the pits, pulls yes, off is. to the right-hand side, so the fix they thought they had done has not worked. And they are going to need to plug that laptop in again and see if they can do something else. Now, if they were Porsche, there would be pro Porsche representatives crawling all over the car uh, that know the cars inside out. There are representatives from manufacturers to help out teams. I don't know whether Ferrari have that same level of attention to their customers that certainly Audi would and Porsche would as well. Uh, and what you see and experience in Mercedes uh, here in the paddock. Anyone with a laptop in Ferrari gear. Well, not you don't necessarily see them in Ferrari gear. They uh, could well be in team wear. For instance, when we were in touring cars, my engine guy was an RML engine guy. However, he wore my team gear. Okay. So, you know, we paid for him Undercover. to be... Uh, we, yes, yeah, basically. Just looks like part of the team. Yeah. He is part of the team because he's with you all season. Um, so that that might be the case. I'd like to think so. I mean, have you seen the cost of those 296 <laughs> Ferraris? I'd like to see, you know, the, 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 the team of technicians come with it well the uh, the team is a swiss german team wtm rinaldi i suppose is italian yeah I'm and Rina rinaldi have been connected to ferrari for a long time yeah i was about to say listen for the italian accent and you might be able to yeah. in in the midst of the germans and the uh, and the swiss you'll be able to hear it but not if there's rinaldi's in there as well uh, diana you got more news Yes, I'm back at uh, the number five, and uh, quite correct. Obviously, you can see that there's still an issue. You've just you've just jumped out of the car. We could see there was some problems there. What, how, can you explain to us what was happening? Yeah, something with the gearbox went, went wrong. Um, we don't know exactly what. I think there's still an issue. I, I'm not sure. Uh, so I I uh, shifted up, and then finally the, the gearbox stuck between two gears, and, and, and there was one gear in, but I wasn't able to shift. Uh, so we, we tried to change the, the steering wheel, but this was not the issue. Then they tried to thumb to do something, and suddenly it, it shifted up again here in the pit. So we tried it. I'm not sure if it's running well now. It's a pity because we uh, we had a good pace after the, the bad luck we already had in the second stint. Uh, so I was able to catch up from P4 to P2, and we were gaining. Uh, but this is part of the game, so but it's not over now. So the, the car, they're going to make their way back in, and are they going to bring it back into the garage? Yeah, it, it seems like, yeah, there it is, there it is. So it's uh, still not okay. I don't know, let's see. Uh, hopefully it will not take too long, so that we have still some time to gain some positions back. It's frustrating, but I guess you've got to wait and see what you can do before. Yeah, of course, it's, it's frustrating. But again, it's, it's not over, you know? We will, not, we will not stop fighting, and uh, there is still a lot of hours to go. So let's see what they do. It. Thank you. Thank you. We saw the car fuel up at the fuel bowser, but getting away from the fuel bowser seemed a real struggle, like it wasn't in the right gear. Like it was in fourth or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Peter off the fuel pump and make its way onto the pit and apron. Of course, if you're in that situation with an old uh, spec car, you could clutch slip. That's right. But you can't clutch slip with a car that doesn't have a clutch. Yeah. But presumably it's kind of automatically clutch-lipping to help you 
You're just putting your foot on the accelerator going and saying, go, go, go. It's not a two-pedal configuration on that 296, is it? It's, you, it you, you, have, you have got a clutch have pedal you? to pick away, and then, and okay. then the paddle shift allows you... You don't need the clutch because it'll, be it'll be an ignition cut as you pull the gear. And then same with the downshift. I would have thought it would only so have so That's kind of like a semi-automatic then, isn't yeah. it? To one for Nick to find out. Well, no, I mean, actually, I've stuck my nose in enough GT3 cars. I actually should know that. Two pedals or three, Bruce? Three, four. <laughs> oh, yeah. One Thanks. for the front brakes, one for the rears. Oh, yeah. Nick, Nick can find out whether or not that, certainly the, the Ferrari 296, the car we're talking about, whether or not it's a two-pedal or a three-pedal configuration, the clutch being used to pick a whip. Um, he can, I'm sure you use Nick, your Nick's, hands. Nick's fine with sticking his head in places where he's not wanted. Remember, in endurance racing, you don't tend to have race starts as That's standing right. starts, so you don't That's necessarily right. need a foot pedal. No, you, you only. I really, think it's. I think it's. A, I think it's a hand. The only reason you. The only reason you need a clutch pedal in, in any form, even with a crash box, even with an old stick shift, is to get away. I mean, in the wet, you never even you never used the clutch in the wet in a Formula Ford because it upset the balance. When you dip the clutch, you would wreck mm. the balance mm. of the car. So you try and downshift without the clutch. You could you can do it if you get the timing right, if you're clever enough. Do you know what? It's something I've always assumed but never known, and I'm now going to have to go and find out. We're not on. We're, we're stopping soon, aren't we? Yes, Let's we are. Let's go and stick Nine our minutes. nose in a car and find out. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's only two pedals in most. GT3 cars, yeah, it's not I all. I know, you got me thinking now. Yeah. Ah, talk amongst yourselves. I know someone who'll be... Able to we're, we're off in five minutes, it's fine, I think. Yes, we are. Yeah. We'll have to break up Johnny Palmer. Be asleep on we'll the bench outside again. Is he really <laughs> having a little nap, is he? Who knows? Here's Sabina De Castro, last time out, uh, was the start of the race, where he started in the lead in 992 and dropped down to fourth, inherits the car second, would you believe, in class, and actually, at present, 56 seconds off the lead. So they have gained time, but that might be a false positive, depending on if they owe us a pit stop or not. Let's have a look. No, they are on a similar strategy, Brute Broikers and Sabini De Castro. And so, actually, the 955 has done an amazing job in this last stint to get back onto the lap of Evo Breukers. Because uh, well, last time we checked in with them, there was over, we thought there was a lap and a half difference between the two of them. And it's down to definitely half a lap. Now, with uh, Yannick Redant in the 903 sitting third in that class. And now Gustav Bergström with a great stint up to fourth in the HRT performance, leaving the two teammates in HRT behind. And getting back, I wonder if this is the first time back for him to circuit racing. As I mentioned earlier, been uh, doing rallycross. His championship, of course, stopping due to the fact that uh, Sebastian Loeb's uh, Lancia De Delta Integrale caught a light on its own at Lydon Hill in the middle of July. Yeah, that was big news, wasn't uh, it? Setting, setting the whole of the uh, Guerlain Shishri team's car, other car and paddock alight, uh, cancelling the next round and the next round after that of the World Championship because... Why, why, was it all, why did it all just come to work? Because there's no guarantee of safety under the battery. The, Is fact, that the right? battery, Is that, yeah. the car was charging, suddenly it was alight, and because of the heat, so then it sets the other car alight. All the other electric cars had to quickly be moved away. And there is no guarantees on the safety from the FIA and also the, the battery manufacturer that it won't happen again. So they haven't been allowed to go racing since. And, uh, and so two rounds of that championship cancelled. And therefore, Gustav Bergström, without the ability, his car's fine, it's sitting in uh, Sweden, no doubt, but with the ability not to go racing mm. until they restart the championship in South Africa in a few weeks' time and using that... a different car. Right, so that is this, that is happening. They've done something with regards to with the a, re with a recharging. One, nope, using a completely separate car, using effectively, think of Formula One. Formula One car is deemed unsafe, but we need to carry on racing, so we're going to use Formula Two cars. That's what's happening in Rallycross right. at the end of the season. Right. One make... And so they're all one. They're using one make RX2e cars, 
uh, to finish off the championship. Two but rounds in South Africa, two rounds in China. But the same recharging process. Uh, but di completely different manufacture of car, and therefore different battery and oh, all the rest of it. So the RX2e car is safe, by, deemed by the FIA, but the RX1e car hasn't got those guarantees. Remarkable bit of uh, motorsport things going on. Yeah, if you, really If is. you like the politics and you like all the backstories, uh, the World RX has been tumulus the last couple of years. It's been very tricky for them. So Nick's done something Nick, really Nick's, clever. Nick's either just sworn he, at he's, me. He's used <laughs> Google. Oh, yes. And that's a Ferrari 296 with a, with a two-pedal configuration and a hand clutch, is it, Nick? Yeah. You found out that there's a hand clutch on there. Have you seen how many switches are in that cockpit? There's about 47 different modes that you can put that car in. And, uh, and so thank two you, pedals. Thank you to Limited Running, at Limited Running on Twitter, Ian McCarthy, always with us. Uh, and he's just sent the sales brochure of the Ferrari to us as well. Two pedals. Pretty much two pedals. I'm being told three. You only need the clutch to pull away only. What? So it depend right, so depends on the car, then. In fairness, the question was in GT3 these days. Okay. So we were specific there with the 296 Ferrari. Yeah. yeah. KTM has two pedals from memory. KTM? Is my, my source. Yeah. Well, as in the GT The, the crossbar. The G yeah. So we've got we've got uh, we've got people. Other people are messaging other people as well. <laughs> so we'll get an overall view I, on this. I just think the GT just makes it's a GT2 car. A GT3 car is a, a race machine. One foot, one foot per pedal. So therefore, you've got two feet. So How two do you pedals. pull away though? You just put your foot on the accelerator. So it's semi-automatic. So it's a semi-automatic. Yeah. With you select set, first because I know you can. You select first and stay stationary, and then accelerate away. Okay. And the car goes. And of course, you don't need it from a from a standing start because we have rolling starts in yeah. GT3 racing. Yeah, yeah. So it's only pit yeah. stops. Right, the Ferrari heading back out onto circuit once more. Have they fixed it this time? It's all rather unravelling, though, which is a real shame because the pace of that car was ferocious at the head of the field. I absolutely hope they have because this is going to be quite fascinating to see this car now in what will be a recovery drive. Is as that we've, a red got, we've got a Porsche stopped out on the track. That could well be the 903. Now, the 903 of Yannick Redont was third in class. Turn nine, so let's have a look. Lost it coming through turn nine on its own very early on and is off into the kind of the motor, motorbike section of that circuit. Ah, he's regained. It was Yannick Redont in the 903. <coughs> and so. Uh, but yes, that was second, third in class, wasn't it? So that would have yeah. lost that third in class to Gustav Bergström. It wasn't far away. Odd one. Kind of just lent on the rear of the car and it didn't stick. Thankfully, the uh, thankfully there's lots of runoff there on the outside of nine. And he's resumed, pulled back on the track, and he's back into the race. Okay. The Ferrari of the Wokkerspiegel team, Monschau team, the number 22, was going round at what looked like race pace. So that gearbox glitch has rectified itself. Whatever the team have done, they've done a good job on doing whatever, change of sensor. Thankfully, it wasn't, or it doesn't appear to be, the actual mechanism of the gearbox itself. Look how busy. Very the, busy fueling area. And now, is that them looking at what was going on with uh, the Red Ant car and preempting a Code 60, which is obviously ah. not going to happen? Or I feel as though looking at strategy, we are a bit early, but no, we're not, actually. Alpha Renault an hour and ten, uh, so that makes sense that the leader has come into the pits and Laurent Hergon has followed him in from second position uh, with an hour in their stint, uh, even though they did uh, two pit stops. So that puts, would you believe, Philip Quaife into second in this race uh, for CP Racing. He owes us a pit stop as well. It won't be there for very long, uh, as does Hash in fourth position uh, in the car collection Porsche. There's another Porsche for car collection sitting in the paddock, would you believe? So we go, we go like, oh, well, the car collection do Audis. They've got more Porsches here than they do Audis this weekend. 
and it's available. It says in the window, available for hire. You know, like when you drive down the street, it says car for sale, call yes. this number. Yeah. Pretty much that. Have you already made inquiries? <laughs> yeah. Known you as we do. Apparently, I haven't got money. Uh, CP Racing, all right, they started what I would say out of position because yeah. of the truncated qualifying. So they've done a cracking job there, strategy coming to the fore. And with Phil Quiff now at the wheel, bringing that car through the field in the last four and a half hours, the car, well, five hours actually, because we're just clicking towards the top of the hour. So it's took them five hours to get in contention for what will be an overall winner here at this rate. Fabulous, fabulous endurance racing from the CP Racing team as ever. Whatever happened to Yannick Redon, it's uh, not affecting his pace. He's back underway again and he did lose that third position but only now 10 seconds behind Gustav Bergström uh, and back under full pace. There might be a little bit of damage to the tyre uh, on the 903 but I think they will be joining us in pit lane uh, soon enough. I'm not quite sure why I haven't got that car highlighted but uh, I will highlight it now. And yeah, an hour and 15 minutes that car has been running without pit stops. So uh, it will be coming soon, I imagine. We're having our next pit stop here in the booth. Um, myself and Joe Bradley taking our next break. And it is uh, Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones taking you through the next two hours. Thank you very much, Ben. We'll leave you and Joe to go and look in the footwells of all the cars up and down the pit lane and we'll count, find out what the average number of pedals is when you come up next in two hours' time. But thank you for leaving the race safely for us to take you through for the next two hours from five o'clock local time until what I call supper time, seven o'clock. So don't be late when you come back to relieve us because the food absolutely fantastic here at the circuit. But CP Racing leading the way, as you say, but owing a pit stop. So Phil Quaife. Looked on good form in crew catering earlier today and uh, now leading this event. But the real story of the last half hour or so has been the decline of the Ferrari. It was leading when we clocked off two hours ago. Isaac Tatumlu uh, out on the track, but the car way, way down the order now. Listed in 28th position. That's 28th out of 39 positions. So things have kept on changing. The car that's still bringing up the rear, but it's only a lap behind its closest rival now is the Bagheera ZM Racing Mercedes running in the GT4 class. They got away about... I know about 55 minutes of the laps in the race before uh, a fuel feed problem was sorted, and that's only one lap now behind another car that's been delayed a bit, the GSR Motorsport both running in GT4, but so difficult when you start an event and uh, are on the back foot from the very, very outset. But right now, let's celebrate uh, Phil Quaif leading the race in CP Racing Mercedes. That's the top of the GT runners. In fact, uh, one, two, three, four, four, top five runners all in the GT class and sixth place at the moment. Red Camels, Jordan. We heard lots of tales of woe from Rick Brookers, uh, Rick Brookers early on about how they didn't have the right setup and it was going from bad to worse. But since then, they seem to have found Red Camel Jordan's a very good balance because Eva Brookers, sixth place overall, Johnny, and leading the Porsche Cup class. It was in good position two hours ago and it's still in good position now. Uh, Lou Brookers, I think, more at home with the uh, far from ideal setup rather than older brother Rick and he was putting a brave face on it now what on earth is going on at the first corner because all of a sudden the Ferrari are having to straight line the left hand kink at turn two and CP Racing's Mercedes the race leader looking to try and get through all of this traffic it's almost as if there was a bit of confusion there were we under code 60 were we not we absolutely are not the Ferrari unlapping itself in fact on Phil Quaife's CP Racing Mercedes whilst all that madness happens in the first sector of the lap let's get to Diana Binks who has this from the pits? Um, uh, with Lauren Hogar, who's just uh, jumped out of the number 76, but uh, I know it's very loud here. You can't really hear me that well, but uh, Lauren, how was that stint? So, the feeling inside the car is very good. There, there is a lot of traffic on the, on the track. It is the main difficult with the traffic, but I did my job. I did uh, I drive safe, so I think it's a, it's a good thing. It's still very, very early on in the race. What is the traffic management like out there on the track and how much are the conditions changing? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the weather is very hot, so it's difficult to, to keep the, the tyre in good condition. And uh, with a lot of traffic, you need to, to overtake inside, outside. 
and it's not easy for the tire because you have a lot of pickup on the tire, and after that the car slides a lot. But it was a, it was a good scene, I think. Was it fun? Yeah, it's very fun. Very fun. I enjoy it. Thank you, Diana. Uh, oh, there's a lot of debris again on the main straight. This has been pointed out to us actually a couple of hours ago by various people around the world watching this race. Maybe also be here in Barcelona on the main straight. Now, that wasn't tyre pickup, I don't think. Oh, maybe it was. No, it was something far more substantial than that that's just been run over and the Ferrari collected it uh, latterly, but uh, maybe a rear section of Porsche that has just been splintered into a thousand pieces. That's concerning, though, Bruce. Then, you know, extrapolate later on into the stint. It might take a while for that to really manifest itself. It really could, and I think it came off the tail end of the Porsche that went for a spin just before we uh, swapped over. It was up at turn nine, went off backwards, rejoined the race, and it suddenly exploded on the main straight, literally on the start finish line, right into the face of the Ferrari that's tumbled right down the order, still trying to fight its way back, but you do not need hiccups like this. So for Isak de Tumdu Lopez, he wasn't wanting that, but let's hope there were no shards that got into his tyres. And as you say, you can sometimes have a shard in your tyre for a while before it actually makes the cut. Let's hope it was just an explosion of, of black bodywork, and uh, that is all, but just not what you need. If it's predominantly plastic, I would favour the tyre being the stronger of the two substances, but, yeah, any metal work or... Uh, shards that can easily puncture a tyre, but uh, over a period of time. So the Ferrari now diving to the inside line to pick off a few more of the back markers. Remember, lots of ground lost by a very quick car. And, uh, well, certainly you've got to start somewhere, which was the lower ranges of the top 30, but Isak to Tom to, to Tom Lu Lopez is now finding one or two spots here and there. A chattering Porsche in behind with the nose cover of that car not fully securely fitted. Let's hope the bonnet pins on that last the distance. Great looking car, but all manner of uh, issues latterly. Clutch that's been the problem for the Ferrari, the 22 car, we don't know. OK, so it's been in and out of the garage, and maybe the team don't know either, and that's precisely why it's taking so long to diagnose and then to solve. But car 22, at least back in the race, and able to lap in an attempt to keep up with Phil Quaife in the Mercedes, Daniel Alleman in the Herbert Motorsport Porsche, and in third place, Julian Anlauer, that man again, back in the IMSA Performance Porsche. Well, he's like to Tom Lou Lopez, driving that Ferrari at the moment for WTM by Ronaldo. He's lapping just about the same pace as, that, in fact, slightly faster than the race-leading Mercedes of Phil Quaife, but he's 11 laps down. Yes, we have time plenty, but I don't think I've ever seen magic that can find 11 laps in a speed in a race as competitive as this. More penalties being given out. Red Camel Jordan's the car that's uh, leading the Porsche Cup class, or was before it dived into the pits. That's just picked up a penalty. There it is at standstill. Evo Broikers climbing out, and presumably uh, it'll be one of the two other Broikers, both of his sons. Rick, I would think, would be getting back in uh, right now. We'll confirm when that goes out. It's been having a good run, but they were querying the setup, and so many of the teams saying, we just simply didn't get the track running, because if you weren't with us yesterday, it was uh, wet with more rain on top of it. It was hideously wet and uh, really hard. It was a case of survival for a lot of the drivers when they went out in night practice to get the job done. Yeah, and rotating a car over... A, a, a course like this, when you've got many different corners, it was almost a big problem at the pit stop there. I think everyone kind of knew what they were doing, but uh, driver about to take over in the 909. Rick Broikers standing in slightly the wrong position and nearly mown down by his father, but he's now on board that car. And, uh, well, let's see whether the, the situation of that car has evolved at all since Rick was at the wheel. But you were talking earlier on about this being such a popular test venue because you've got every single corner known to man. But if you can't turn the car through them, if it's just wanting to understeer off at every possible moment, that is a real challenge. Also, you're not going to get very even tyre wear across a stint. But if you can start to just back it into the corners and help the rotation that way, that's adjustment driving, and that's why we see, you know, so some, some people with such high skill doing well in longer distance racing. Now, of course, when the circuit in 90, opened in 1991, there was still plenty of Formula 1 testing, out-of-season testing, in-season testing, but one factor is, as well all the combination of corners was the fact you used to have lots of wind to sort the cars out as well. But let's go down to the pits because uh, he's just got out of the car, he's just missed running over his elder son, Rick Broikers. Diana's got Evo. 
I am with Evo, and uh, he's very kindly come to talk to us, but clearly you've had a busy day at the office there. Yeah, quite a busy day. Uh, feels like I was alone in the office. There were no secretary or uh, butler to help me. I had to nurse the tires. I had to load the fuel, the cars. They were very tough. Uh, I know always the first hint is very tough. Uh, we know we have problems with the tires, so I try to keep them good. But on the other hand, you want to push, you want to show the, the lap time, sorry. So, but difficult, and then I said five laps to go. And then I say eight. And finally, if you come to the fuel station, I make a little spin as well. And I came to the fuel station, and then everything. So, uh, I'm happy. I think uh, we are still in the top three, so uh, it's looking okay. You've got to be proud of yourself. You've given it your all in that stint. Yeah, I did, I did. I, I did some workouts um, before, and I think it helped me. No alcohol for five days, so it's paying off. Evo, is this job getting harder and harder? Sorry? Is this job getting harder and harder? Uh, yes, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's on me to do something about it. I have to improve. <laughs> Thanks, Evo. Go and get a drink. Well, straight out of the car, and there's a flavour of just how tough it is. But I think inwardly, very, very happy with uh, the work that he's done, and he's going to get congratulations from all around the team as well. Little spin as he came in for fuel, but, I mean, there is a guy who, yes, he's challenging himself, but it's ultimately so much fun, even now, after years of racing, and he's still getting the same buzz as he did probably the first time he got into a racing car. You could absolutely tell there how tired he was, breathing off the top of his lungs, looking very, very florid indeed, any of us would. It's a hot, hot afternoon here at Barcelona, but the extra mental strain of trying to drive a car and save its tyres, the, the setup, Rick Brokers tell us right at the start, is just not right. It's another factor that's super difficult. Also driving a Porsche Cup car, you've got the GT3 cars, which are marginally faster. You've got to look out for them and their battles. So it is a real, real strain, but, you know, Ibra Broikers still at the top of his game, still learning, still improving as he goes through the years. But obviously with a hard taskmaster and he's a pro son, Rick Broikers, and Ibra Broikers getting quicker all the time, the younger of the two brothers. It's a, they're a competitive family. There will be, uh, you know, little digs here, little digs there. Uh, so maybe it wasn't such a mistake that he seemed to be heading, heading straight to Rick in the pit lane before jinking in front of the pit garage. All said in mirth, of course. But again, just a real clear sign about 100% application there from Ibra Broikers. Likewise, when you look to the Herbert Motorsport crew, who are a very well-oiled machine, although there's been an adjustment to the driver lineup there with the introduction of Patrick Kolb and the restriction on driving out for Ralph Bone and Robert Renauer, who are also doing a different meeting this weekend in Valencia. Uh, that is tough, but we will see those two at some point in the overnight stints. The 91 car now being driven by Daniel Alleman about across the line. He's actually finding a bit of time here and there on Phil Quay. That's probably down to Phil finding these batches of traffic in the most awkward of positions. But Daniel Alleman is one of the most consistent drivers out there. Again, he knows the pace that he's comfortable with. He's, you're not going to get any heroics from him, but it is consistency that always uh, you know, accompanies many trophies, actually, across the years for Herbert. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's three things combined. It's the natural pace of Daniel Allen and the Swiss racer, combined with the fact he's raced a Porsche for years, combined with the fact he's raced a Porsche for Herbert Motorsport for years, and continuity really is something that, uh, particularly for a team with the two Renauers running it, they're always looking for performance advantage. They're brilliant at race tactics, but I think continuity is something that just helps improving drivers, because they all sit down together, they all discuss it, and they're, they've got a sort of shared platform of knowledge, and I really, really think that is a huge help. But uh, right now, Daniel Alleman doing a very good job. He's lapping, yeah, a, a last lap or so. He's taken one and a half seconds out of the race lead. But almost every time you look at the circuit, there are gaggles of cars. You can mm. see how easy it is to squander a bit of time. Phil Quaif in the white, blue and red nosed uh, Mercedes from CP Racing, car number 85, making space for others down the start, finish straight, but being cautious in, into the first of the corners. And that's very wise indeed. His margin at the moment, best part of 50 seconds in the lead of this race. The Lumirank positional number, which occasionally changes to the first three letters of the driver on board, flashing away on the leading car. That, I believe, to let everyone know. It's a leader. Be aware and try and make space where possible, because there's blue flags even being waved in the direction of Pablo Bouguera in the E2P racing car. Now, that's a quick racing car 
nevertheless in the GT3 category, but it is about to be lapped by the race leader, and that's neat and tidy driving there from the 9-0 Porsche. It got a little bit close, in fact. That's running in sixth place overall, but the Spanish driver just about kept out of the way, but he now goes three laps down on the race leader. So uh, CP Racing, Phil Quaife, stint length, one hour, 51 minutes. So um, that's a double stint quite clearly and, and will be coming to an end soon. So the British driver in that five driver lineup, if you're just joining us for the 24H series and this 24 hours in Barcelona, we've uh, got uh, five laps under our belt already, five and a quarter laps. Um, but it really has been, uh, <laughs> we've just welcomed the fact we've got dry weather. Yesterday was so, so super wet. Uh, and if you have just joined us, uh, having been watching early on, the Ferrari that was leading the race had its mo moments, lost a lead of one minute, 18 seconds, wasn't it? There was contact down at the first corner with the GT2 Mercedes, the lone GT2 Mercedes entered by NM Racing. It was slightly quicker than the GT3 cars down the start, finished straight and uh, very, and clattered into the back of uh, poor, um, who was at the wheel at the time. It was just being taken over by um, just Leo Weiss. Leo Weiss, he was the second driver in the car, it was spun around. We hadn't seen that contact for some time, but that's been in the wars. But since then, we believe it's a clutch problem has dropped the Ferrari way, way down the order. Now in 24th position, Isaac Tutumlu Lopez gaining pace and places. He, he dropped down nearly to the 30th position but it's going the right way, but uh, so many laps squandered, looking, just checking the charts, 11 laps in arrears, so uh, it's going to take some form of miracle, but for CP Racing, who've been such staunch support of the 24-hour H Series leading race right now, and I would reckon in the next lap or so, we'll see uh, Phil Quaife come in and hand over to... Uh, well, Charles Putman and Joe Foster would like a play as well. The car was started by Charles Espinal, but then Shane Lewis went in second. But they're running long stints, these early ones, and uh, doubling up in many ways. We've got, what are we looking at at the moment? About another two hours of uh, clear sunlight, daylight, and then we will drift into darkness. If you're paying uh, attention to the Radio Show Limited Network of Channels coverage last weekend, it was a busy one again with the latest round of the World Endurance Championship at Fuji, but also two NLS races on the Saturday and the Sunday, each of six hours. There was a CP Racing Mercedes taking part there on the Nordschleifer as well. And I had to ask Phil Quave at the start of this weekend, have you just brought the car from Germany to Barcelona? No, no, no. This is a completely different chassis for CP Racing. It's a brand new, not a brand new car, but a different car. And I was concerned about the stresses and strains of a 12-hour race and all the sessions leading into that, and then a 24-hour race after that. But um, they do strip these cars down, of course, but they're actually starting from square one once again. And therefore, should be very confident. I'll, I'll perhaps eat these words later on, but should be very confident about the reliability and the fact that it should be able to do the distance here. CP Racing won't like me mentioning that this early on, though, after only 155 laps and we're barely a quarter of distance into it. But doesn't that logistical the challenge just show how GT racing, long-distance sports car racing, has just grown and grown and grown? You look how the 24-hour H series has been uh, expanding its calendar, moving to different venues, the long-distance races on the Nordschleifer, then you've got GT races this weekend down at uh, Valencia, this one here. There is so much happening. So, yeah, trying to get one car around Europe uh, to go from race to race is, is really... You know, sometimes the calendar isn't your friend. When the calendars are announced, you try and meld them together. And, and it's great that a lot of teams and drivers have got all these races and series to choose. But you do have to get your wall chart out nice and early, don't you? And try and work out where not only the car and the drivers are going to have to be, but all that team personnel that so often accompanies the circus as well. I'm very fond of a matrix, but a wall chart is clearest as far as I'm concerned. But looking down in the pit lane, the CP Racing Mercedes is in. So Phil Quave just has to get it from the fueling area and uh, pop it down the pit lane. Give someone else a go in that number five GT3 AM class entry. So Porsche Cup cars totally together now in the early phase of this lap. Philly Motorsports car flashing the lights. The 955 looking for a way by the 967 Porsche. And uh, flashing the lights, well, might be intimidatory, but uh, will it get the desired results? It's Papi Cosimo for the Ebi Motors run car. And he, does able, he is able to get ahead of Emedio Pampanini. They were on different laps anyway, and that's Cosimo looking to stay in third position in the class, whereas the car he's just lapped is in fifth. So the 992 class getting slightly more sparse than I might have expected, or further apart, should we say. The Yannick Redon 
driven 903 is comfortably in front of the single make category all running on the same uh, compound of Hankook tyres not just the 992s but everybody in the field incidentally but although there's then six 992s locked together on the timing screen from second down to seventh in that subcategory we do have a runaway leader with a cushion of not one, not two, not three, but four Audi R8 LMSs in between the first 992 and the second place car. So that's the two Yuta racing examples. The Shara Sport car, which has had its hiccups along the way. I'd expect, I would have expected the one car to be further up the order than this. And the Lant Motorsport car with Johannes Kerkhoff at the wheel of the 34 machine. So that's the car. Actually, that was calling the car collection machine earlier on in the uh, reflex action yeah, I, I, yeah. white Easy and blue do. race livery i know at lant i need to be in green and white uh, not in the kirchhoff livery but i mean yeah things chop and change we've got to move with the times bruce well another thing just looking out from our lofty commentary position is how long the refueling stops are when it's under green you get accustomed to the half tank load you're allowed under code 60 when the majority of the runners came in the very first uh, code 60 was pretty much uh, as the cars were wanting to make those first uh, pit stops so it seemed quite natural but uh, right now the CP Racing Mercedes doesn't have to go very far, just has to go into the pit lane past the uh, circuit-shaped uh, podium and park at the first pit garage. They don't have far to go from refueling. Another car sitting in there at the moment, lights flashing, waiting to get going, is the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. You just mentioned that, so that's a reason why it's falling down the order a little bit. And the E2P Porsche that was uh, running in sixth place, uh, Pablo, Pablo Buguera, he's moved up to fifth, but he's at a standstill. Still being refuelled. Bouguera, no relation to the Bouguera team, completely different spelling, uh, but nevertheless, we've gone through all sorts of different pronunciations of that, I think, <laughs> over the weekend's coverage. I call it the car 416, actually. Much Mercedes easier. 416. Much yeah. easier. Uh, but Bulgaria with a steep uh, heritage in European truck racing and uh, moving to GT competition in the last two or three years. But they're not last anymore. They have moved from 39th oh, to 38th. They've just got ahead of the Ginetta. Uh, they're in refueling at the moment. Jeremiah Jurek just waiting to... In fact, he tried to move away from refueling and I don't think they'd quite finished. They stopped the 416 Mercedes and uh, moved it back a metre or two. Or maybe he was just positioning the car, but that has been last from the very outset, and now it's risen from 39 to 38, so it's all slow progress. The next target, alas, the NM Racing Team, Mercedes that spent so long in the gravel down at Turn 1, the GT2 entry is uh, <coughs> 16 laps ahead. A new leader because the CP Racing Mercedes has been in, and there's been a driver change there as well. No doubt a new set of Hankook tyres for Charlie Putman. It's Daniel Alleman who is out front by virtue of being effectively a pit stop behind and also moving up a spot Julian Anlau for IMSA performance onto the provisional podium slots Mathieu Detrie for Haas RT this is nice to get a good bit of rotation every time one of the leading cars has to make a stop as we head back to the pit lane who have you got this time Diana Binks I have uh, Phil Quaif that's just jumped out of the CP um, racing car uh, Phil you were, making, you were punching in the times out there on the track. How was that stint? Yeah, very happy with that stint. The car was running well uh, with this game. It's just pumping in those consistent laps, staying out of trouble. And, uh, yeah, maintaining those tyres so they don't degrade too much uh, throughout the stint. And I think we achieved that, so pretty happy. From a driver's point of view, how difficult is it to sort of manage and conserve the tyres when you've got conditions like this here in Barcelona, I know you know Barcelona well, but the, tr the track conditions and the temperatures are changing all the time. Yeah, as the day goes on, the track temperature goes up, the ambient goes up, so it's all about managing that tyre uh, tire deck. And we've got that, our right foot, but also we have driver A, so manage the, the wheel spin and the slide, uh, and basically we have to do that throughout just to keep those tyre temps to a minimum. And what's the traffic like? I was quite lucky on that stint, to be fair. Um, it, it's obviously busy as usual. There's 55, 60 cars out there, but um, it's just about managing that and uh, picking them off one by one in a, in a safe way. That doesn't cost you or them too much time. And as ever, a fantastic uh, pit turnaround by the crew here. I mean, they, they are just on it from the minute you're coming in. Oh, these guys are amazing. I've done two Dubai 24 hours with them. This is the first Barcelona 24 
they're just awesome, a great bunch of guys, and they just work so hard. The car prep is absolutely second to none. And the amount of work they go into the pit stops, as you can see, is, uh, is brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Too, well, without sorry. the Phil Quaife element, they managed a third place finish in last year's Barcelona. That was the Putman Espenlau Foster Lewis uh, combo that we're more used to seeing. So, theoretically, you had uh, Phil Quaife in there as well. As he said, he's done two Dubai 24 hours at CP Racing. First action with the team was actually last year. It feels like he's been associated with CP Racing for slightly longer than that. But um, he's been in and around the Dubai 24 hours, of course, for various teams. And with, I mean, he's raced TCRs there in the past too. So uh, a useful number to have, I would think, because he can drive anything. And a former winner here, which he'd rather forgotten about, hadn't he? He told us earlier he won here in 2012 in the McLaren with Klaus Hamel, Christodoulou, well, he's, uh, Adam Christodoulou and, and Tim Mullard, so very handy. Mm. A McLaren win, so that was an MP412. Gosh, how the models move on through the years. Looking on screen at the moment as the recovering Ferrari, the WTM by Rinaldi Racing Ferrari, a dominant leader. We have to, just from the outset, went from third to first on uh, by the time it got to turn two on the opening lap and uh, was driven absolutely superbly in the opening stint of the race by Jochen Krumbach. He did a double stint, but uh, unfortunately, just after the car was taken over by Leo Weiss, it went backwards in terms of uh, not only direction, but in terms of time and rejoined just in time to lose the lead uh, to the IMSA LS perform Group Performance Porsche. But at the moment, the Ferrari, the only 296 GT3 in this race, is down in 24th position. You sit to Tumlu pressing on his lap times. Yep, he's quicker than the race leading car, but it's a long, long way down. 11 laps were scored. Wandered. And hopefully whatever the problem was that delayed the car, that will be behind them now. But 11 laps, are, well, you know, you just can't expect anything from there. The team won last year with it, but it was a 488. But again, then used the 296. But with every race, they're finding something different. Unfortunately, this time, it was something they didn't want to find. Yeah. Of course, 11 laps assumes that the race leaders are not going to have a sustained spell in the pits as well. But... It would be a stretch for them all to have a difficulty to that sort of tune. You've just got to keep ploughing on round and hope that, uh, you know, the persistency will glean a half-decent result. But it seems like we're going to have a different winner from 2022 at this rate, at least. It would have been a different car anyway for WTM and uh, would have extended the dream yet further of 2023 in the Ferrari trophy cabinet. It's been a spectacular one to date so far, but uh, many of the German manufacturers wanting to take the spoils this year. We don't have any BMWs in the GT3 category. In fact, there's only one BMW in the whole race, and that is the Hoffer Racing by Bonk Motorsport car, but otherwise Porsches, Audis and Mercedes galore, and we have three of those that four manufacturers represented in the top four positions. It's likely, well, CB Racing arguably in the stronger place, but they've fallen back to fourth only because they were the first of the pit stoppers, Bruce. Yeah, it's in, it's in that cycle. And talking of CP Racing, um, we heard from Phil Quaife, they got a little bit carried away, 55 to 60 cars. It must have been the, the, the light glinting through the rain yesterday. We had 39 starters, and you know what? We've got 39 cars still running, so good job so far. Charles Putman in traffic all of a sudden for CP Racing, but he's settling into that stint, as Johnny said, running around in fourth place, but he's now got plenty of time. We'll probably do a double stint, I think, as the sun will start to fall lower in the sky. Just uh, about 23 hours ago, you couldn't even see the sky. The rain was so heavy, but we sensed there was a little break in the clouds and the sun just popped over the, the hills to the west of Barcelona, just as at sundown, and then things have improved since then. But right now, the playing surface, surface absolutely spot on. Not far off, half past five here in Montmelo, and uh, the official time for sunset is a minute to eight but it will start to get, uh, well, we'll get those golden skies, hopefully, typical of this sort of place as the sun starts to slowly move to the horizon and then a uh, cracking sunrise here as well, typically speaking, as, lo as long as the moisture in the nearby valleys clears quickly. And uh, on occasion, you get a drone chasing a car on our uh, visual feed. Hopefully you're able to spend a bit of your Saturday and Sunday
sitting down to consume this race, but the beauty of our radio-only coverage as well on the Radio Show Limited Network of Channels means you can take us with you and let us describe what's going on. But I would reserve a bit of time for your weekend because the drone pilot or pilots this weekend, very skillful indeed, mainly in that uh, final sector, but producing some really good pictures of our starting grid leading up to the midday start earlier as well. When you think you know a circuit, as we said, this circuit opened in 1991. Delighted we don't have that chicane between the penultimate and final corner. It's just quite nice to see a few different angles. Keep you guessing when you first arrive at a circuit. Where's that one taken from? Camera mounted low at turn six, looking up to turn five and so on and so forth. But certainly the development of drone shots in the past uh, 10 years or so has taken us to places we have never, ever been before. But right now the sun getting a little low in the sky here. Track conditions absolutely perfect and 39 starters and 39 cars still going. Herbert Motorsport leading by uh, best pass of a minute, 58.3 seconds last time around. Daniel Allam and his Porsche ahead of another Porsche, the IMSA LS Group performance. Uh, but the best sounding car in the field is continuing to rumble around. It's uh, the Mark II V8, that wonderful V8 burble. J Jose Close now driving that for the, the Belgian racing team. VDS Racing Adventures, and I love the fact that uh, the Van der Straat team continues to run with that red livery, the broad white and blue uh, stripe up over its nose. So many single-seater successes back in the 60s, sports car successes going into the 70s. A traditional race livery always wins the vote from me. Uh, Dr. Johannes Kerkhoff looks like he's just got by Rick Breakers unless actually Rick was able to lap a little quicker than the Lance Motorsport Audi. So the concern now there for the 992 leader is, uh, is actually Rick being slightly delayed by what should be a quicker car, but he would prefer clear air in front of him. There's only 0.6 of a second between the 34 Audi and the 909 Porsche, so we want to try and clear that as quickly as possible. Well, you mentioned how Rick Breukers, uh, you know, by the time Evo handed over to Rick in that pit stop, the Red Camel Jordans, uh, Porsche fell down from the lead of the Porsche Cup class, but it's now fell to fourth, now back into the lead. It's the quickest car in class with a, an advantage of uh, best part of, let's have a little look, 53 seconds over the second car, car in class. And it does appear to be Red Camel Jordans versus Philly Motorsport by Ebi Motors. They have been at the top of that class in circulation for about the past three hours. So uh, looking quite good. But just remember, right at the start of the show, uh, we heard from Rick Breukers complaining that the handling of the 909 Porsche it was not only bad, but it was getting worse. But with every pit stop, every chance for the driver to talk to the engineers, hopefully they're coaxing it back to a performance that is helping the car on a dry circuit. However, what did Evo say to us? He said, it's eating his its tyres, you have to nurse it. And of course, Rick will be able to be a little bit more on that uh, than Evo, but it's something that just makes the driving so much tougher. Every corner you have to sort of almost pull back a little bit to take a little bit less out of the tyres. But Rick Brokers at the moment, uh, eighth place overall, right in behind the Audi of Johannes, Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff, the Land Motorsport Audi, matching it totally for pace, but there's no point taking a risk. And as I say that, Rick looks almost to the outside line at turn three, but ducks back down. We'll try and get the inside, the 180-degree uphill corner. Still turning to the right, now they've got the short straight down towards turn four. Actually, you can start to see with every image that Rick's getting a little bit frustrated being stuck behind the Audi. Different classes of car, he's in a Porsche Cup class car, and of course the Audi is in GT3. But he's got to choose his moment, I would suggest, in about four corners time when they go down to the end of the infield straight. So turn 10 might be the place, and as I say that, he goes, I'm not waiting that long, goes side by side on the run down the hill. There's the kink to the left at turn six. And into turn seven, the move is pulled off. And at that moment, uh, Johannes Kirchhoff looked in his mirrors and thought, oh, go on. Yeah, oh, from, from the doctor's point of view, I think it's a bit futile We're needing to defend that overly. In fact, another car creeps through as well. Well, that's not for position because Papi Cosimo is about 50 odd seconds further back. But uh, yeah, as soon as you start driving in your mirrors that Kirchhoff was risking doing there, then you're going to lose time ultimately on your Delta pace as well. Rick's just quicker in this phase of the race. You don't know what sort of strategy the alternative car and theoretically slower car is on, but we know all about the straight line speed of these Porsche Cup cars. They have next to no aero on them, or certainly compared to a GT3 car. Let it go, and now uh, Johannes Kerkhoff can, uh, can improve on his own delta time, on his own a little bit more. He can settle down. The other Porsche that went through was actually the car in fifth place overall, the car collection motorsport Porsche, the number 23, even Giacoma. 
in that Swiss crude car up in, well, it's still in fifth place, but again, he just wanted uh, someone removed from the track in front of him. So job well done. And Ivan is about a lap and a bit down on CP Racing's Mercedes, which is in fourth place. Hassarty, their Audi, is in third place. Uh, Mat Mathieu Detri at the yep. wheel of that. Julian Andlauer in second place. The gap for the race leader, fairly stable. Daniel Alleman, 53 seconds to the good, leading the race for Herbert Motorsport. Darting down the inside line there to pick off one of the TCR cars was the RPM prepared uh, Porsche, which is car number 907, driven by Nick Leonson now. So Nick heading in front of the Holmgard Motorsport Cooper Leon Competition for Michael Salenbach of Canada. So the 102 leads the TCE part of the race from the Baz Kooten entered uh, Cooper of Bert Metz, number 125. But it is Herbert Motorsports, Daniel Alleman, with his 53-second lead now. There's a more of a look at Nick Johnson, who is driving once again with Tracy Crone this weekend. Big crash yesterday, early on in the setup phase, is really sideways there. Spectacular driving, but it's not the quickest way through Turn 5 for Papi Cosimo. Clearly realising I'm losing time here on the new class leader, Rick Breakers. That's the danger. You start to try a bit too hard in the moment, cook your tyres, and then that really uh, doesn't allow uh, this particular stint, stint to go south very quickly. And this is exactly when a driver steps up from doing sprint races, how it takes a while for them to understand endurance racing and the fact there's a consequence for every little nanosecond they try to shave off. It might mean you have to pit a lap earlier. It might mean all the last five, six, ten laps even of your stint. You, you're, you've got tyres that just don't want to play. But it is a learning process, and we've got drivers from teenagers right through to the other end of the age spectrum. But uh, with, as I said a short while ago, the explosion of series that uh, offer long-distance racing, multi-driver racing, multi-class racing, uh, so many drivers are now giving, getting a chance to do proper endurance racing. Not so long ago, you didn't have these options, with the exception pretty much of the long-distance racing on a regular basis around the Nürburgring. But uh, drivers of all ages and all levels of ability really do enjoy these endurance races. And, uh, but you just have to learn how to get in the rhythm, how to work with your teammates, but certainly, as you pointed out, Johnny, how to keep your tyres sweet. Yeah. Algirdas Galginis in the Jutta Racing Audi in fourth position, uh, 15th overall, sorry, 14th overall, fourth uh, in, uh, in the GT3 AM part of the field. And the Jutta Racing crew are effectively trying to catch that CT Racing Mercedes. Here it is, in fact, the 85 now at turn three. So the AMs all down to the driver combination. No difference actually between each of the GT3 cars in the field. They're obviously built to uh, built in different ways because they're from very different manufacturers, but effectively to the same regulation set. And then a thing called balance of performance should even them up around a lap. And that means that one car will be quick in some of the tighter corners, others better off a slow corner and down the straights. And really interesting to work out where each of the strengths and weaknesses are of the three major GT3 cars that we have here this weekend, Porsche, Audi and Mercedes. Am is led by CP Racing. Second place in that category is the Lant Motorsport Audi of Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff. Uh, Pro-Am is the overall leader, Daniel Alleman, in the Herbert Motorsport Porsche from the third place car of Haas RT. And that means that the GT3 uh, entry without the suffix, so effectively Pro, is Julian Anlauer now in the second place position for IMSA LS Group Performance Car 76. Important thing about that is the lead is coming down quite quickly. It's still, uh, it was just over 50 seconds, it's now down below 48, but with every lap, a second or two is being gained by Julian Andler. You'd expect that. Daniel Alleman is uh, certainly not of the same calibre as the young French charger. Daniel Alleman, in fact, 64 years old. He's got some great success under his belt. He, of course, won the Dubai 24 hours with Herbert Motorsport. It was a blink of an eye ago, it was already back six years ago, 2017, the start of the 2017 season. So you would expect Julian and Lauer to close in, but uh, bear in mind their, their stint links are exactly the same, they came into the pits at the same time, but clearly since then, the IMSA LS Group performance, uh, Porsche Black, race livery, normally the colour of uh, 
purpose motorsport but they're running running white and red this weekend at least here because of course that's the team that's busy as well down the road gt sprint races at valencia the first of those has been completed and uh, that means that two of the drivers robert renard and ralph bone can um, do their second race meeting of the weekend they're, they're working their way up here just keep them on their toes yeah, well, you always uh, need to know the plans for the day or indeed where you need to be next. But, of course, they can come and do the night stints here, then they go back to race yeah. two tomorrow down in Valencia at the circuit Ricardo Tormo. Very, very different circuit to this one, but, uh, again, it's one of those circuits where if you stand on the roof of the main building, you can see probably about 90% of the lab. It's much more compact site than this, whereas at various points at the circuit Barcelona, Catalonia, you can see uh, the circuit at other points nipping up and down the slope here. But uh, Ricardo Torma feels as though it's in about a quarter of the space, but uh, still great fun for the drivers if you can of course they would have rather had them on separate weekends particularly if it's a 24 hour race if you're doing a six hour race and a couple of sprint races it's one thing but logistics are clearly massive this weekend for them probably sat down and thought how do we make a 24 hour race even more taxing uh, and it's the ultimate challenge within motor racing well no actually the ultimate ultimate challenge is to do another meeting as well as a 24 hour race and well, they haven't done it yet uh, and given the responsibility, we think, of the overnight stints as well. So uh, they're going to need a bit of rest in the week, you would have thought, but they'll probably be back to their day jobs by that point. Day jobs? Who needs a day job? Well, most people, quite frankly. Now, they were due to be getting here to just north of Barcelona. It's about, on a very good run, about 45 minutes from the airport, but at the weekend, you never really know. But they were due here at about 7 o'clock in the evening, so about an hour and a quarter from now. We'll see what time they rock up, but certainly bringing Patrick Colbin's team gave the two who were here on a regular basis, Robert Renard and um, Daniel Atham, a little bit of support, welcome support, because it's a hot day and they would have been rather drawn out if they had to do all the stints until about half seven or eight o'clock tonight. They'd bear in mind, we started not at three o'clock in the afternoon, at midday, so that would be a big ask for the two of them to be chopping and changing uh, through the first eight hours. The uh, other interesting thing is the fact that uh, Patrick Kolb uh, will alter the driver lineup as well because Patrick, the 28 year old silver, means that the 91 car is now a pro am car, whereas I think previously that might have sneaked into uh, the am category. Although Robert Brunauer is a goal, so therefore an out and out pro, but Patrick Cole, the am plus, slightly rarer um, uh, designation of driver rating, but puts him between the pace of Daniel Alleman and uh, Alfred Brunauer for example. What were you just finding out there, Bruce, from Nick sitting behind? Well, Nick was keeping an eye on all things as Nick does. So down at Valencia, there are th uh, four classes in the championship and they finished fourth in the Bronze Cup. So they're getting some good points to drop into the pot. They'll go back tomorrow to see what they can do. But in between, while other people would sleep, they're coming here to race through the night. Fair play. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's nothing to be sniffed at, but um, it, they, at least they're wanting to take that challenge on board and you can bet that even if they're sort of half asleep the paint the car will still go lightning quick lightning yesterday thankfully none so far today though at the track uh, i'm liking the graphics on the left hand side of uh, the video stream because that separates out where, where the various top three in the classes are doesn't actually differentiate between gt3 pro-am non-pro-am and, and am if you like but bear in mind the 76 is a is a more or less pro lineup uh julian Andlauer able therefore to put in lots of hours behind the wheel and he's expecting a busy night as well uh from what he told nick a little earlier on 38 and a half seconds the margin between he and daniel alleman but uh, far more consistent right now is the 24 year old frenchman compared to the race leading swiss Herbert Motorsport is a pro-am car, as I've mentioned, as is the Haas RT, but that's the top three within GT3. 909 still leading the 992 class. GTX in the hands of the RD Signs uh, Cholet racing crew. So their Lamborghini Super Trofeo car is neatly placed. Atlas BX Motorsport leading GT4 and the Home Guard Motorsport in front in the TCR race. Just checking out the pace of the various front runners, and Team Giacomo deserves a bit of a pat on the back. The car collection most sport Porsche, not an Audi. Of course, we've moved on. We've had that little conversation a short while ago. Of course, the colours that used to be carried on there, Audi. Uh, is now being run by Land Motorsport, but even Jacoba fifth place overall, and he is the f 
Oh, actually, as I said, he's now the second fastest out on the track because uh, Julian Andlauer has just improved his pace. Now just uh, 38 seconds down, so really very quickly coming from the wrong side of a minute down on the race leader, Daniel Alleman. Julian Andlauer, same stint length. They've uh, been uh, 41, 42 minutes into their stint. He is catching, but really, really good pace from Ibn Jacoma. But that car collection, Porsche is still some distance. It's about a minute down on Charles Putman for CP Racing, but with every lap, he's gaining whole chunks of time. But bear in mind, uh, CP Racing are leading the GT3 AM class. Very happy to be there. Plenty of people choosing a good vantage point, uh, looking over the, well, from the roof, most of the spectators. And if you're lucky enough to be a guest in one of the hospitality units, you get a really good perch there above where all the business is happening in pit lane. Lots more, or even more atmospheric when we get to the nighttime hours as well, uh, with uh, the sound somehow changing in the hours of darkness, but there'll be no shortage of light, artificial light that is, with most of the pit lane here well illuminated. Still the level of marbles is concerning, particularly if you need to go offline to pick your way through the slower moving traffic. And it tends to be flung off the cars on the fastest bit, so even though turn three is effectively a hairpin right, it's a very open hairpin, and it, as Joe Bradley was mentioning earlier on, chews through the tyres that segment, particularly rear left in these GT cars, so they have to keep an eye on that, the wear and tear of this circuit, over and over again. Amadeo Pampanini for HRT Performance, number 967, currently fifth in class, but look in front of him, might as well be out on his own there in a test session. Oh, I'm sure it's pretty busy though behind. It will not stay quiet for too long. With, as Phil Quaife put it, 55 cars in the race. Might feel like 55 cars, slightly fewer than that in reality. Yeah, 39 cars and uh, having praise for the Bagheera ZM Racing for their Mercedes having got off last place. It uh, in the cycle of pit stops has now fallen back before it's uh, one of the rival cars from GT4. The GSR Motorsports, the Lithuanian entered Ginetta. So back down to last place and now Alia Koluk just getting her run in the Bagheera Mercedes. One position further up in 37 now on the outlap part of the pits. Jorg Vibarn, we just saw it, the spectators looking down onto that uh, 715 GT2 Mercedes the NM racing team, that is now back into the race. York Vibarn should make that go very well indeed. And GT2 means loads of power, and down the start finish straight, that is why that car was involved in an incident where it had contact with the race-leading Ferrari that uh, led to the delay for the Ferrari, but the main delay for Ferrari has, alas, been something more serious that's cost them a lot of time. It's fighting its way back, but uh, Isaac Tutumlu Lopez, it's been a long battle to get closer to the car in front. He's gained about four positions, but seems stuck for the rest of this stint, I would suggest, down in 24th position. But the real number you need to put in your, in your little notebook is it's 11 laps that were lost with those delays. The first delay being the car facing backwards in the track uh, down at turn two when then advice was at the wheel, but the main delay was lost in the pits. Third place, Mathieu Dettree should be in need of fuel earlier than any of those cars around. He's been at the wheel now for a little over an hour. So looking out for the Haas RT Audi needing fuel in the not too distant future. The two cars ahead, about three quarters of, their, of the way into their stints for Alleman and Andlauer. And Charlie Putman, as mentioned, uh, was plugged into the 85 CP racing car most recently. So obviously he can go a little bit further. Similarly, actually, Ivan Giacoma for car collection. So still very interesting to judge precisely where each of these runners are in relation to their next stops. And obviously with a fuel stop, that will delay them and drop them down the order and will give the, well, swing the momentum back in the favour of CP Racing, perhaps. Daniel Alleman has done some better laps recently, so he's slightly preventing uh, the gain of Julian Andlauer. Andlauer, 34 seconds in arrears, their lap time's almost the same, so in fact it, it may as much as anything be the race leader not being blocked by traffic and Julian slightly being delayed, but uh, we know it ebbs and flows between them. Alleman now on lap 173. Yes, needing to be a touch cautious about how close Anlauer is getting, but at the moment it will just be a, a word in the ear on occasion, perhaps from the team. 
give you give him an update on how far back the 76 car is, but he doesn't want too, too much information that will become distracting then. Uh, better for Daniel just to, as mentioned, pick his pace and stick to it. In the 992 class, Rick Breakers breaking away now from the Johannes Kerkhoff driven Lance Motorsport Audi. That gap was uh, 0.5 or 6 in arrears when I first took notice of it. Now the 992 leader is a good 13, nearly 14 seconds in front of the seventh placed GT3 car. And that is crucial because it's increasing the gap over Papi Cosimo as well in the Villy Motorsports by Ebi car. Now, it probably won't come as a surprise that Rick Brokers is the fastest driver of any of the Porsche Cup drivers. So this is a very, very important stint for the Red Camel Jordans team. He's going to build as big a lead as he possibly can at the moment he's sitting here on quite a tidy margin of about just over a minute from, as you say, Papi Cosimo. But to the laps, every single lap, Rick Broikers is gaining a little bit more of an advantage. So this is a, a foundation stone of the team's uh, sort of push towards their ambition here, trying to take victory in the Porsche Cup class, down in seventh place overall now, but uh, running like a train. The other car that uh, will still really start to... Uh, make an impression on the timing screen is the number one Audi which moves from the right hand side of your shot to the central part of the track there with Pierre Kaffer at the wheel easy to miss his stint because it's down in ninth position in GT3 which is 11th overall with the goal back into the number one car after such a great season last year and uh, Kaffer again picking his way through to find that racing line through the tyre debris Good exit out of three, and uh, that rare thing of an open road in front of the German driver. He's got Ed Sandstrom not too far back uh, in the HRT performance car, but a different class. So, again, having to work its way through the Pro-Am leader is, remember, the overall leader, this car, the 91 of Daniel Alleman. But whereas Alleman is... One of the AM drivers, Pierre Kaffer, ne now needing to try and uh, make up some of that lost ground as pretty much the quickest in the combination at Shera Sport. But early ground lost, you have to imagine. I mean, we were talking at the time that actually Michael Doppelmeyer was in a good position because they were putting him in the car whenever there was a code 60. But if you start becoming that reactive to what proved to be relatively short cautions, I wonder whether they actually lost time, uh, you know, when you look at the broader picture it's always a gamble you never really know how long a, a, a code 60 is going to be but certainly we had it was the first time that Pierre Kaffer got into the car and he'd only done a handful of laps and suddenly in they came he was popped straight out if there hadn't been code 60s you'd have expected some really quick laps and that would have put the number one Audi for Shearer's bought PHX much closer to the front but right now yeah I don't think they did gain in all of that but there were two uh, Code 60s during Michael Doppelmeyer's period. So uh, you commented at the time, well, maybe this will work, but maybe they just exactly so were not long enough. But right now, the pace that Pierre Kaffer's uh, putting in lap after lap, the only driver faster than him at the moment is Julian Andlauer in the IMSA LS Group performance Porsche that's now just 28 seconds down the race leader. So he's found more than half a minute in this stint, but the stint is, what, 50 minutes long? So it's not going to be a whole lot longer, another 10, 12, possibly 15 minutes, uh, according to if there are any other uh, code 60s in that time. But, of course, at that point in your stint, you just dive in anyway, I would feel. Yeah. yeah. So Mancha de Tree now well over an hour in the Haas RT car in third position gosh yes yeah, nearly one hour and 12 minutes so he's certainly eking out a long run it will uh, I'm just trying to think whether there was a code 60 yeah there was that. yeah so that will help obviously it, the fuel guzzle if you like uh half an hour for charlie putman likewise for ivan jacomo baz scouten in the Utah racing audi is 23 odd seconds back from jacoma how do those lap times compare in the favour of the 23 car collection motorsport Porsche. So that's look, looking like it will extend as well. That's now a touch wide from Dr. Johannes Kerhoff. Uh, and Daniel Alleman in the in the position of Rick Broek as was a few laps ago now. I actually thought not fully as committed as the Dutchman, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, there was a, about the same gap as they dropped down out of turn five through the kink to the left at turn six and approaching turn seven. There wasn't the dive up the inside. Rick Brokers was very, very positive. Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff, I thought, had left enough of a gap. He's now put his indicator on. 
to say down that infield straight, I'm going to the right-hand side of the track. Come on up the inside. He's spotted or been told by the team that the race leader's coming through. So Daniel Allerman, this will be another lap in which he's lost a bit of a time to the chasing Julian Andlauer. But, you know, at that point, caution was absolutely the byword. Uh, for Daniel, and he did exactly the right thing. Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff, they've raced together a lot, if you think, in the past decade. Uh, but, uh, you know, Herbert's Motorsport against, uh, you know, traditionally car collection motorsport here at the Nürburgring, all the other 24-hour H series of venues, which keep on changing. We have uh, some exciting ones coming in mm. for 2024. If you think it was warm here this weekend, we haven't quite finished, but uh, July in Misano, trust me, I've been there that, that very same date, and uh, 40 degrees is not a stranger. Yeah, so that will be a real tester, and we've had um, similar conditions to those in recent weeks here at Barcelona, and then particularly inland from that, red hot in Madrid, for instance, too, as a lot of this part of Europe has been suffering. Um, middle part to the end of August with the second significant heat wave affecting Italy, the south of France, and the whole of the Iberian Peninsula more bearable conditions i have to say this weekend as we would perhaps expect for the middle of september however drivers after over an hour's worth of a stint in a gt3 car are certainly feeling it and uh, that's uh, also depending on whether your power steering is working or not and how much input you're having to use as uh, papi cosimo in the 992 division is still in front of the HRT performance, Ed Sandstrom driven Porsche Cup car. Kobe de Broeke is only 13 seconds back, actually, for third place in the 992 class and is taking a little bit of time out of Sandstrom at times. Sandstrom should be pretty solid, though, in fairness. He uh, used to race regularly Audis at GT3 level, the 930 driver. So, again, really difficult to isolate a lap time and think that's the that's the consistent pace, because you never know what traffic it's uh, tripped over on any one lap. I'm just keeping an eye on the GTX class for a moment. That's being led by Paulius Puskasifius, who seems to have been in that uh, Lithuanian-entered Cholet Racing Lamborghini forever. That's leading the class. The car in fourth place, though, the Vortex number 701, the Vortex V8, Philippe Bonnell. Not lapping very fast at all at the moment. Uh, uh, he was in the background of the shot, limping along. He's lapping in two minutes, and you really expect him to be at least five seconds faster. He's about 51 minutes into a stint, so maybe, just maybe, I caught him as he recovered from a problem, but I keep an eye on that one because a few laps earlier, I was looking out of the window from the commentary box, high over the start finish straight, and I thought, those vortexes, A, they sound brilliant, B, they're still going. So it was all looking good. I wish I hadn't had that thought now. <laughs> The 1.0 Vortex then, and uh, they always sound glorious because uh, a lot of the time they run with a Chevrolet engine, so it just uh, just grunts and growls its way around particularly this venue, which is in places a little bit of a dip, so you get the sound ricocheting certainly off the um, main straight buildings, big grandstand of drivers left, a significant pit building as well, drivers right. And that's the reason why sometimes we throw to an interview in pit road with nick or diana and uh, both the interviewee and the interviewer struggle to hear one another but you know when the when the interruption is car noise and such glorious car noise we perhaps shouldn't complain no we certainly shouldn't and it's not quite as enclosed as le mans where it's have even more giant buildings at both sides of the track philip bonnell in that 701 uh, Vortex V8 is now in at refueling. It was pretty much the end period of that stint. I'm just slightly worried about his lap pace, uh, but that's fourth in the GTX class. So, as I said, that class being led by the Lamborghini from uh, Cholet Racing Team. Second in class, the VDS Racing Adventures Mark II V8. And third, the KTM Expo, the crossbow of Rizun Morvan Racing. Uh, Christian Loymer has just emerged from the pits in that, so maybe a chance for Philippe Bernal to close in, except for the fact he is having fuel taken on board. So he'll remain in fourth place in GTX. Around that tricky left hand, there will go the red camel car, up to seventh overall, which is no mean feat. And, as I say, a decent buffer zone provided by an Audi and a Porsche back to the rest of the runners in the 992 division. GTX, just mentioned Paulius Pascovicius in the 720 car. Let's say closer, gaining on Stefano Monaco on that particular lap. And in the TCR category, Michael Seilenbach in his Cooper for Holmgard Motorsport. The Ginetta has been 
troubled with various reliability issues and unfortunately he's having to go back in the garage for the time being. How many laps is that car now? 139 laps, 138 laps, so it's yeah. moved down into last place. Alia Koluk in the uh, Bagheera ZM Racing Mercedes has gone past, so that's third and fourth, but it's been overheating. That's been the main problem for the Ginetta G56 and uh, Rokas Kaviras coming in. And uh, just down to Diana, what, what do you think the problem is? go back out but they're really struggling with that they told me it's about 25 laps down on the class leader which is the atlas bx motorsport uh, korean mercedes with takyu takyun yang uh, uh, driving the 403 car uh, but yes that gives you an idea of how much and how costly this delay has been we talked about 11 laps for the ferrari for instance well double that and a bit more for this poor old Ginetta g56 Right, we've got a change of drivers in there. In fact, uh, we've got Ernesto Globiccia uh, climbing aboard and uh, just taking over for Rokas Kvedaras, and that's in the GSR. Ginetta does look fantastic. Emerald, uh, sort of uh, olive, olive green with gold trim on that, but unfortunately a car that's in the garage never looks fantastic because clearly it's not working too well. So the work carries on. It's, uh... Again, and speaking of great sounding cars, these Ginetta G56s do sound glorious, but um, have to be out on track in order to do that. We're bang on another race hour. So six o'clock here in Barcelona, that marks one quarter distance. Uh, it means uh, an early finish sort of tomorrow, but uh, obviously it's a long run till nightfall, which is at a minute to eight o'clock. Here's the order in the TCE race with the 102 Holmgaard Motorsport Leon Competition leading with Mike and Michael uh, Salen back. He shares that with Tom Chloe, Roy Edland of Norway and the two Danes, Jonas and Magnus Holmgaard. Baz Kooten Racing's Cooper TCR is second for Bert Metz in number 125 and it's the Wolf Power Racing car that had a terrible start causing the first code 60 of the race and into the gravel at turn five it went in that opening hour. Herbert Motorsport leads in the GT series part of the race. Daniel Alleman has now been driving that car for very nearly an hour so they must have put him in at five o'clock on the dot and remains to be seen whether when that car pits they'll do a switch around for the driver change. I suppose it also depends on the location of Robert Renauer and Ralph Bone hurriedly making their way towards the track from Valencia. 76 IMSA LS Group performance and their Porsche second for Julian Anlauer. Then it's the Haas RT Audi in third place. Mathieu Detri, the Belgian racer. Uh, in 85, it is the CP racing car of Charlie Putman. And then Ivan Giacomo for Car Collection Motorsport in fifth place. The first of the two Utah racing Audis, number 71, is in sixth. The head of the Red Camel Jordan Stock NL car of Rick Breakers. That is the leading car in 992. And in GT3 Am, eighth overall, it's Dr. Johannes Kirchhoff still for Lant Motorsport in the 34 Audi. Ninth place is where we find the 90 E2P Racing GT3 Am Porsche. It's in turn ahead of the second place 992 class car for Vili Motorsport by Emmy Motors, 955. Share a Sport PHX with a very quick driver, Pierre Kaffer, but his lap time's not necessarily being felt, I suppose, in 11th position after a tough start for that team. HRT performance, the all Swedish lineup, and Ed Sandstrom's driving that car in third in 992 and fourth place. They are pretty close to one. Well, last time I checked, they were pretty close to one another. It's still about 13 seconds in reality for the 13th place car, 903 Red Ant Racing. Yutta Racing second Audi, number 72, is in 14th ahead of the RPM Racing 992 AM car for Nick Johnson. And then it's Mikhail Pitamba of South Africa in 16th place for HRT Performance. 17th, the RD signs Lamborghini Huracan, number 720, leading. GTX. Next up is Mike Mikel Kroll for Hoffer Racing in another GT3 AM car, the Mercedes. It's 18th. 
Red Ant Racing's 992 19th. 992 Am entry for HRT Performance is in 20th position for Stefano Monaco. Jose Closer, second in GTX in that mighty Mark 2 V8 from VDS Racing Adventures. Laurent Mishbash for Orchid Racing Team is running in 22nd and in the 992 Am class. The recovering Wachenspiegel Team Monschau Ferrari now 23rd ahead of the Razoon More Than Racing GTX car, which is the KTM Crossbow. And then outside the top 24, the 988 MRS GT Racing Porsche for Anti Ramo. 26th is the Vortex V8 for Philippe Bornell and Laurent Pochard's 910 Saint Lazure Racing Porsche Cup car is 27th. The GT4 race leader is Atlas BX Motorsport of Korea with their Mercedes GT4. NKPP by HRT Performance 29th in the Vortex, the second of those cars, 30th. And 709 for Escuderia Faroon in 31st, a slightly older Porsche Cup car. Hoffer racing by Bont Motorsports BMW, the only Beamer in the race is 32nd, that's car number 431. And finally, in 33rd place, Richardson Racing's 906 Porsche, the NM Racing car, which is uh, York VB, VBAR now at the wheel, but again, they have certainly had their issues with a prolonged spell in the first corner gravel after contact with the 22 Ferrari. Bugera ZM Racing's 35th for the 416 numbered Mercedes, and 405 GSR Motorsports rounds out our 36 runners in the GT Series. And as we venture into our seventh hour of this year's 24 hours of Barcelona, we uh, are in the 24th edition of this race, and now a chance to wind, to take back a little bit, to tell you, if you're just coming in, what you've missed in the first six hours of the race. through its short course we had Julian Antlauer getting closer and closer to the race lead he's now just seven seconds down but that's Bruce Jones that was having sneeze. a little sneeze there yeah. I was getting so excited it was just around 55 seconds at the start of this stint and Julian Antlauer is now within seven seconds and closing on the race leader the car that's running last is on our screens now it's the uh, 
Ernesto Globicha driven GSR Ginetta. This is the car that's had so much overheating uh, trouble, and hopefully for her, as the evening cools down, it may give it some form of sustenance where it can pick up its pace, but right now they're nursing it around there. They're short pit stops, but the car is always being dragged back into the pit garage so they can take a little look and see what they can do uh, to stop it from overheating. But right now, it's just a case of getting out there and going on around. The temperature is starting to come down. It uh, rose to 27 degrees today, but here we are at uh, just gone six in the evening, and it's now down by a degree or two. So we are just under two hours away from the sun officially setting. There's a bit of darkness here and there in the sky, but it's uh, generally unthreatening clouds after a troubled day of weather on Friday here. Friday qualifying, there were some test sessions midweek as well. But the opening six hours of this race has been all about trying to find some sort of dry setup that has not been there for all of day one of the meeting. Matcha Dittri, who spent some time um, flirting, certainly with the top four positions, has just got out of his car and straight to Nick Damon. Uh, Matthew, firstly, I've spoken to a number of people today. You don't look as hot as the others. Um, is it, have you got air conditioning in your car? <laughs> no, no, we don't have, so it's pretty hot. How, how is it out there now? How are conditions? What's the track like? Can we... How is the track now after a few hours of running? Uh, the track is horrible to drive. There is no grip. Uh, always on the steer, so yeah, we have to keep going. It's a long race, but at this moment, the track is very difficult to drive. Is, you say this understeer, is this a setup issue or is it just a case that where the track got washed yesterday, all the grip went? I think it's a track because we didn't change the setup and yesterday the car was good, so we have to see during the night if it's the same issue or not. Is there anything you can do or just wait for it to get cooler and, and, and hope that as the track will come to the car? I don't know, I have to discuss with the team. Maybe we can do something with the tyre pressure, but not so much because we have... A, we are in a good position, so we don't have to lose some time, so that. Has RT, you've driven for them for most of the races, but you get a different set of teammates every time. How difficult is it to keep forming new team bonds with different drivers? Yeah, it's not easy for sure, because uh, every time you have to uh, do it again, the process for the driver change. In this race, we have some issue with that. We practice a lot, but it's never easy to have the same uh, um, yeah, I don't know the word. But sorry, but it's not easy. <laughs> That's right, Matthew. Good luck and uh, keep going. Now, hang on. Don't go anywhere. Well, uh, you, you can go, but don't you go anywhere. I want to show you something. I was meandering around the back, as you do. And look, I found this. It's a little gift that uh, Creventic have given to all the teams. Thank you for this amazing season. And now, guess, boys, you've got to guess what is inside Burr. the tin. No, no. I think it's where is Creventic uh, base in the Netherlands. So, what small sweet treat will be in here? Uh, Stroopwafel. Stroopwafel. Got it in two. I still prefer the thought of myrrh, but actually, I... look at those, Nick. I'm now feeling very <laughs> hungry indeed. You're not one of the three kids. Exactly. You're a very naughty boy. <laughs> And are about to have a change for the lead of the race happening right in front of us. It was down to 1.2 seconds at the start of the lap, but Daniel Allerman hanging on to the lead, but sweeping around the outside and trying to make it stick into turn 10 and getting the job done is Julian Andlau. He's gained 55 seconds in this stint. They're an hour and 10 minutes in, so not long until they need to pit, but uh, prize and no prize as yet. But pride, I said first. Julian Andlau, he's hunted down Daniel Allerman, but Daniel Allerman is still waiting for the cavalry to arrive for Herbert Motorsport. And as the, it happens so often, doesn't it? Imagine if they'd had one lap before the, more, less before their, or fewer before their pit stop, that move wouldn't have happened. But uh, change of lead there, IMSA LS performance, bragging rights to them and Julian Andlau, but a good job still from Daniel Allerman. Good building blocks for Herbert Motorsport. Yeah, and uh, whether they were measuring Daniel's speed to to the pit stop and saying you're likely probably on your in lap to be overtaken by Julian and Lauer, but don't worry about that because it's all part of the longer term plan <laughs> who will, who knows but um, Daniel wants useful information and uh, he precisely went to pit now the slight difficulty could be that the later arriving Ferrari number 22 has now gone across the nose of the Porsche so does that mean the release from the fueling area could be a, a little tricky. I think there's it enough be clearance fine. there. Just actually. enough clearance, yes. The, the camera 
t tells a touch of a lie uh, for the foreshortening of it because there's a good, probably, car length between the two of them. Uh, to go back to the point that Nick was making about Mathieu Detri and this re revolving door of different teammates, he began the year at the Dubai 24 Hours with Fred Viavici and Stefan Perra, and they made up a pro am lineup. But since then, cycling through the car, Olivier Bertels, uh, Gregoire Sauvé, and then here he's got one, two, three, four, five teammates Max Hoffer, Mika Panu, Chris Cools and Gavin Pickering, and in the case of Cools and Pickering, they have not been part of Haas RT prior to Barcelona, so that's the reason why there's been lots of extra practice for driver changes who were not uh, in the loop before, so three, six, nine different drivers in car 21 through the course of this season already. Again, the under green flag, the refueling stops team to take forever. We should have the CP Racing Mercedes, I would have thought, which should sweep by the moment to take the lead of the race, running at a, a different uh, time. They're about uh, 52 minutes into their stints. They've got about another 18 minutes, perhaps, for Charles Putman. He should go into the lead of the race because the Herbert Motorsport Porsche, which was overtaken just before they came into the refueling stop, is still being refueled, and just uh, the next... Uh, pump before it actually the one before it is being occupied by Julian Andlower and will bring their cars into the pit lane for the pit stop but still that long refueling period and still just alongside them with the tail sticking out a little bit is the Ferrari that led the race early on by a minute and 20 seconds had a little bit of a mishap down at turn two and yes according to the, the, the gap between the two lead Porsches the first and second place Porsches when they came into pit lane they were separated by about a second and a half after that passing manoeuvre by Julian Andlauer. And as they leave the plump pumps, it stays much the same. Keeping uh, a tab on how the RPM car is getting on still. Nicholas Jonsson driving that and leading the uh, Porsche 992 AM category. And as the cars leave the fueling area, the cars we've been talking about, heading right in the direction of Nick. change round depending on who is in that IMSA car. And the answer is Gregory Gilver. So back to where they started effectively. Gilver was in the car at the start of the race at midday. So we've had Julian Anlauer and who else then in the 76? Because you've not Simon Termont. In fact, they've all run because uh, Laurent Urgol had a go as well. We they heard did. from him at uh, around five o'clock when we came back up into the commentary box. He was looking uh, as warm as all the other drivers who've got out. Uh, certainly been a very warm afternoon here. It got to 27 degrees at Barcelona, but we're now at uh, just gone quarter past six in the evening. So it is starting to cool just a little bit. But the flags above the pit lane hanging limpid. So, pit stops happening. Uh, well, the, the, the Machu de Tree pit stop happened seven or eight laps ago. We obviously heard from Machu chatting to Nick, and Mika Panu took over there. We've had the stop from the Mercedes, although Charles Putman uh, continues on. No, big problem. We haven't had the stop yet. It's uh, sort of slightly showing erroneous information in front of me. But we've certainly had the top two in. Charles, as we said, ca can always uh, have gone a bit further, uh, not yet ticking off the hour on the drive time, and probably with a bit of code 60 here and there, she'll be able to go north of 60 minutes in the CP racing car. So they're leading GT3 AM. This is great, though, from a, a driving combination perspective. The overall top three in GT have one of each in the different combos. So 
GT3, GT3 Pro-Am second, GT3 Am in third. There are many ways to do well in this race, it seems. Uh, certainly are, and I think this next stint is going to be very interesting. Gregory Gilbert came out in the lead in the IMSA LS Performance Porsche, that a group performance Porsche, that's car 76, the black one, and the red and white one of Herbert Motorsport, car number 91, has got Patrick Cole. Patrick has many, many years of GT3 experience, where for Gilbert, who started the race for the IMSA crew, he's been a GT4 driver for many, many years years in fact he's been a double french gt4 champion in 2018 2019 was a gt4 pro-am champion in france in 2020 but he's sort of stepping up trying gt3 and i think well let's find out how that how i would expect that uh, patrick Kolb should gain a little bit of that lost time back again bear in mind there was about almost a minute swap with uh, Julian Andlauer hunting down the Herbert Motorsports Porsche for IMSA LS, and he managed to get ahead just before the pit stops, and that is why the 76 Porsche for IMSA is in the lead of the race. But I, I'll be really interested to see their respective pace, and uh, next time around I'll give you a clear answer on that for their first flying lap out of the pits. Keeping an eye on cars earlier, uh, further down the order that uh, are gaining a few places, the Fabio Spergi driven Porsche from the 992 class just gained a couple of spots on that lap. Raphael van der Straten and Jochen Krumbach, remember him? He led the race for a big portion of the start of it in the WTM by Rinaldi racing car. So back into the 22 goes Jochen Krumbach. Big challenge though now for the bronze rated driver to get that Ferrari back into contention after it lost over 10 laps as the Race leader Gregory Gilvert heads downhill towards the first corner with its lean rank number still flashing, indicating that that is our GT Series uh, race leader. And Nick has a little more from the pits for us. Yeah, just uh, down with the 11, the um, Hopper Racing Mercedes. Uh, Michael Kroll's just got out and he's walked out of it about as gingerly as I would. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, I feel his pain as after an hour in the racing car, everything has completely stiffened up. Now, I'm trying to work out who's got in. I don't recognise his helmet. It's quite a slow stop. Um, may well be uh, the new driver. Well, the new driver to me, because uh, obviously Carson Tilke has been in the car in the team before, sorry, and the new driver is uh, Manuel Rubo. I don't know it might be. Either or someone's got a very nice new helmet. But away they go. Um, and down here in Hoffa Racing, obviously, they... they it's interesting because one person who's, who's racing here for one of the TCR teams is Christian Frankenhut, who of course was absolutely a major part of the Hoffer Racing team in the, before they had that kind of brief, well I call it sort of a brief child break, and they had a break while Chantal and uh, Alex were bringing up their the first couple of years their youngster. They come back now, but they've uh, no more Kenneth and, uh, uh, and no more Christian, who were always the life and soul of the party. And the great thing about Kenneth Heyer is it gave us an excuse to tell his dad's story every time. <laughs> Which is? <laughs> oh, Bruce is with you. Bruce no, can I tell know. the story well know, better yeah. than I can. Uh, if yeah. someone and needs a gate open, yeah. you shall have your Formula 1 debut, whether you've qualified or not. But ever since, and, ever, and even before, you can wear a jaunty hat with a feather in. So that's uh, encapsulated all of that. Uh, Carsten Tilko was the question. That was the, uh, the driver who set off in the, doing the outlet now for Hopa Racing in their GT3 Mercedes. We were trying to encourage Ben Constantinuris this morning as we were driving into the circuit to do exactly the same thing because the Porsches were about to go out on, for one of their sessions. We said, go on, Ben, just join that. Yes. No one will know. The gate was open and our little hire car, I think, might have struggled up the hills, frankly. Not overly powerful. <laughs> Very much not a Porsche. So we may, yeah, we might have been rumbled. OK, now as I wanted to know the respective pace of Patrick Col Kolb against Gregory Gilvert. Gilvert leading uh, the race for the IMSA LS Group performance team, but the gap is coming down because the last lap was only two seconds quicker for Herbert Motorsport and Patrick Kolb. So uh, having had the gap go the other way, it's early days in this stint, so let's see how they settle down. There could have been tra traffic involved, and in fact, uh, Spotted Herbert Motorsport and Patrick Cole on his outlap going very wide at turn nine. I thought, hello, but he seems to have settled down very nicely, as you'd expect a driver of his merit to be able to do so. I was interested in looking up when Christian Frankenhout last race for Hoffa, and uh, well, in a Creventi race. It looks like the Dubai 24 hours in 2019. When Already were... that long ago, yeah. no getaway, getaway. A6 Am. And let's just have a look to see who is uh, in their driving combination. Yeah, Chantal and Michael Kroll, Alex Prinz, Kenneth Heyer.
Christian Frankenhaus. So that was when the band was last together, if you like. Sadly, that uh, on that occasion, it ended in retirement. But the start of 2019, time really does fly. But it's good to have Christian Frankenhaus as part of the 24H series paddock once again, although in very much different machinery. He's now uh, rated silver by the FIA. I'm pretty sure he was gold for a period of time. Another seven minutes or so, we'll have another half an hour in the book. And if you are booked in for one of the transition stints, daylight into night time, then they'll be thinking about getting you suited and booted for that. Let's hope that uh, the food that need to be taken on board has been. Our, our fantastic on-site catering here at 24H Series. And then, uh, by the sounds of things, people like Julian and Lauer um, aren't going to get any sleep at all uh, with the 12 hours maximum that he could run. But those nighttime hours are going to be oh so important when you've got a pro like that in your lineup. OK, as I said, it's very early in the stint for both the, dri the drivers in first and second, the 76 Imps of Porsche and the 91 Herbert Porsche. And uh, Patrick Kolb is actually, as he went faster than the race leader, Gregory Gilver. Gilver settles down, is now lapping at the 1 minute 45s, quickest driver out on the circuit. So the advantage from first to second has uh, stretched from six seconds to eight seconds. But again, a little bit of traffic could affect either of them. We've still got 39 cars Having started this race, 39 cars still going. Some with a little bit of a trouble, but uh, right now, one thing I think we need to look at, Johnny, is the, the speed, the lap times that the WTM by Rinaldi Racing Ferrari can do. It's still down in 23rd position. Actually, when I said Gilver is the fastest driver in the race, I hadn't seen the pace that Ferrari's doing. He's in the 1 minute 45, and the Ferrari, with Jochen Krumbach, the driver who sprinted away in the first two hours of this race, is... Uh, down in the one minute 43s mm. still to 123rd position it's amazing when you lose so much ground there were 11 laps shed as uh, the various uh, ailments were sorted out in the garage and probably the equivalent of the um, best part of a lap being lost when there was the spin down at turn two just after then advice took over to be the second driver in that number 22 ferrari entered by wtm or WTM run by Rinaldi Racing, but Jochen Krombach is showing there's nothing wrong with his pace in the car at the moment. We didn't expect there to be, quite frankly. No, the way that he started at midday today, like a scalded cat, just really did rock it off into the distance and certainly impressed me. His uh, Nürburgring Nordschleifer uh, knowledge is never in question, and you should be able to reapply that to uh, other circuits like this too but some lead they had uh, but a story of what might have been for wtm even this early on in the race what's going on with you nick in the pits so i'm just wondering whether this is the most um, geographically diverse team uh, where they're based because you've got um uh anthony lee from new zealand uh, Michael Patab from South Africa, Harley Heyman from Britain, and uh, Julian Hayden from Germany. So I think if you go from New Zealand, Britain, to South Africa, you've covered the biggest geographical area possible. And I was formulating that in my mind as Harley Houghton took over the car from Michael Patamba. And I'm not quite sure it happens because you don't have a clutch, really. Somehow the clutch got released and it launched forward whilst uh, the uh, assistant mechanic was still in the car door and he was kind of pulled along, but only about three metres. It looked more dramatic than he was. He gave a wry smile as he got out. So that's my challenge for you boys, the full entry list. Is there any other team where the people driving are more geographically spread than we'll these We'll get back boys? to you, but that certainly appears and the girls. initial winner with, uh, as you say, Mikael Pitamba from South Africa, Anthony Lees from New Zealand. And again, just reiterating how this uh, 24H series has expanded through, th through the years and more and more people wanted to come and play on some fantastic circuits. You know, you kick off at Mugello and it seems to get better and better from there. It's really catching on. You've got Atlas BX Motorsports from Canada to the Netherlands to Korea, but probably still nowhere near the mileage that Nick's talking about there. Uh, interesting, I, I might need a bit of time uh, to go away and research that, and that's not conducive to uh, me and you talking. No, but luckily you brought a globe with you to the corner of the well, commentary have, box, so you can a few pins. spin that around, yeah. but uh, I, I suppose really the prize in terms of the team that comes from furthest away has to go to Atlas BX Motorsport, because I would have thought that uh, that is furthest away, based in South Korea. Mm. And all yeah. the drivers have a Korean element to their 
to their nationality. And in fact, uh, Ronald Bruins is one of the few drivers I know who I have in my driving records with three different names. He's raced as Ricardo Bruins, Roelof Bruins, as a Dutch Korean, and also MG Choi, when he won the 2019, uh, it was then the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Asia title. Battle right down to the line, but uh, again, it's largely a Korean team, let's call it. The Atlas BX Motorsport, and it's been leading its class for a very long time. Top in GT4, actually doing very well up in the hands of TK, as we call him. In fact, that's what Stephen Cho, one of the drive calls him, but his real name is Takion Yang. And uh, that leads the class, was 27th. As I said, that fell to 28th overall, but way clear in GT4. Just reading about Atlas BX, actually there are some connections with Hankook as uh, the uh, tyre group, also of course Korean, so uh, um, interesting that we're generating definitely uh, a following in that part of the world for the 24H series and uh, helping that along has been the Hankook backing of the 24H series for a number of years now. We're powered by Hankook once again for the 24th edition of the 24 Hours of Barcelona here just up the road from Montmelo as just a dab of the brakes there into the final corner for the 72 Audi which will strip across the line very shortly indeed and we can grab this update from Nick um, as I walked down the pit lane uh, two seconds ago uh, there is literally nobody in the pits and I'm not sure about taking pit stops not one car is not circulating and I can't remember that ever happening before in six and a half hours into a race and everyone's out now i do believe i may have, even thinking that may have cursed it and we may be about to receive the 906 again or possibly even the uh this the bog motorsport car and that's about to go into the garage but for a glorious minute there there was no car receiving in pit attention and that is changing because the man for motorsport uh BMW motorsport very smart is bringing out his laptop so the, uh, the sea green and orange car has been cursed. I mean, just thinking, oh, there's nothing wrong with anything. Let's see if Michael Bog will talk to us. We're with her. Michael, what's the problem? Uh, gasoline pump, I think. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm only a driver, not a technic. Your name's on the car. Huh? Yeah, I'm only a driver. <laughs> I mean, we, we're used to you guys being running in Creventic races with, you know, quite old BMWs, cars that have been around for many years. What's it like to have a brand new car? The problem was the old one was every time the last car in the field. But now we got a new car and still the GT Ford are the last. <laughs> but we try to get in the forward and so. So basically you need to buy a GT3. Pardon me? You need to buy a GT3. For me personally, it's too fast. I used to drive with my brother and Chanta, but it's, for me, it's too fast. I'm too old for that. <laughs> with the new M4, obviously, that's got a lot of um, aids you wouldn't have had in the uh, the previous BMW. Is it is it a real pleasure to drive? Obviously, when it's working. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's uh, you you can feel it's uh, the technique going go further and further and further, but we driver. We have to learn it, that we go faster and faster and faster. But it's easy because when you're a little bit faster, not so many cars pass you, so you get faster as well again. So Yeah, you, you get a chance to get into a rhythm, don't you, when you're not having to look in the mirror the whole time? Yeah, so when you, you can drive, you can drive. This car has uh, air cooling inside, so after one and a half hour, you can get out like when you're driving to shopping. Great stuff. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. So part of the Kroll family rather than Michael Bonk. I was trying to work out whether that was Michael or Martin Kroll, though. Um, I'll, I'll stay guessing at that, but obviously he referred to his brother and he referred to Chantal Kroll, now Prinz, who has done plenty of racing in the past, and that goes back to what we were talking about with Christian Frankenhout and Kenneth Heyer. So uh, it's Martin Kroll who we were chatting to. Uh, Mark... Michael Bonk is in that car at times too. Um, Nick says they all look fairly similar. OK, well, we'll forgive you for that, no problem. Um, oh, it's a real shame that the BMW uh, is out, well, is uh, not in the race right now. Far from retired, of course, but uh, brand new car. 
with it, I suppose, can come some teething problems as well. Uh, but generally speaking, Martin uh, pretty happy, I think, with the purchase. An interesting comment he made about these days, GT3 just, just a bit too fast for me. You know, what, what people forget, GT3, GT4, nothing stands still. Of course, there's balance of performance across the various championships and things, but uh, it was commented a couple of years ago that GT4 cars are now as fast as GT3 cars were when GT3 was introduced. That sort of gets lost in the wash many a time, but, you know, uh, for the drivers, they've got to find something that doesn't spook them. You know, it's, you know, many a time over the history of sport, people have stepped up a level and suddenly went, oh, you know, actually, I'm right on the edge of my comfort. I remember friends who went to race in Formula 3 and they went, I'm frightened, stupid. And it's equivalent to flashing my, my, throwing my money out of the window of the car as I drive to whichever circuit. And they come back down to a level that's right for them, they can compete. But we, you cannot underestimate how much these GT3, GT4 cars are getting faster and faster. But it's also how you can manage the handling. Almost everybody you've heard, particularly the drivers in the Porsche Cup class cars, really struggling for grip here. Uh, circuit at Barcelona but bear in mind that we lost so much dry running yesterday it was very very wet a lot of almost every team is going to be on the back foot in terms of what experience they have and if you're just uh, listening in or watching in you might go where's the the final chicane thank goodness it's gone but it has gone so in terms of setup the teams racing here this weekend are racing on a different circuit to 2022 mm. yes true and uh, although you're taking a bit of wear and tear away there uh, in terms of whacking the curves at the chicane and a bit more heavy braking towards the end of the lap, actually what you then weave into the mix is more braking required into the first corner because you're approaching at a much higher speed. And I think actually you know, the, the heat that we're talking about, the temperatures of these massive brake discs on the GT3s really does skyrocket when you've got a long straight, a fast straight, into a hard stop down at the first corner. So, team struggling for setup. One team that was definitely struggling for setup, but certainly not in terms of pace. Rick Broikers, Broikers has just come in. He's in the fueling area, leading, or he was leading the 992, the Porsche Cup class car. Papi Cosimo now leads that up into eighth place for Willy Motorsport by Ebby Motors. And just going back, if I made that race, the battle for the lead of the race, the lap pace, Gregory Gilver leading for IMSA, and then Herbert Motorsport in second, separated by under six seconds now. If anything, Patrick Kolb just marginally faster, but I thought we'd start to get an answer in this one. We haven't as yet, but uh, six seconds, we've seen with uh, all the cars still running on the circuit, very easy to trip up over a back marker or have to be cautious, and uh, you could lose a second and a half here or there. So, uh, Greg Gilver, normally in GT4, cannot relax in the lead of the race for the IMSA LS Group performance, the black Porsche car number 76, but Patrick Kolb settling down very nicely in second place for Herbert. KTM Crossbow now heading on to the start-finish straight. Nice bit of clear road in front, which can be a rare thing around here. There's only one KTM Crossbow, again, in the entry with the flag of Austria next to it, of course, because they're built in Graz, and the Razoon more than racing uh, car ticking off another lap. That car has Christian Leumeyer at the wheel of it, second in GTX, a real collection of all sorts of different cars in GTX. That's why I half done love it, because you don't quite know what you're going to get from meeting to meeting. But uh, we have the two Vortex 1.0s in there. This KTM, the Lamborghini Huracan that leads for RD signs, and the great Mark II V8 as well from VDS Racing Adventures. And, of course, the Mercedes GT2 at the back yes. of the pack. That's down at the tail, but it was running very well early on. Just going back to the, the KTM, yesterday when the rain was lashing down, the cars were out in night practice, trying to get the two flying laps recorded for each of the, uh, the runners in the field. The KTM was coming back very slowly because the lid had popped up. The, uh, the hinge door that hinges forward and up to let the drivers in and out. It's not what you want when you're trying to go down the back straight between turns 9 and 10, but uh, coming back and probably getting quite wet in in the process as well. In the pits at the moment, the second of the Vortexes, uh, car number 702 just coming in. That's Selene Amrouche has just got out of that. Uh, and, uh, of course, an Amrouche in either of the of the Vortexes because Lionel did uh, the, the lion's share of the driving in the sister car, the 701, in the opening stages of this race. Two and a bit hours he did early on. 
Race leader from the 992 division now into fueling. That's Papi Cosimo for Vili Motorsport. Four cars totally together on the screen. Uh, it tell us who's doing what in the 992 class. Fabian Dance back into Red Camel, Jordan Stott NL after doing a couple of races previously this season and indeed last season. So Fabian getting more and more familiar within Red Camel when it's normally been a broker's family effort. So they have four drivers. Fabian Dance coming across from the TCR version of the 24H series. And Fabian now on an out lap. So that's what's dropped in behind Vili Motorsports and the HRT and Red Ant Racing Porsche Cup cars. And I would imagine Papi Cosimo will be due to get out of that car. It feels like he's been at the wheel of the Billy Motorsport uh, for a couple of stints now. Gregory Gilver getting a little close to the 929 Porsche Cup car in the braking area there for turn 10. So, again, as you are trying to lose as little time as possible through some of this traffic, you never quite know who's at the wheel of each of the so-called slower cars. And just a hair's breadth there between wheel arches for the race leading car and Charlie Putman. Although, unbelievably, though, Charlie Putman's CP Racing car goes another lap down now. That means two laps separate first from third. It looked like an inconsequential moment, but if you have, you know, you could so easily pick a puncture up with a bit of tire, a bit of rubbing bodywork onto the tire, tires of the CP Racing uh, Mercedes, but at uh, the last moment, Charles Putman suddenly thought, I'm going to go as far left as I possibly can to keep out of the way. Otherwise, it'd be rear quarter of the... Uh, it's a Porsche coming through, striking the front right-hand corner of the CP Racing Mercedes. So good job from Charles Putman, needing the GT3 AM class to just keep it out of the way. But Gregory Gilver has no margin to lose at the moment. It's, it was 6.2 seconds his lead. It's now 5.7 seconds, but he's got through that group of cars. Patrick Kolb will have to do the same. And all these drivers, they look up ahead. If you've suddenly got two Porsche Cup cars battling for position in front of you again, please just sort it out, if you will. Lights flashing from our race leader, Gregory Gilbert, dives up the inside of one. He's got the other one to pick off. This could be a chance for Patrick Kolb to slow that uh, close that margin down to maybe under five seconds but of course when you get a gaggle of cars it could be there for Kolb as well but uh, two Porsches dominating this race at the moment we are on the 200th lap now just uh, bar, well 40 minutes beyond the one quarter mark so on for a very decent amount of laps completed potentially by midday tomorrow Bouguera, who've had lots of difficulties through the course of the race, are now back in the pits. How are things going, Nick Damon? Well, we've had a bit of a flurry, actually. Bouguera, to my right, are doing a full service with their recovering 416 Mercedes. Right in front of me is the Land uh, Motorsport Audi uh, R8. In the colours, we, we personally, as Creventic uh, regulars, would think of the car collection Motorsport, but is that the Dr. Hannes Kirchhoff's colours? He's just got out the car, Ingo Vogel in. Then to my left, um, it's a real swap of the veterans because Nicholas Johnson is getting out of the 907. And a man who was absolutely synonymous with racing Porsches 25 years ago and up until a few years ago, Patrick Heisman's getting into it. So anyone who's a big, big motorsport fan from many years ago will remember that Patrick Heisman was often featured for his uh, interesting race reports, where they were always unlucky in qualifying, and the weather report was important as the overall result. But Patrick is an absolute classic, obviously a multiple uh, Porsche Super Cup champion as well. He's now in the 907, so if he, anyone get one of those things to work, it's Patrick. Anyone who wins a Porsche Super Cup title has uh, certainly uh, some feathers in their cap, but uh, four years in a row, 1997, 1998, 1999, guess the fourth one, 2000 for, for Patrick Houseman there. And uh, so lost none of his speed, but uh, quite right, Nick. And uh, the team running that Porsche, his Porsche at the time, a certain Olaf Manti Racing, who are fairly well associated with Porsche racing even to this day. Uh, although Olaf uh, stepping away from looking after the team itself, but Manti, a key Porsche preparer the Nürburgring and other places too. We've had Manti associated with Herbert Motorsport in this championship in years gone by too. And Patrick Hausman at the wheel of that car and where's he going to rejoin? 16th position for RPM Racing. 
So yes, that's uh, it's not, it's barely a, a change in pace, I would suggest, with Nick Johnson getting out. The RPM car is still going to go incredibly well. Well, we're having a little debate last night. What is the longest standing driver pairing in motor racing? It surely has to be Tracy Crowe and Nicholas Johnson. It's been forever and many days. Uh, the young Swede, I remember seeing him racing in in Formula 3. He had a funny funny experience once, about the same, same time, racing in the very early 90s in Formula 3. Um, Gilles de Ferran doing great things, obviously went on to do great things in IndyCar. He said it's quite extraordinary. We're at the Marlborough Masters in, uh, at Sandvoort in the Netherlands, and he said, who's that Swedish guy? He uses the clutch when he changes gear, which, you know, no, no one else was doing that stage. They were just crashing it through the box. But he said, but he's quick. Yeah. <laughs> he could be quicker if he didn't use the clutch, but I'm sure soon thereafter. But then coming into contact with Tracy Crowe, obviously giving Tracy, you know, driver support, driver mentorship, but, you know, they're obviously on the same wavelength, got it to work, and all these years later, they're still racing together. That is a partnership. Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, certain driving styles don't feel like they should be quick, but actually they do a very good job. I, I remember uh, paying close attention to Shane Van Gisbergen uh, in the NASCAR race earlier this year, where on a street track, he was using the clutch. Nobody else in the field had a clue what he was doing, but that's how, on a very bumpy street track, actually, you prevent the rear wheels from locking a great deal. So, you know, supercars to NASCAR, and he won the thing. So sometimes different approaches will get 30 you 30 years, success. the partnership with Nicholas Jonsson, ah. and uh, let's go down, because Nick has captured the Flying Swede. Nicholas, um, one of the most experienced drivers here, but um, it's obviously hot even for you. Yeah, it's uh, really hot for me as well, it is. I mean, I don't know, we have some sort of issue with uh, airflow in the car. So we have absolutely no airflow in the car, and uh, it gets way hot. We're, we're postulating that your um, partnership with Tracy Cron may be the longest partnership in motor racing history. You think it's 30 years. What keeps you guys coming back and racing together? Having fun and still be competitive, you know, it's a motivation, right? And, uh, you know, it's, we, we ask good friends, obviously, but Tracy has a huge passion for racing, and we decided many years ago that we were going to try to go racing together and we're going to stay together as long as we can. So we're probably going to retire together. Whenever that is, future, you know, we'll tell, but uh, hopefully not, you know, for another few years. You're a cup of legends of the sport, but you've been joined by another Porsche legend in uh, Patrick Heisman. How did that come about? Well, Patrick and I have known each other for a long time because we both, you know, really old farts, right? We used to race together back in the LMS days, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, both driving for Porsche factory, you know, me for the American Porsche factory and him for the North European. So we got to know each other back then. And now when we both uh, have been degraded to bronze and uh, amateurs, figure out, you know, why not to get back together and get the, you know, the old band back together. Just one quick question about the car. Most of the Porsche teams are complaining about complete lack of grip. Are you also suffering from that? Yeah, we definitely are. I mean, uh, Hancock brought a different tire in this weekend, and I think we haven't really been able to develop that yet, so we do struggle with it. I mean, it's a way of trying to kind of take care of the tire, I think, the first half of the stint, to kind of make it last. But we're not quite sure about pressures and temp and stuff yet either, but we, we get in there. But uh, it's definitely a challenge for sure. Oh, I wasn't aware. So is this new tyre a track-specific or one that will be used moving forward? I think this is the tyre that's going to be used moving forward. So we're going to have to go testing over the winter to figure this out. Great stuff, Nicholas. Uh, I'll throw the ball to over yourself. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Really interesting. Uh, Nicholas Jonsson, we know he's as fit as a fiddle. One of these uh, pro drivers always kept it up. But just when you've got no airflow going through the car, every inch of his body was uh, glazed in perspiration. I'd be like that after two laps, but he's uh, fitter than me. But uh, again, though the temperature is starting to drop a little bit, the heat, it's something if, no, if somebody has never seen motor racing before, they couldn't understand the heat just sitting in the car. Plus the fact you're being physical. You've got the two straights here at Barcelona, but the rest of the lap, 12, 14 turns to be fitted in. They're working hard, very hard. And a lot of the teams, again, we mentioned this, particularly the Porsche Cup cars, really struggling to get a setup here. So they're, they're fighting the car much more than they normally would. You say how professional Nick is. He also maintained eye contact to the camera until it went off air. He was desperate for a glug of water, but he kept looking down the lens of the camera. Am I off? Am I off? Am I off? And now I can say thank you. So, you know, broadcasting as well, uh, as well as being incredibly quick in that car. Look, it also comes from racing in the States for so long. It's, you know, he had an illustrious record, three-time 
Swedish kart champion, straight out of that into little si junior single-seaters, double Swedish Formula 3 champion, then he's a Scandinavian touring car champion, but what he was always short of, that was 1992, the last of those titles, then he was fishing around, he didn't have a budget to go anywhere, he went and competed in Formula Asia, one of those single-seater series that comes and goes, but then he went to the States and then it all clicked in, he's had to work at his career, but I love the fact he said, we will go racing, Tracy Crabber and I, as long as we're having fun, they're clearly still having fun. Yeah. The fact he's still thinking what we can do over the winter to make us faster in 2024. So well done to Nicholas. You know, it's really great to see someone who hasn't been lined with cash, who's been able to make a career work. I was interested just to look at the statistics of both Patrick Hausman and Nick Johnson at Le Mans as well, because Hausman there as early as 94, it was a further 12 years, I think, before Nick Johnson first appeared in 2006. I've, I've 2006, spot yeah. on, well yeah. done. So again, that shows you time over in the States, doesn't necessarily get the opportunity to go to Circuit de la Sarte and possibly budget as well, holding him back. Both definitely uh, worthy of going to the great endurance race and of a similar age as well, only two part, two years apart. Anyway, they're in the same car this weekend uh, and, as he said, been mates for years. Speaking of Porsches, second position for Patrick Kolb in the Herbert car, trying to keep tabs with... Gregory Gilver, he's taking a little bit of time out of him here and there, but actually lost about half a second last time through, so 7.3 is a gap that Patrick and the team at Herbert will be monitoring to a certain extent. We are north of 200 laps, though, now, as I said, we were working 200 last time I mentioned that distance, it's 2.04. And who's best the rest? It's uh, one lap down or around, actually, more than two and a half minutes down. So a lap and a half is uh, Mika Panu for Haas, RT, the, the best of the Audis in third place overall. CP Racing, Charles Espinel has taken over from Charles Putman. He is leading the GT3 AM class now in fourth place, but we do have these different cycles. Uh, Fabian Dance has taken over the Red Camel Jordans dot NLO Porsche that's leading the Porsche Cup. That's down in the ninth overall, two places ahead of Willie Motorsport, but we've just had Charles Putman out of the car, and Nick is like white lightning, and that was the team that uh, Nicholas Johnson made his debut at Le Mans, but down to Nick in the pit lane. Charles, how was that stint for you? Oh, that was a lot of fun. You know, I got, I kind of get the prime selection time, so the sun was going down, the track was cooling a bit, so traffic was spread out a little bit, so it was a lot of fun for me to drive. A lot of um, uh, issues, certainly, with some of the other chassis about grip, they haven't gotten easy to save the Mercedes. Is your car better? Yeah, yeah, we're we're really struggling for grip. Uh, we just have to be, you know, drivers. You have to be really patient. The tires only take so much power before they'll spin and they'll only turn so fast. So it's just a matter of self-discipline and unfortunately slowing the car down a little more than our brain tells us we should. But uh, you know, obviously. Uh, this type of conditions, it's not rain, but it's that type of a thing. So you kind of have to drive it with that same mentality. And of course, the straight line setup helps tremendously in these these situations. <laughs> you've um, you obviously been at this, this race several times. Is, is this is this track feeling very different from previous years? I mean, it has the has the change in layout exacerbated the problems? No, I, I think everybody likes the change in layouts. It's really for us as drivers, it's a lot more exciting. It's a lot more fun. Um, I'm a technical guy, so I don't mind the chicanes, but I also like this layout. But across the board, I've heard all the drivers say they really prefer this layout. But the track itself is kind of Barcelona. It changes as the day goes on, the grip goes up, the grip goes down. But it's a great, challenging track. That's why everybody wants to drive here. Charlie, thank you, mate. Thank you, guys. That Charlie. is it. That Charlie, is come time-honoured point from Charles Putman there. This track famous for its uh, grip going through the course of the day. I mentioned earlier in off-season in particular, it was the wind. You've got the combination of the different corners, but the grip level up and down all the time. We're going to do this through the course of the race, show you the real-time points situation. Just the top three for each of the teams and uh, the classes within, for example, GT3. So it's still a 10-point gap. If it were to end like this, Haas RT are currently third with Mika Panu doing a stint in that number 21 Audi. CP Racing's Mercedes tucked in behind with Charles Espenlaub now driving the car that earlier had Charlie Putman in it, or very shortly ago had Charlie Putman in it. Four points back from that, Scherer Sport PHX. They have had difficulties, and their number one car with Elia Earhart at the wheel is running in seventh position. The other real-time standings we will work our way through 
in the next eight minutes or so towards the top of the race hour. Side-by-side -side action there as down the inside will go the Lant Motorsport Audi. Share of Sports BHX Audi, though, leading the GT3 Pro-Am points standings and comfortably on 160 from our current... Well, I was going to say current leader. That's no longer the case, of course. Pro-Am leader, though, Herbert Motorsport on 76, and then the Lance Motorsport car in third position in the real-time points standings. And we can nibble there to the rear of the Lance Motorsport car is the 85 Charles Espenlau Mercedes then. They're desperate to try and keep the nose clean on that Mercedes after it had damage early on in the weekend. And speaking of CP Racing, the GT3 Am leader is also leading the points on 158 by 10 from e2p racing and that motorsports are still in third a little kink at the right hander at turn nine then you can really start to open the throttle up as you head between the white concrete walls Hard onto the brakes through this reprofile corner in recent years, so you can afford to open the steering a little more readily than only two or three years ago. Now, this is really tight as a category for class 992. On current standings, Vili Motorsport by Ebi Motors lead by only two over the Red Hat Racing crew. Red Hat Racing with the 903 going to say, although they have got a couple of cars in the race, haven't they? So it might be 9.04 with Mark Goosens, who Bruce and I were talking about during the lunch break. Uh, the fact that Mark had sneaked into the entry there with uh, Red Ant Racing. Good to have Mark and someone of his calibre uh, again. We're talking about Nick Johnson and uh, Patrick Heisman. Well, sort of, sort of cut from the same mould, um, Mark Goosens. Red Camel Jordans NL to finish the point about teams in the 992 division, they're eight points adrift of the Red Ant crew and a total of 10 from Vili Motorsport. So nose to tail once more between the third place car of Miku Mikapanu, darting up the inside there into turn four. The 992 AM team, so this is all to do with driver combination again, similar to how GT3 works, and runaway leaders are RPM Racing from the sister Red Ant Racing car and then HRT Performance, but Red Ant and HRT on exactly the same point, so that fight's all about second in the remaining hours of this year's European Championship. Right, we need to look at what's happening in the lead of the race. The, the margin between first and second, between the Yimpsa number 76 Porsche and the Herbert Motorsport uh, entry number 91, was around five, six seconds. It's now nearly 10 seconds, so Gregory Gilvey is really clearly adapting very, very well indeed to uh, moving up from GT4 to GT3. First year he's been doing that and uh, he's stretching his advantage but uh, don't forget most of these teams have four or five drivers in their lineup so they've got to balance it across the board through the course of the 24 hours rd sign still leading in real time by 18 points from the first of the vortex v8 teams it's really a two horse race between those two because nine and eleven nine and elf racing are not on site this weekend they are third in the gtx category one or two cars I notice now with the full beam headlights on as the light starts to fade, although we're just over an hour away from sunset. In GT4, it's Atlas BX of Korea on 180.1 points from Bulgaria ZM Racing on 62, and then PCR Sport also not here with us this weekend. So between those two, Atlas versus Bulgaria, and going the way of the South Korean squad right now with their links to well, certainly Atlas BX batteries uh, now linked company-wise with Hankook, our tyre supplier this weekend. Good to see a couple of R8s going door handle to door handle briefly there and uh, laying a bit of rubber down the Haas RT Audi out of turn five. In TCR, the team's championship very much in the hands of Holmgard Motorsport with their 120 points, virtually double the amount that Wolf Power Racing have managed to accumulate across the five-race European season that began back in March at the Mugello 12 Hours. But it's IMSA LS Group performance with Gregory Kiefer who leads now by 10.4, so that has opened up by a decent margin. 
since the last time we checked. Three more seconds added. In the GT Trophy, again, it is the story of Atlas BX Motorsports, but it's a closer affair because there's only eight points in it. Back to RPM Racing and then the RD Signs Cholet Racing crew with their Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo. But there are points, of course, as well, awarded at the 12-hour marker, so that will significantly change. Yeah, well, uh, they're quite generous points as well, uh, yeah. from 1st to 15th in your class, if you've got that many people, 20 points for 1st, 18, 16, and you can see a lot of these uh, groups, uh, championships, uh, categories are separated by a handful of points, so if you get 20 points and one of your rivals is a fair bit further back, you're going to steal a real march, and then, of course, full points at the end of the race as well. So Holmgaard Motorsport and the Hoffer Racing by Bonk Motorsport, TCE Trophy teams. There's a 40-point deficit there, which is significant, despite the 12-hour points that will be added. And Wolf Power Racing are in third, a further 12 back. Great movement from the camera that's been mounted into the Crone Racing RPM run Porsche. Just tilting from left to right. I'm not entirely sure it's meant to be doing that, but it nevertheless gives us a good view of... Uh, the forces at, at play, particularly these corners that go on, it feels like forever. Turn three and then turn four as well as you end up facing completely the other direction after those uh, right-handers. Then finally the track does turn left so you can relax the neck muscles on one side. And this portion of the track, five, six, seven, all of a sudden very, very busy indeed, Bruce. Yeah, this is the point where drivers can be late in their stint. We've heard so many complaints about just trying to get the, the cars to behave, to turn in, but if you suddenly find yourself feeling a little tired with more understeer than you'd like, very easy to slide a little wide and catch the tail. So all the drivers, you've seen their, their lap paces going up and down there, certainly working very hard at the moment, but they're taking a fair degree of caution. Gap between first and second, now 11 seconds. Gilbert continues. Maybe the flags away most vigorously, the blue flags to clear the back markers as he comes through, uh, and he's just receiving it well. But you feel fairly sure Patrick Cole will not let a great deal more go out. They're how far into their stints? 44 minutes in their stints. They've got another half hour or so a piece before they need to come in. Hassart in third place, so it's the two Porsches, then the Audi, all actually lapping at relatively similar places. Maybe Mika Panu leaving, losing a little bit of time for Hassar Far less experience, though, at this level. And so in fact, I've been very impressed with Panu. I think mm. he's come in and uh, really settled down. You know, there's a hybrid combination, a team from Aruba with a finished driver. Indeed. We were talking about the spread of teams and uh, drivers. We were mentioning Michael Pitamba and... Uh, at least New Zealand and South Africa, not respectively, quite the other way around. But yes, so it is a global series, the 24H series. Thank you, Bruce, for the last couple of hours. We'll allow you to step away and uh, we'll concentrate in a moment or two on hour eight of this year's 24 hours of Barcelona. We are live from Montmelo in the northeastern corner of Spain, in Catalonia, for yet another edition of the 24 Hours of Barcelona, live on the Radio Show Limited network of channels, both sound and vision as well, but uh, radio only for your convenience. If you'd like to take us with you, that may well suit your plans for the weekend a little more than sitting in front of a TV or indeed a device these days, but I would hope that you can reserve some segment of your weekend to enjoy the, uh, the very picturesque circuit that we're at this weekend. And, of course, in the next hour or so, we will be plunged into... Well, it'll be a gradual thing, but uh, I'm rather envious of Joe Bradley and Ben Constantinos because you'll be now enjoying that lowness of sunlight, the golden sunset that we so typically get in this part of the world, and then into darkness. Uh, we'll be back, Bruce and I'll be back for two hours of that or so, but... Um, this is where a lot of the kind of gun drivers really earn their money because there's probably about three or four or five laps where you're going to be blinded by that low sun. And then you better hope that you've learned the entry well enough because you'll just be dazzled by headlights for many, many hours. Well, this is the time of day that people write songs about, isn't it? It's the romantic hour. But as you said, Johnny, it's also a tricky hour because, you know, those windscreens are pretty dirty by now. We've had some tear-offs, we've had some wipes every time we come in the pits. But that low sun absolutely causes all sorts of problems. And it'll be, as we go through turn three, the sun will catch these drivers right in the eye line and smeared, any sort of smear across the windscreen will be 
magnified and just make the windscreens opaque for just a second till we then change direction and head down towards turn four out of the sun. Still plenty of racing left, just under 17 hours then. We've clicked by the 17 hours to go, Mark, and we've got a race, haven't we? The IMSA Group Performance Porsche, 212 laps completed, just under 12 seconds is the gap. And the trade-off of lap times is absolutely intriguing. Gregory Gilbert at the wheel of the number 76, leading car 146.648. Last time through, Patrick Colbin, the 91 Herbert car, both Porsches, of course, 1 minute 46.745. There is nothing in it. So we have a race in our hands with the Milkapano Audi Haas RT car 21 holding down third, just off the lead lap by my estimation. Then two laps behind them comes the CP Racing Mercedes. Charles Espelau now at the wheel of the number 85. They're lapping in the 1 minute 47s, the Hassarté last time through, 1 minute 49, we'll keep an eye on that. But right now, the battle at the, late, at the front of this field is intriguing. Ben Conduras joins us. And Ben, uh, Johnny and I were just waxing lyrical slightly there about the, the, this twilight hour, the golden hour. It's what people write songs about, isn't it? Uh, it's lovely, isn't it? Uh, especially in Spain, this part of the Mediterranean. For some reason, and I'm sure there's a, a scientific explanation as to why sunsets are better at this latitude, but they really are. It takes longer for the sun to set. That sounds mad, but... Well, the closer you get to the equator, it kind of just plummets, doesn't yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The roundness of the Earth, uh, and yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, we haven't got that oranginess yet, but with a bit of cloud and whispers in the sky, I'm sure we will this evening. <laughs> what a difference a day makes, eh? Uh, sheltering for them storms last night at dinner and uh, this evening able to eat my uh, uh, we're, we're able to eat my cordon bleu outside um, so riding on board with Patrick Hoisman as I said uh, in my first bit of commentary a very rec very recognized and well known uh, pilot Dutch pilot in that RPM car with a great uh, team of people now a very special moment for you all because uh, we've been talking a few times about uh, how exciting a launch we had yesterday of a brand new vehicle that will be making its debut in, Ka in Kuwait in just a few months' time. And Nick Damon is down in the paddock with the new Vortex 2.0. Hopefully you can see me, hopefully you can hear me. It is the new Vortex 2.0. And anyone who's a Creventic fan knows all about Vortexes. Now, the first thing you'll notice is this is not bits of carbon, bits of glass fiber. This is a full carbon car. It is absolutely, un it is a unique machine. They've designed it from the ground up themselves. It does actually, if you strip off the orange paint, look quite similar to the old car, but now completely in carbon. With a, again, they've been working with a couple of people who De Salt in, uh, I think they're based near Maycor. Uh, to do the uh, for the aero, if you look in the uh, it's the, the, the large piece of, of carbon. Quite, I must admit, I thought these large pieces of carbon were quite a uh, a risk. But actually, if you look at this kind of streak back into the uh, wheel art, it's exactly the same as the current car. So they have done some testing. Now, I'm not sure. I'm going to give this a go. I'm not sure it's going to work. Is their car locked? No. Look, I could I could break into their car. I've <laughs> stolen the car. It's Gullwing and ready to go. So it's a Gullwing, fully carbon machine. Uh, they are doing some testing on it. Effectively, what they've taken is their, their design, the DNA of the Vortex. They brought it forward 15, 20 years. They brought all the modern materials. It's going to make it lighter. It's going to make it better. It's going to make it easier to serve. It's going to make it stronger. However, I can't open this, but underneath this, it's the same uh, Chevrolet LS3 600 horsepower, 650 nanometer engine as before. So it'll be as quick, but show you more reliable. You can see by looking at how much more smooth it is, how the aerodynamics are much more worked out. So this car is going to become much more of a rival for the SBX people like the Lamborghini and of course our new joiner in SBX, the GT2 Mercedes. Could this be the secret weapon to take Vortex from also Rand's to front of their class. It's very attractive. It certainly looks the part, doesn't it? Yeah. 
and remember the motor that that's got that you've got strapped to your back there. That <laughs> that's a piece of I engine. Mean, that, that, it's like a fire. That would be like driving a firework. That thing. I wonder how much lighter it is than Vortex. Just about to think that. One point zero. That. Yeah. That's one for you, Nick. Uh, to try and work out uh, how much lighter the, the, the car is uh, than one point zero, because uh, and it'll be a lot stiffer as well. Yeah. yeah. Fiber. There's not much difference in weight. Last fiber yeah, is super on, you're light, rid of the, but it's not doing rid of anything. You're getting the skeleton, uh, the frame as well. Yeah. Some of the skeleton, yeah. Yeah, of course. The well, I'll try and find out. Obviously, there's a there's a limited amount of English in the vortex. So let's just guess and say quite a bit lighter. Quite, quite <laughs> lighter. Uh, and and as, you, lighter. as uh, as we said earlier, this was revealed to the public. Uh, yesterday, about 24 hours ago, before the rain came, uh, and this was the response. I'm Philippe Bonnel. Uh, uh, I take care of the communication of the French uh, racing team called Vortex. And today for, for us is the, the, the presentation of our new car, the Vortex 2.0. The main change, the main difference between the two cars is the full body uh, work in, uh, in, uh, in chassis in carbon, certified the uh, FEA for the chassis, for the crash box and for the frame on the top. For the moment, the engine is still the same between the two cars. It's a Chevrolet V8 6.2 liter, uh, 550 horses. The car has been designed by uh, our family. Uh, Gomez family with Arnaud and uh, Olivier uh, and with the help of uh, two main partners called Oxal and Miguel in France for mainly for the, the, the body parts of in carbon. The first race will be uh, with the team in Kuwait in three months and Arnaud, Olivier, Lionel and me will be in the car at this occasion. It is still unmistakably a vortex. Yes, that's quite. That is quite an undertaking. That is quite. I mean, just by looking at the way those components have been put together, carbon fibre tub. Um, all right, the engine's hanging off the back on a, on a, on a frame, but it's a stress member. Um, that is quite an undertaking and quite an investment. Yes. To, and that's a prototype, of course. That is a prototype sports car. There's no other way to describe that. Uh, um, Nick said it's it's unique. Mm. Yes, it is, which is the very essence of prototypes. Um, that's what they are. They, they, you know, all right. I don't know how many orders they're going to get, but um, you know, if we have, can you imagine half a dozen of them in the field at the moment? Just you know, part, part that would certainly you know give us a massive GTX class, and that's what the GTX class is all about. That kind of project. Um, I wish them well. I'm really looking forward to seeing that car on track at Q8, um, and then moving forward into 2024, the full season, full European season. We'll see it in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, of course. Um, but Vortex have been a big part of this championship and the big, bright orange livery of these cars that go around. I remember Mugello, was it Mugello last year when they brought three cars and, you know, space frame chassis that were looking a bit aged. Um, they still have developed them. They've, they've been working on them. They've been looking at the reliability. There's a lot of energy going through that there was that little space frame chassis from that Chevrolet V8. And I'm not surprised that, you know, attrition has become a bit of a part of the running of these cars. But uh, recently, certainly the last few races, they've gone and had some cracking runs and are a big part of the GTX class. I mean, the, the, if you look at the GTX championship standings, and I'm going to be quick on the fingers that I can get this. Um, standby caller I'm getting the GTX class up because they're a, they're a massive part of GTX they are currently in second place behind the RD signs Lamborghini so there you've got a, a vortex for year challenging Lamborghini the might of Lamborghini it's a it's a it's a in the middle of a being a, a Lamborghini trophy or car but that vortex there could easily become European champion in the GTX class 
And it is very similar to the Ginetta story in the UK, as we see yeah, the GSR yeah. Motorsport Ginetta parked up at turn one, not stuck in the gravel, so waiting to see whether they can re-fire this car up and get back going again. But obviously Ginetta with a one-make series, multiple one-make series in the UK, probably a bit further down the road uh, than Vortex, uh, but certainly with a huge amount more investment than, uh, than Vortex has. But Vortex from 2016 uh, building uh, that car so it is eight years old the vortex 1.0 uh, the dream of arno and olivier gomez uh, who are who are brothers competing uh, in the in various silhouette racing series and we go code 60. oh and look at the reaction of the uh, of uh, the the Uber racing machine there unbelievable just diving into the pits at the very last moment. We've got the 76 already in, so Greg Gilbert, that has fallen beautifully for IMSA LS Group performance because this now really resets the field. We haven't had a Code 60, would you believe, uh, for over three hours. It was our mid-hour stint last time that it happened. And so lots of green flag running, lots of green flag pit stops. We now go to a Code 60 pit stop for Patrick Kolb in the 91, but a 76 clean full tank. And Hass RT missing the Bowsers and straight to Nick Damon. No, they were already in the fuel oh, stop before Code 60 was called. So they've got a full tank. They lost half of it, or well, two thirds of it was done under green flag. Now doing a full service. Mika Piku, Mika Panu getting out, sorry. Not quite sure who's got in. I was too excited about the. But that's a quick stop. Oh, no, stall, but it's gone. But all that part of the pittery, the driver change, the tyres, that was all done for free, effectively under Code 60, and most of the fuel stop as well. So the uh, gods have smiled kindly onto Hass RT. Yeah, Hass RT, and you would say the... Uh, Everyone actually uh, took advantage of that one. Greg Gilvert, uh, Emsa LS Group, actually Renauers and the Herbert machine having to only take half a tank. They're pitting now. That will take effect in 45 minutes time when they will have to pit again and the others will be able to stay out. Uh, the Bowsers aren't completely full, uh, but there is a lot of cars making their way around the final turn, so maybe they will get fuller. Janetta obviously with a little issue, not stuck in the gravel, now being pulled away. The Imsa's with Nick now. Simon Temo or Lauren Ergen, but I didn't quite see which one it was. Uh, currently, obviously, in the car was uh, Gregory Cuivert. He's out. And it's already cleaned down the way now. Of course, they've only got half a tank, so they have less fuel added than uh, Hassel T. Oh, no, to say down the way, it was down, but it's not away. Makes a few seconds. They've still got a lot of their cooling, uh, the kind of the hip cooling you have on the... Uh, Porsche 911. They've got quite that blacked off. I expect to have it blacked off for the uh, obviously the much cooler damp weather, but it stayed um, blanked off. So obviously they've got their uh, temperature very much under control. Uh, we've got a bit of a traffic jam, I'm afraid, in the pits. The Ferrari has got blocked in by uh, the Seat Cooper, the 125, trying to find space uh, and couldn't find space. So basically parked up and blocked the 22 Ferrari in uh, for a few seconds. Uh, that has now cleared the Ferrari coming in to have the rest of its service done. Uh, but everybody wants to get a service done at this point, I think. And IMSA heading out back into the race. Uh, Nick is still watching pit stops. Yeah, down the way already, the, uh, the Herberth car, they've done, a, they've done a driver change. I'm wandering down there now to see whether the driver change they've done is someone who's arrived from Valencia or is on there is either Alfred it's Ralph or Nick. Um, it's Dan Ralph Allen. Nick. Yeah. Because Ralph, oh, they are. they are here. They have arrived. Uh, that's exciting. Well, I have to see where Robert Renau is around because the whole team should be there. Worth a chat. But yep, yeah, so that just goes, they said they'd be there for seven o'clock and quarter past seven, Ralph's in the car. And Trusses has decided to keep the 903 out and not come and fuel it right now. Not very many teams choosing to do that. No, no, the 909's in for fuel, uh, uh, Ben. Sorry, it was the 903 that's gone past then. Which yeah, that's is the red ant car. Red ant car. Yeah, different animal. Different animal. Same colour. <laughs> yeah, and not dissimilar liveries, I just, just a bit more orangey. And I'm not sure an ant's an animal, actually. It's an insect, isn't it? 
isn't an insect animal? I think so. Oh, it's still early. I in the think race. so. <laughs> the uh, ants are animals, says Nick Damon, on air. I don't know why you're still yes. on air, Nick, but you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's down to you. That's down um, to you. And uh, so, yeah, Not interestingly, the 955 and the 903 both missing the pits and carrying on. Not I. Not because the um, the fuel bowsers were full, but that's obviously playing into their strategy. Well, it's a way of, of, of gaining ground, isn't it? If the other car, the car that is ahead of you, it's a way of gaining ground. And, and while that car pits, you are gaining on it all the time. Um, and if you've, if you've got a good uh, chunk of fuel still on board, your tyres are good, your driver's good, then it's a way, you know, you can, you can miss some, a pit stop out and, and gain some time back. However, the 909, let me just have a look at the 909 is on its outlap. Fabian Dance now at the wheel of the Red Camel's car, still in the lead of the 992 class. And I'm not... Actually, you know what? Um, it's not really a surprise for those cars to stay out, Ben, because they're trying to make up a lap. Yeah, absolutely. They're trying to get back into contention, aren't they? Let's go down to Nick, who's got Patrick Cole with him. Uh, Patrick, I mean, it's a convenient time to stop, but had you already had a call saying, OK, Rolf's here, you better get out of the car. Yeah. It was, the eagle has landed, so it was, get the fuck out of my car. No, kidding. Uh, we were basically six laps to go on the fuel, so it was relatively good timing for us. Ralph is here, Ralph is on fire. He got a bit of a warm-up this morning already, so that's good. And now he can go hunt down the leader. And how is the car out there? We were hearing a lot of issues about grip for those Porsches. Yeah, well, I mean, in the end it can't be that bad because we're at the front of the pack, which is good. Um, we're struggling, we're driving around a bit around the problems. I think it's a new tire for everyone. Feels good, it seems to hold, which is nice. And uh, yeah, other than that, it's just adapting the driving style to the new tire. Great stuff, thank you, Patrick, indeed. And apologies for language, but he's just out of the car and he did need to get out of it. The rest of Europe don't mind, it's only us English. Um, so, to explain then, Ralph Byrne and Alfred Renauer Robert. race. Robert. Robert? Yeah, Alfred's been here. Okay have been uh, racing in Valencia today in the sprint series of the SRO Endurance Championship. And that's about four and a half hours drive away. Haven't clarified how they've arrived here. Planes, trains and automobiles, eh? Yeah, because I think a helicopter would be a lot faster. Uh, but they have now arrived. Valencia race was at two o'clock local time. And uh, so they gave themselves half an hour of uh, a shower. And if they did drive, then they have got here bang on time. They're going to do the night stints and all their duties here. But they then have qualifying tomorrow morning in Valencia and a second race. So uh, double bubble in uh, in an IndyCar, NASCAR, you know, Daytona, yeah. si no, yeah. what is it? Coca-Cola 600, Indy 500 kind of speck of a way. Yeah, we've had people fly, flying up from America to do the... Uh to do the um, Le Mans test here, for instance. They've done the Detroit race on the Saturday and then flown across the Atlantic, private jets, private planes, in any way, shape or form they can get across and drivers taking part in the Le Mans test here. So very, very, very international motorsport -y, that. Crucially, uh, Urban Motorsport coming back into the pits to get the second half of their fuel done. Uh, I've just seen that underneath me. Uh, so, and so has the 76 LS Group performance car. So they must have felt as though they've missed the uh, the green flag. I thought they're getting a full tank of fuel. We're going back to green flag racing now. Um, Nick, did you have anything else to add? Uh, just that um, Robert and Rolf came fourth in their class in Valencia. Ah. Fourth in the bronze cup. Oh, good. So it was probably worth it for the points. They're going for the championship. Yeah, very good. Uh, Nick, you need to clarify how they've made it from Valencia, which form of transport was the very high-speed motorcycle. I went to have a look. No sign of Robert at the moment, but I'll carry on hanging around that pit like a bad He's probably smell. part in the car. He's probably just dropped Ralph at the garage. Um, oh, it's a nightmare here parking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ralph Bond, by the way, it's a very special race for him. It's 50th, 50th race with the 24th series. So it's something to celebrate, no question. And it's great to have both Robert and Ralph having made it from Valencia, uh, no pressure at all, is it? There you go, Ralph. Oh, you've arrived. Get in the car. Where are we in the field? You're leading, mate. Yeah, and look Off at the traffic go. that he's got to contend with here. Already cleared four cars. He's got another four to get through. I think he's also leading still. 
despite the fact that uh, they were kind of caught a bit short, I think, by the uh, by the Code 60. That is real eye racing in real life, isn't it? <laughs> it's like when you, you, you get sick of a track, so you, you come off the track, you put the kettle on, have a cup of tea, sit back down, I'll try another circuit. Here he is, having been to Valencia, here he is now driving around another circuit. That really is real life eye racing. Apart from he's jumping halfway into a race, which is not something <laughs> yeah. you can do. Yes. Yes, we'll see just how much uh, of an impression he can make on that car. Um, 1 minute 44, they were, they were lapping in 1 minute 46s, um, the, um, the Patrick Kolb was. So we'll see if Rolf can get straight back on it and straight on the pace. Now, we know the car's good, we know what the car's capable of. We spoke about this a little bit earlier on, but the greatest difference he's going to have to adapt to is the tyres. Yes. Because he's on the Pirelli tyre in SRO. It's the same car that he's driving, uh, obviously not exactly the same car, but it's going to feel very different because of the Hankook tyres that we have in this series versus those Pirellis. Probably not as different as the Michelin, because the Michelin, inherently, the French build quite... Um, strong stiff tyres not whereas the I know the Hankook and I know the Pirelli but the, the Pirelli. Hankook is quite a soft sidewall so it moves around a lot more. The Pirelli's a softer compound as well. as well yeah so you'll not be able to lean on the Hankook like you can with the Pirelli mm, that's you know true. you can you can really lean on the front end when you've got a softer compound you've got to be a much more delicate to get the tyre to bite when you've got a more robust compound which the Hankook is and of course you'll compromise the chassis setup around that tyre, so right. with a stiffer tyre, you'll soften the suspension to try and get the same feel as a... But the s softness of a tyre uh, will be... Oh, and there's also... Sorry to interrupt myself. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> sorry for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's coming to the end of the evening. Uh, 91 Herbert Motorsport Machine has a 10-second penalty for not respecting the refuelling regulations. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe you remember we, you described Ben how that car very last minute darted into the pit lane. Um, did he? Did he cross the blend line? Is there a blend line? Well, that that doesn't come under fueling regulations as well, does it? That's more track rig track infringement. So f uh, f putting too much fuel in or something like yes, that. Yes, something Seven like that. Alvaro Fontes here in the uh, skid area. Faron is facing the wrong direction at uh, turn eleven. Uh, sorry, turn 12. Uh, so that is the p almost the penultimate turn. And uh, we didn't see what happened there, but uh, presumably we get going again because it didn't look like there was any contact. They're saying that he hasn't moved. No, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah he's fired, he refired it back, back up. Alvaro getting the car back on track. And it looks, it looks like there isn't any apparent signs of why that may have been just a harmless spin car showing no signs of damage as it comes through turn 13 onto the final corner of the track to complete a lap and he's getting now under speed cars are going to just go past him and he'll be getting back in trying to find his composure getting his heart rate down after that little spin certainly the heart rate goes flying up doesn't it after you've made a mistake like that and uh, baptism of fire because he's right into the mid pack nick down to you yeah we just saw the uh, the lithuanian Ginetta being delivered to pit exit, uh, a few of the engineers ran down to it and started pushing it back up the wrong way at the pit lane, which is fine in Creventic, and they had a... Oh, yes. Good point. I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good point. There's a lot of 991s, 992s, 9912, 992 class. This, this GT3. is a 991. This, this is, is a 9912. Yeah. This is a 9912. Yeah. 9912. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> only, only our only boss Porsche. man Heinhoff yeah. would know. Yeah, um, we need a Porsche expert. Do we know any? <laughs> Uh, John would be able to tell us exactly the differences from the, you know, even the thickness of the steering wheel. Nick, uh, the, the next thing is to find out what the word for why is in Lithuanian and ask the Janetta boys yes. that word, because uh, it does seem a bit odd that uh, well, they that... need to have a Code 60 towed all the way around the, the circuit to pit 
it, it had, out. It had all the appearance yeah. of a control or delete, didn't it? Um, I'm not sure exactly what went on there, but if, as Nick said, they just fired it up and then went back out, that's a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit intriguing. So gaps-wise, then we're watching the leader of the race, Ralph Bond, in the Herbert Motorsport Porsche 9912. Two. Um, <laughs> ahead of Simon Terman in the IMSA LM, uh, LS Group Performance Porsche 992 GT3, I think. Can I just say, Ben, I did, I did say, let's see if Ralph Bond can get straight on the pace. Look at that, a 145.7. Oh, wow. oh, wow. He's on the pace. He's on the pace, straight away. He's first flying lap past the pits and a 145.7. Um, in comparison, 146.4 for the number 76 second place Porsche. And, and 58 one, seconds is the gap. And 58 seconds is the gap. 149.5 for Chris Jules in the Haas RT Audi. 147 dead for Yannick Mettler in the car collection Porsche. So straight on the pace. In fact, he's gone quicker. 145.3 that time. What we are waiting for... Or it, it, we do now have quite a significant gap, don't we, between first and second and then third, fourth, fifth. Yeah, spacing out. Chris Cools in the Haas RT Audi now, 220 laps completed versus the 223 uh, that the number 91 car has done. So, uh, big gap. Then Yannick Mettler in the car collection, Porsche number 23, uh, sits just, I think, just under a lap from Chris Cools. And then just 11 seconds back is Charles espen -Laub in the CP racing. So that reset of pit stops after that little code 60 has really changed things quite a lot in the uh, in the top order. In 992, it is the 909 that still leads and the objective of the last code 60 was to try and get 955 and 903 onto their lap. Uh, I'm not sure where they've achieved it or not. But I, don't, I don't think they have been there. Uh, so the 999 uh, sorry, the 909 is on 217 laps. The cars behind them in class. Sergio Nicolai in the Villy Motorsports Porsche on 216. 35 seconds behind in third place is uh, Hoop van Heindhoven in the Red Ant car. And a further 18, just over 13 seconds behind is... Uh, has, that got, has that jumped over the... So it's, four, lap. so it is 45 they seconds. Have, yes, yeah. yes, they have. They've proved me wrong. But so Red Camels have that pit stop advantage, don't they? Th yeah, 34 seconds is the gap in the 992 lead. So that, that tactic did work. And now, if we get another opportunity to pit, and everybody does so, the Red Camels car, our, our friend Paul Truswell, can decide whether or not to and stay out. So, as ever tactics coming to the fore. I've always said it, Ben, endurance racing is one on the pit wall. It Absolutely. is a pure team effort. Half a minute between Sergei Nikolai and Hub van Eindhoven, but does mean that... No, they're all three on, on the lap, and HRT Performance 930 is also on that same lap, one minute 30 back. So the top four in 992 are all on the same lap, which is great news. Patrick Hoisman is uh, the man we're watching right now in the 907 RPM Racing Porsche, that distinctive chrome green, and they are the best AM competitor in 992, but they are a lap back. They're, they, we are looking at the European champions in the 992 AM class elect in the, in the form of the RP Racing Team. Little spin for Aldris Navikas in the 72 Jutta Racing Audi, fifth position in GT3 AM, 11th in GT3. Uh, penultimate position in GT3 now that the Ferrari of Jochen Krumbach uh, has got going again, but they are at the tail of the GT3 field. In GTX, it's the KTM crossbow that we uh, jump aboard every so often with. 10 seconds to the good over RD Sign's Lamborghini. So there's a battle to watch, whether it goes out or in, we're not so sure. And then a lap back is the VDS Racing Adventures Mark II V8. And uh, Raphael van der Straten is aboard that car right now. And they are third in class ahead of the first of the Vortexes, which is 701. GT4 is led by Atlas BX. And they are a good chunk ahead 
of the Hoffer Racing by Bonk BMW now. Uh, I say a good chunk, let's be more specific. Nearly seven laps. Uh, and that is basically all the information on our first page. Apart from TCR, which is led by Hongard Motorsport, Magnus Homeguard aboard that car right now. Three laps to the good over Jos Stevens in Baz Kooten's Cupra. Uh, got a question for everybody out there in 24 Series Land. What is the connection between the Haas RT team <laughs> and the Van der Straten team? I don't think anyone would know. No one's going to know the, <laughs> the answer to that. Yeah, one's, one's running a Mark, Mark Cars V8, the other one's running an Audi R8. It's not the number eight, that's not the connection. One's, gonna, one's based in Antigua, the other I, base is in Holland. Say that again, Nick. It's That's all Belgian. Everything's Belgian. They're all Belgian. It's a Belgian well, it's an thing. Antiguan entry. The Haas RT. Well, that's not the answer, though, Nick. Belgium. Yes, but Belgium isn't the answer. No, no, I'll tell you the answer. Uh, Sandrine Haas, the name above the door, is, a fam is, is family connected. Second cousins to the Van der Straten family, is how she explained it to us. And she's only realised that. Did she say she only found that out this week? When Not she's been chatting or just no, recently? No, no, it was recently, though, yeah. Yeah, fairly recently. And the 758, the car that's modelled on the, the Ford Mustang, it has got a Ford engine, and that's a tube frame car. And if only we could get, what, 12 of them? They sound phenomenal, like any V8 on, on full pipe sound. It, they absolutely sound beautiful. It's music. I'm all for loud racing cars. I'm old school. Have you seen the new Ford Mustang GT3 car? Yes, Woo! exactly. And have you heard it? Oh, even the GT4 car sounds pretty yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah. Talking of sounding good, the Bocken Spiegel team, Monchal Ferrari 296, doesn't sound too bad either. Did we get to the bottom of what the problem was there? Well, we were talking gearbox issue. Well, yeah. We? yeah. There's a one for Nick then. Let's find out. All right, gearbox issue isn't enough for Ben and I. We're geeks. We want to know exactly what the issue is because they, they came in, they obviously played around with some sort of software with a laptop, reprogrammed something, car went out, wasn't rectified, came in again, spent a little bit of time, uh, let's, let's bring Nick in there, Ben. What, what you say, Nick? You, did you find out? No, I'm still working on the previous thing, which is Sandrine Haas. <laughs> I brought Sandrine uh, to answer that question. Sandrine, um, we understand you discovered you're related to Raphael van der Straten or the Mark VDS team this week. Yeah, well, I kind of knew, I guessed, um, and a few races ago, um, I did ask him if one of his aunts was, and yes, we are family related. Is it just because you're all basically Belgian is it, and all the Belgians are related? <laughs> no, not all Belgians are related, but all Belgians know each other, yeah. <laughs> now you've got yourself a special t-shirt. If you look on the back, this is the, this is the t-shirt. It, it mentions all the teams. Now, the key point is, how do you qualify? You, you had told me how myself and Joe and Ben could qualify to get on the T-shirt. How do we get on your T-shirt? I think first, have to spend more time with us and have to drink rum <laughs> after the race. It's the rum after the race. You're on. We're all, we're all fine. The race finishes at midday. We've nowhere to go for five hours. Let's drink rum. No rums. <laughs> hey, Nick, I may qualify because I've worked in the same race team as Krista Donker. Chris the boss. Ah, yes. Yeah. So I might be in there, and I can drink rum too. And I and I, and I visited Antigua, so does yeah, that count? I think we're in it. Yeah, I, I think we're in there. Yeah. yeah. I even knew the bar that she was talking about. Hello uh, to Cloggies, uh, if you are still watching over in Antigua. Um, I have had a drink again. in your bar before. Fabulous. Cloggies. Yeah. Owned by a Dutch a person. Dutch guy. Unsurprisingly. Yeah, a Dutch person, yeah. yeah. Hello, Cloggies. They apparently are tuning into the race, Ben. So when we go back to Antigua, well, when I go to Antigua, when you go back to Antigua, 
We can it, pop into Cloggies and see who we are. Well, and also, if you are a fan of the 24H series and you find yourself in this dilemma that your, uh, your partner or your friend has booked you a holiday in Antigua over a clashing 24H series 2024 race, for instance, let's say Mugello, you know that you can still tune in in Cloggies and enjoy your holiday at the same time. Great to be point. fair, I can't think of anything better than hanging out in English Harbour, drinking rum, and watching the 24H series at the same time. There's no pirates there now, is there? Oh, yes, lots. <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> Almost certainly. And parrots? Parrots? There's got to be parrots there if there's pirates. I suppose there's parrots. Don't spoil the illusion. They mate. might not be. They might not be as um, colourful as a parakeet. Is that the right word? I, mean, I don't know. What, yeah. what does pirate? What do pirates have on their shoulder? Parrots or parakeets, aren't they? Yeah. Could choose. But if there's pirates, there's going to be parrots. But that's a great. That's great advice. That's great uh, advice. Oh, it's a macaw. Yes, you're so right, Nick. It's, well, for them. Yeah. <laughs> Shame. You. What was about, sorry, whilst I was getting to yes. dream, you were witching on about another thing you wanted me to do. What well, was it? Well, we are, Ben and I being geeks, we're not just happy with the expedition on the Vogelspiegel team, Ranchal Ferrari, as having a gearbox issue. We want to know exactly what the issue is, because the car's going splendidly now. The car's well back in it, it's on 218 laps, yes, 10 laps down off the lead. However, 146 sixes, cars back on the pace. How did they fix it? Yeah. And actually, you could go to Bagheera uh, and ask the same question as well. We've got a yellow flag because there's a car facing the wrong direction uh, that we've just decided not to look at. Um, at turn seven, there it is, 917. And that's Antonio Garzon of Orchard Racing Team. They've actually got an onboard camera in that car uh, that we sometimes go and have a look at. They're second in AM right now but uh, there are only a lap ahead of MRS GT Racing. Wow, this is going to be a bit of a tricky maneuver. It's reversing into the racing line down there at turn seven. Don't like it. Go forward. Yeah, it's, he, oh, oh, you see? Yeah, it's causing some consternation, this, isn't he? This is, like, my, my ah. bum cheeks are literally squeezed together. Now then, hasn't quite got the lock. No, he has perfect. got the Lovely. lock, yeah. No code recovery. 60 needed, and I can relax. Yeah, great. It was uh, a little bit touch and go there, wasn't it? Very fast section there, of course, to turn seven. Got to carry that speed up the hill towards turn nine. You want to, you want to be on it. So as you come through the corner, they'll have been met with the car at 90 degrees, but uh, no harm, no foul, and that car's back underway. Uh, good discussion on the YouTube chat uh, as the 929 with a puncture. With a puncture on the left front. Uh, so Harley Horton aboard the HRT Performance Porsche there. One of three named as such, one of four run by the team. Um, good chat on the YouTube stream at the moment about being Dutch and not related to Belgians, more connected to Germany than Belgian. Uh, Erwin, thank you very much. And Erwin likes to sleep next to his computer with the stream always running when there's a 24H series race on. Great stuff. Oh, now 709 grinding to a halt. What's going on? The attrition's kicking in. Let's head down to Nick Damon. Nick, what have you got? Well, I've meandered around the WTM racing, and I, I thought, you know, I'm going to use my investigative skills. There aren't many spares here, are there, on this thing? There's a new spare thing. This is an E-shift actuator. Something that actually runs here where your paddle shift, it converts your paddle actuation into a movement on the gearbox. Something that can be unfixed and refixed with three screws. Hmm, that could be a gearbox problem, could it, That's boys? A great, that, is, that is outstanding work, Nick. You're, you're almost taking an interest there. That is fabulous work. <laughs> fabulous work. <laughs> gearbox actuator. There you go. Yeah, paddle actuator. Great work. It was a flappy paddle issue. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've got a puncture on the 929. We've got a car that stopped. What was the number on the car that stopped? I didn't quite see it. 90. Oh, there he is. 7 Seven. What does that say? 709? From, from, um, it it's Alvaro Fontes. Yeah. Who, we, who, spun, um, who spun a little bit earlier on on our last stint, I think. So the 929 has now made it back to the pits and has gone straight through fueling and will be heading down to their pit garage. Harley will take the car 
into the pit lane. HRT Performance will be ready for it. Seventh in the 992 class. So not in contention, certainly for a class podium, but that will not do their race any good whatsoever, that puncture. Strange. Uh, we've seen a couple we've seen a couple of deflated tyres, but not that many, so I'm not quite sure how that car's picked that one There's up. a lot of bits out there, isn't there? Uh, whether yeah, it be marbles is, yeah. or bits of carbon, there's a lot of stuff on track. And because we've not really had a long Code 60 period, there's not been the opportunity for the marshals to go out and do a big sweep. We had that earlier on. I mean, just on the look on the, this is the start finishing straight. And on the right hand side, there is a border of chunks of rubber that have been left on the side of the circuit. And we've seen a couple of tyres deflate on the main straight, haven't we, uh, earlier on today. It's kind of, kind of give up, I think, they've probably got the damage earlier on. And there could on. have been damage yeah, from contact, yeah. yeah, which we established. I mean, what, what you don't want to do is run your, run your tyres across those marbles, and because all of that melted, all of that rubber will stick to the tyre, and then you'll have a horrific vibration for the whole stint, because it'll be very, very hard to shed that amount of pickup. Lots of pickup there, just off off the racing line, literally inches off the racing line on driver's left, heading down the main straight. So we will not want to be doing that for any of our drivers. Uh, the rest of the track looking as fabulous as ever, soon beginning to just disappear behind the clouds on the horizon, so it'll not be long before we start seeing the, uh, the darkness creep into the sky. Last few moments of light here. Actually looks very light on our camera it's not as light as that in real life everybody we have got tinted windows ah yeah there it is Clever. have we really yeah we have slightly great view there circuit of catalonia there's that iconic shot head on on the pit straight just going into turn one and then just see the speed that the cars carry yes it's a heavy braking area but it's not a stop is it? It's a carry speed into that section of track. The right, left, and then into the never-ending turn three. What a great view there, just looking back down the pit straight. And uh, that undulation in the track is quite a, it's quite a steep entry. The CP Racing Mercedes in fifth place overall, just off the lead, a couple of lap, laps by about three or four laps at the moment. Charles Espenlaub at the wheel of the car. And this car just being run like clockwork. It was out of position on the starting grid, but as was perhaps 80, 90% of the grid, to be honest, after the, uh, the wet weather truncated the qualifying yesterday. Only had one of the 15 minute ses sessions for the AM drivers. The AM drivers played an even bigger part in yesterday's qualifying because that's how the grid lined up. So, CB Racing. Way down the order, and they've just stealthily made progress, just kept to their plan, and have crept up the order, and are certainly in contention to be seen on the podium as they're leading the GT3 AM class from the E2P Racing Porsche, <coughs> just behind them. I'm pretty sure they're a lap ahead of the car in the GT3 AM class. We're currently fifth overall for the number 85, sixth overall for Javier Mochillo. And Javier is just uh, approaching turn five now, as we've got Anton Garzon facing the wrong direction once again. Um, Mr. Damon, what have you got for us? I've got Robert Renauer. Ah. Robert, you've had a hell of a day. Yeah, I was a bit busy today, um, coming from Valencia after the sprint race today, and now we are here. Uh, try to support our teammates, uh, Ralph, uh, Patrick, Bridle and uh, Daniel, Daniel a little bit during the night. So, looks good at the moment. Really enjoyed it. So how, how did you get from Valencia to here? Did you plane, helicopter or just drove really fast? Uh, we just uh, took the easy way by car. Um, yeah. Going to Valencia, uh, to Barcelona from Valencia was not a big deal gonna be uh, a bit harder going back to Valencia this night so yeah we will see we have one guy with us from our team and driving us later or in the in the early morning hours and then we see so the car that's here is this your GT open car is it that's true yeah it's the GT open car now 
obviously Ralph's just jumped in the car and doing Which a brilliant one? job, but it's a different track, it's different tyres, it's even a different type of Porsche. How difficult is that? Yeah, it's true. Um, it's complete, complete different from driving side. The steering, uh, steering uh, is complete different from the new car compared to the other one. So, to be honest, it's, it's harder to get from the 992 into the 991 than uh, from 992 to 991 into the 992 tomorrow. So the step today now back to the old car is much harder than, for example, tomorrow back to qualifying. So has the trip so far been worth it? We know you guys came fourth in the Bronze Cup earlier. Is that enough points to make it worthwhile going to Valencia? Um, not sure at the moment. Our sister car, the Pure Racing car, was really strong today. Um, they are still leading the championship. Um, cross fingers at one of both cars winning the championship. Robert, have a good stick when you get in a bit. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Great to see Robert making it from Valencia and sharing in the duties in that Herbert Motorsport car. Ralph Bond, who was his uh, co-driver in the car from Valencia, like he says, no big deal. I'll take his word for it. 230 laps, 34 laps completed. And Ralph uh, putting in a, a, quite a sterling stint here, lapping very, very consistently in the one minute 45 sevens. And uh, the fastest car from what I can see on the time of screens, the fast car on the track. And a shout out to Ian McCarthy, who fed me that information about the uh, uh, GT Open car being the same livery as the Lion Speed car that they run over in GT Open. And that's where uh, suspected it was the same car, and it is. But interesting, he talks that the steering is completely different. Yeah, interesting. So it really, it might look quite similar to us, but. Uh, you know, underneath the, the, the covers, big changes happen every time they upgrade these machines. Well, of course. I mean, it, it makes sense to evolve and develop and make the car better. And certainly, I remember first impressions of the 992 from drivers who would uh, who, who sort of took the car out first, even when it was here as a prototype, um, were that the car was a massive improvement on what was already a very, very quick race car. Got the hole for Mercedes in the pits. That looks like Chantel Kroll getting into the car, sharing the car with her husband, Alex Prince. Chantel Prince, of course, maiden name Kroll, former ladies champion in the 24th series. Not sure who got out, but I think Nick's down there. Nick, are you able to tell us and maybe even get a word? Carson Tilku got out. He's uh... He's sitting down and I'll see if I can, he's having a chat. I'll just, he, and it looks like he's drinking either an energy drink or some very cheap Aston lemonade. So I'm guessing it's the energy drink. He's, uh, he's chatting with, uh, with Alex Prince and uh, there's Carson. I'm going to get a very nice helmet. You've got to say, look lovely. It's very <laughs> Carson, how was that stint? You look quite warm. Yeah, it was warm. Actually, it was a bit cooler than uh, the first stint I did today, but uh, still, still quite warm in the car, yes. How are you finding the circuit of Catalonia? People are saying it's quite different from normal. Uh, actually, um, it's my first time here uh, racing, so uh, for me everything was new. Uh, I like it, it's a challenging circuit. Many fast corners now with a, a new modification at the end. But uh, it's, it's fun, but uh, challenging, yes. And how is the car going? Because again, it's, it's the Again, it's been, we've been hearing from all the drivers, it's been very um, uneven grip. The cars are kind of not really gripping well. Sorry, sorry, I didn't hear that. How is the grip on the car? Because a lot of drivers are saying it's very uneven. Yes, the grip is very difficult. Uh, at the beginning, it's quite good for a couple of laps. And then, especially in the first stint, it was very difficult. Now, when the temperature goes down a little bit, uh, it felt better. But at the end of the, at the, end of the stint, it's very slippery uh, out there uh, with the tires. Great stuff, thank you indeed. Yeah, it's a pity he hadn't driven his dad's version of the circuit as well, wasn't it, Ben? <laughs> we, were, we were just saying that. <laughs> yeah, that's very we were, good. We were then. just saying that. It was, it was his dad's version that uh, was, he was brought in, Herman Tilker, his father, was brought in to slow the cars down through that final turn. And to be honest, he achieved that objective. He was given an objective Quite and he achieved, yeah, the objective. He achieved it. Yeah, and he the, achieved the it. other idea was to try and encourage overtaking. So bunch the cars up closer through the chicane so that they could then follow easier through the final turn and then outbreak each other at turn well, one. That was the problem because the cars, for, we're talking Formula One here, yeah. weren't able to follow each other through the final turn because exactly. it was so high speed, so yeah. you had disturbed air. So they wouldn't be able to follow each other through at all. 
uh, which negated the, uh, the this one kilometre straight into a heavy braking area. So, yeah, in fairness, certainly suits uh, endurance sports cars and certainly GT3 sports cars and, and under. Yeah, the circuit itself, not built by uh, Herman Tilke's organisation, built in 1991, around the time of the uh, Barcelona Olympics, in fact, and formed part of uh, various events that year. But it was the Tilke organisation that was brought in to modify the circuit later on. In fact, uh, doing a little bit more research on that, the first Herman Tilke circuit built was not until 1999. I expected, considering Herman's age, that he'd been building circuits for 20, 30 years. He was a racer himself and actually really got involved in Super. modifying the A1 ring. But the first track he built, Nick Damon correctly says, was so paying. There is a, uh, there's um, a Christmas quiz question for, uh, yeah. for anybody to add to. Yeah, he, didn't he also um, design the Chinese? Track at uh, um, Zhuhai. He's done many at Shanghai. Time. And what's more, he, he is, he's responsible for the Singapore uh, night race circuit. And I had a beer with him in Singapore, and he just sat down and started chatting to us. And it took me after talking, oh, so what do you do here? And, and he asking the same question. Yeah. Took good 20, 25 minutes to get to the point where I was going, oh, I'm having a beer with Herman Tilker. Oh, right, because he didn't come over, I'm Herman Tilcup, I built the circuit. Right, yeah. He was like, oh, yeah. can I sit here? Yeah, yeah you can. Like, chat, chat, chat about motorsport. And he was such an understated gentleman. It was a, a lovely discussion to have with him. Uh, but he's had, there's a lot of circuits that you've never heard of that he's now built. One in Kazakhstan, I noticed. It's the yeah. theme of the weekend, weird racetracks. <laughs> Yaz Marina. Well, yeah. You know, you go to Yaz Marina, which is where we'll go for the Abu Dhabi six hours in January. And that really is, when you go to a facility like that, that is 21st century motorsport. You know, I grew up standing in a muddy field up against a wooden fence. And then you go to somewhere like Yaz, and it's like, ah, this is what modern motorsport facilities are. You know, fully paved, brick paved, concrete, tarmac, seating areas everywhere. Well, don't forget they what built a, a marina there as well, as part <laughs> of the build product. The marina wasn't there before the track was there. So it was just called Yaz. Yeah. Well, it was just a piece of scrubland, marshland. Yeah. They built the marina into it to, to create the Monaco feel uh, oh, that, yeah, it, that it now has. Uh, Nick Damon? Nicholas? That was a, uh, a we say that my lovely die was coming early for my dinner. Does that mean uh, that you can replace die earlier on later? That I would know be what a you're great getting, idea. I know what you're a fantastic at. idea. Nick. Oh, thanks, Nick. We owe you. Goodbye, then. Nick deserves uh, a lovely dinner he after does. working out what the uh, issue on the Ferrari was. Exactly. We knew it was gearbox issue. And his Vortex the, tour. The, and the Vortex the, tour was fabulous. We'll get, yeah. They'll be clipped up and used forever and a day until yeah. we see that car in December. Uh, you'll hear more from Nick Damon before the end of, of our broadcast at 11 o'clock local time this evening. Uh, we'll take a rest overnight. You'll be able to watch what's going on on the live timing, of course. And we will rejoin you with pictures at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning for the last five hours of this race. Very odd. I don't think I've ever started a 24-hour race so early on in the day and having so much of it before the second day. Actually, we're having completely equi hours equi hours of time because it's starting midday till midnight and then midnight till midday a lot of the time you'll have a three o'clock start traditional with Le Mans uh, Spa 24 hours tends to be a four has been a 5.30 one year and that's painful because you get to the it's second day painful. and you go hang on a second oh I've got a whole day to yeah. do tomorrow two and a half hours for you and I yes we're and done by 9.30 and, and when we're back we're back on air at 7 a.m. Uh, local time here and what we'll be able to do at midnight, we award half points. We award half points towards the championship. So going into the final five hours of not just the Barcelona 24 hours, but the 2023 24-8 series European trophy for GT and TCE, we'll be able to bring you up to date, massively up to date, with the championship standings. If you can't wait till then, it's all going to be updated as it goes, as it evolves organically, on the website, so go to 24 h series uh, on your uh, on the internet, 24 seriescom and check out the championship standings, which, as we go through this race, are updating all the time.
So as we change positions, as cars drop and, and or improve, the championship situation differs ever so slightly. Uh, just to give you an overview, GT3, the, well, let's start with the overall trophy. It's still got the Atlas BX Motorsports Mercedes at the head of the championship table on 180 points. Behind them in second place jointly is the RPM Racing Porsche team on 172 with the RD Signs Lamborghini on 172 also. Vini Sports by EB Motors overall on 166 points in fourth place. And the Bagheera ZM Racing, that car came into this, uh, this race in massive contention for overall honours with the European Championship. They're in fifth on 162 places, and that's purely down. The reason why they've dropped down the table is because of that problem starting the race. Uh, Home Guard Motorsport lead the Touring Car Endurance Series, and if they are still where they are at midnight, they will actually take the championship. They cannot be caught going into the final five hours of this race. So if at midnight, Home Guard are there where they are now, they will take the European Championship for the Touring Car Endurance Series, which is indeed the last time we'll be uh, racing for the Touring Car Endurance Series. Uh, we'll, it'll be coming to a, a halt next year, 2024. We amalgamate all of our GT and Touring Car classes into just one big series. It's the way we did it before. We're going back to that. And uh, so it'll be the, the, uh, the final award of our Touring Car Endurance Championship tomorrow or indeed at midnight tonight if Home Guard Motorsport can stay where they are. Uh, our class championship, GT3, is being led by the Haas RT Audi team. They're at 130 points. That's on your screens at the moment. There is your GT3 class championship leader. The GT3 Pro-Am championship is being led by the Shearer Sport Audi. The GT3 AM category being led by CP Racing, as is the class in this race. CP Racing leading the class as well as... Or am I wrong? Have they dropped down behind the Ferrari? No, they haven't. No, they're still ahead of the Ferrari. And then the 992 class, Vidi Motorsport by EB Motors. They're on 166 points. Red Ant Racing's in second on 156. And then just behind them, Red Camel's Jordan on 152, that's the 992 class honours there, up for grabs still. 992 Am, you've got RPM Racing there in contention for the overall uh, European Championship trophy. They're leading the 992 Am class by uh, on 172 points, and it looks very likely that they will be our European 992 Am champions. We'll see them tomorrow night at the presentation or the tomorrow afternoon. Uh, RD Signs, Lamborghini, they are leading GTX. European Championship and GT4, Atlas BX Motorsport, the team that's leading overall. We've mentioned Home Guard, TCX, SK Racing's leading that one, and TC, Hofer Racing by Bonk Motorsport, looking like they'd be awarded the European Championship trophy. Let's take a look then at the results as we click into uh, 8 o'clock local time, 16 hours to go. It is Herbert Motorsports that leading by just over a minute over the slightly newer Porsche 911 GT3R of IMSA LS Group Performance with Hass RT's Audi four minutes and 15 seconds back. Uh, so that is about two laps back. Car collection, though, in their Pro-Am GT3 911 GT3R is uh, about a minute and a half behind Haas RT. And then 40 seconds back is CP Racing, uh, leading the AM category of GT3. Share of Sport have just overtaken E2B Racing up to sixth position. And Jutta Racing's 71 with Jonas Gelzenis is aboard that car at the moment. Eighth spot, ninth to land Motorsport. And 10th is the first of the 992 category cars. It's Red Camel leading. But look at the gap now. Just five seconds between themselves and a pedalling Willy Motorsport by EB Motors. Second in class. Third in class is the 930 HRT Performance Machine. And fourth in class and best am is the 907 RPM 992 with Patrick Hoisman aboard that car. They're all on the same lap as well. Tasty. 
903. Red Ant is 14th overall, fifth in that uh, 992 class. And then we have the troubled Ferrari down in 15th now, slowly making its way back up through the field, the 296 GT3 machine. Red Ant Racing, uh, the second car down in 16th, sixth in class. The 72 Yuta Racing, 17th, 929 HRT with Harley Horton aboard. That car, 18th, has been uh, facing the wrong direction quite a few times, that machine. Uh, 30 seconds behind them is another teammate of theirs, the 967 HRT Performance 992 New Spec GT3. It's not a GT3, is it? Because it's in, in the 992 category car. Uh, Hoffer Racing is down in 20th spot, and then we get the best of the GTXs, which is still the KTM Crossbow, but only 10 seconds ahead of the RD Signs Lamborghini Super Trofeo that sits second in class. Third in class is VDS Racing Mark uh, V8, which is about two laps back from that. Uh, and then Orchard Racing Team 917. We've seen that car facing the wrong direction a few times recently as well, with Seb Lajou Racing. Uh, uh, they had a problem with Laurent Cochard, didn't they, early on in the race? A good few spins for that car. Uh, 928 had power steering issues early doors down in 26th spot. And then the first, the Vortexes. Untroubled touch wood so far. Fourth in class, 27th overall. MRS GT Racing never really showing in 28th with Atlas BX Motorsport, the best of the GT4s in 29th position overall and a good chunk of time ahead of Hoffer Racing by Bonk, the second of the GT4 category cars. On to our final page, and we have the 709 car, which has uh, had an issue with Alvaro Fontes out on circuit, back in the fuel zone now. Richardson Racing may be in the pits, down in 34th spot, Bagheera, uh, still not really recovering after their early fuel issues. And GRS, uh, GSR Motorsports Janetta is overheating. That's the issue that they have got, and they are struggling to get that uh, working properly. They're the three TCR cars. Hongard seven minutes ahead of Bas Kooten with Wolf Power Racing uh, a long, long way back after breaking a drive shaft in uh, hour four, I think it was. Thank you, Ben. Let's head straight down to the pits where Dinah Binks has got something for us.